We used to live in a house in Nairobi, Kenya, in Kurichwa Road. It was an old estate and had been there since like 1936. The owner was super old. My brother had come from university and like he did every single time that he came, he stayed downstairs in the living room. He would always watch horror movies until really late and catch up with me while my big sister and other brother were always jet lagged and sleeping. So one night we decided that we would watch It, the movie. I got some crazy nightmares. I even shouted my brother's name for him to come and open the door for me so I could go and use the bathroom. When I went back to sleep, he and I were sleeping in the same place. And that's when I froze for a second. I saw a girl dressed in all white, just lying on my roof, back flat, looking at my brother and I. I was shocked and in utter disbelief. I rubbed my eyes and she disappeared. The same occurrences started happening pretty regularly. I told my brother and he thought it was just banter, until one night he saw it for himself. We told our parents and our siblings and they got so skeptical that we moved out right away. After a while, our old estate became completely deserted and I've never bothered to go back there again. Who knows what ghosts might be lurking around the house, waiting for their next victim. I should lead by saying that I tend to lean towards skepticism when it comes to the paranormal. I 100% believe that paranormal entities exist. However, more often than not, I think people psych themselves out rather than have a genuine paranormal experience. In fact, that's why it's taken me so long to follow up on my situation. I'm reconsidering the weight of the situation now based on the behaviors of people that have been around this artifact that I have, as well as some of the things that have happened to me while I was looking into it. About two years ago, I found myself volunteering at an orphanage in Uganda for six months. I decided to go out there as a way to recover from my alcoholism and move forward with my life. While I was in Uganda, I also ended up being involved with getting a primary school started and I assisted in getting a nonprofit off the ground. I was actually offered the position of operations manager at the nonprofit when I left the country, and the school was named after my friend and I in our honor. The point is, I was working really hard to have a good future, and I had succeeded in my recovery. In my last month in Uganda, a fellow volunteer gave me a gift. It was a Coptic cross that he had picked up in Ethiopia while he was on his way back into Uganda. I thought it was super cool and unique, so I got some string and fashioned it into a necklace to bring back to the States. I think it's important to note that the guy who gave it to me came from Trinidad and Tobago and outspokenly hated Americans. We clashed occasionally but we both understood that we came from different places and ideas and just agreed to disagree. To be clear though, 90% of the time we were friends and on good terms. The very first peculiar experience happened to me about six months after I had gotten back home. I was in line to check out in a grocery store when I saw a man who looked like he was from Africa. It's hard to explain, but when you've been in a place long enough, you can pick up on their demeanor and their clothing and things like that. The man was just walking by when he looked at me, then at my necklace, and then back at me, but this time with a look of absolute terror. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but still, it stuck with me. Before my second experience, I had some friends comment on my necklace. I was told that it had some sort of weight to it, and that something about it felt weird. I ended up asking some coworkers about it since I knew some of them were heavy believers in the spirit realm. After I took it out and showed them, nobody was comfortable standing any closer than five feet from me. 
they prayed for me and sent me home with a prayer book, which they claimed would keep me protected. At this point, I began to get paranoid, and I began recounting weird occurrences in my apartment. One example is that my two-week-long writer's block with my music production suddenly ceased when I moved the necklace out of my studio and into another room. I kept thinking of similar circumstances. The only problem here was that I couldn't quite convince myself that I wasn't just falling victim to my own placebo. I also remember the very distinct feeling of being watched, and I never really felt alone after that. One night, after overcoming my usual nightly restlessness, I fell into the comforts of sleep. The next thing I know, I had started a business in my hometown. A car wash, actually. I was showing a friend the place, and I let us all into the office. Everything in my office was neatly placed in its spot, just as it should have been. Suddenly, a man appeared walking past the doorway that exited from the side of the office into a car wash bay. Everything about the man's appearance was average. What was unsettling, though, was that I could tell that he knew I was watching him, even though he wasn't looking at me. It was just a gut feeling. The man disappeared as soon as I got a good look at him. I walked out the door in an attempt to see where he went. The man was nowhere to be seen. I walked back inside the side door of the office, and everything was trashed. I looked over at my friend and said that we needed to get the hell out of there. I led the way out of the front door, and laying on the ground in front of my feet was a horse. The horse was barely alive and was quite clearly in excruciating pain. I noticed it was missing two legs, one in the front and one in the rear. It was at that moment I realized I was in a dream and I felt my subconscious start to panic. When I finally woke up, I was sweating and terrified. Needless to say, that sleep was not something I was going to attempt again that night. I was seriously freaked out and decided to look into the possibility of a haunting. A week later, I found myself in the home of a spiritualist. I had made sure to leave the necklace outside to see if she could sense it as a sort of vetting process. I also made a point to be aware not to make any hints toward my experience, and more importantly, that necklace. She had told me that she felt the presence of a demon about me, and that it was not from the necklace that I had left outside. Since I made sure not to mention anything that could lead her to know about that necklace, I trusted her reading. However, I politely left after she gave me an estimate for $200 to solve my problem. I know she needs to pay her bills too, I just didn't quite have that much money at the time. A week and a half later, I went to the office of my friend's pastor's friend. She was a Christian counselor who just so happened to have some expertise in the subject. I'm not a Christian, but I figured that it wasn't really a big deal since not everybody in counseling is a Christian. So, the appointment moved forward and I told her everything that had happened. She responded by doing some forearm muscle tests, which revealed that there were seven demons in me. She was able to relinquish six of them, and then things quickly escalated. Apparently the seventh demon was a tier above most, and can't be renounced with spiritual faith. I admitted that I wasn't a Christian, but leaned toward agnosticism. I didn't think it was a problem because I answered that question in the introduction packet she gave me when I first walked in. Long story short, she berated me for 20 minutes, told me I was going to be stuck with this demon until the day that I'm a devout man of God, shamed me for coming to a Christian counselor without being a Christian, and charged me more than we initially agreed on. I think it's important to note that I don't think this is normal behavior for her. I obviously didn't know her very well, but the shift in her demeanor was huge. I honestly couldn't even recognize her when she got angry. Apparently, she's been in business for years, and I can't imagine she would be remotely successful if she went off on every client that was simply looking for help, but didn't align with her point of view. I suspect it might have been induced, but nonetheless, I left her office hurt and angry. A week or two later, I decided to go out to Haiti to volunteer for disaster relief. 
I'm in my motel in Miami overnight with a flight out to Port-au-Prince the next day. That night, I woke up with sleep paralysis. I've read stories about it and realized it was important to stay calm and wait for the rest of my body to wake up. Suddenly, my legs were thrown out from under me across the bed. My torso felt like it was being pushed around. The next minute consisted of my body being thrown helplessly around the bed while I quietly prayed with all of my might. When I did, it ended abruptly, and I waited until the sun rose to relax. I ended up missing my first flight the next morning by a fluke. I booked another ticket the following day, but I was given the wrong time of my flight, and I missed that one as well. In the last six months, I have lost my jobs, isolated myself from friends, I am practically homeless, and I have had to file for bankruptcy. My ever-so-promising career in music is now gone, and I am ashamed of myself because I never made it out to Haiti. I don't know if there is any merit to paranormal interference. I can chalk up the nightmare to my subconscious thoughts, the sleep paralysis to muscle spasms, and everything else to paranoia, but the unexplainable portions are well, unexplained. Edit. Yesterday, I drove up to a spot on the mountain that I know pretty well. I crossed two creeks and walked a mile into the forest until I found a spot that I could easily recognize. I had the cross wrapped in a cloth that I had drenched in boiled salt water and let dry. I had also cleansed it myself before I left. I dug a small hole by the base of a tree and dropped the cloth-covered cross into the ground. I took out my Bible and read a select verse, prayed for it to leave me alone, and then addressed it directly. I demanded in the name of God that it will not follow me home or bother me anymore, and that it would be staying there. I've come back home and I've only felt better since. Granted, it's only been a few days, but I've been acting more like myself. My productivity has improved vastly. And most importantly, I don't feel burdened by that feeling of constantly being watched. It looks like that did the trick. Although, if I ever do need to get back the cross, I have the exact coordinates memorized. This story happened in 2001. I was 14 years old at the time. I live in Madagascar, and a lot of strange things happen in everyday life here. One day, the mother of my friend lost her expensive handbag with valuables also inside of it. She really loved that handbag. It was a gift, and she desperately wanted to find it. So one person told her that Solware, an old lady, could find everything you had lost. She had some kind of supernatural sense to find everything, especially when the item was stolen. So my friend and his mom and I went to this lady. Her house was like 10 kilometers from my friend's house, and none of us had ever seen this old woman. My friend and I stayed in the car while his mom went inside the lady's house. When she came back, she told us that the lady gave her an exact description of where the bag was. She said, you lost your bag at home. The day you lost it, there were three people in the house. A young kid, an older kid, and you, or the mom. The younger kid stole the bag. Close to your house, there is a house where an old man lives. The young kid often stays in that house. There is a dog on the property. The bag is inside of the doghouse. The old lady even gave a physical description of my friend and his young cousin who were in the house that day when the bag disappeared. The house she was talking about was the house of the kid's grandfather. We went directly to that house immediately after seeing the lady, and the bag was exactly where she said it was. It was really crazy. The bag was right there inside the dog's house, with everything in it except for the money, like the lady said. It was unbelievable. That old lady was living 10 kilometers away from that neighborhood. 
Neither my friend, his mom, or I had ever heard about her, let alone met her. It was a very old lady who could barely walk, so it was completely impossible for her to know the face of my friend and his cousin, especially to know what happened that day. His cousin was like 10 or 11 years old, and neither him or his family could have known the existence of that woman. I don't know how that lady could know all this stuff. And when we were at the lady's house, there was a queue to see her. There were like 15 people waiting outside, asking her to find their lost things. The funny thing is, she didn't even ask for money for it. You just gave her what you wanted or what you could. Some people gave money and others gave gifts. Others gave nothing. It was the most insane and unexplainable thing I have ever experienced. I'm a pretty rational person. I need to experience things myself to believe them. But I'm still interested in the paranormal because I keep experiencing weird things. It all started when I was a child. I used to have a lot of weird nightmares, but a few stood out more than others, especially this one. A weird looking figure is following me through the city at night, trying to kill me. But for some reason, I can't seem to come near my apartment until a moment when I look at the sky and see a little guy lying and sitting on a half moon, looking and smiling at me. After that, I'm finally able to come home. One of my other experiences is in a Catholic church or parish that I often went to with my aunt. I can't remember why. My mom is Protestant, so I grew up in this part of Christianity. I was still a kid, not older than eight years old, and I grew bored because I had no interest in religion, and I'm a hyperactive kid. So I go to the confessional booth. I enter a first time. The other side is empty. Then I go out and re-enter it, and there's a beautiful woman smiling at me in a very caring way. I smile back and go out again to get in again, and it's empty. The doors of the booth made a sound when opening and closing, so I would have heard her when she came in and out. Those experiences do not seem scary. On the contrary, they were kind of peaceful. Then everything changed for the worse. In 2010, I moved to another country, and it had been rough on me. I had trouble making friends, and I was self-conscious because of my weight. So, I would always make the most of my vacations when I was back in my native country. In 2013, one night I went to the cinema to watch a horror movie with my friend. Then we got back at my house to sleep. It's midsummer, so it's really warm. Thus, I kept my window wide open. We're fast asleep until we hear a big boom, like something crashed into the boxes that I have over my wardrobe. I just scream for my dad because I think that it's a bird or a bat and I'm scared. But my dad says there's nothing, but by the loud sound and the fact that the box had moved and that it was a heavy box, the bird or bat would have been unconscious. But anyway, we go back to sleep and the next morning when we wake up, I have bruises and scratches all over my body. This has never happened before. I don't move very much at all when I'm asleep. Neither does my friend, and both of our nails were really short. She even tried to scratch me again, but it didn't leave the marks. At this point, we were both uncomfortable, so we decided to go sleep at her grandma's house. When we were there, we slept in her great-grandmother's bedroom, and just between the two beds, there was a cross. So again, we fall asleep, and when we wake up, the cross is inclined, and I have even more bruises on my body. Then I go back to my mom in the country that I had moved to. The bruises disappeared maybe two to three weeks after I arrived. It was from that moment on that my life took another turn for the worse. 2014. 
As I said, my mom is really religious, so she wanted me to take my communion. I truly didn't want to, and every time I was near a religious place, I would feel discomfort. But I went through my Bible study, so we decided that I would have my communion in Cameroon, where my mom is from. Weird things started to happen to me there. I had to visit a priest prior to the ceremony, and he kept saying that something was following me, and that it didn't seem to want my well-being. But I'm thinking, whatever, I don't believe in any of this, I'm just doing this to make my mom happy. So fast forward to the ceremony, not even two minutes in, I get bored, so my eyes keep on scanning the church, and they keep moving up, so I'm actually looking over the priest's head. I see something that looks like an LED tinsel catching fire, so I started pointing at it. Luckily, they extinguished it quickly. As for the rest of the ceremony, I felt kind of disconnected. Then we came back to Europe, but my anxiety kept getting worse. I couldn't even go to school properly, but nothing too severe. In 2015, I went on a summer vacation at my dad's. Again, I came home with a lot of unexplained bruises. My mom kept thinking that it must be some result of the fact that I was turning vegetarian and I had lost a lot of weight. But the blood tests showed no signs of anything that could explain it. In the summer of 2016, I got my first real boyfriend, and it was in the beginning of my first year of high school. It was pretty calm, but I kept feeling more and more anxious, and I kept distancing myself from others. But it's weird because I should have been happy. I had everything I wanted at that moment. Two years later, my mental health got worse. I was diagnosed with severe depression. I had a lot of dark thoughts, and the bruises on my body were back. In July of 2018 is when I decided to move back to my native country and try to get healthier. I got into a high school where I made a lot of great friends and my mental health began to improve. But weird things happened at that house. The first year was okay, but from 2019 on, things just kept happening. In my dad's house, we have two bathrooms, one upstairs and one downstairs. I would use the latter while my dad and stepmom would use the one upstairs. I'm used to waking up at odd times, especially around 3 a.m., so I got downstairs to drink some water, go to the toilet, and then to the bathroom to wash my hands. I made sure to shut off the water correctly and go back to sleep. I'm the first one to wake up, and I go to take a shower, but I see that the water is running, which is weird because I know that I shut it off. But at the time, I was like, okay, I was tired. Maybe I didn't shut it off correctly. But it happened a few more times. The one experience that really got to me was this year. I was home alone, and I brushed my teeth, and I made sure to shut the water off. I even double-checked it. I went back to my room, was minding my own business, and that's when I heard the staircase creak. It can't creak without somebody stepping on it. At least, not like that. I heard footsteps going downstairs, and the water starts running. Again, I'm home alone, but I was like, screw it, and I went downstairs to shut it off. I was on my way upstairs again when the water starts again. I shut it off again, and I hear footsteps going upstairs. I felt watched the entire night. I almost always had the feeling that I was being watched in that house, especially when I woke up during the night, or when I was downstairs at night. I also had a lot of nightmares where somebody that I knew, but also somebody who scared me when I was younger, or a stranger, depending on the night, were trying to kill me or me and my friends. Another common dream was that the house next to mine was burning. Then I came back to live with my mom in July of 2020. I had the scariest nightmare of my life, although it felt like more than a nightmare. I was attending a wake, something that I would never do, for an uncle from my mom's side that I didn't recognize. 
But again, there's many people from her side of the family that I don't know, with a cousin. Many people were there remembering good times with him, until an aunt brought up that his teeth were rotten. And then many people started bringing that up. And another uncle and the cousin that I came with said that they knew why, because he told them, just before passing away. My cousin said, and I quote, The reason his teeth were rotten is because he was a cannibal. And that's when I woke up. What's special about this one is that I could actually see myself in this nightmare. I was conscious that it wasn't real. I could feel the tension and uncomfortableness. So I kept telling myself to try to wake up. The night after that, I had another nightmare where somebody was trying to kill me again. There are two other nightmares that I have all the time. One, I'm in a car with my friends and the car breaks down and suddenly there's a car that stops and a man suggests his help, but he ends up killing us. Well, I wake up before he really does it, but it's obvious what he's going to do. The second time I had that nightmare, I was aware that I had already had it, but there were different friends in the car. I could remember what was going to happen from the last time I had the dream, so I forced myself to wake up. The second dream, it was with a kidnapped little boy that I had tried to help, but instead I became a hostage myself and was almost killed. Again, the second time and onward that I had this nightmare, I remembered that it was a nightmare, and I was trying to wake myself up. When I close my eyes to fall asleep, I see faces. Most of them are very scary, and it makes me uncomfortable. I often see a clown staring at me. I happen to have a phobia of clowns, and it's always the same clown, but there are many faces. Am I just getting myself worked up? Is there something wrong with me? I have no idea what the meaning of any of this is. This was not my only experience with the paranormal, but it certainly is the most memorable. I was living in rural Ghana at the time, working for a non-profit organization based in a small farming town of about 4,000 people. It was very poor and undeveloped. Few houses had electricity or running water. I lived with my colleague in a guest house on the organization's compound. This town, like many rural communities in West Africa, was home to a substantial number of people who practiced juju. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, juju is a traditional form of West African witchcraft. Many times throughout the year I lived there, I would wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of a local coven off in the bush somewhere, beating drums and chanting. They were practicing their rituals and performing spells, as the locals had explained to me. This always occurred in the middle of the night, during the witching hour. Oftentimes, when this was happening, parishioners from various local churches, mostly Anglican and Catholics, would meet up on a hill and start their own drum circles, chanting prayers and singing hymns, in an effort to defend against the black magic being performed across town. As often as this spiritual battle happened during my stay there, I never got used to it. Not only was it completely unnerving, the noise would keep me up for hours and I would be exhausted at work the next day. One night during a torrential downpour, the power went out. This happened every few days during the rainy season, so we weren't concerned. We took out the flashlights and lit some candles in our shared space and went about our evening routine. But something felt very different about that night. The air had a certain feel to it, a strange tension that both my roommate and I sensed but neither acknowledged in the moment. Without much else to do, we both went to bed early to read. I remember feeling really uneasy going to bed as if there was some kind of presence in the room. I kept shining my flashlight into the corners and around the room. 
Eventually, I drifted off to sleep. I woke up hearing the faint sound of drums off in the distance. I got up to go to the latrines, and walking outside, I could hear the muffled sound of chanting. Although I had heard it dozens of times already by that point, the sound of their rituals sent a shiver down my spine. After using the restroom, I went back to bed, doing my best to ignore the sounds emanating from the woods. Just as I was falling asleep, I heard a bizarre sound coming from my acoustic guitar in the corner of the room. It sounded as though something was slowly dragging an edge down along the underside of the steel string while stretching it outwards at the same time. I came out of my half-sleep, my heart in my throat. The slow scraping of the string continued for a second, then paused. The guitar creaked in the dark, the string sounding completely stretched, and then thwang. The string slapped back against the neck of the guitar, ringing throughout the house. It honestly sounded as if the string had broken. I was terrified. I couldn't bring myself to move, or even to shine my flashlight toward the corner to see what might have struck the string. I laid there in bed, too fearful to move or sleep for about an hour. I started wondering if it was all in my head. Eventually, I started to fall asleep again. Without any build-up, the guitar made the same stretching sound on another string and then released, slapping against the fretboard and ringing out as loud as the first time. I jumped out of bed with my flashlight, looking around the room, wondering if I'd lost my mind. There was no falling asleep after that. When morning broke, I checked the guitar in the light. I could have sworn that the two strings had broken, judging by the awful sounds they made but they were all intact. Two of the strings, the low and high E strings, were way out of tune and felt loose while the others were all still taut and in tune. I asked my roommate over breakfast if she had heard it, and she had. She had heard the first note ring out before falling asleep, and the second had woken her up. We were both understandably rattled. We told the story to our colleague at work that morning, and he said it was probably the wind blowing against the guitar strings. That satisfied my roommate, but not me. How could the wind pull and strike a single string at a time? If the change in temperature or air pressure was warping the neck of the guitar and affecting string tension, wouldn't all of the strings be way out of tune? To this day, I have no explanation for how my guitar rang out on its own in the middle of the night and I will never forget that sound. This happened in around 1954 in Hilbro, Johannesburg, South Africa. My grandparents lived in Hillbro at the time after my grandfather returned from the Korean War, flying for the SAAF and finding work in the mines. He loved being a pilot, but with a growing family, he took a job with the mines, paying much, much more. From the beginning, the house they lived in just didn't seem right. Strange things would happen, like blankets being pulled off at night with nobody there. Movement could be seen from the corner of the eye, and my aunt, who was around three at the time, would talk to someone standing in the door when my grandmother gave her a bath, someone that only she could see. One morning, everybody was either at school, kindergarten, or at work when my grandmother was getting dressed to go to the shops. She was in her underwear when she saw a nun standing in her room. Her blood froze in her veins when she saw this old nun. Suddenly, at a fast pace, the nun walked toward my grandmother, shouting, Hurry up! Go! Go! They need you! Go now! As quickly as she appeared, she was gone. My grandmother was out of her mind with fear and ran outside, struggling to open the locked front door. She managed to run outside and scream in the street. It wasn't until an elderly lady from next door ran outside and covered my grandmother with a jacket 
that she realized she was still in her underwear. After going back inside the house with the elderly lady accompanying her, she explained what had happened. The neighbor explained to my grandmother that this was foreboding and that something bad was probably going to happen. Her words weren't even out of her mouth before the telephone rang. It was the mines, informing her that my grandfather had been injured in a rock fall underground. He was okay, but taken to the hospital with a broken leg. A lot of strange things would happen to them in the future, especially after they moved to the new founded gold mining town of Welcome in 1957, my hometown. I was in a class, and we had a special guest speaker from Guinea. He brought a balafone with him. I had read in the book for the class that there were a lot of superstitions and paranormal beliefs in some cultures in Africa. So during the Q&A time, I asked him if he had ever experienced anything paranormal. He then told this story about his family's balafone. He said that his family, as well as other musical families in his village, would place curses on their instruments in order to protect them for generations. His family's balafone had been around for many generations and had a powerful spell put on it. He said the military came one day to take his family's balafone away. He gave a reason for this, but I forgot what it was. He said they loaded it onto their truck and went to start the engine, but the engine wouldn't start. They tried many things to get the engine to start until finally they took the instrument out of the truck. They then went to start the engine again, and this time it started with no problem. Then they decided to put the balafone back into the truck while the engine was running. As soon as they put it in, the engine gave out. At this point, the military guys got spooked and they left the balafone behind with the family. Another story that I heard was from one of my Uber drivers. I believe he said he was from Nigeria and I had the nerve to ask him if he had ever had any supernatural experiences while living in Africa. I figured there was a good chance, because it seems like there's a strong and ancient magic in Africa, at least based on what I've read in that book I mentioned. He then told me this story about how his family would throw objects into the stream by their house if they wanted to curse another family in their village. He said that these spells would always work, and the other family would always have some misfortune or become ill. I don't know if these guys were just pulling my leg or not because I'm a silly American, but they seemed very serious when they told their stories. I particularly don't think the balafone player would have told that elaborate story if it had been made up, since that would have been a giant waste of time for the class. It's possible that the balafone story could be explained by some kind of weight capacity issue with the truck, I suppose. Also, the water curse might be explained because they used water as a drinking source and the stuff they threw in might have poisoned people downstream. But something tells me that there's more to it. I kind of hope there is. often have strange things happen to me. This time, it was on my recent trip to Tanzania for a midwifery internship. One weekend that I was there, I went on safari in Ruaha National Park. On the safari itself, it was only the guide and I. However, afterwards I was staying at the hilltop lodge in a small hut-like room. It was a peaceful lodge, overlooking Ruaha Valley. One particular night I was there, I fell asleep as usual, but I was awakened to the sound of clicking from heels on a hardwood floor. They were coming toward me. As soon as I opened my eyes, I heard a woman say, How can you sleep here? I turned to look to my right because that's where the voice came from. I couldn't see much, but I did see a black shadow right next to me on the edge of the bed. The shadow then fell into my stomach or hip area, 
At least that's what I felt. I felt the shadow go through me, and I felt the bed compress next to me. Keep in mind, I was alone. I checked the time, and of course, it's 3 a.m. I was in Africa, by myself. There wasn't anyone to talk to about what just happened. So I thought, stupidly, that I would reach down where there was an indentation in the bed. I don't really know what I was trying to accomplish. Maybe something was there. Nothing. I was pretty scared. I wanted to turn on the lamp that I had next to the bed, but that didn't happen. All these events happened fairly quickly, within five minutes. After I felt around, the strangest thing happened, and all of a sudden my head was back and my eyes had shut. I knew that I was falling asleep. I also knew that I wasn't purposefully trying to get back to sleep. My body began to go numb in a systematic kind of way. First my head, then my chest, and so on. I tried to scream, because I thought maybe the lodge owners would hear me and would be able to help. I was in sheer panic. I managed to whisper scream. That's all I could get out. I screamed three times and I realized that it wasn't going to work. I gave up and was propelled into a dream. A nightmare, rather. The black shadow had possessed me and was in my mind, speaking to me. She told me that I could do things with my mind when she was there. I found I could open doors and start fires just by thinking about it. It was cool, but really terrifying. I had to find a way to get her out. She wanted me to do terrible things, and she wanted to consume my soul. I spent a majority of the time trying to figure out what I could do to make this demonic being leave. I knew I could have an exorcism, but I couldn't find a priest to do it. I pleaded with her, begging for my soul, screaming that my life was of value and that there were things that I was meant to accomplish. I would be incapable of said things with this demon possessing me, but it wasn't working. She didn't care. My body was her vessel now. The end half was an endless search in a sanitarium-type hospital, looking for a different vessel. I thought that maybe, if I could find somebody who was brain dead, it would be the best idea, if you can call it that. I don't know how the dream ended because my alarm went off. It was so realistic, and I do believe in the paranormal. It was so real, I had to make sure that I couldn't still do things with my mind once I woke up. I will never forget this experience. So this all started at the age of eight. My family moved a lot due to my father's job. So we had just arrived in South Africa and about a month after arriving there, my parents found a beautiful house, big and magnificent. However, three weeks after moving in, I wake up at three in the morning. Next thing I knew, I was hearing a man singing. I opened my window to hear him better, and through the leaves, because of course there was a tree so I couldn't see anything, I see an African man wearing a purple boo-boo. He kind of looks like my grandfather, so he didn't scare me at first. However, at one point he stops singing, and I can feel his eyes piercing through the leaves. I quickly close my window and put myself under the sheets force field, I guess. Right after that, he starts singing again. The melody, I've tried to look for it for years now. It's like it's tattooed on my brain. Anyway, it only happened once whilst in South Africa. I had a lot of other spooky shit happen to me there too, but it's unrelated to this story. This was in 2008. Fast forward to 2015. I'm out at one in the morning in my town, just walking and appreciating the silence of the night. At one point, I hear a faint whisper. At first, I thought it was the wind. Nope. The melody starts again, 
and it seemed like he was singing, standing a couple of meters from me. Except I was on a road, and one side of it had a river. The other side just had an empty space, just dirt and some grass for about an acre. I remember looking around and could kind of spot him in the corner of my eye, still rocking his purple boo-boo. I panic and I yell at him to stop, but it goes on. I start running to my house. It was about two kilometers away. I'm no runner, and I have practically no endurance due to anemia, but believe me when I tell you I sprinted for a good ten minutes. I stopped at about two hundred meters from my house completely exhausted and spitting my lungs out. I felt weird for a moment because I was basically crouching, taking a breath, and it's like everything stopped. I heard him sing again. I took whatever energy I had left to get back to my house. I slept with the lights on for about two weeks. Now I'm 19, and I kind of forgot about all of this until three weeks ago. It was about eight o'clock. I went out early to buy some cigarettes and I was walking back home. As I did, I passed through a park. Lo and behold, he sings again. This time I start thinking that I must have episodes or something, but cars are passing literally a couple of meters from the fence of the park. So this time I keep my cool and tape recorded on my phone. Then I try something. I take my headphones and put them on without music. Although the sound from the outside world is muffled, I can still hear him singing, but muffled, just like the sound of my environment. So it's not from my head. I take them off and head back home, checking behind me every so often. Once home, I take my phone and listen to the recording. Blank. Absolutely nothing on the tape. So I just go on with my business. At this point, I didn't give a damn anymore. In and of himself, he doesn't really scare me. Like I said, he reminds me of my grandpa. I'm half French and half African. However, it's just so startling each time. And this damn melody. Sometimes, I catch myself singing it. I know that he will come again at some point in the future. But next time, I want to be ready. I don't know how I'm going to do that. But I will. I've had a number of experiences in a house in Cape Town, South Africa, in a certain section in Belleville, to be more precise. I'm trying to find some sort of online archive where I could research the experiences that I had. If anybody knows anything about this or could help, that would be great. Alternatively, if you work somewhere and I could give you some information, let me know if anything comes of it. I would appreciate that too. As for a bit of backstory, I've had many unexplained happenings in a certain house in Belleville. I think I experienced pretty much all of my paranormal experiences there. Extremely uncomfortable feelings in certain parts of the house. Noises of children playing. Sightings of a girl, probably around 9 or 10, being hit by items that were thrown at me. Doors and toilet seats slam all the time. And younger children have nightmares while living there. They'll wake up in the middle of the night and have dreams of blood coming out of the walls and the flowers. I'm not too sure, but I do believe that I heard that another couple who lived in this house before us moved out after less than a year with no reason given. If anybody can help me find something out about what's going on, I would appreciate it. This happened to my late grandmother when she was a child during the early 1930s. She grew up on a farm on the Orange River 
in a small town called Priska in the northern Cape of South Africa. Their farmhouse was built in such a way that the front door and back door were aligned across from each other. As such, you could walk through the house from the front to the back with only the dinner table in your path. One summer's evening, just after sunset, her parents and her seven brothers and sisters sat down at the dinner table and my great-grandfather started to pray, giving thanks for the food that they were about to eat. As all kids do, she opened her eyes during the prayer, looking around the table. Suddenly in the front door, she saw a little man covered in hair, no taller than two or three feet. In his hand, he had a little shambok and a cap on his head. He looked directly at my grandmother and started to run toward the table. She started to scream with fear. Everybody at the table was bewildered because of her scream and jumped up. At the same moment, everyone saw this little man run toward them, dive under the table, and run out the back door. Everybody was pretty shaken, and nobody slept that evening. Many strange happenings have gone on on that farm, from Tokoloshi to a pitch-black dog with an extremely long tongue that's only ever seen at night. But being Christians and very religious, my grandparents didn't let that get them down. They never gave up on their farm. Tokoloshi is African folklore, but I tell you, my grandmother and her family, they saw the Tokoloshi, and I believe that he's real. I've been in Africa volunteering and teaching English to students for quite a while. I've been back home in America for about two months now. I don't know if this is a dream or real or both, but the following is 100% true. For the past week, I've been having this recurring dream about a creature at least two to three times. It's tall, about seven feet. It has long, pointy hands and claws, and its body is wet. Not like dripping wet, but just wet. Its feet are large, and it makes loud stomping noises with each step. Every single dream is the same. I look out my living room window, and it's there. It's facing away from me, toward the middle of the street. But somehow, it senses me and it turns its head all the way around to stare at me. Its whole body doesn't turn, just the head. It sees me and it lets out this loud screech and runs toward my house. It doesn't run like a normal person or humanoid does. Its body jerks about in an odd, creepy way as it runs toward my home. I run away from the window and I jump in bed. I hear it climbing up my house. I can hear its claws scraping at the house, and then it reaches my living room window. It climbs in without opening the window. I never hear the window sliding open, but somehow it's in my house. My husband is asleep next to me and I'm trying to wake him up, but he doesn't budge. The clock says 3 a.m. That's when I hear the loud thud of its footsteps. It's taking slow steps toward my room. I feel like I can't breathe. I can't move. I'm literally frozen solid in my bed. Then it makes its final steps to the bedroom. I can see this creature standing there looking at me. And then all of a sudden, the clock hits 3.01 and I wake up. When I wake up, I'm actually awake in real life and my heart is pounding. I don't know what I'm experiencing. Is this just some creepy dream? Sleep paralysis? I haven't experienced anything like this often, only once that I know of in my life. I don't know if this is a real creature from lore, maybe something that followed me back home from Africa. I don't know if it's trying to hurt me or if it's just my brain being weird. Any input would help though. I need to figure this out, because I 
and terrified. In a small town in South Africa named Pilgrim's Rest, ghost stories are ever prominent amongst the locals. One school holiday, I went to visit some family who had an old gable house on the outskirts of town. Being gifted with the ability to speak with the dead, I loved going there. I would sit in the fields or near the old railway, as they would show me flashbacks of the town's early days. But that holiday, something terrible was shown to me. Terrible to the point that I have never returned to the town. Not because I don't want to, but more because I'm not wanted. I discovered a dark secret of that town, and what I saw left a scar. I was out on my usual night walk through the old children's cemetery, which was established during a plague. Most of the graves remain unmarked, but all the years of deaths, say 1886. I loved watching the kids play under the full moon, but then I saw them, the miners. They were walking from a part of the forest that I had been told was off limits, but they looked sad, like they were forgotten. The next day, I went to that part of the forest, and eventually, after about a two-hour hike, I found the miners again. Approaching slowly, I made them aware that I could see them, and that's when they told me the story of their gruesome death. See, back in those days, witchcraft and curses still scared people, and the founding families had been brainwashed into believing that the reason the plague hit town so hard was because they were mining on sacred ground. But instead of following the right procedures to stop the mining, they just collapsed the mine on top of all 50 miners claiming that it was an accident, and then proceeding to leave the miners buried under the rubble and erased from history. After I discovered this, things weren't so friendly for me there anymore. And like I said before, I've never been back. Not because I don't want to go, but because I am no longer wanted. This happened about four years ago in South Africa. To start, I must mention that I am a serious skeptic when it comes to ghosts or the paranormal. I almost always resort to a practical answer, but in this case, I could find no excuse for what happened. We moved into a new house. The previous tenants were apparently drug addicts and you could see that some really bad shit happened there. One of the doors had a hole in the middle, with a piece of hair sticking to it, like someone's head had been bashed through. Anyway, one afternoon I was home alone watching TV. There was no wind outside. The fan and the air conditioning were off. My hair flicked forward, and then flicked me in the face hard. I looked for my cats, assuming that they were playing with my hair. But they were both outside. Like I said, there was no fan, nothing at all that could have caused that. Two nights later, my husband and I were watching TV, and we heard what sounded like a shower come on. We both went to have a look, and it turned out it was coming from outside. The front garden was pretty much flooded, with absolutely no water source. No rain, no tap, no water hole, house pipe, gutter, nothing and only in one patch. A few weeks later again, we were watching TV at night. We heard three loud bangs on a window from the back of the house. Being South Africa, we thought, oh shit, an intruder. My husband ran to have a look, and there was no one there. There's no access to the back except for a padlock gate. The walls are very high with electric fencing on top, and my husband was there within a few seconds. 
There's absolutely no way that someone could have knocked and gotten away over the walls or the gate that quickly. I should also mention that while living in this house, my husband and I fought constantly. We never used to fight before, and we haven't since. Again, a few weeks later, our doorbell rang. We lived in a complex, so I thought maybe some kids were messing around because there was no one there. It rang again, and again, no one there. I went outside, and the complex is in a circle shape, so you can see pretty far down both sides of the road, and there was nobody. The same night, a little later, it went off yet again, and the tune of the bell had changed from a normal ding-dong sound to that of an actual melody of some kind. It was one of the preset songs on the bell, sure, but not the one that we had chosen. I thought, okay, don't panic, it must have a short or something. But it never happened again. We got hold of a lady from our church and had a meeting with her, not at the house. She said without a doubt she could sense that something was going on at home, without me even really getting into it. We then had a priest bless the house, and ever since that day, we didn't experience anything else. Not one thing. Like I said before, I always look for obvious answers, always, but I couldn't explain why these things happened. I promise you, this is 100% true. My family and I always led a pretty exhausting life. I was busy with school, they were busy with work and bills, so we barely ever got breaks. However, during the holiday school break in around December, my father decided that it would be best if my half-sister and I went to a secluded cabin in Alaska. His mother had bought it when they were fleeing the war in their country in order to relieve some stress. She has three kids who are already married and have children of their own, so she was supposed to take care of me. Everything went fine when we arrived there, and we slept in the same upstairs room, except my bed was in front of the glass doors leading to the balcony, and hers was right by the door. It was around 2 a.m., and I was still awake, using up all of my mobile data to chat with friends who also had trouble sleeping. We were on Instagram. Suddenly, I heard a loud thud that jolted me to my senses. My half-sister only rolled over in the bed and complained about the sound, but then she fell back asleep. Once I made sure that she wasn't awake, I quickly abandoned my bed and opened the glass doors, and then went out onto the balcony. It had a small wooden chair with a mug that my sister was drinking coffee from earlier. At first, I saw the other cabin, where an elderly couple was staying with their grandchildren and two big German Shepherd dogs that slept outside. So I thought they may have knocked something over, because the couple had big barrels outside of their house for some reason. But something else caught my attention, and it wasn't anything ordinary. It was a figure of a woman who walked calmly out of the forest surrounding the trail that led to the small bundle of cabins there. When I noticed her, she looked straight up at me, and I immediately bolted back inside. I forced myself to sleep quickly that night. I woke up at around 4 a.m., and I had to go to the bathroom, but I was too lazy to stand up for a while. So, I rolled over, and the first thing I see is a woman with all gray features, despite there being a light outside, tapping on the glass. I just ran quietly toward the bathroom because I was still feeling sleepy, and when I came back, I noticed that she wasn't there. I got creeped out, so I woke up my sister, who checked everything, including downstairs, but there wasn't anything there. I remember that the dogs barked a lot that night. The next morning, I told her about that, and she asked me if I was sure that it wasn't just a bad dream, and then promised to call the police if the woman kept showing up. It was two days later, and we heard a lot of barking, but never saw a woman. My sister invited the couple over for coffee. 
I remember that the old man also mentioned seeing a woman outside who was digging in the snow and dirt with her hands in the middle of the night. When he yelled, what are you doing here, loudly at her, she just ran off into the forest. Nothing really happened later except the power going off and on constantly, the couple's dogs acting really strangely, and footsteps in the snow that weren't there before showing up in front of our cabin. We wrote that off as other people staying at the cabin looking at ours when we went out grocery shopping, though. What I remember clear as day, however, is that when I was upstairs playing with the old couple's grandchildren once, the mug that was still on the balcony, because my sister had forgotten it there, just flew off and shattered despite nobody being there to do it. Afterward, the dog started barking again. It scared me so badly that I took the kids downstairs. When we returned home, though, my mother jokingly said that maybe the place is haunted. And that seriously has me thinking that it really is. Is there something paranormal about this? Or is there just some creepy robber lady going around the cabins and scaring people? I still can't explain the mug, though. I just wish I knew what this was. So, I don't even know where to begin. I've always considered sharing my stories, my family stories, sharing things about that house. But I was always scared. We didn't talk about the house, in the house, or on the property. We didn't talk about it after my brother and I moved into our own places, so writing this makes me nervous. We didn't really tell friends or family, we just didn't have people over that often. And if they did come, they usually didn't come back. But the papers are supposed to be signed in the morning and the house might actually be gone. I'm still hesitating about jinxing it though. I guess I'll start with some background and a story. We live in Alaska and this house was built before Alaska was actually even a part of the United States. There are several buildings and the house has just been continuously built onto. It's now just a large three-bedroom house. There's really nothing from the outside that would make you consider what might be happening within the walls. It's actually kind of alluring. It has a nice big front lawn and big pretty trees. Just kind of cozy looking. I think I'll share the one that bothers me the most. Although it's by far not the scariest thing, it still really haunts me. My dad started having heart attacks really young. He was 36 when he had his first one. By his third one, the doctors had to have him flown to another city to perform the surgery. I was around 15 and my brother was 17, so we just stayed at home while mom and dad were at the hospital. My dad died on the table that day. He was dead for a long while before they managed to bring him back. He was in a coma for about two weeks and then came home to make a full recovery, no less. But the weirdest thing ever started happening when he got home. I didn't know until a few months later, but it actually started the night that he died for a while. That night at around two in the morning, I woke up in a panic attack. I couldn't move a muscle. I could hardly breathe. I thought I was dying. And that happened every single night until they got home. My parents came home and my dad started to make his recovery. I was able to start stressing less, and I hoped that that would help my sleep issue. It didn't. For a couple of months after they got home, I had panic attacks every night. I tried just not sleeping, but I could never stay awake. I couldn't tell my parents, my dad being out of work and so sick. My mom was working to cover both of their checks. With all of the extra stress she was under, I didn't want my bad dreams or whatever they were to cause any more stress. But obviously, my caring father did eventually notice that I was tired all the time, and so he asked me about it. And I told him it was nothing, that he didn't need any more things to worry about. One night during a panic attack, I heard someone coming down the stairs, which my parents didn't do during the night. When I finally calmed down and caught my breath, and was finally able to move my limbs again, I went to see who it was. My dad was sitting in the recliner in almost complete darkness. 
He looked so beat down and tired. He saw me and asked me why I was up. And I finally told him what was happening. And that's when he told me his story. The day he died, he saw someone, something. He told me that every night he would wake up paralyzed knowing that this being was near. Sometimes it would be standing there. Sometimes it would pop into a dream. Sometimes it would just be like shadows in the darkness. For a couple of weeks after, it kept happening to us, but it was happening at the exact same time. It wasn't always, say, 2.15 in the morning, like that, but it was always in sync with his. If he woke up knowing that thing was around, I would wake up with a panic attack. Every single time. We would meet in the living room, confirm that we had the same problem as the night before, and try to go back to sleep. It had to be about four or five months of this, and one night, we were done. We were exhausted. Why us? Why isn't my brother waking up? Why doesn't my mom feel it in the same room? My dad was so frustrated. Finally, he literally screamed, Leave me the fuck alone. You can't have me. I'm not ready to die. He said that about four more times. And as crazy and Hollywood and bullshit as it sounds, it left us alone. We could sleep. Neither of us have ever experienced it afterward. We experienced some other truly insane shit at that house, but never again have I woken up in a panic attack. I work in an elementary school in a fairly rural part of Alaska. Like everywhere else, we have a work from home order for all the teachers. I'm working in an administrative type position right now though, and I was supposed to record which stacks of paperwork teachers left for students that still needed to be delivered, and then call the parents to arrange a drop off. Because of the time of day and because of social distancing, I was alone in the building. Even the janitor was gone. Now, this isn't the first time I've been alone in the gym. I was a long-term sub for the PE teacher and spent maybe four months in the role. But it was the first time that I was the only person in the entire building. Today, I was moving stacks in the gym, sorting by family, when the door to the PE equipment closet started to shake. It sounded like somebody was leaning against it and trying to push it open. I thought at first that air pressure from a vent or something was to blame but I've worked in the gym a lot and that's never happened before. I walked over to investigate and then the door popped open. It was a bit weird, but I figured maybe some kind of airflow issue was to blame and maybe the door hadn't been latched the whole way. I checked to make sure that nobody was hiding in the closet and I re-secured it, taking my time to lock it so that it couldn't pop back open. I got back to work, picked up a stack to move, and the door flew open again, this time more violently. It banged against the wall. I'll admit I was getting a little creeped out. The door has never caused me trouble like that before, and I cannot stress enough, I have been the PE sub a lot. I even coached an after-school sport in the gym. I checked to make sure that nothing was leaning on it, that it was fully latched, that there was nothing in the hinges, and then I secured it again. I finished my task and started walking to turn off the lights and re-secure the building. Right as I reached for the light switch, the door flew open again. I admit it, I fled. Instead of staying to make phone calls in the office, I locked down the building and left. After I got home and was telling my mother, a former teacher in the building, about the experience, she laughed. She said, that's just Mr. Chris. He's an old PE teacher who used to work in the building. Apparently, when he was alive, he would sometimes hide in the closet and startle her when she was working as a track coach. He was a bit of a prankster, but everybody loved him. She thinks that our resemblance just caused her old friend to want to say hello.
Recently, my friend died suddenly. His last text to me was, sorry, but we've got no word from toxicology yet. All we know is that he didn't drink enough to kill him. He wasn't sick, and there were no signs of a struggle. I didn't find out on the day that it happened. I have no clue what I did that day. I know it was a full moon. I remember coming home and looking for it. I have no texts or posts or screenshots from that day. I have a total gap in time. My friend and I had a rare spiritual connection and talked often of quantum cosmology. We could always tell when the other one was feeling off. I had always joked with him that if he died before me, I would want him to come to my apartment, flicker my lights, and give me some kind of a sign that he was still there. Four nights ago, I'm finally passing out after having been awake the majority of the time since this happened. I'm going mental at this point, looking through all of his posts, and realizing that a lot of the content had common themes. Swallowing someone else's demons. Being swallowed by your own demons. Being stuck in a labyrinth. A tired soul seeking escape from the maze. My grandma calls before bed to tell me that she's saying a prayer that I'll get a sign because everybody knows I'm a disaster. Soon after, my lights start going mental. I have the dimmer light, and all three were flickering out of sync. I freaked out for a while, but at this point I'm beat, so finally I just pass out. I dream that Jordan, my friend, is telling me to go walk downtown to the highest hill I can find and calm down. Not just a dream. He's in my room, I swear it in a gray sweater I've never seen before, and he's sitting down laughing at me, telling me that the answer I'm looking for is so obvious, and to just go take my walk and I'll figure it all out. It was like a sleep paralysis, but I was totally calm when I saw him. I get up and I walk calmly downtown. I know there's a spot here that people go to to pray and follow some sacred walk, but the last time I went, it was all unfinished. I text my friend, and I say that for some reason I need to go there. I head up the hill, figuring I'll find some meaningful passage or stone or something, and I find a giant labyrinth. There's this huge labyrinth at the top. For those that don't know, the labyrinth walk symbolizes your quest as a spirit on a human journey, rather than a human on a spiritual journey. Oddly, that was one of the last quotes he had sent me. He was also obsessed with the book Looking for Alaska, which I didn't bother reading until this happened. But holy hell. It's about a guy who gives up on searching for answers when a friend dies suddenly to escape the labyrinth and realizes that forgiving his friend for dying is the only way out of the labyrinth of suffering. Side note, when I told his girlfriend about what I had seen and experienced, she said that he died wearing the gray hoodie I described. I will try and give as much detail as possible and keep this from going on for too long. This happened back in the summer of 2015, when I was serving in the United States Army Reserves. I was stationed in southern Alabama in a transportation company. Sometimes, my girlfriend would come with me on drill weekends, and we would crash at a friend of hers apartment, which is where this incident took place. This particular weekend, we were in a large convoy in the middle of nowhere, on some back road out in the sticks, well over a hundred miles from the city. That was when I got the most confusing, bizarre, and downright creepy phone call of my young life. She was in utter hysterics. She was crying and screaming, wondering why I would frighten her so badly, what my problem was, and asking me how I even pulled it off. After I was finally able to calm her down, this is the story that she relayed to me. Sometime that afternoon, her friend was at work and she was at the apartment by herself. Suddenly, there was a loud bang on the door. Not a knock. Several loud, violent bangs. After looking through the peephole, she saw me, but there was something off. She says that I was wearing my army uniform, and it looked like me, 
but I had this very angry, aggravated look on my face. She opened the door wondering why I was home so early, and apparently without saying a word, I angrily blew past her, shoulder checking her into the wall, and quickly walked down the hall taking a left into the bedroom, slamming the door behind me so hard that the whole place shook. She was, of course, very alarmed and confused about why I was home so early and in such an agitated state. I mean, that is so out of character for me. I'm not a violent guy at all. On top of that, if something did happen to set me off, she would have been the first to hear about it. So she's walking behind me trying to get some information out of me. She opens the bedroom door behind me and sees the closet door slam shut. So she proceeds to run over to see what I was doing in her friend's closet and claims that when she opened the door, it was completely empty. That's when she had a panic attack and called me. Imagine my shock and confusion hearing that story, knowing that I was well over 100 miles away at the time. She finally believed me after I sent her a photo with my current GPS location, which only served to freak her out more. I thought that there must be some kind of rational explanation for what she saw. I'll be honest and save it, she did smoke a little weed here and there, but at the time I know she was sober and it doesn't usually cause stuff like that. She didn't mess around with hard drugs or drink and she had no mental illnesses of any kind. Over the years since that happened, I came to learn about doppelgangers. I don't know what they mean, what they represent, or why they come around. All I know is that they're creepy as shit and a girl I dated for several years came face to face with mine and it put the fear of God into the poor girl. Take this story for what you will and I honestly don't care if you believe it or not. I just wanted to get it off my chest. So I was talking to my buddy today and he told me a story that happened to him around September of last year. He was driving around 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night on a kind of secluded road in a suburb of the city of Huntsville. There are woods on both sides of this road. As he was driving, he thinks he sees a deer heading toward him. As he sees it more clearly, it turns out that this deer is on two legs has antlers, and is running toward him. He said that it was mostly dark in color and was running pretty fast from the side, so he slammed on his brakes to try to avoid it. As soon as it got close to his headlights, it disappeared. Your guess as to what happened is as good as mine. My theory was that it jumped over the car while my buddy was swerving to avoid it. He said he still has nightmares about it, and that he also isn't a big ghost person, but whatever it was, he swears he's never been that afraid. I have no idea what this could be. I don't know any of the legends around North Alabama that match his description. We've started to refer to it as Antler Man, but beyond that, we have no idea. In 2017, one of my good friends lived in Portland, Oregon. He was offered a job in Long Island, New York, and took it. He asked me to fly out so I could road trip with him across the country so he wouldn't be alone. Of course, I agreed and flew out from JFK to PDX. We have many stories from this road trip, but none stranger than what happened to us in Ohio. After a few days on the road, we had entered Ohio. I wish I remember exactly where this took place, but I honestly don't recall. All I know is that it was past Zanesville, heading east, where we had stayed the night before. My buddy was driving as I was reaching toward the ground, trying to grab my phone that I had dropped. He suddenly said, this old lady next to us keeps pointing at me. I think she wants me to pull over. I, always paranoid, said, F that dude, keep driving. But he pulled over. A black Escalade with plates from Alaska pulled in front of us. Out hopped a woman, no younger than 60, and said, I'm glad I got to you boys when I did. Your tires are smoking. 
It's important to note that we were towing his Camry with the U-Haul we were in. Side note, what happened in Zanesville was that we got stuck in the parking lot, couldn't back up, so we had to rehitch his car. We realized later he had left the emergency brakes on. Anyway, after she said this, we looked at each other, completely puzzled, and immediately at the tires. They were absolutely smoking, looking like they had bullet holes in them. This is where it gets strange. Not even a few seconds after we kneeled down to inspect the tires, she was gone. No goodbye, no sound of a car pulling off, just gone. The whole interaction from her getting out of the car to her vanishing couldn't have been more than 15 seconds in duration. I didn't have a doubt in my mind that she had literally vanished. My friend looked at me pale as a ghost, confirming exactly what I was thinking. I don't know for sure what would have happened if we hadn't stopped. I don't know if the car would have caught fire or anything else. But I do know that, real or not, to us she was an angel. I've tried to look into stories like this, but haven't had any luck finding anything. What do you think? I've had several experiences all around the same location within months of each other. The first one happened when I had just adopted my puppy. He was 11 weeks old and loved everyone. He would run up to anyone and everyone, tail wagging, the friendliest thing. One day, we were out on a walk in a large open cow field behind where I lived at the time. It was dusk, and there wasn't really anybody else around, except for this hiker in the distance walking toward us. My dog saw him and stopped in his tracks, got down low to the ground, and just started growling. The hiker was still too far away for me to even make out his face, but my puppy was freaking out. As he got closer, I started to become seriously unnerved. He was pacing toward us like a robot. That's the only way I can describe it. Or like the way military people walk. He was pale white and had these dead eyes that seemed not to see us at all. There was no acknowledgement of us whatsoever. He just did this robo speed walk straight in our direction. The dog was going crazy, growling, whining. I had never heard him make those sounds before. When the hiker walked past me, I just felt this sense of dread hit me in the gut. It felt like evil. It was the single most terrifying encounter I've ever had. As he passed us, his eyes didn't move. It was as if he didn't even see us, even though the dog was growling at him. He just power walked past us and continued on. It was strange too, the direction he was going in, because all there was that way was just a giant hill and it was getting dark. Anyway, as soon as he was past us, the dog and I just broke into a run as if we were both running for our lives. We ran all the way home. The next encounter happened in the same field. Again, I was walking the dog a couple of months after the first encounter. Again, I'm just reiterating the point that he is the friendliest dog ever, especially as a pup. All he wanted was to run up to every stranger for pets. So anyway, we're in this field and there's a load of hikers with backpacks, all stopped and checking their maps. Puppy is checking them out, tail wagging, when he zeroes in on this one hiker lady who's standing still, just observing a tree. He dropped to the ground, started growling and whining, just like last time. And like last time, she didn't acknowledge us. She just stared at this tree with her dead eyes, and again she was super pale. When I caught a glimpse of her face properly, I felt the same sense of dread that I did the last time. She looked fairly normal except that she had almost no nose. I know this sounds kind of insane, but she had slits. Like somebody who's done too much coke and had their nose fall off, or like Voldemort. I don't think the dog could have been growling at her appearance though because her back was turned to us when the growling began. The third one freaked me out the most. A friend and I were just leaving my house to walk the dog, again, when we realized that we'd forgotten something inside. Where I live, there's no car access, and it's considered the safest area ever, so the dog is usually free to roam outside, 
saying hello to people on the path, and so on. We left him outside for a second while we went back in, and when I came out, there was a man in a business suit, standing completely still, staring at my dog, and my dog was staring back at him. Not growling this time, just very still. It was so weird. He wasn't looking at the dog like he was afraid of it, more like he'd never seen one before. It was a look of curiosity, as though he was genuinely intrigued by my dog. Also, the fact that he was wearing a suit was freaking weird, because I lived on a boat on the river. It's muddy and there are cows and dogs and stuff all over. It was just such a strange outfit to see somebody in that location wearing. Almost as if somebody was trying to play human and got it a bit wrong. Anyway, so this stare-off went on for a good minute or so, while my friend and I just kind of observed from the doorway. Then he walked on, past a gate, and into the field where the other two encounters occurred. We followed behind him because we happened to be going in the same direction. We followed him through the gate, into the field, and watched him veer off to follow a path to our left, toward the hill that the first hiker was marching toward. We continued on straight with the dog, heading for the pub on the other side of the field. You can tell I'm from England, right? When I realized that I had forgotten my purse. I turned around to go back, but now the suit guy was back at the gate that we'd all just come through. He was just standing there, staring at the gate, occasionally lifting the latch on it, as though he was inspecting it. It was super weird and creepy. I mean, what was he doing? He was just walking away and then turned around and came back to what, check the gate mechanism? I decided not to go back for my purse because honestly, I didn't want to have to walk past him again. The fourth experience happened in the same field another couple of months after that, on a dog walk, yet again. My boyfriend was with me, but he told me to go ahead into the field while he finished getting ready and that he would meet me there. So the pup and I went out into the field and immediately spotted a hiker, robo power walking toward us, as if he'd just come down from that hill. It wasn't the same guy as before, but it was the same kind of unsettling energy. I felt it in my gut. It was just unease and wrong. And he was walking the exact same way. I pretended to chase my dog in the opposite direction and waited for him to pass through the gate before I got back onto the path. I watched him walk through it and disappear past the gate and down the path. Puppy and I carried on walking when about two minutes later, I felt like I needed to turn around. So I did. And there he was again, power walking toward us with those dead eyes. I literally felt my blood run cold. I've never been so terrified. He was going so fast and with such intensity that the dog and I just started running out of instinct. I fumbled for my phone and tried to call my boyfriend, who didn't answer, and I veered off the path, cutting through the long grass and circling back to the gate in a giant arc. Creepy alien dude continues power walking up the path he'd just come down, as if he's going back up the hill. Sweating and out of breath, I spotted my boyfriend finally walking up to join us. I ran up to him babbling about the weirdo hiker with the bad energy. He says, Where? And as I turn to point him out, we both realize that he's now power walking backwards with his eyes locked on us, still heading back up the hill, but backwards so that he could face us. We were both seriously freaked out. These all happened in the summer. Come autumn, I was living alone on the boat with the dog while my boyfriend was away for work. One night at around midnight, the dog and I were walking home from a pub quiz. It's always super dark on these country paths, and my phone had died, so I had no light. I was literally crashing into hedges and trees, trying to basically feel my way home by moonlight. And the moon and stars were super, super bright that night. Anyway, to get to my boat, I have to cross over the river on a bridge. As I'm walking over this bridge, I was looking up at the stars, since they were the only source of light. I ended up observing what I thought was a plane because it was moving steadily in my direction over that hill in that field where everything happened. As I'm watching it, it seemed to suddenly look at me. I don't really know how to describe that. It's as if it suddenly realized that it was being observed and I felt us connect. And it shot off to the left 
super fast and just blinked out of existence. Obviously, in my mind, that's a UFO, and it's hovering over the hill where all the creepy alien crap kept happening. So now, I was terrified. I ran all the way home, crashing into bushes like a crazy person because I couldn't see. I locked the door and hid under the covers like a kid. A month or so after that, Pup woke me up at like 4 a.m. because he had to pee. Half asleep, I went to open the door for him to let him outside. I want to just paint a picture so you understand how weird this is. I live on a boat on the river. Where my boat was moored was the middle of the countryside. There are no lights on at night. Not much light pollution at all. No street lights. It's pitch dark apart from the lights of the stars and the moon. So when I stuck my head out of the boat to call the dog back, I found myself blinded by a white light. So of course I was very confused. I looked up at the sky and I couldn't even open my eyes fully because it was so bright. It was like this giant white mass really low in the sky. So low and bright that I couldn't see anything else if I looked up. The dog came running back in and I slammed the door shut, locked it, and went back to sleep. It was almost like a you-didn't-see-anything moment. I didn't even think anything of it at the time. But looking back, it makes no sense. I even went back to the spot recently to make sure that there were no other lights that I might have missed, like a new lamp post or something. But there's nothing. Anyway, I don't know what all of these encounters mean, but I moved back onto land and away from that hill and field, and they stopped happening. I actually walked up to the top of that hill one morning to check it out, and it's just a really pretty picnic spot. No alien headquarters that I could find. If anyone has any ideas, let me know. I have never really told anyone about this memory. It has stayed with me since it happened, somewhere close to a decade ago. I was probably nine. It was a completely normal day, and then I went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night, despite normally being a very heavy sleeper. I don't know why, but I immediately decided moving even an inch would be a terrible idea. So. I stay still and shut my eyes. I don't know why I'm doing any of this, I just do. But then I feel something. You know how you can feel what's happening around you, even if you're not looking, as long as you're paying close enough attention? Imagine that feeling, but amplify it by about 400%. I could feel two presences in my room, not near my door, no but right next to my window on the opposite side of the room. I kept my eyes shut tight, but it wouldn't have mattered because it was as dark as dark could be anyway. After remaining near my window for however long, I began to feel like they, whoever they were, knew that I was awake. Then they started moving over to me. I can see their exact path that they took through my room in my mind, based only on what I felt. Almost comparable to how you might imagine Tof could see an avatar. Adrenaline-fueled heightened senses, I suppose. They both stand right in front of my bed. I'm laying on my side, facing toward them. The one closer to my head bends down and gets near my face. I don't hear anything. I can only feel them. They stay like this for another short while, while I'm internally panicking beyond belief, concentrating on keeping my mind in check so that I can stay alive. At that moment, I prayed to God that they would go away. And then, peace. They were gone. I have no idea what happened after that. I don't even remember waking up, despite this memory of the encounter and the peace that followed praying, all of which was extremely vivid. I had ruled it off as demons, as that falls in line with my beliefs, but after reading a few encounters, I don't know what to think. 
I wouldn't believe in aliens if not for this experience. Well, this one and the next ones. That same year, within about five months of this, I was taking out the trash, and once I got to the end of my driveway and dropped off the cans, we had a long driveway, I looked up to search for the two dippers, like I always do. I didn't expect to see five shapes in the air. One, which took up maybe a twelfth of the circumference of the sky, was composed of four bright lights, assembling what was perhaps a trapezoid-esque shape. It was emitting what appeared to be similar to a headlight on a car, except huge, of course. It was stationary, and revealed no stars behind it. To the right, there were two big, bright stationary lights. Seemed more like individual ships, much larger than stars. Between them was a moving assembly of three red lights forming a perfect triangle, heading up, I guess. Almost looked like it was following the fifth entity, which I think was just one of our satellites. It was small, fast, and zipping on by. I would have thought the triangle could have been an airplane, of course, but it looked way too big for how it was moving, and how far away it appeared to be. I have seen this triangular ship two other times as well. Once I was even with other people, though it was too fast for anyone else to see it. We were in a moving car, and it went out of view. I have no explanation for these events, only the vivid memories and assurance that I did not dream them. On top of these experiences, I also noticed another similarity between myself and people who claim to have been abducted. A strange fascination, almost obsession, with aliens when they were younger, which suddenly stopped, at least for a while. I've also felt that odd sensation that many others have expressed when certain things are shown or brought up. You begin shaking, quivering, tearing up. You don't know why, but you know you have to get away from what triggered it, which, in my case, 100% every time, is anything related to aliens being shown or discussed in media. It doesn't happen every time aliens are brought up, but when it happens, that's why. Am I blowing this all out of proportion? Does anybody know what's going on? Please let me know, because I feel kooky. I work a pretty easygoing office job, and I consistently listen to podcasts while I do my work. That being said, I've always had an interest in the paranormal and the unexplained, so that's typically what I listen to. I was listening to an interview by Astonishing Legends with Terry Lovelace about the things he encountered, and what he experienced from a camping trip in Devil's Den back in the 70s. To sum it up, he touched on what happened to him and a couple of things stood out to me. It reminded me of something that happened to me as a kid, that I always chalked up to sleep paralysis. But now, it has me second-guessing myself. I must have been in about the third or fourth grade. At the time, we lived kind of on the edge of a bunch of farmland and woods. Our backyard opened up to our neighbors who owned acres upon acres of land and to the left of that was just endless farmland and forest. We lived a few miles away from a really popular dairy farm, but we were also a mile or two out from the main road that leads into town. I guess the point I'm getting at here is that we were kind of secluded, but not totally isolated. The Midwest is like that at times, I guess. My room at the time was in the basement, and the stairs that led down to it was right in front of our back door. I slept with my bed right in front of my bedroom door as well. It was summer break, and after I finally decided that I was tired, I went to lay down in bed. My memories go in and out at this point, and there are still missing spots in between, because I think as soon as I laid down, I just blacked out. I remember I had just woke up, right after passing out, 
and I'm not sure how much time had passed between these two points in time. I immediately looked at the foot of my bed, and the door to my room is wide open. There's this blinding light outside my room. I remember seeing this figure right in the doorway to my room. I couldn't make out any distinct features because of the light coming from behind it, so it was backlit. All I got was a silhouette, an outline, and the shape of how it looked. It must have been not that much shorter than me, and I was a kid at the time, maybe around four feet. It had a huge bulbous head and a tiny body. In retrospect, it was shaped like a gray, but I don't know if that's too cliché to say. I just remember this utmost primal sense of fear, and I couldn't move. I've never experienced that level of horror before, and I haven't felt that feeling since. I was laying on my back in my bed, and all I could do was stare at it. I was trying to scream, but nothing could come out. I couldn't get up to run or anything. I was completely paralyzed to that spot. I blacked out again and came to again, and it was closer, right at the end of my bed. At that point, I tried screaming again, but still, nothing would come out. At that point, I blacked out again. I came to that morning, on the opposite side of my room, flopped across this little couch I had. It's hard to explain it, too, because there's nothing in between these points of time. It's just a blank spot. I tried to explain all of this to my mom, but she chalked it up as sleepwalking and a nightmare because I had stayed up too late. Something to that effect. For a while, I was completely horrified to watch any form of alien movie, or even just anything in TV that resembled that shape. I would have a full-blown panic attack and start to hyperventilate. I've gotten past that. It doesn't really get to me anymore. However, to this day, I cannot sleep with my bed in front of my door, or with my door open. I don't even like sleeping near the door. I need to be as far away from it as possible. Even during the day, if I'm doing something in a room, the door has to be closed. Having it open just sends this massive feeling of discomfort and anxiety through me, and I can't do it. I've experienced weird things throughout my life, but this particular instance I eventually just chalked up to sleep paralysis. But now, I'm not so sure. Can anyone offer any insight? Or at least tell me I'm crazy? Or not? Trying to explain it or even think about it just makes me feel like I'm losing my mind. Last night, I had a really weird experience, but at least somehow, it has a positive ending. It was like 2.20 a.m. To be honest, nothing felt wrong until I opened my eyes. I was half asleep, but I could clearly see the typical gray alien head behind a chair that's close to my bed. Well, nearly all of its face. I couldn't move at all. In fact, I tried so hard to move that my right leg started to shake because of my effort. It looked kind of ghostly. It wasn't fully defined, and it was whitish. But the face was basically an alien. I couldn't see the body. The head, which was huge, by the way, was at my bed's height. So it was probably crawling or something? I don't know. The moment I opened my eyes, I wanted to do something, battle it, get rid of it, something. I used all of my strength to move. I could see this thing because I often sleep with my lamp on. If I turn it off, I start to imagine them all around me. I don't know why. Without that lamp, I never would have seen a thing. I simply could not move. My body would not respond. So, I started to pray, saying, Jesus Christ protects me. Jesus Christ sets me free. Don't let it take me. All of a sudden, it vanished, and I could move. After that, I stood awake for a while, but I didn't get out of my bed. 
I was too exhausted from trying to fight this thing. I just kept thinking about it and looking at the same spot while I was spooked out. I'm not even a Christian, nor do I practice any religion, but I do know that Jesus' name freed me from this thing. You could probably consider me an atheist, but what happened, happened. So I am open to the fact that spiritual things exist. From what I've read from a few reports on the internet, several people have been set free from abductions, alien encounters, and so on, praying to God. I really don't know what to think about that, but it happened to me too. Before this encounter, the last two days, there have been two full power cuts throughout the neighborhood, one each day. A short one during the first day around 11 a.m., and a fairly long one the other day at like 2 a.m. Has anybody else experienced anything like this? All I know is I hope to never experience it again. Something is wrong. I'm staying with some family in a very rural area. The closest stores are super far away. Ours, actually. We got here late Friday, and we're leaving late Monday. Today, my cousin and brother happened to see a drone that was following them on the land that we have here. It's about 200 acres. Everyone was a little bit confused and didn't really like it because it's creepy, and an invasion of privacy on our private property, but we disregarded it, figuring that somebody on their land nearby was just bored and didn't realize they were on ours. It's now 2.25 a.m. on Monday, and my parents are together outside relaxing near the house on this swing chair thing, just listening to the nighttime sounds. I was inside with my grandparents in bed with my cousin and two siblings, when I got a sudden phone call. Seeing as it was 2 a.m., I was very confused and didn't think that anybody would be calling me right now. I grabbed my phone, realizing it was my mom, so I immediately answered, making sure everything was okay outside. There are plenty of weird insects, poisonous things, snakes, coyotes, wolves, things like that around here, and my mom gets scared very easily. She says in a concerned voice, Dad and I just saw something flash over our heads, really low down on us. We don't know what's happening. So I told my cousin and my brother and sister and everyone seemed pretty freaked out because that's very unusual. We all run out to the trees by our house and get to my parents, who are staring up at the sky and a bit far away, panicking. As everyone was outside staring around at the sky, we managed to point out multiple drones or something strange in the sky, flashing getting farther away and then closer. We saw one, then another, but then we saw up to five and some were disappearing. For a moment, we thought, oh, stars. But why would my parents have something shining on them and why would they hear whirring sounds if it was just a star? We drove what we call a donkey, I don't know what it's actually called, it's a small vehicle like a golf cart, but not. Anyway, we drove that into the field that it was closest by. We shined a spotlight on where it was, right above the trees. It started coming towards us, and then I saw something weird by it that suddenly went fast towards it, then stopped, and fell into the woods. So we started driving away and went back home. But then my dad drove over there with my cousin and siblings, and my mom, and then my grandma came out on the porch. We were waiting for them to come back while they looked for drones in the sky themselves. I went inside because I was getting bugs all over me, and I hated that. I start hearing this weird noise from outside the house, and then I hear a yell. The dog started barking and howling. Then I heard my mom tell my grandma that she had just heard my sister scream and that something's up with the cows that my grandparents own. After a bit, my family all came back, and they're all still outside, but my sister came in to explain what was up. With tears in her eyes and fear on her face, she said they went out there, and everything was absolutely fine. 
But then the cow has started acting weird. And then she heard it. A loud woman screaming. The UFO was getting closer, flashing green and red, so they drove really fast back to us. Everyone is so confused and freaked out. We have no idea what's happening, why these things are watching us, why there are so many. I'm interested to know what anybody else might think it is, because I am definitely freaked out. My first sighting was when I was 10. It was a massive floating ship, shaped like a huge manta ray. When I saw it, I felt like I had been on it for a while, but I shook off that feeling and ran home. The memory surfaces periodically. Sometimes I think I can remember what the inside of that ship looks like, and I remember not being alone there, but I have little idea who I was with. Much later, I saw a craft landing in the cow pasture at my parents' house in a rural country. I feel compelled to go inside the house, and it's like I forgot what I had seen. I lost a few hours of time that day. I always assumed I must have watched TV, but later I realized I literally have no memory of the next few hours. Later, I began seeing lights in the sky, and I would ask aloud, Are you here for me? The light would bob and weave up and down, left to right, where it would flash brighter for a moment. Again, I would go inside, and soon after, I would lose memory of what I was doing for the next few hours. This happens often, still to this day. I have a lot of theories, and sometimes I remember parts of conversations with people about my life, my personal feelings, my aspirations good conversations about how I can improve my life, but I can't remember any faces of the people I talk to. I do benefit, though, as my life has steadily improved over the past 10 years, so I'm not fearful about the encounters. I'm aware that they are taking place. I just don't know if I'm ready to remember more yet. When I was around eight years old, around 1995, I went to visit a friend's house just up a path and through a courtyard from my house, about a minute away. On the courtyard is a set of flats which creates an archway that you have to walk through. As I walked back home and through the archway, I heard a low humming noise, and I looked over my shoulder to see a typical film-like shaped spacecraft. The round, disc-like shape with the dome on top and the circular lighting. The lights didn't shine as such as it was daytime, but I can now only explain them as looking like LED lights, which is why they were so noticeable in the day. The UFO is small, no bigger than about three feet and a foot and a half high. I think it's coming for me. At this point, I'm so scared I start running for home. I'm about 30 seconds away but the corner to the path is coming up. I'm still trying to watch this thing chase me, and as I get to the corner, it's just behind me, and the low humming is deafening. I can feel it within me. I have to take my eyes off of it for a second to turn the corner, and as I do round the corner, the light, whether it was natural sunlight or the LED-type lights, went really bright and sounded like a jet plane thundering overhead. I look up as I round the corner. It's above my head, so close that the wind it created whipped up my hair. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. No visual sign of it, but I heard that jet plane noise and low humming noise move away from me. I get home and tell my mom and dad. They don't believe me and say I must have mistaken a bird. I told my friend the next day, and she rolled on the floor laughing. I stopped telling people after that, but I can still remember it like it was yesterday. 
and I still can't shake the feeling that it was coming for me, even though it was so small that there's no way I would have fit in it. I just can't explain the fear. I was six or so. I think it was 1998. My grandparents and I were heading to Southern California to see family. It was dark, but not late, so it had to be winter. I get car sick, so they drug me up, and when I wake up, I see a tall hill. On top of the hill, I see a saucer with a spotlight. It scares me, but I just go back to sleep from fear and Dramamine. Next time, it was 1999. I was playing on the computer, and I looked out the window at about 11 p.m. I see a craft above a house outside my apartment complex, spotlight on the roof. I watch it for a while and decide to go to bed just before the ball drops. In 2001, I got a stuffed cat for my birthday. I left it outside, and my mom got mad at me and told me to go get it. I go outside and look for it. I look up and across the street, and I see a huge ship. Two football fields across at least. Bright orange lights, flat back and round. I don't know why I keep seeing these things, and maybe I don't want to. About two years ago, my family and I were sound asleep at home in South Georgia. There was a bad storm passing through that night. Anyway, I wake up at about 2 a.m. to a really weird sound. The only way I can describe it is like the sound of the alien machines in War of the Worlds. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it was freaking terrifying. It was so loud that it shook the house. Also, at the same time that the noise sounded, the sky outside turned green. And I mean green. Such a bright green that it looked like daytime. I get up to investigate, basically to see if anybody else in my family had heard the noise or seen the light. When I walk out into the living room, my mom and brother are already standing there at the window, looking outside. They ask me if I had heard the noise and seen the sky. I said, heck yeah, that's why I'm up. We all stayed around the window, discussing what we thought it might be. Weird lightning, an electrical transformer malfunctioning, a nearby nuclear plant. About every two minutes, the sound would start and the sky would turn the bright green color. We were freaked out, but there was nothing we could do about it. So eventually, after we'd watched it several times, we decided to go back to bed. Expecting to be able to read about it or hear something about it on the news the next day, we decided the best we could do was just go to sleep. The next day, there were no reports on it. We asked neighbors and nobody else had any idea what we were talking about. Obviously, it makes you feel crazy. Like, did I dream that? But it's something that my mom, my brother, and I all saw at the same time. We still wonder about it today. We couldn't have had some kind of collective dream, so I have no doubt that it really happened. But I have no clue as to what it could have been. My sister and I were sleeping one night, and I was woken up. I don't know by what. But I was able to wake my sister up as well. The room was dark, but I distinctly remember seeing two soldier-like decorated generals at the side of our beds, similar to drawings of Pleiadian aliens. Once I woke my sister up, a portal opened up on my side of the bed, along with a vessel. We both got into the vessel and noticed that it was on a track. 
My sister and I both woke up remembering this experience, and we still do to this day. I can remember it all. She says she remembers them being extremely kind and saying things like, let's go have fun. Just really warm, inviting, and all the nice things. We went into this vessel, which was like a ride. I just remember it being like the Peter Pan ride, or it's a small world. And then it was over, and I don't remember much more. I always used to look down at the ground in amusement park rides to know if they were real. I don't know why I did that, but I remember looking down at the ground, and it was so real and detailed. I can't remember much about the ride, but it was bright and vivid with flowers. I also live very close to NASA, for what it's worth. I've never had any more experiences like that afterward, but yeah, I thought I would see what you guys thought. I have two encounters. The first one happened roughly 10 years ago. My father, two brothers, and I were on our back porch in Georgia. We lived in the country and literally had no neighbors for two miles in any direction, so we were out there. We were looking at the stars on a clear night, and we noticed a very bright star. After looking at it for a few minutes, it shot across the sky, stopped, and shot straight up stopped again, and then shot to the right. Stopped one more time and then went up diagonally and disappeared. Every time it shot across the sky, it was moving a good five to six inches as far as we can see in the sky, so it was easily moving hundreds of miles. I don't know if it was aliens or the government testing something, but it was amazing. The second encounter was my father, brother, and I driving down the road near our house this happened five years ago, so about five years after the last encounter. It was nighttime, and again, we live in the middle of nowhere, on backcountry roads. We saw in the mirrors, and by turning around, a red rectangular light heading down the road from behind us, heading our way. It was going slightly faster than us. It passed overhead, and it was completely silent. Obviously, we stopped at this point and it continues on down the road. Once the road ended, it went above the tree line and literally shot away at a very high rate of speed into the sky. We never saw it again and couldn't make out what was causing the light. There was just this rectangular looking light coming from it. It was also very large, much larger than the car, approximately the size of two school buses if they were welded together side by side. If you have any idea what this could have been, let me know. This happened to me back in 2013. I was 18 at the time. I was a healthy, normal woman by all accounts and lived in a suburb of South Florida. Just at that juncture in my life, I was moving up north to UF, which is in Gainesville. Aside from the university, it's a very boring town, mostly nothing up there. I had noticed that before moving there and during my time there, once a month, always on the same night, I think the first Sunday of every month, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Without fail, I couldn't sleep. I would toss and turn all night. Sometimes after those nights, I would wake up with something strange on my body. Once on my lower spine, right on the spinal cord, I woke up with a large red bump, perfectly centered. It wasn't itchy like a bug bite, and it was unlike a pimple. Another time, I awoke with a scar across my lower abdomen. It was long and unlike a scratch. It was brown, like it had been cauterized. But it left my body within a day or two like a scratch might have. On one such Sunday, my boyfriend happened to be spending the night. It was my parents' rule that he would sleep in a separate bedroom, but before he went off to his room, he laid next to me in my bed for a little while and we talked. He was saying something when, suddenly, he went quiet and looked behind him. 
I asked him what was the matter, but he shrugged it off. He went to his room, and we both tried to sleep. However, like usual on these nights, I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. A feeling of dread prevented me from sleeping. I got restless and decided to go sleep in the room with my boyfriend, hoping that I might be able to relax with him there. But still I couldn't sleep. I would nearly doze off, only to awake in a fright, which was really uncharacteristic of me. I gave up and went back to my own room until I suddenly gave in and fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I told my boyfriend that I couldn't sleep all night and that I felt like something was coming to get me. He told me at that moment, the previous night when he suddenly fell silent mid-conversation, it was because he thought he saw something outside of my window. He said that for whatever reason, the first thing that came to his mind was aliens and that it froze him with fear. He also told me that shortly after I had returned to my own room in the middle of the night, he was disturbed by a loud static noise and felt vibrations in the air. After a few months, these routine, monthly sleepless nights stopped, and they never returned. I still don't know what it was all about, or if it was even anything at all. But that night put both of us on edge. It started when I was very young. To this day, my parents remember me always screaming in the night for them to come to me. The first encounter I can remember was when I was a kid. I remember getting ready for my first day of school. At the time, we were living on post at Fort Sam. I remember waking up at 5 a.m. to get dressed for school, and I heard this loud, strange humming noise coming from outside my window. When I opened the window, I saw this large silver UFO. I can remember this very vividly till this day. It was so large that it covered the whole window. The only thing I could see of it was the silver aluminum from the ship. It had white lights on top and these light blue lights at the underside of the ship. It freaked me out. I slammed my blinds shut and screamed for my dad. When he came in, I told him what I had seen. He laughed and opened the blinds and of course nothing was there. From that day on I had constant nightmares, nightmares that felt like real life. I could never understand anything they said, but they could understand me. I remember in one dream I would try and scream for help before they took me with them and I would be paralyzed and unable to scream for help. I wouldn't be able to get my parents attention when they took me. They would put me on this examination table and just look at me as they were studying me. They never did me harm, they just observed. I remember being in my early teens, still having these same dreams. I finally built up the courage to speak with them. I remember the first time I was 12. They took me as usual, but this time I just let them. I had a strange, calm feeling this time when they put me on the table I asked them exactly what they were trying to do. The one alien told me they were trying to figure out how to make humans live forever. They then asked if I felt safe, and I told them that I did. I asked if they would mind showing me around their ship. I don't remember many details, but the ones I do remember is seeing other people, human beings, examined. One was undergoing surgery. They then took me to the command center, which had a lot of big monitors with strange writings, and underneath the floor, it was like glass so you could see through it. I was so amazed, because I could see Earth, and it looked so beautiful. They could read my mind and tell that I was pleased, and I told them that they were free to let me come with them, as I wanted to learn more about them. For a while, I would go back, and instead of being examined, they would just take me around the ship. I met a few different aliens, three to be exact. Their faces were slim and they were bright green in color, very skinny and long arms and legs. They wore nothing and they seemed to really grow on me. We started to develop a friendship of sorts. I was able to start understanding what they were telling me clearly, but it wasn't speech. It was telepathic communication, 
with me speaking out loud to them. One time they took me into a big green field that was like a maze. It was not on earth. I'm not sure where it was exactly, but it was very peaceful. Nothing was there but hedges and fields of grass. We talked there two times, and the third time we talked there, they told me that they would now have to leave me for a while, and that I would only see them one more time after this. The last time I would encounter them was very, very strange. They picked me up that night. I was laying in bed, and this time I was back on the examination table. I saw one of my friends and I asked him what was going on. He told me not to be scared, but that they wanted to test something on me, and if I was okay with it, they would be unable to see me ever again. I was very sad and told him that I didn't want to lose them as we were very close. He told me that this was very important to them and that they could really use my help, and that it could change the future of their research. I was 14 by this time. I agreed, and then another alien that I didn't know had me follow him to this pod. It was egg-shaped and silver and had bright red lights around it, and had a chair inside. The glass that would normally cover it was open. I sat in the chair. I was scared. There were large, sharp objects hanging from inside. They looked like drills and saws. I asked him for my friend, and two of my friends showed up. They held my hand and promised me that I would be safe. The other friend behind him reassured me that his words were true. The alien had a long needle in his hand, which was about the size of a large medical syringe. It was maybe two inches long, and there was this neon green fluid inside of the syringe. I asked if it was going to hurt, and they told me that yes, but to remember that I was helping them. I asked them what it was, and they said they would tell me after they were done. So I was ready, and they could tell, so they injected the fluid into my left arm. It hurt a lot. I was crying, and they could tell that I was in pain, but shortly after, it subsided. I noticed three big green fluid-filled blisters on my arm, and then he told me. What they had injected into me was the serum that would make you live for eternity. They told me that I shouldn't tell anybody what they did, because it was very secret. My two friends gave me a last hug goodbye, and the one that had given me the shot waved goodbye as they sent me back home, where I woke up in bed. When I woke up, I rolled over and looked at my arm. And I kid you not, there were three green welts on my arm. When I put my finger on it, it popped, and green fluid came out onto my bed sheets. I popped all three. I was kind of scared, and I yelled for my dad, and he ran in and saw my arm and rushed me to the ER. I didn't want to tell the doctors what had really happened out of fear of them thinking I was crazy, so I just said I had no idea what happened, that I had woken up with them on my arm and popped them. The doctors took samples and prescribed me some chemical burn cream to put on them. I still have three circular scars on my left arm, and they're very faint now, but they stayed visible for years. I always wanted to share this. I have no idea why they were so nice to me, and why they chose me for this experiment. I never saw them again after that, and everything stopped. I just thought it was strange. In a weird way, I missed them, too. I wish them well, and I would like to think that maybe I did do something to help mankind in the future. But whatever it was, I was glad I could help them at all. When I was in probably the fifth grade, I was staying up and watching YouTube on my iPad, and I decided that I should probably get to sleep. I think it was either 1.30 or 11.30. I can't remember. I just remember 1s and 30 being on the clock. I remember laying in bed and suddenly I heard something. It sounded like the little hovercraft things with blades on them that you see in the movie The Incredibles. But yeah, I heard that and I just froze and sat there not knowing what to do. So I climbed out of bed and looked out the window. I saw this little light moving in the sky, and then it stopped for a minute. And then, after a bit, it kept moving forward. But there was still this little light that kept flashing random colors, from red to yellow to green to blue, and back to red again. 
I know this is going to sound weird, but it was almost hypnotizing to watch. Not only did it change colors, but it changed shape as well. After every flash of color, it would change shapes. And then, the next morning when we woke up, our satellite was gone. I'm not shitting you. There were no storms that night, or any strong winds at all, and no reason why it should have been missing. I work a pretty easygoing office job, and I consistently listen to podcasts while I do my work. That being said, I've always had an interest in the paranormal and the unexplained, so that's typically what I listen to. I was listening to an interview by Astonishing Legends with Terry Lovelace about the things that he encountered, and what he experienced from a camping trip in Devil's Den back in the 70s. To sum it up, he touched on what happened to him, and a couple of things stood out to me. It reminded me of something that happened to me as a kid that I always chalked up to sleep paralysis, but now it has me second guessing myself. I must have been in about the third or fourth grade. At the time, we lived kind of on the edge of a bunch of farmland and woods. Our backyard opened up to our neighbors who owned acres upon acres of land. And to the left of that was just endless farmland and forest. We lived a few miles away from a really popular dairy farm, but we were also a mile or two out from a main road that leads into town. I guess the point I'm getting at is that we were pretty secluded, but not totally isolated. The Midwest is like that at times, I suppose. My room at the time was in the basement, and the stairs that led down to it was right in front of our back door. I slept with my bed right in front of my bedroom door as well. It was summer break, and after I finally decided that I was tired, I went to lay down in my bed. My memory goes in and out at that point, and there are some missing spots in between, because I think as soon as I laid down, I just blacked out. I remember that I woke up right after passing out, and I'm not sure how much time had passed between those two points in time. To me, it felt instantaneous, but I immediately looked at the foot of my bed and the door to my room was wide open. There was this blinding light outside my room. I remember seeing this figure right in the doorway to my room. I couldn't make out any distinct features because of the light coming from behind it. All I got was a silhouette and the shape of how it looked. It must have been not that much shorter than me as I was a kid at the time, probably about four feet tall, I think. It had a huge bulbous head and a tiny body. In retrospect, it was shaped a little bit like a gray. I just remember this utmost primal sense of fear, and I couldn't move. I've never experienced that level of horror before, and I haven't felt that feeling since. I was laying on my back in my bed, and all I could do was stare at it. I was trying to scream, but nothing came out of my lungs, and I couldn't get up to run or anything because I was completely paralyzed to that spot. I blacked out again, came to, and this time it was closer, right at the end of my bed. At that point I tried screaming again, but still nothing would come out, and yet again, I blacked out. I came to that morning at the opposite side of my room, flopped across this little couch that I had. It's hard to explain it too because there's just nothing in between these points of time. It's like a blank spot. I tried to explain to my mom what happened, but of course, she just chalked it up to sleepwalking and a nightmare because I stayed up too late or something to that effect. For a while after that, I was horrified to watch any form of alien movie or even just anything on TV that resembled what that thing was shaped like. I would have a full-blown panic attack and start to hyperventilate. I've gotten past that and it doesn't really get to me anymore. However, to this day, I can't sleep with my bed in front of my door or with my door open. I don't even like sleeping near the door. I need to be as far away from it as possible. Even during the day, if I'm doing something in a room, I have to close the door. Having it open just sends this massive feeling of discomfort and anxiety over me, and I can't do it. I've experienced weird things throughout my entire life. 
But after a while, I just chalked it up to sleep paralysis. But now, I'm not so sure anymore. I hope that somebody has answers, or can at least tell me if I'm crazy or not. Because even attempting to try to explain it, or even just thinking about it, makes me feel like I'm nuts. So before I tell you the story, let's get one thing straight. My dad is a stubborn, no bullshit type of old guy. He thinks aliens and ghosts are all a load of crap, and he wouldn't make something like this up. We're from England, and we live in the Midlands. And one night during the late 80s, my dad and his friend are out making hay in the tractor in a field, when all of a sudden, a bright flash of light appears right in front of them, and there's a giant ship hovering in front of them. He's always ever told me it looks just like you'd imagine a spaceship, disc-shaped, with lights spinning around the edge. He and his friend had only just taken in what they were seeing, before it darted off in the opposite direction toward the next village. So my dad gets on his CB radio, because, you know, if you didn't have one of those in the 80s, and who even were you? And he radios another farmer friend in that village, and he sees it too. He even radios his wife, who then wakes up the kids, and they all see it too, before it darts away into the night. I always remember my dad telling me the story when I was a kid, although out of character for him to do so. I just thought it was some cool story he made up. But a couple of years ago, his friend comes over, the one who was in the tractor with him. And I just happened to mention it in kind of a, oh, you know that old story dad used to tell me kind of way and his friend remembers instantly and begins to describe it exactly how my dad did, which really makes me believe that it was true. My dad still doesn't believe in aliens. He believes it was a spacecraft made by the government to spy on us and that they made it to look like a typical alien spaceship so people wouldn't think it was the government. God knows. All I know is I believe it happened and it's cool as hell. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, and then there was a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, I pause and watch what's happening. As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb, and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sensed that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. 
I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. When I was little, probably eight years old, my family and I were driving back home from my grandparents' house late at night. They live in the countryside, surrounded by orange groves and corn stalks. I remember being so excited to be out at night. There was no moon though, so looking out the window was a little bit scary, since I was looking directly into darkness. I could only see a little bit ahead of me because of the car headlights. When we were passing the corn stalks, I saw a person with black eyes that glowed from the headlights. This person had a weirdly shaped body. They weren't wearing any clothes either, but I don't remember seeing any other body parts besides arms and legs. When I saw it, I got this overwhelming sense of fear. I was so scared that I slid down in the seat to hide from it when we passed by. My parents didn't see it, and I never mentioned it until years later. I'm not sure what it could have been, and I'm still trying to figure that out. Maybe it was a child. Maybe it was my imagination. Or maybe it was an alien. I've never seen anything like it after that. It was just that one time. But it definitely stuck with me. On two occasions, my friend and I were in separate rooms of our housing complex. This friend lived on the second floor, while I resided on the fourth. The first time the humming started was one night, at around 3.35 a.m. This humming noise started to fill the room, and at first I thought it was my roommate snoring. I thought this until the noise kept going and getting louder. It was so loud that my head was hurting and then it slowly went away. I thought I was going crazy, until my friend texted me from the second floor and was like, what the actual hell was that? I thought nothing of it until about a month later when it happened again. This time, it got much louder at a much faster rate. It was so loud that my bed and belongings started to shake. This time, it was around 12.30 on a weekday. I was pretty scared, not gonna lie, and after two minutes of this sound and shaking it quickly went away. The weirdest part is that the first time the sound went from left to right, getting louder and quieter. The second time it was down and up. Anyway, I'm not a big believer in aliens, but I don't really know what to think about this. Maybe it was. As a side note, my social media months before was only alien spam, even though I never talk about them or search for it, not even for space. Once I openly started talking about aliens and researching Orion's belt, all of the alien spam went away, and nothing even related to aliens comes up on my feed anymore. Kind of backwards from how that's supposed to work. Anyway, I just want to hear others' thoughts about it. A few years ago, while visiting grandma with family from all over, and while eating lunch, we get into normal family talk. Ghosts, aliens, stuff like that. An aunt was explaining to me that as a child, she's the youngest of three so she's about 60 now, she was walking down the road next to their house. As she was nearing the corner, she noticed a man with his back to her. She said that his skin looked human, but a bit of a grey colour and he turned around and looked right at her. That's when she saw that he had huge yellow eyes, all yellow, that were a bit rectangular in shape. She turned and ran home. She and my father on separate occasions saw what they thought were satellites, 
but they were traveling the opposite ways that satellites normally travel, and they hit each other, and both ricocheted back in the directions they'd come from. They experienced a lot of things in their childhood home. Fast forward to my aunt being married with two kids, they all experienced stuff in their family home. I always think about what my aunt said she saw that day while walking. A hybrid? What was it there for? As a child, and somewhat now still, I'm scared of aliens. I have gotten a bit better with a few of their faces, but I still have night terrors of being abducted, and a lot of times, I'll wake up throughout the night, and my boyfriend will tell me that I woke up all night long, but I never remember doing so. Also as a kid, and to this day, I see shadow people and hear things. I've been touched by things that I can't explain, mainly because I can't see what's touching me. Long before we started dating even, my boyfriend's mom said that when I would come over to hang out, it would seem as if the ghostly actions in the house would pick up, but still. I think about what my aunt saw. I want answers, but I'm slightly afraid that I'll never get them. Newfoundland is an alien hotspot if the stories that I hear are any indication. Almost everyone I know has some story about when they lost huge chunks of time and were missing, usually for about a day, but it can go up to a week. I've never heard of any violent encounters, but a lot of I was frozen and couldn't move for a bit due to a light in the sky kind of stories. It's a pretty good assumption that if aliens do exist, they stalk my family. My dad has stories about being frozen on beaches, being watched in his sleep, and a weird story about the stars changing configuration. My mom has stories about meeting aliens, and she has a few accounts of what they look like. I might tell those stories one day, but I really feel like this is a good introduction to the types of encounters my family has had. For me, it all started when I was about 13. There's nothing overly remarkable about me, other than being in a military family, and I was more precocious than most. At the time, I was living in my dad's hometown, maybe a solid kilometer up the hill. My house was a raised bungalow, meaning that all the first floor windows were about 10 feet off the ground. My window faced the front yard, and was probably the only one that didn't have some kind of bush in front of it. Basically, I had a good solid view of my outside. One night, I remember being woken up fairly abruptly at around 1 in the morning. Not unusual for a 13-year-old, so I thought, go get a drink, probably pee, go back to bed. Except, when I tried to move, I couldn't. Some people describe the feeling of an overbearing weight that prevents them from moving. This wasn't that. It was like my whole body was asleep, complete with that tingly feeling and an utter lack of ability to move. I wasn't sleeping in a weird position, and aside from having maybe an extra blanket on the bed, I couldn't figure out a reason why this would be happening. The only thing I could move was my head, as my neck felt asleep, but not enough to completely prevent movement like the rest of my body. So I flopped my head to one side, and that's when I saw it. In my window, roughly in the middle, was a disc-shaped object. It hovered maybe a foot away from the glass and didn't move. This is remarkable for anyone who's been to Newfoundland, where 40 km per hour winds are the norm basically every day. The disc was maybe three feet in diameter, and the better part of a foot tall. It let off this low-grade, almost LED-like hue. It reminds me of those horrible blue Christmas lights. The thing had three thick, prominent ridges on what I assumed to be the front of it, which was facing me. From the middle one came a red light, and the thing didn't have a lens. It just kind of emanated from this thing. It split into a wide vertical pattern, and it's like it was scanning my body. When I moved my head, the disc was beaming around my belly button area. As soon as my head flopped, with maybe a second or so delay, it moved the scanning laser to my eyes. 
For maybe five seconds, I stared rather uncomfortably into this horrible red light, and it burned. I wanted to close my eyes desperately, as it felt not dissimilar to staring into the sun. But they wouldn't move. I tried to yell, but I couldn't say anything. And, much like staring into the sun, you see little else. After the five or so seconds, the light turned off, and I could just make out the disc object, flying off down the road toward the ocean. I was awake for maybe ten more seconds before I fell asleep. For full context, this all happened in about 20 seconds, give or take. I need to point out that this happened in 2003, in rural Newfoundland. At that time, there were no such things as drones. Drones were the terrifying flying machines that the US was sending to bomb the shit out of Iraq. They were something I'd only even seen recently on the TV, as those big, white, plain-looking things. I have no real explanation for this other than possibly aliens. I had tried to talk to my family and classmates about it, but they mostly called me a loony and laughed. Eventually, that night passed from me trying to tell people about it to thinking nobody will ever believe me, so why bother? A month, maybe two passes, and my life carries on as usual. The only real difference is I become shit at math. I was a top student in my class, always pulling best grades for most of my school life until that point, given the math isn't all that hard. But I really started to suck. My grades went from 90s to 60s, often 50s, and sometimes even failing in the math department. Often, I was failing in the math that I was able to do not even four months prior. Nobody was concerned for some reason, but that was a frequent theme in my teen years. So, I was now just the kid that had fallen from grace. Still had amazing grades in everything else, just never again in math. So one night I remember being woken up. Again, my body felt like it was asleep, and again I had some control over my neck. But I remember this like I remember a dream. But way too many details for it to be normal, but I'll get to that. The first thing that hits me is the blinding white light. It was coming from outside my window, brighter than stadium lights, and coming from who knows where. But I knew it was close to my house. All I heard was a low, growling hum coming from outside. In my room were two of those discs I had seen before, shining a wide red light all over the room, which dampened the sheer brightness of the light outside enough that I could see. Then I see one of them. It walks into my room, and I remember being scared-ish, but largely indifferent. It was easily over 12 feet tall, and was uncomfortably skinny. Its arms and legs were way too long for the tiny torso that it had, about the size of a child. They were multi-jointed in at least seven places that allowed it to fold its arms and legs enough that it could fit into my room. I have no doubt that if it were to fully extend all of its joints, the thing could easily top 20 feet. It had hands which had too many joints on the fingers, way too many fingers, and no thumbs. They were in a half circle around its pretty round palm, and generally unsettling now that I think about it. It had a head, a huge head, but it lacked any real eyes except for maybe tiny pinpoints where a massive socket would otherwise be. It had no nose, no hair, no real chin, and two holes where our cheeks would be. I'm guessing that it might be a mouth, but hell if I know. The head was thin, because of course it was thin, and resembled somewhat of an oblong pancake. The whole thing had white skin with a gray undertone, or what I assumed to be such given the lighting in the room. The creature held out its hand, and instinctively I held it. It walked me out of the room, stark naked, and was leading me to my living room. When I get into my hallway, I see all the doors in my house are open, and there are a dozen of these things just sort of mulling about. I remember one looking into our linen closet, one walking into our basement, and another unscrewing a light bulb. All over the house were the discs that gave everything that faint red tint and the huge stadium lights from outside, making it look like broad daylight, but with a slight red tint. In the dining room was my mother, also stark naked, kind of just standing there, 
as two of these creatures were in my kitchen doing something. Lying on the couch in the living room was my dad, again naked, with three of the creatures looming over him, with a bunch of weird tools in their hands. I can assume doing some kind of procedure. I remember asking, where is my sister? To which I got the reply, outside, from the creature holding my hand. I'm still unsure if this was telepathic or if the creature said something out of its uncomfortable holes, but I accepted that as good enough of an answer. As I walked by my dad, I could see that the creatures were fiddling with him, poking and prodding him. I remember being concerned, as I know that my dad had just had a surgery, but I again got the feeling that it would be fine. The creature I was with placed me in the corner of the room, facing the wall, and I sat down cross-legged without much issue. The creature then left and I was there for about a minute or so. All I can remember from that time is a few details. Above me was one of the discs, shining its broad red light. But I had the faint blue as well, giving my vision an odd hue. The only other distinguishing feature I remember is the silence. The piercing and utter silence only broken by that soft, low, growling hum coming from outside. I remember then waking up, back in my bed, no worse for wear. All I think is, damn, that was a realistic dream, and went about my day. The only difference is I had, and still have, a small lump on the back of my neck the size of a split pea. It comes and goes, sometimes I feel it, and sometimes I don't. And a few times I've squeezed it, and some dry, powdery substance came out. I just assumed it was some weird medical thing, but if it ever happens again, I might try to get it looked at. A few years go by, and my dad and I were chatting. We got on the topic of aliens, one of his personal favorites. I tell my dad about the multi-jointed creature thing, and before I can even get to the point in my story where I reach the living room, he goes, Man, I had a dream like that bunch of skinny white men with hoods were poking me right after that surgery. There was a red hue all over everything. I remember seeing them sit you in a corner and you just sort of stayed there for a bit. Crazy dreams, huh? I asked if it seemed real to him and he said, well, yeah, I've had those dreams ever since I was a kid. The white guys in hoods never do anything interesting. This was the only time. Our brains are weird, aren't they? I've brought it up a few times since, but I don't get a whole lot more than what I've already told you. My sister has somewhat of a similar story, but she remembers like three seconds of it. I have maybe two minutes. The best guess I have is aliens, and this is far from the only time that I've encountered these creatures, but I'll save that story for another day. I come from a relatively small island in the southern part of Denmark, with approximately 6,000 inhabitants, which is where all of the following sightings have taken place. Most of the island is covered by fields. I have no doubt that these events are 100% true, and not just made up. One has to understand that in such a small community, if you report seeing UFOs or other such things, you risk being labeled as the crazy guy seeing aliens and stuff and could potentially be publicly ridiculed and made fun of, especially as a younger person. All of these people told me that they kept shut for many years in fear of being called out. Therefore, local people would likely not share such stories if they weren't 100% true. Why risk being publicly made a fool of for a lie? As they've grown older, I guess they begin to care less about what people might think. The first story was my father, Around the mid-80s on a warm summer night, my father was in his 20s and sat outside looking at the night sky. Suddenly, a white orb appeared. Across the night sky, it appeared to be about the size of the moon and moved slowly from north in a straight line directly south. He never talked about it due to the fear of being called crazy. A couple of days later, he was visiting my grandmother's hair salon when an elderly woman started describing the exact same sighting. 
He then shared his own experience with my grandmother and the lady. It turned out that four or five people had seen this orb moving across the sky. The second event was described to me by a close friend of my father's and is somebody that I know very well. This was around 2005 or 2006. He was standing in his kitchen around midday. The window in his kitchen overlooks a large field. At one point, he looks out his window and sees a large, white, glowing orb, similar to the one described by my father. But it wasn't moving. It just hovered close above the ground. And then, it suddenly shoots up into the sky and is gone. He also kept shut about it for several years before telling anybody. The last sighting is, to me, the strangest. This happened in around 1990. The person who told me this story is a good friend of one of my own friends. He told me that at the time that he was 11 or 12 years old, he was playing in his room with a friend. He lived on a small farm and from his room, he had a good overlook of some fields. He could see relatively far away from where his room was. At some point, they both looked out the window. Out in the middle of one of the fields stood a large structure shaped like a pyramid. It appeared to have an opening or an entrance. They stared at it as the opening began to close. As the entrance closed, the pyramid suddenly shot up into the sky and was gone. He told me if it wasn't that he had had another person see it with him, he never would have told anybody about it because it just sounded too crazy. Still, they both kept shut about it for several years and he says that he hasn't told many people about this encounter. What do you think? Maybe somebody has reports of experiencing something similar in Denmark. A few nights ago, around 5.30 in the morning, I noticed a green light in my room near the wall across from me. I had all of my lights off and was just looking at my laptop, which I closed when I noticed the light. The room was completely dark, no lights on, door closed, blackout blinds, no phone flashlight on. When I saw it, I wasn't scared, but I felt almost hypnotized and placated by its presence. But I did want to take some video to make sure that the object or being was real. I saw the light moving around my room for approximately 30 minutes. Sometimes it moved slowly and organically. At other times it flitted away quickly and the movement appeared similar to a drone. And sometimes it stopped in one place for several seconds. At first it seemed like a single point of light, but at points in the video it splits into two pieces. At some points a red light flashes very briefly as well. I also didn't notice or see this at the time of the event, but in some of the videos there appear to be grayish figures around the edges or corners of the frame, or the entire screen will go from black to gray and vice versa. I held the phone still while filming it and just waited for it to come in and out of frame. In the last video that I took, the light flashes insanely quickly, appearing in one place, disappearing, and then reappearing in another spot in less than a second. I don't really remember waiting for it to go away or anything. I just stopped taking video and went to sleep. What do you think? I wanted to share a scary experience my family had when vacationing at the Caribbean Beach Resort in August of 1995. As a quick side note, I was born in 1992, so I don't remember anything from this trip. This is all coming from my family. Also, I do not know the exact room number at the time. We have family videos from this trip, but I haven't found them yet. If I find them, I can confirm the room number. I want to say that it was on the island of Aruba, but I'm just not sure. A quick setup for the story. This was a big family vacation because it was my aunt's birthday. The first room consisted of my brother and I and my mom and dad. 
The room directly next door consisted of my three sisters and their friend. Farther down and around the corner was my grandma and my aunts. They did not experience anything that night, so they don't matter much at this point in the story. It all started at 2 a.m. on night two of the vacation. My mom shot up awake and ran for the door, screaming about a giant bug. During this time, my dad says that there were a lot of colorful lights shining through the windows. But they said there was a meteor shower that night, which might explain the lights. Eventually, my dad was able to coax her back to bed. She said all she remembers is seeing a huge bug. I asked her recently about this, and she said that she saw the silhouette of a giant bug. It could have been an alien, I guess, but she doesn't know. This is important, because my mom is the one who said it could have been an alien, but she doesn't know. My mom is super religious and never cared for crypto stuff, so I can't see her lying about this. After a while, they go back to sleep, until around 4 a.m., my dad wakes up in mid-air at the side of the bed and dropped, hitting his head on the nightstand. He even had a large bump on the back of his head. He said he was in the air for a few seconds before falling. He was pretty shaken and spoke to my mom until about 5 a.m. That's when my sister called the hotel phone. My sister called because they had coordinated to get up early that day and my sisters couldn't sleep. My mom said, that's fine, your father kept me up all night talking about the weird stuff that happened. And my sister yelled, weird stuff happened to you too? We'll be right over to talk about it. Once they came over, they discussed what had happened to them. At the exact time that my mom woke up screaming about the giant bug. At 2 a.m., my sister Christy woke up to my other two sisters, Kim and Trisha, screaming. Kim was on the floor and Trisha was still on the bed. Christy was trying to understand what happened, but neither Kim nor Trisha would calm down enough to speak coherently. Eventually, they calmed down enough to tell her. When Christy asked what happened, Kim said, I don't want to say it. Trisha, you say it. And Trisha said the same. It was as if they both experienced something so traumatic that night that they didn't want to relive it. Finally, Trisha got the courage to try and explain. She would start to explain it and say, it was horrible. We were... And then her mouth would get contorted, and her speech would slur. She couldn't get the words out no matter how hard she tried. Same with Kim. Whenever they would try to say what had happened to them, their words would just scramble. So flash forward to the morning. Before going to Magic Kingdom for the day, we all had breakfast at the Hard Rock Cafe. During breakfast and the rest of the day, my mom, Kim, and Trisha would randomly start crying. My mom said it was the weirdest feeling of being so small. She said she felt like a dot. After breakfast, we were in the Magic Kingdom. We were going on rides and such and eventually found a letter in my stroller that definitely wasn't there before. The letter was in French, but they couldn't figure out what it said. They brought it to a few French couples they had met, but every time they were told, sorry, this doesn't make sense, I can't translate it, or I don't want to read this to you, it's too weird. Eventually they lost the letter and it was never translated. And that's really it. Aside from a crack in the ceiling of the hotel that wasn't there the night before, I think that sums up the odd experience. I was three at the time of this occurrence and my brother was five. We were both untouched and unbothered. If I was old enough to understand, I would probably have that letter to this day. My sisters don't remember anything from that night. They thought about going to see a hypnotist or something, but they were too afraid of what they might find. My main reasoning for posting this is that I wondered if anyone else had a similar experience. I'm sure there is an answer to what happened that night, but it's probably something we'll never know for sure. I'm not really sure what this was, but I vividly remember a situation that happened to me when I was younger. I do remember watching some kind of alien horror story on Animal Planet or something at night, 
about how a lady went to space and then had something in her stomach that was alien-like and it exploded or something. I don't exactly remember everything. I had seen this before I went to bed a couple of nights prior. This was maybe when I was younger than 10 years old, and I slept with my mom in my bed, and we lived on the second floor with a window by my head. I remember waking up and all of a sudden seeing green light, and I heard some weird noises. I was so scared. I tried to wake up my mom, but she wouldn't answer. I know we had a light by the back side of the apartment, because we had a porch, but this was like a green color that kept turning on and off, pulsating like every five to ten seconds. I also heard a whirring sound, but not really. I do remember that the light wasn't like the porch light. It seemed much bigger and more illuminating through my window but I couldn't check because we had an awning. I don't remember much of it since it's been over 10 years, but I just remember being so scared. I don't know if I imagined it, but I do remember waking and just covering my head with the blanket, wishing it would go away. It seemed like it was hours before it stopped, and then I went back to bed and woke up again. Luckily, nothing has ever happened since, and we've moved apartments. So, for context, it was pretty late at night, but I don't remember the exact time. It was around 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. I was with my boyfriend in the car. We were just sitting and talking before he went home. But as we were talking, I was sitting in the passenger seat, so my body was direct toward him, and the road that I used to live on was behind him as well. We're in mid-conversation, when I see a figure walk past on the other side of the road, going toward a park I lived near. It was just right around the corner from that road. This figure was pretty tall. Not inhumanly tall, but definitely taller than the average person. And it was completely all white. Not glowing, but was a super bright white that I could see perfectly, even though it was dark. It looked as if it had no clothes on, but honestly it didn't need it. I didn't see any details on the body, or body parts, or any muscle definition. The limbs were thick in the sense that they just looked like cylinders, but wasn't thicker than the body itself. The neck wasn't inhumanly skinny, but definitely a bit thinner than I think a normal person has. The head was rather small, but again, not inhumanly small, just oddly proportioned for the height of this thing. The whole time, I was speechless. It wasn't a small glance. I stared at this figure walking for a solid minute or so. My boyfriend didn't realize since we were mid-conversation, until he saw the look I had on my face, and by then it had turned the corner. He didn't see it at all since his body was directed toward me. I went to a family member about it who lived with me at the time, and she had a story of her own about weird paranormal experiences at the park that it was walking to. Hers was a bit different. It was the same with plain white figures, but instead it was more than one, and their heads were spinning. She and her friends ran home immediately after seeing them. Obviously I can't confirm her story because I wasn't there, but I thought it might provide context. If you have any idea what this might be, let me know. The mind is a funny place, and it creates a lot of weird, untrue stuff. Here are two related true stories or dreams that have stuck with me for more than a decade, vivid enough that I flip-flop in my mind whether they were even real today. My family had a house in a rural part of Massachusetts, and a train track into the woods, maybe a half mile from us. One night, I had a dream of a light shining into my wooded bedroom window, and figures outside. That same dream appeared to fast forward, and my family and I were all walking in the middle of the night down our rural street. We didn't talk, 
but I remember feeling the base of the back of my neck was off, felt stiff in the dream. The dream skips forward, and we were at the train tracks. My family and I again say nothing, quietly walking down the tracks. They feel real. I've walked these tracks many times, hanging with friends during the day or sneaking out at night. At the time, I knew them well. We enter the woods some way down, thick, dark brush in the dead of night. My family is with me. We move quietly. I have a grandma who is elderly and a sister who is well able but has Down syndrome. We all traverse hyper-realistic woods arriving at a clearing. Wind rushes in my ears and I hear my grandmother screaming. There are bright lights, so bright. There's a feeling of wind as I open my eyes and I am at the field at the bottom of my parents' home. The sound disappears and I remember feeling like I had wires out of the base of my neck. I rub it, but there's nothing there. My family and I walk up the hill, and I wake up. My mom says she didn't sleep very well that night, but that's about it. I chalk it up to a random dream. Two or three years later, my family camps in Lake Placid, New York. We rented a towable pop-up trailer. As I dream one night, I feel the rush of wind. I wake up and see light shining into our trailer. It gets closer, and I remember nothing. A loud gust of wind, my mother and I both shoot up from the dead of sleep in our trailer, both staring at the door. We look at each other and discuss it. Like, thunder? Maybe? We go outside. It's a clear night. We joke about aliens a little bit and go back to bed. I've been uneasy since then at times over these thoughts. Years and years later, I can still remember the feeling of wires sticking out of my neck. How vivid the dream was of walking down the road. The feeling of missing time. I'll never know if these are dreams or coincidence or something else. But it's happier to think that they're just dreams. I've had sleep paralysis before. I get it like once every two years. But every time that happens, I wake up in the same spot where I'm paralyzed. The first time I slept on the couch after a long day at school and saw a dark figure opening the window and walking toward me. I woke up at the same spot I'd fallen asleep in and nothing happened. The second time I was sleeping in my room, Friday night, and I saw a woman with a knife coming for me and cutting my hand. I woke up in the same spot I'd fallen asleep in and again, nothing happened. But the third time is something that I think is pretty insane. The third time, I don't think it was sleep paralysis at all, but a memory that came back. I was at my girlfriend's house and I was sleeping on my left side. My girl is next to me on the right. She was awake. She tries to wake me up, but I fall asleep again. And then I felt like I was lost in a deep, forgotten memory. My girlfriend and I were messing around with our speaker that we have. It has multiple options like Bluetooth and aux. While trying to change stations, we're engaging with a new sound like space radio or something like that. When you hear a lot of strange single noises of different electronic devices, it's like that. The second that hits, I'm getting kicked back by gravity into the bed, laying down, paralyzed on the right side of the bed, when my girlfriend is sitting on my right at the edge of the bed, looking straight down, with her hand leaning onto the bed, paralyzed as well. When this happens, I hear a loud, deep, mixed voice, not humans, but speaking in English, which is not my native language. It was inside my head, but it was also so loud that I can't think of anything else. All I hear, like it's some really important message, is the world, the will, over and over again. It was like they wanted me to remember this somehow, but chose to bring that experience to me just at that moment. The voice in my head was strong, but I shivered. I felt like somebody was tasering my head. I felt like I wasn't in control. I somehow understood that my brain couldn't take it anymore, 
and I was trying to wake up, but nothing helped. Until I suddenly wake up, stressed out and reaching for my girlfriend, asking her if I was talking in my sleep or moving or doing anything that showed signs of a nightmare, but nothing. She says I was sleeping like a baby right next to her. I found nothing about the world, the will, but I believe that it was a real encounter. My girlfriend doesn't remember any of it, but it's terrifying just to think about it. After all, it might be a memory of mind control or aliens or something. Or it could just be a really bad sleep paralysis dream, but I don't think so. The red light that was around this whole situation is the fact that I wasn't at the same side of the bed, and I always wake up at the same spot I get paralyzed in when I have sleep paralysis. I have two reasons for sharing this story. One of them is to see if anyone else has encountered this message, the world, the will. Maybe it's something from a movie that I heard once, or maybe it's something else. The other reason, I guess, is just to see if anybody knows what I might have experienced. If you have any ideas, please let me know. I have a story that I want to share to see if anybody has experienced anything similar, or just to find some explanations. I was seven, maybe eight years old. I'm now 22. I was in my bedroom getting ready to sleep. My mother was in the other room, waiting for my dad to come back from work. The door of my bedroom was closed. It was summer, I guess, because I remember having the windows open. The room was dark with no light, except for the moonlight and the light coming from our garden. As soon as I laid in bed, I remembered that I wasn't really tired. I wanted to stay up with my parents. I looked towards the nearest wall, maybe 30 centimeters from the wall. I can see this clear figure slowly standing and looking at me. I started screaming my lungs out and in a couple of seconds, which felt like an eternity for me, my parents got scared by the screaming. They ran in. As soon as they ran in, the figure disappeared and I'm just staring at a wall. I'm terrified and I start crying and I tell them everything. They decided to call the nearest priest to bless the house and me. Anyway, I remember this figure really clearly, even though I was very young. The same night, I described it as an alien with a black coat, like the death. That's a quote. In fact, it was this little figure, maybe one and a half meters tall, dark green or gray, with a black coat on his body and a hood on his head. The eyes were long, oblique, and black. I could see his face thanks to the lights coming from the windows. I remember a small mouth, and that's it. The fact is, why would I ever imagine an alien this way? I mean, I've never seen movies with aliens in my life, I've just never been interested. And, as I remember, if you asked a kid to draw an alien, he would probably draw something really tall without any clothes and big black eyes, you know, the like. But, for some reason, that's what I saw. I know I didn't make it up. I know what I saw. I just don't know what it was. I have struggled with the idea of sharing my experience, mostly because I don't even know if it actually happened or if it was just a dream. One night in the summer when I was about 10 or 11, I was awoken in the middle of the night. I could hear the horses running around the pasture as if something had happened to startle them. I decided to get up and go check on things. At that time, my family had a massive old barn and we lived in the middle of nowhere. I walked through the door of the barn and found a very large man, as white as snow, climbing into the hayloft. I remember being startled, but not scared. He turned around and looked at me, and slowly lowered himself back down. He took a few steps toward me, 
before he knelt down and put out his hand, like one would do to a stray animal. As I looked at him, I felt like he looked sad and tired, and not at all like he would do me any harm. I decided to take his hand and walk him toward our kids' hangout space, which was just a space in the barn where we had some old couches, a few toys, and a radio. As soon as he saw the radio, he became more animated, ran toward it, and started messing around with it. That went on for a little bit, and I kept asking him what he needed the radio for. He never said a word, not one word. He wouldn't give me a name, so I just started calling him Radio. After some time, he sat the radio down and sat down on the couch. I brought over my favorite horse book, and he started thumbing through the pages. I started showing him all of my favorite horse breeds. Eventually, he gently took the book from me and closed it as if to say, I'm done. I got up to put the book away and he laid down on the couch. I remember him being so large that his head was on the armrest while his legs hung over the other armrest at the knee. He was a giant, pure white, and I don't recall any hair. His eyes were jet black, but they weren't huge or angular. If anything, they slanted downward a bit and were very beady. After he fell asleep, I decided to go back into the house and go to bed. I put a blanket over him before I went in, so he wouldn't get cold. I woke up in the morning and the whole experience came flooding back to me. My feet were dirty, as if I had been outside during the night. I grabbed some snacks and ran out to the barn. I ran to our hangout space and found everything as I would have expected it. The blanket was on the floor, the book was sitting on the table, the radio was out of place, but he was gone. It's important to know that I had a habit of sleepwalking at this time in my life, so I guess it's possible that this was all just an elaborate dream. At first, I thought he was just a very, very strange person, and I hoped that he found safety. The memory never left me, and by the time I was a teen, I had decided that I had dreamed the whole thing and I let it go. Then, Prometheus came out and I agreed to go see it with friends. When the tall white alien came on screen, I nearly jumped out of my seat. It wasn't an exact likeness, but it was like seeing a ghost of someone I had once met. At the time, I knew absolutely nothing about aliens, and the only one I had ever heard of was the classic Little Green Men. Nonetheless, I forced myself to let it go and move on. That memory could not be real, so I must have dreamed it, right? As time passed, I started wondering how I could have imagined a being that I had never heard of or seen any imagery of. Could that have really happened? Could radio be real? This happened three to four years ago, and I've been thinking about it recently. It was late one night, around 11.30 p.m., and I'm driving home from my job at Sonic. I was taking US 64 home, which is a fairly desolate stretch of road with houses and farmland on either side. I was in my 99 Ford Explorer, and I was just driving along at about 65 to 70 miles per hour with the radio on a low volume. As I'm driving, through my sunroof comes a bright green ray of light that envelops the interior of the vehicle. This lasts for about two to three seconds and then disappears without a trace. After it happened, I just sped up and got home as quickly as possible. I was only about five minutes away anyway. That's really about all there is to the story, but I was young and it really freaked me out. I've pondered and pondered, but I have no clue what it could have been. I wasn't tired because I woke up around 5 or 6 that day, and I have no history of illnesses that could have caused that. I wasn't on any medications, nothing like that. I've told a few people and they don't think I'm lying. I've never been the kind to lie about that kind of stuff, but nobody can give me a solid answer either. Some have said maybe it was a laser, 
but I don't think there's any way that a laser could completely cover my vehicle in green light like that. There was also a farm I was passing by and no street lights. Has anyone had any similar experiences or can anyone offer any insight as to what happened? It would be much appreciated and would ease my mind. This happened in Calaveras Big Trees National Park in the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California on Highway 4. There's an overlook that affords a vista of the Stanislaus River Valley. For those familiar with the park, it is where Oak Trees Parkway turns into Big Trees Parkway. As you drive from the park entrance and head down into the valley toward the campgrounds, my father, my little sister, and myself at 12 years old were in my father's truck headed up the hill away from the campgrounds, driving toward the park entrance with the intention of going shopping in nearby Arnold. As we came upon this overlook, I saw at least four or five cars parked on either side of the road. There were a good number of people standing around and looking into the valley at something. The next thing I know, I was gradually coming to consciousness from some sort of stupor or hypnotic state it was like gradually awakening from anesthesia. I was sitting straight up and my eyes were open. I looked around the cab of the truck. My dad was driving and my sister was sitting there. Both were in a kind of trance state, not really saying anything. After about a minute, they also started moving around like normal and talking. We had exited the park and driven down Highway 4 almost to Arnold, a distance of about six miles, and all of us are missing that time. If I remember correctly, half an hour to 45 minutes was missing. I don't know if it's simply missing time or a potential alien abduction, and I don't know what everybody was looking at, but we still can't explain it to this day. I just went out for a walk before bed. I saw what I thought were very close shooting stars a couple of times. The third or fourth time I saw it, I gasped because I noticed that there were different colored lights coming from some kind of flying object. Then I saw it zoom off, leaving the very bright shooting star kind of trail behind it. It was there for a split second, but I saw it. Very bright, it quickly descended from the sky right by my house. I rushed inside and looked out a window, and I saw it zoom off again away from me. The things I'm seeing lately, it's getting harder to deny their presence. I know it's not the longest story, but I've been seeing strange things a lot, and I'm pretty sure they're aliens. So I'm in my bed, covered in sweat, shaking and scared. This is my second experience with them. The first time they watched me, we weren't in the same room, but I could feel them watching me, and I saw their light from the space in the doorframe. It was greenish yellow. Time distortion happens when they initiate contact. Also, I don't remember hearing any sound at all during either encounter. This time was horrifying. I woke up and saw faces on my ceiling. They weren't detailed, but they looked human. Their features were outlined with a pink light. They're interdimensional and are invisible to my knowledge. I felt two of them grab my arms. I struggled physically. I think they were really latching onto my consciousness, but our auras are human shaped, so really they were grabbing the energy in my arms. I could feel their grip and their strength. They're smaller and weaker than us, but they have large hands and long fingers, and I could feel them pulling me. 
Although I got out of bed and struggled physically, pulling and jerking my arms out of their grip in a spasm of defensive flailing, it dawned on me that they were trying to separate my consciousness from my body. So in reality, my physical struggle made no difference. After the struggle, it seemed like about a minute or so long. They let go. I'm not on drugs, although mentally, physically, and spiritually, I am exhausted. I believe they come for us when we are vulnerable. I survived my encounter and was able to share it, but now I wonder, when people die or have heart attacks or strokes or just collapse, were they victims of some kind of alien abduction? Are their corpses just hollow vessels left behind by interdimensional soul thieves? I don't know. All I know is that I've been experiencing unexplained phenomenon, and I believe them to be alien. I don't know anything else beyond that. Growing up, I had seizures every now and then when I would fall asleep. I wasn't diagnosed with epilepsy, but for some time, I was having them until I finally grew out of my late teens. Due to being able to choke and hurt myself when I would have an episode, my parents placed a baby monitor in my room. Also, my room was connected to my brother's through our bathroom. It was basically a short hallway, and we can see each other's beds from each other's rooms. Both of our doors were always open when we would go to sleep just in case if my brother needed to be there for me. Now, on another side note, I saw the movie Dark Skies, so you guys can have a better understanding of this alien that I encountered. The movie alien species, I believe, are supposed to represent the greys. They're a species of alien that are known to have telepathic powers, and even be to the point where they can alter people's memories of certain incidents. In the movie, the alien is causing the family's son to have horrible nightmares. In a sense, to break the family down emotionally, maybe so that the abduction would be easier. Anyway, I don't think this encounter had to do with an abduction, but more in the sense to just torment. So, I'm probably around 12 or 13 years old when this took place. My brother was about 16 or 17. One night, probably about an hour before my brother and I would have to wake up for school, I woke up to my brother walking down the bathroom hallway into my room. I remember just randomly waking up to him walking toward me. When he got into my room and there was more light from my nightlight, I saw that he was crying. He told me that he had a dream that he found me dead in my bed from having a seizure. He said that it was so vivid and surreal that he had to come and see me to make sure I was okay. Now at that point, I'm a little freaked out, and I call into my baby monitor to get my parents upstairs. When my parents come upstairs to see what was going on, they decided that him and my mom would go downstairs and get ready for school early. Now for some reason, I remember that we ended up in my brother's room, my dad and I, because there was still an hour to sleep before the day started. And my brother's bed was a real-sized mattress that could fit both my dad and I comfortably, and he wanted to stay with me. At some point, my dad falls asleep, but I stayed up for a little bit longer before I completely passed out. Before I fell asleep, I swear I saw a long, gray, ET-looking hand coming from the bottom of my brother's bed. I remember seeing the hand come from underneath the bed, and whatever it was placed it so quietly at the side of my bed, literally a few feet away from me. I don't know if I'm describing this well, but imagine someone laying underneath the bed and they bring around the arm on the side. I remember that when I saw it, I was filled with dread and I was beyond scared, way too scared to touch it to see if it was real. Then suddenly I woke to having to go to school, even though I don't recall falling asleep. For some reason, I never gave a thought about that specific part, about the hand, until I saw dark skies and I had kind of a eureka moment. I don't know if that thing was tormenting my brother with these nightmares or what happened. I don't even know if it's real sometimes, but it was real to me. Has anyone else ever had a similar experience? What do you think it was?
So two nights ago, I was laying in bed, scrolling Reddit, looking for something to read so I could fall asleep. My dog was asleep next to me and my fiance was playing Xbox, but sitting on the couch and on the other side of the room. I wasn't sure what time it was when I felt him crawl into bed, but I instantly fell back asleep after he did. Again, I'm woken up, not sure what time it is, and my dog was up, moving on the bed, I guess trying to get comfortable. My eyes are completely wide open while I'm looking around the room for a half-filled water bottle when I see a bright flash go off literally right in front of me. Thinking my fiancé was messing with me, I waited to see what his reaction would be when he asks me if I saw something. I tell him how bright the flash was, and he said, yeah, I know, it was bright enough to wake me from my sleep. He thought he was dreaming. We started asking each other different questions, like if the TV was on. We have some beer neon lights on the wall behind our bed, so we thought maybe the plug was moved, but the whole extension cord we have them connected to was disconnected and nowhere close to the outlet. We quickly felt weird vibes, like we weren't alone in our room, and we both jumped to each other to hide under the blankets. My dog is the biggest chicken, so she was already under there. We woke up around the same time in the morning, and it was the first thing we talked about. My fiancé thought he'd been having some kind of dream, and we always feel weird when we bring it up. I know this sounds silly, but has anyone else seen any random flashes or had some similar experience? What do you think it was? When I was around eight years old in approximately 1995, I went to visit a friend's house just up a path and through a court from my house, about a minute away. On the court is a set of flats, which creates an archway that you have to walk through. As I walked back home and through the archway, I heard a low humming noise. I looked over my shoulder to see a typical movie-like shaped spaceship the round disc shape with the dome on top and the circular lighting. The lights didn't shine as such as it was daytime, but I can only now explain them as looking like LED lights, which is why they were so noticeable in the daylight. The UFO was small, no bigger than about three feet wide and maybe a foot and a half high. At that point, I think it's coming for me. So I'm so scared I just start running for home. I'm about 30 seconds away, but the corner to the path is coming up. I'm still trying to watch this thing chase me, and as I get to the corner, it's just behind me. The low hum is deafening. I mean, I can feel it within me. I have to take my eyes off of it for just a second to turn the corner, and as I do round the corner, the light, whether it was natural sunlight or the LED-type lights, went really bright and sounded like a jet plane thundering overhead. I look up as I round the corner and it's right above my head, so close that the breeze it created whipped up my hair. Then, just as it had appeared, it disappeared, suddenly, no visual sign of it, but I heard that jet plane noise and low humming noise move away from me. I get home and I tell my mom and dad, they don't believe me, or they say I must have mistaken a bird. I told my friend the next day, and she rolled on the floor laughing. I stopped telling people after that, but I can still remember it like it was yesterday, and still can't shake the feeling that it was coming for me, even though it was so small that I wouldn't have even fit in it. I don't know that that matters, though. I still don't want to know what would have happened if I hadn't made it home. My first sighting was when I was 10. It was a massive floating ship shaped like a huge manta ray. When I saw it, I felt like I had been on it for a while, but I shook off that feeling and ran home. The memory surfaces periodically, and sometimes I think I can remember what the inside of that ship looks like, 
And I remember not being alone in the ship, but I have little idea who I was with. Much later, I saw a craft landing in the cow pasture at my parents' house in a rural country. I feel compelled to go inside the house, and it was like I had forgotten what I had seen. I lost a few hours of time that day. I always assumed that I must have watched TV, but later I realized I literally have no memory of the next few hours. Later, I began seeing lights in the sky, and I would ask out loud, are you here for me? And the light would bob and weave up and down, or left to right, or it would flash brighter for a moment, like it was communicating. Again, I would go inside, and soon after, I would lose memory of what I was doing for the next several hours. This happens often, still to this day. I have a lot of theories, and sometimes I remember parts of conversations with people about my life, my personal feelings, my aspirations, good conversations about how I could improve my life, but I can't remember any faces of the people that I talk to. I do benefit, though, as my life has steadily improved over the past 10 years, so I'm not fearful about the encounters. I'm just aware that they're taking place, and I don't know if I'm ready to remember more yet. I'll cut to the chase and tell you what I experienced and saw when I was in a dreaming state, but was nonetheless very real to me. It's hard to explain, so I'm going to do my best to sum it up. This may be long, but please hear me out. My identical twin and I have had a sleeping disorder known as sleep paralysis as long as we can remember. Them being severe, we would experience false awakenings, believing we have actually awoken, just to realize that we were still dreaming. It happened during a false awakening but I immediately knew something was wrong, unlike other times, where it takes me a bit to realize I'm dreaming. I'm laying horizontal, almost against a hard surface, and there's something, a light maybe, blocking my main view. I'm frightened, and out of my peripheral, I focus in on the walls. Remembering what I saw after is what sometimes bothers me at night, right before I go to bed. The walls didn't ever seem to meet. There were no corners. Smooth, metallic, no edges. Everything was curved, making your perception confused. I couldn't tell if I was in a small room or a very large space. The walls almost seemed to move in a very unnatural way, but still were completely solid. The word kaleidoscope comes to mind, but it's not quite right. It was like no other place I've ever been or seen, completely alien in design. If you have severe sleep paralysis, sometimes you can feel yourself come back. I had that feeling before I actually woke up in real life. I'm not looking to discuss whether or not my experience was fake seeing as I was in a dream state, although because it felt and still feels so real to me, it leaves me with questions. Has anyone experienced or heard of anyone who's been abducted and could visually explain the inside of the craft? Does anyone know of information connecting geometric shapes with extraterrestrial beings? I would be grateful for any help on the theories on ET craft designs, or any information on some similar experiences to mine. This happened probably about two years ago, except my memory of when it happened is really hazy and I struggle to place it on my timeline. I would say I was about 15 years old and it was the middle of the night. I live in a two-story house and the second story is quite high, so I sleep with the curtains wide open as I like to look at the stars. For reference, the window that's in this room takes up almost the whole wall. 
I woke up one night and my room was completely bright. My bed is in the corner opposite the window and all I could see out my window was a blinding light taking up the entire window. My bedroom was completely lit up and I could barely look out the window because it was like looking into the sun. I sat there for probably about two minutes, absolutely paralyzed with fear, before I decided to grab my phone and film it. The second I grabbed my phone, the light went out and my room went back to dark. I couldn't make out anything through the window as my eyes had to adjust since it had been so bright. And once I could see, after about maybe a minute, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I wrote myself a note to look at in the morning because I needed evidence that it hadn't been a dream. I eventually got back into bed and tried to sleep, but the adrenaline and fear kept me up for hours. I managed to fall asleep eventually, and when I woke up, the note was exactly where I left it. I spoke to my family, but they were all adamant that they hadn't seen or heard anything. I have explored every logical possibility, including sleep paralysis and night terrors, and even the possibility that I was hallucinating. But I've never hallucinated before, and I haven't since. I have no history of mental illness other than depression, which I wasn't struggling with at the time. And the same with night terrors and sleep paralysis. The note I left myself has proved to me that I wasn't asleep when it happened. This was during a time when I had some weird experiences happening while I was asleep. I would wake up with strange bruises and scratches all over my body almost every day. My memories from around that time are very hazy, and I can only remember bits and pieces. That time of my life is almost blurry to me, and I usually have an excellent memory. Any possible explanations? Six years ago, my boyfriend at the time, husband now, woke me up sweating and shaking in absolute fear. I asked him what was wrong and he began stuttering and telling me that I would never believe him. He went on to tell me that he was woken up around midnight to this person standing at the end of the bed. Yes, my first thought was sleep paralysis as well, but he sat up and was ready to attack if he needed to. In his head, he heard a voice that wasn't him, telling him that it was okay and that they weren't there for any bad reasons. He said he felt immediately calm from that. He also noted that he was shocked with what a light sleeper I was and that his movements hadn't woken me. This being was unnaturally tall and had to crouch a little due to its height and us having been asleep in the basement. He said that this being reached out for a greeting and again began hearing a voice in his head saying, Hello. Nothing much else happened that night as my husband was frightened. All he remembered at the time was that the last thing he heard from it in his mind was, I'll see you again soon. And then he said it felt as if time had started again, not realizing that it ever felt like it stopped until that point and then he was back in reality, and that's when he woke me. What he thought had only been about a 10 to 15 minute encounter had actually taken over an hour. These visits continued for months, minimum once a week, max three to four times, but my husband got less and less frightened every time. This thing and him built a sort of friendship from what he explained to me. It had a name, but for the life of me, I can't remember what he said it was. It answered any and every question my husband had. I won't go into what those were here. But after a while, it just stopped. He stopped waking me up in the middle of the night or telling me about it the next morning. But the times were always the same. He would be awoken around midnight and they would have discussions about literally anything my husband was curious about. And then he would come back to reality and time would unfreeze again between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., having only felt like the encounter had lasted a short period of time. 
Once it stopped, though, I can't emphasize enough just how much it stopped. I mean, full stop. It was like, for him, it never happened. It's been six years, so I know this is choppy, but it's hard to remember everything with it having been so long ago now. I forgot about it for so long, and I don't know what prompted me to remember it just about a week ago. But now I just can't stop thinking about it, and the oddness of it all, and how it just stopped so suddenly. He's literally never made mention of it ever again, and I've never brought it up to him this last week in fear that he may think I'm crazy. Which, I don't know why that's my fear, but part of me thinks if there's a chance he's completely forgotten it, whether it be on his own or something else, he may think I've gone insane. Anyway, if you have any ideas or similar stories, please let me know. I'm trying to figure this all out and what happened to my husband, as it's literally keeping me up at night. I'm a lucid dreamer, and I can control my dreams and my nightmares. But last night, I had a dream that was very different from anything else. I was working on the floor of my factory job and running the forklift, like normal, until out the bay door there were fireworks, it's more like a plume of light and an explosion, coming from the other side of the valley. I live in the desert, we don't have valleys where I'm at. We decided to go outside after seeing these lights fly away into the sky to the left of us. Once we get outside of the bay door, the ground is illuminated like a full moon times ten. We were now in the backyard of my childhood house. We look up to the sky trying to find the light source, but it was just a night sky. When we looked to the right, there was a typical looking alien and when it noticed us, it screeched and jumped up toward us but it dissolved into the brightening light. I woke up in a scream and I couldn't sleep until daylight. My cat, who's pretty aware as well, stared at the wall behind me for a good 30 minutes. Now I can dream about scary stuff and when it happens, I can usually alter it. I can always control what I'm dreaming about, but this was different and I haven't dreamed about aliens in over 10 years. What is this supposed to mean? Have they decided to come back? Why me? My first ever encounter was when I was around seven and my family was all around the table. I will never forget the order we sat in nor what happened. My mother sat in front of me while my sister was beside me. Father was next to mom and my back was turned to the kitchen. My brother sat next to my mom in front of my sister, a family of five. We were eating and then the window straight across from my dad at the right of my direction shone with a very bright light. Everyone seemed frozen but my mom and I. My mom told me to run, run and hide. My mind was blanked out and I didn't think at all. I just got up and ran to my mother's room where I felt my mind was telling me would be the safest place. Once I entered my mom's room, I went straight to her king size bed with a huge light underneath. There was nothing under my mom's bed because she kept everything in bins at the foot of her bed and closet. The foot of my mother's bed was facing the door while the head was against a wall next to two big windows. Then it was her closet across from where you were laying so you could see it. Then the bathroom was right next to that. Once I got under the bed, I saw that the light was still on. I looked through the cracks and it was quiet. And then I saw about six sets of feet that were not human. Then I felt them start to surround me. One almost touched me by getting on the bed and reaching down through the crack. There were two through the crack, three in front, not showing their faces, but trying to reach further under. One was at the foot of the bed. 
Then I looked near me and saw a face that was gray and had huge eyes. I felt like I couldn't move, but when I looked closer, I saw a whole galaxy in its eyes. It was so pretty how the colors merged like a sunset, and for a second I almost forgot it was an eye. Then it moved or flinched and I came to my senses. I looked around and they were still moving to get me, while the one that I looked at was staying still and looking at the closet. Then I heard the closet door opened and I saw Nega. Nega was my childhood imaginary friend that taught me the greater lessons than what is now being slowly forgotten. After seeing her, I relaxed and I saw them try to fight. And then the tall gray-like humanoids were gone. I looked at Nega and then I looked at the bathroom to see another creature that had orange eyes that I know commonly stays in my mother's bathroom. Nega hushed me, and then I seemed to have forgotten what had happened until I turned 14. After this, I just carried on with life. I never saw my imaginary friend again, but old friend still lingers from time to time in my memories. I will never forget this Wednesday night as long as I live. It was the summer before seventh grade, sometime in July. It was Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. The evening before, my family had watched the old school show, Unsolved Mysteries. I awoke in the night, lying on my right side, awake, but my eyes still shut, completely silent. None of us ran fans back then to aid in sleep. I was awake and basically waiting to fall back asleep again. However, I decided to open my eyes. On the right side of my bed, right there, was a being seemingly fixated on a plush bear that I kept in bed with me. And this being fit all of the descriptions that I've always heard or watched on television of an alien. Shorter, pale gray skin, and those awful eyes, huge, black, and slanted, staring at my bear, right by my bed. Honestly, I cannot put into words how I felt right at that moment. I was only just about 12. At some point, I pulled my covers over my head and felt an awful rushing through my body of super warm, then cool, then warm again. Only later in my life did I understand that I was most likely feeling shock. I couldn't scream. I felt frozen. Too scared to scream, maybe. What if I did scream? My mother and stepfather and two brothers would hear me. What the heck would they do if they came running into my room and saw this thing. What would it do? Is it going to kill me? Abduct me? What if it already had and it was returning me? All of these thoughts plus a million more just raced through my young mind. It's awful just recounting it all. Again, how could I ever forget something traumatic like this? So being such a brave 11 year old and after what felt like 12 hours, I decided to try and scare it. I decided that I would thrash my legs up and down from under my covers as hard as I could. I know, horrifying, right? I was so petrified though. So I did this and then remained under my covers, just waiting. Nothing happened. So I stayed under the covers. This had to be at least close to going on two hours from when I first opened my eyes and saw this thing. As I lay wide awake, I heard a noise. To this day, I still can't explain exactly how it sounded. The sound felt as if it surrounded me and was coming from outside. It was crisp, clean sounding, maybe mechanical, but maybe not, lasting only about two seconds a sound that I had definitely never heard before and have never heard since. As soon as I heard the sound, something in my mind told me 
Oh, they're gone. As crazy as it sounds, I firmly believed that the sound was their transportation leaving. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night or early morning. It took me so long to confide in my family about this terribly scary incident. Of course, they did not believe me. However, now, from time to time, my mother will mention it and suggest that maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia now. Very well could be. This is the first time that I've shared this story publicly, though, and it would be reassuring to hear any other stories of similar happenings. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, I woke up at 2, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl, or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom, the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction, like an air hockey puck perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures, it just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. 
I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black, silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son, on the same deck, at the same house. We have since moved, though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone, so I was amazed at all the apps even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, Hey, there's no star there. It zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out, like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise. If I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. So call me crazy, and I'm sure some people will, that's okay, but I swear this happened to me when I was 16. What's weirder is that it happened on the same night that I had an alien abduction dream. My mom wasn't home. She worked nights looking after the elderly at a nearby retirement home. I lived a normal teenage night playing video games, messaging friends, and watching TV. I went to my room and went to sleep. I had an extremely intense nightmare that I was abducted by aliens. All I remembered is looking up in my dream and seeing my whole field of vision turn completely white as I simultaneously heard this really loud buzzing or humming sound. I wake up drenched in sweat, heart pounding, and it's around 5.30 in the morning. But what's weirder is that I'm not in my bed. Confused as heck, I look around the room, and to my surprise, I'm somehow in my mom's room, frozen in fear and confused. I tried to figure out what was going on. After about 20 to 30 minutes, I finally calmed myself down enough to get up. So I get up, and when I go downstairs, I can see through the door to our backyard, which is made of glass and I can clearly see that the gate to our backyard is wide open. It's an old-fashioned wooden gate, and it hadn't been opened in years because it was covered in vines and was always left locked. I go to investigate, and as I go to unlock the back door, the door handle goes down with no resistance at all, and I realize, crap, this door is already unlocked, which only added to how shook up I was, to be honest. So, hesitantly, I go into the backyard anyway, and I look at the gate, which is also open. I look for footprints or boot marks, thinking that somebody must have kicked the gate open. Nothing. I look more closely. The old rusty lock to the gate, which hasn't been opened in years, is still there. Not bent. Not damaged. Not broken at all. Just a bit rusty. The same as it's always been. I lock that gate back up and look around the yard. Nothing's missing. I go back in the house. 
I lock the back door and take a real good look around and nothing's missing. I go back to my bedroom and double check that I did get in my bed that night and yep, I definitely did. The bed's still messy. I thought, did I sleepwalk? Did I go into the yard and then somehow go get in my mom's bed? I checked the carpet and floors in the house, which certainly would have been dirty and muddy if I had walked into the yard and then back in. And nothing. I called my mom and explained everything that had happened, and I asked if she had messed with the gate or unlocked it lately. She confirmed that she hadn't, and was just as surprised and confused as I was. To this day, I have no explanation as to what happened that night. Just to confirm, I was very into sports as a teenager. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't take substances, and I was completely sober. I also remember feeling oddly terrified of the sky as it began to get dark out that evening. I remember sometimes that if I was playing football or soccer with friends after that, and it started getting dark, instead of walking home like I usually would, I'd kind of hustle. I'd constantly look up at the sky, feeling fear, and I remember a number of times where I decided to just run home instead because I was scared, even months later. All of this still confuses me, even to this day. One night while driving home, I saw a huge bright light, probably a little larger than a full moon, straight ahead of me in the sky. It changed colors from green to yellow, red, blue, and then two other similar lights showed up next to it. They changed colors for about 10 to 15 seconds. Then they all became one big white light and completely disappeared. Then they all came back, changed colors more, and then disappeared for good. I've just never seen anything like this, but I was wondering if anyone else had similar sightings. About two months ago, I was driving home from my parents' house late at night on a route that connects New York to Connecticut. My town in Connecticut directly borders New York State. The town has some serious hills bordering on small mountains. At one point on the route, the trees thin out to the left, revealing a large hill or small mountain, which can be seen pretty clearly from different perspectives for about two minutes. As I was driving on this particular night, I noticed two large, slow blinking and slow moving rectangular lights low in the sky. I couldn't see any specific features of any craft surrounding these lights, so my perspective could be off, but it seemed to me to be only about 20 meters higher than the top of the hill. I'm guessing the distance or height by how fuzzy the edges of the light seemed to be and by how large they appeared to be, in addition to the multiple perspectives provided by my consistent 40 miles per hour speed on the road. When I spotted it, it was nearly directly forward in my line of sight, off to the left just a bit. In the two minutes that I watched it, it moved maybe a half a mile farther to my left. For reference, the top of the hill that I mentioned is about a mile from that road in the same direction to the left. That would mean a speed of about 15 miles per hour. The lights were blinking too slowly to be standard aircraft strobes, on for about two seconds, off for another two, in a regular rhythm. They were moving and blinking in unison, which implies that they were both part of one larger thing. They seemed to be set about 30 to 40 yards apart from one another. There was no noticeable sound, and no witnesses aside from myself that I know of. I had always thought that if I saw a UFO, I would love to follow it, but I was too freaked out and I didn't do that. I felt like an instinctive horror. I couldn't bring myself to deliberately get closer. 
If there is a next time, I will try harder to overcome that. The year was 1976. We were living in the Middle East. My father was in the secret police called Savak. It was common that a helicopter would land in our backyard and pick my dad up for a mission or something like that. One night, I saw a bright light and it got my attention. I thought it was my dad returning home on the helicopter landing in the backyard, but I guess it wasn't. But I don't remember anything after the light got really close. I woke up in bed the next day. Well, I thought it was the next day, but I found out that a few days had actually passed. My father was standing next to my bed with two well-dressed men. One was American, I think, and the other was a translator. He introduced one of them as Mr. John and told me they wanted to talk to me. I was confused and they asked a lot of weird questions. Soon after my dad took me, my brother and sister moved us to the UK. We lived there for three years until my next strange encounter. Once again, one of the original two men, Mr. John, with a new guy, questioned me once more. A few months later, on the 4th of July, 1979, we moved to the US and we have lived here ever since. As time went by, I asked my dad questions about the moving and the men questioning me but he would never talk about it until recently when he was diagnosed with dementia. The things he said were incredible, too incredible to be true. I thought it was the drugs or the disease. I thought that's pretty cool if it was true, but there's no way. Well, he's in a nursing home here in Laguna Hills, California, and I went to go visit him. When I walked into his room, to my surprise, he had a visitor. A man. Not just any man, but the one that had met with me twice before. A face that I'll always remember. The only problem was that the last time I saw him was 35 to 40 years prior, and he hadn't aged a day. I was older than him. He saw me, pulled his cap down to cover his face, and left without a word. I asked my dad who he was, and he said to me, that's Mr. John. And remember, buy Safe Moon. I can't make heads or tails of it to this day. I was 10 years old. My brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, stuff like that. Anyway, about a mile away from my house, I look out the window and I see an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it. Because a day or so before that, a bunch of kids and I at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it, thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house, and wasn't about to think another thing of it. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally just shrunk before my eyes into a tiny, shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky except it wasn't a star. It was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even farther into the sky, shot down to its original height, and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. When I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling about the end times. My mother said that I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad, because my mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. 
Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me that when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which, by the way, was only a few miles away from our house. They saw an orange football-shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father is skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff, ever. But when I shared my story, he paused and said that it was very odd to have seen the exact same thing behave the exact same way more than 30 years apart. I'll start out by saying that I've seen my fair share of strange things in the skies, but one memory will always stand out amongst the others. I've done the math and I believe it was fall of 2005. I was in sixth grade, outside on the phone with my first boyfriend. I'd say it was between six to eight o'clock Eastern time at night. It was dark outside and only our back porch light was on. I was talking up a storm and I was watching my two dogs roam the backyard. Out of nowhere, it was like somebody turned on a blue light above us, the dogs and I. It was a bright, beautiful electric blue. I immediately looked up and saw what I can best describe as the shape of an eye, but perfectly symmetrical in the same blue color. It was lined with an almost holographic looking light a constantly changing rainbow of colors. I stared for maybe two seconds before it closed up, leaving only the colorful outline. It immediately shot to the left like a shooting star and disappeared. In shock, I told my boyfriend I would call him back and I immediately ran to my parents who were folding clothes in the bedroom. I shouted at them, I just saw aliens. They laughed at first and told me to stop joking, but my father knows my eyes. He saw my panic and quickly changed the subject. I've never forgotten this moment. I can still see it so clearly, even to this day. What did I see? Why did I see it? Can anyone help? On the evening of September 7th, 2006, my friend Jen and I were driving home from a friend's house near to where the Big Air Radio Observatory used to be. It was somewhere around 10 p.m. near the corner of Cheshire Road and Route 23 between Delaware, Ohio and Lewis Center, Ohio. We were driving down Route 23, heading south toward Lewis Center, when Jen saw a bright light very distant in the sky. We both jokingly said, it's probably a UFO. So we keep driving and we eventually lose sight and forget about the distant object in the sky. Then as we're coming over the precipice of a hill, just beyond where the golf course is now, where the telescope once stood there, was an enormous glowing football shaped UFO hanging right above our heads, steadily moving over top of Route 23, heading toward Lewis Center. It was the most frightening and awe-inspiring thing I have ever witnessed. We stopped on the side of the highway and got out of the car. It was the largest thing I've ever seen. I felt like an ant beneath the giant glowing boot. The object looked like it was engulfed in some orangish reddish plasma, almost like what the surface of the sun looks like close up from space. It looked as though it had flames bubbling and churning within it. I tried to take a video with my Motorola Razor, but the phone just would not pick it up at all, even though it had been working just fine and had nearly a full charge. It slowly begins to back away from us a bit, 
and begins floating toward the town of Lewis Center. We follow it back to Lewis Center, where my friends and I watch it for nearly an hour, and eventually it begins to gain altitude in a dizzying display of lights. Then it flashes and blasts it away in the blink of an eye, leaving behind a wispy blue teal vapor trail. I found out later on that the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Delaware, Ohio, was where they had received the WOW signal in 1977. This object took up a large portion of the visible sky as we came upon it. I'm an airman. I have been trained to observe and identify aircraft. I would estimate the object to be the size of an NFL football stadium, just floating above the tree line highway and houses and buildings. The object was witnessed by at least five people other than myself. As it was gaining altitude, glowing bluish purplish orbs began to cascade out of the main shaped object, one after the other. Each time they would appear, they would revolve around the main object, intensify until all I could see was a spinning blue glow around that main football stadium object. And then in the blink of an eye, it shot off into a flash of light in front of it, like the Enterprise going to warp speed leaving only a bluish trailing haze behind. The whole experience was the most profound thing to have ever happened to me in my lifetime up till that point. Thank you for hearing my account of what occurred. This Sunday gone, my girlfriend and I, who live in Adelaide, Australia, had just gone on a dinner date. She is a 26-year-old female and I am a 24-year-old female. We went to her house to drop off her doggy bag. Then we drove back toward my house, southward. About halfway between our houses, I noticed three lights in the sky in a perfect triangle. It was very odd and the lights were fairly obvious in the dark sky, especially because there were also stars visible, so the lights were very visibly different. They were a lot brighter and bigger, though not by much. I pointed it out to her, and immediately she said, holy cow, what the heck is that? At first I thought I might be seeing things, but when she reacted, I knew it wasn't just my eyes playing tricks. We quickly noticed that the lights were moving at about the same speed we were, and had started to flash green and red sporadically. We decided to follow it for as long as we feasibly could. It was a bit of a thrill, if I'm being completely honest, following the mystery lights in the sky, but it also didn't last very long. Maybe five minutes past my house, the lights took a turn, sped up, and just disappeared. We pulled over to see if we could find it again, but we didn't have any luck. We kept talking about how strange and cool the whole thing was. I am telling my story here to see if anyone else has seen something like this or has any ideas of what it could have been besides a UFO. Our first thought was a helicopter, but there's no realistic way for a perfect triangle of lights to come off of that, and they moved way too quickly. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. I can't quite understand this one myself, so maybe you guys can help. This was on the 11th of July, 2019. My boyfriend and I, he's now my husband, were camping in the mountains, very high up. This area is so high up and remote that there is virtually no light pollution, so you can see almost every star in the sky when it's a clear night, like this one was. We were just relaxing, staring at the stars, usual romantic things you do in the mountains, when we started noticing the stars acting very differently. They appeared to zigzag and go upward, almost like they were playing with one another, 
weaving near each other and away again in circular motions. We were just amazed by it all and couldn't take our eyes off the sky. This went on for about two to three solid hours. That wasn't the strangest part though. Where we were camping, there was a clear view of an opening between two other mountains. At around 2 a.m., maybe 3, I noticed this bright light between the two mountains. It was really bright, so I nudged my partner to look over too. We were staring at this massive white-yellow looking star go upward quickly, then noticed it was going toward us. My partner is a man that isn't easily scared, and this really scared him to the point that he nearly broke my nose trying to hide fully in the tent with both of us screaming as this star just stopped right above us. When it was above us, right before we both panicked, it seemed to have a diamond type shape and it was super bright. But that isn't the strangest part. When we were in the tent, the light didn't shine through the tent. This thing didn't make a single noise so it wasn't a drone or anything like that. It was far too big. And what seemed like seconds later, we were both calm looking at the stars again, like nothing happened until sunrise. If both of us hadn't experienced this, if it was just one of us, I could try to make an excuse for it. But we both confirm each other's stories and saw the same exact thing, and I can't explain it. To top it all off, when I'm talking about it, or in this case typing, it feels like I'm lying and my partner feels the same way, like it never happened. It feels like I'm making it up, and the more I try to remember about that night, the more I can't remember. And he feels the same way too. It's like whenever I go to tell my story, something is actively trying to get me to believe that I didn't see what I saw or to stop talking about it. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? Does anyone have some answers? I'd love to know. This happened three to four years ago, and I've been thinking about it recently. It was late one night, around 11.30 p.m., and I was driving home from my job at Sonic. I was taking US Route 64 home, which is a fairly desolate stretch of road, with houses and farmland on either side. I was in my 99 Ford Explorer, and I was just driving along around 65 to 70 miles per hour, with the radio on low volume. As I'm driving, through the sunroof comes a bright green ray of light that envelops the interior of my vehicle. This lasts for about two to three seconds. Then, it disappears without a trace. After that happened, I just sped up and got home as quickly as possible. I was only about five minutes away. That's really about all there was to it, but I was really freaked out. I have pondered and pondered, but I have no clue what that could have been. I wasn't tired because I woke up at around five or six that day, and I have no history of any illnesses that could have caused this. I wasn't on any medications. I've told a few people, and I don't think that they believe I'm lying. I've never been the kind to lie about that kind of thing, but no one can give me a solid answer either. Some have said maybe it was a laser, but I don't think there's any way a laser could completely cover my vehicle in green light like that. There was a farm that I was passing by, but it wasn't lit and there were no street lights. I have no idea what it was that I encountered. This isn't my story, but it's something that happened to my parents just a bit ago. They live in Western New York, upstate, 
and are really open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens for reasons other than this encounter, but that's a story for another day. It might be a good time to add here that my parents do not use drugs or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition go. I'm going to copy and paste a message that my mom sent me and just read it for you, if that's okay. I just figured I'd put some feelers out there and see if anybody else has experienced something similar or has any sort of explanation. Quote, Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a freaking UFO or something. Between Randolph and Steenberg, there was this huge, really bright light blinking on and off in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that is not a falling star. And even though I thought that it might have been a plane, I knew that it was too bright and going too fast to be one. Plus, as far as I know, planes don't make a habit of going straight down. Then all of a sudden, it was gone, like mid-sky. And I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or into the trees. So right then I said, did you see that? And dad goes, what the F was that? He said that he was thinking the same things that I was. And at the same time, we both noticed there are no hills. There is no mountain. There's nothing for this thing to go behind. It was just cornfields and open space. This thing just disappeared. Next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky, and it shot directly upward, back up into the sky. I was looking out my rearview mirror, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around. But the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad was turned around watching it, and it started following us. We had that same eerie feeling we had when we saw the Bigfoot that one time, and we were saying, what the F is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. They have no idea what it was that they experienced. And yes, they do also have a Bigfoot sighting, but that's a story for another day as well. Either way, they've been trying to figure out what in the world they saw. So I thought I'd share their story and see if anybody else had any ideas. My mom is very religious and no nonsense. She grew up brethren, which is basically an old form of Baptist that doesn't really exist anymore. Despite her upbringing, she's always been interested in aliens. I think it's because her dad also had an obsession with them, but I don't know why. Maybe he saw something during his trucking and military days. As a kid, I always caught my mom watching those alien and UFO shows. She really wanted to see a UFO for herself. One night, she was traveling down the Appalachian Mountains in Western North Carolina, coming from a festival in Eastern Tennessee. It was fall, so the leaves were beginning to become bare and you could see through them. She was driving along with my sister and my grandmother when she sees what looks like three to five lights in a circular shape. It's getting really close. My sister and grandmother notice it too. Soon it appears to be behind them, very low to the ground. My mom opens the sunroof and windows, but there's not a sound coming from anywhere. Then, something my mom describes as an opaque white column comes down onto the road behind her car and is following. Like, the distance between the white column and the car never changes. My mom went from curious to freaked and guns it. I think the total time it followed was probably less than a minute. Eventually, it went away without a trace. When my mom finally got home that night and told me about it, I thought she would be excited, but it nearly scared her to death. 
She said she had always wanted to see a UFO, but that once she did, the experience left her terrified. I remember she complained about being unable to sleep for the next few nights. This was 10 or so years ago, but she still doesn't seem to talk about aliens with such frequency anymore. Back in 2011, on a family vacation in Jamaica, my siblings and I were sitting on the beach stargazing. That is, until we noticed this one point of light that was moving unnaturally and without sound. It had the brightest color, and it looked kind of like a dim star, except that it was moving in circular and figure eight type patterns. For perspective, the patterns were no bigger in diameter than the Little Dipper's cup. It was moving with the pattern and speed reminiscent of when one uses a laser pointer to get a cat's attention. 15 to 20 minutes after noticing it, it just faded away. Could this have been a weather balloon? It definitely wasn't a plane, a helicopter, or a satellite. At least none like the ones I've ever seen. I'm trying to find images of weather balloons from the ground at night, but every image is too close up or simply doesn't look at all like what I saw. In my life, I think I have seen a UFO twice I just want to know what everybody thinks. Number one, I was 14 and I was in Spain. I was looking up at the night sky when suddenly this kind of round thing flew low overhead. From what I remember, it was round with yellow and small white lights around the underside. It was really odd. I remember seeing it, but my family says it never happened, but I know what I saw. Number two, this one originally looked like a star sitting outside the back of our house one night we were all looking up and we saw this star moving across the sky. We were all like, oh look, a satellite. We were tracking it going west. But then things got strange. It stopped and started going west. You might say, oh, well, perhaps it was a plane. Planes don't move like that. It stopped again, then went north, and then it just disappeared, just blinked out. Did I see a UFO? A few years ago, I temporarily lived in a cabin out in the woods with my friend due to some unexpected life circumstances. One night, we had another friend over and all three of us had a smoke session in the backyard at about 3 a.m. That was when we started to hear a strange noise in the woods. It kind of sounded like a humming engine coming closer to us. Suddenly, my friend shouts in confusion as he explains that he briefly got blinded by a distant light. A few seconds later, my other friend notices a flying object near the treetops, about 40 meters away. When he points out that the object is see-through and that you can actually see the outlines of the treetops behind it, we are all just stunned and we just look in awe, in complete silence, until the object spirals away super fast up toward the sky in a manner that is certainly not possible with any known technology we have. Then it disappeared. We rushed inside, and my friend had the brilliant idea to have everybody draw what they had seen simultaneously without looking at each other's to confirm what we saw. We all showed our pictures at the same time, and we all drew the exact same thing. We kicked ourselves over not recording the event for proof, but later realized that all of us had left our phones inside while going out to smoke. 
We joked about the light scanning us to see if we had any recording devices on us. We all went to bed, with both of them sleeping upstairs, and with myself being downstairs, alone. As I lay down, pondering over the experience and feeling a bit uneasy, I suddenly see two orbs floating around the room. One was red, and one was blue. I get a bit freaked out and pretend to be asleep while I watch these orbs float around for about five minutes, then they disappeared. Eventually, I fell asleep, and when I woke up the next day, I was eager to share my experience. They informed me that when they woke up and went outside, the door handle crumbled in their hands, like all of the components of the door handle had been dismantled. It was a very surreal experience overall. Aliens, advanced technology not known to the public, I don't know, but it certainly gives me this childlike hope that there's more to this life than the dull reality we live in. So, recently, I've been having really weird things happen at my house. Not only somewhat ghost-related, but also UFO sightings at the same time. I just wanted to tell a couple of stories about my first ever UFO encounter. So, I was lying in bed. It was around 11.30 at night, and I'm leaning to the side of the patio door from my bedroom. I'm thinking for a while, when I look through the blinds to see what looked to be a glowing object hovering above my neighbor's house. On the rim of this craft, there seemed to be a color-changing rainbow, and then a few lights around it, blinking. My neighbor has this really rich friend that sometimes comes to visit in his helicopter, and that's what I thought it was at first, but I swear there was absolutely no sound. I also suspected that maybe it could be a star that flashes, but it was way too close. If it was a drone, it would have made some sound, especially that close. I was amazed at this craft, and I didn't know what to think. Once I got back in bed, I heard what sounded like a plane circling my house. I didn't see it, but I heard it. I thought it could be a plane, but it sounded almost fake. I'm guessing if it was the UFO, they were trying to mask the sound of it or make themselves appear like something normal. When I took a look back at my neighbor's property, the craft was gone. Another story happened about the same time that I saw this other thing. Again, it was around 11.30 at night. And again, I was lying in bed, looking out the window and just sort of daydreaming. Again, I could see a light. It was glowing really white and almost pulsating. I didn't want to go see what it was, in fear that it could be ETs. From these experiences, I've decided to see what it is and investigate it. I really want to go confront them. I really want to go see what they are. outside of Melbourne, Australia. This is the crazy experience that I just had recently. I was outside on my deck having a smoke, and I looked up at the sky. Suddenly, two stars appeared directly on top of each other, evenly spaced. Then a third star appeared directly under the second star, again evenly spaced. Another star appeared blinking and moving toward the first star, then went down toward the second, then down to the third, and then away. It was moving very slowly, and each star was blinking in a pattern. I called my partner outside to verify what I saw, and he confirmed that I wasn't crazy, and witnessed the moving stars slowly move in patterns that normal craft or satellites couldn't move in. It was going up and down and away and then back, at a consistent slow speed. Something clearly had control over it. It was remarkable. 
We checked again a little bit later and all three stars were gone. I chatted to my housemate about it. Sadly, he was in his room at the time and didn't witness it. He said that my friend and her partner that live about 15 minutes away witnessed the exact same thing months ago. I called my friend and she confirmed that they saw the exact same thing and then her partner confirmed it as well. They even confirmed the direction they had seen it in from local landmarks and buildings, which completely matched the direction that we had seen it in. So four people have witnessed something similar in a space of like three months in our small town. Super weird. Back when I was a child, I had a weird UFO experience. My dad had bought a new Ford truck after his beloved Bronco had to go. We went on a visit to my grandma's place on the reservation. We picked her up and we all went fishing together and had a really nice picnic. I remember that I had this really cool Disney swimming pool. Anyway, we were all driving home when this huge aircraft of some kind appeared on the way to San Carlos, Arizona. It was not on some secluded dirt or back road. It was on Interstate 70, between Globe and Paradox. It was huge. It was like the size of a Zeppelin. It had lights all along its length, which flashed blue, red, yellow, and green in about one second. We were stunned. It sat there for quite a long time in one spot, we passed an ambulance coming the other way, and also a police officer, who pulled over in our lane looking up at this thing. I was very young, but I was there with my parents and my grandma. My grandma has since passed on, but my parents still remember it. My mom calls the lights on the side of the UFO windows, but to me they just looked like a row of extremely bright lights. It stayed stationary for a long while before suddenly moving south to the top of Mount Turnbull. Then it went straight upwards and disappeared into the sky. The moon was out and the only clouds were above the summit. I think about this experience from time to time and sometimes I doubt myself as to whether or not any of it happened. But there were three adults in the truck who saw it and the police officer on the side of the road too. I wish I could find the other people who saw it and ask if they remember it too. I'm going to try to make this short by stating just the simple facts of what I witnessed during two separate incidents. Incident number one. This is going back to the late summer of either 1989 or 1990. I was at work with two co-workers near Rhinebeck, New York. One of my co-workers was outside smoking when he called to me and another co-worker to come outside and see something. When we exited the front door, we saw the classic V-shaped craft hovering above a tree in the front yard. It was directly above the tree, which was just about the height of the building, two stories, so maybe 30 feet. I ran up to the tree, which put the craft those same 30 feet above me. It had five to seven white lights, with the largest at the bottom center of the V, with the others running up from it. It made no noise, and even though whatever it was blocked out the sky, I couldn't make out a structure or body. It very slowly and silently started heading across the street and over a hill. My two co-workers went inside, but I remained in case it came back. It did. When it reappeared from behind the hill, the shape had changed. The lights were now in a straight line and were more of an orange color. It headed back toward my location changing shape as it moved. The light formations just kept shifting. It took on the shape of a diamond, then an X, 
then back to a V before it moved directly over the building. It kept going in that direction and then headed south and out of sight. Incident number two. I was at home. Having recently moved into a new apartment, things weren't all organized and my new bed had not arrived, so I fell asleep on the floor. I should also mention here that I am an incredibly heavy sleeper. During the night, I woke up from a sound sleep and sat straight up. This was something that I had never done. Anyway, the corner of the room was lit up with what looked like dozens of very pale, multicolored lights. Staring at them, I noticed a shadow of a figure out of the corner of my right eye. It looked as though it was moving closer, and then, well, that's all I remember. The next day I woke up not immediately remembering what I had seen. All of the clocks in the house were either stopped at or flashing at 3 a.m. Even the VCR flashed that time and was also playing even though there was no tape in it. I had to unplug everything that had an electronic clock in the apartment in order to reset and fix things. It wasn't until I was doing that that I remembered what had taken place. I've been told that I should try hypnosis regarding the second incident, but I'm not really sure that I trust the practice. One of my friends is actually a licensed hypnotherapist, or whatever you call them, but I still don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I want to know. I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding. Stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening, but it's fine. Nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far, and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer, and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking, as it's all they could do. They keep going, and sure enough, up ahead, down the road, there's a parked car. The same as before. This time, they are tripping out, and they run up to it, and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods, and leaves it on the hood of the car saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved. 
They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther, and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. And I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened that I wish I could describe more about how it looked. But she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird, too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently, it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines, and we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live in the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference that people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug-in for my laptop there. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30 and perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just us at the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window, when suddenly I see this bright light just over the fields. It's multicolored, and it kind of blooms, growing larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough in late March, in the middle of the lockdown. Except it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, 
But if I had to guess, I'd say that it was two acres or more away and larger than a family car, hanging maybe 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually, it faded and disappeared again, not behaving anything like a firework and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later, I glanced out again and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment I looked at it. This light was maybe a third of the size of the original and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Bally Money Town firework display is much further away and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we'd have heard it. A drone still strikes me as most likely. We wouldn't have heard it inside the house. And I guess it might have been rigged with powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful. So I don't know. I've never ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime. And I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think maybe I saw a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media though, and I haven't seen anything since, so who knows? Tonight, August 4th of 2019, at around 10.15, my aunt and I were on the porch when my aunt saw something in the sky. It was like an outline of a circle, and part of it was gone, kind of like how an eclipsed moon would look at first. We noted that this was not where the moon usually is. Usually it's behind our house. So eclipse and moon were ruled out. The thing was bright yellow, and had an orange-red tint to it. It almost looked like a fireball. It's night, and the sun is on the other side of the planet at this minute, so wasn't that either. We thought it was a shooting star at first, but it wasn't moving anywhere. It started, like, flattening out, like spreading. Then it started to shrink into a smaller form and kind of looked like a star. Then all of a sudden, it disappeared. A few minutes later, it suddenly reappeared and got bigger and bigger. It looked as if the moon would have been over the sun and coming off of it, moving toward the way it came in the first time. The light around it kind of spread out again. Then suddenly, it started getting smaller, like the dark part of the eclipse was going back over. Then it split into two and completely disappeared. We waited to see if it would come back but it didn't come back for the third time. I started doing some research and found nothing for solar or lunar eclipses that described what we saw. No meteor showers, no eclipses even happened in our area, no comets, nothing of the sort for that night. After doing some more searching, two other people saw almost the same thing three days ago around the same time. My aunt stepped back outside and called me over, fast. There was what looked to be a pretty low plane flying with two large wings. My aunt says it looked like it had four wings, two on either side, and I'm telling you this thing was big. One side was bright red and the other was bright green. Planes in our area normally have a small light that flickers on both sides. It wasn't like this at all. This plane was coming from the same area that we had seen these mystery light things in. And when the plane got behind our house, I ran to look at it and I couldn't see it at all. It was big, like I said. It shouldn't have been out of view already. My aunt and I have been trying to come up with a logical explanation, but nothing makes any sense. I don't want to claim aliens, but I don't know what else it could have been.
I will start by saying I was a devout skeptic before this experience. It has changed me. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and my family and I had some old family friends over at our house. We'd been hanging out nearly all day, and it was getting to be around the time of sunset. My friend and I, who I'll refer to as Adam, went on a walk to the ponds in my neighborhood and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we begin the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky, which appeared to be moving. I tell Adam this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watch the star for roughly five minutes, when we notice two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. Adam pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see, sadly. Nearly immediately after Adam had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars, and formed a large triangle. These lights then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping, then proceeded to move at a speed which I've never seen before, away from each other, and disappeared into the night. Based on the reactions of people back at the house, both Adam and I were visibly shaken up. When we tried to explain what had happened, they shrugged it off, as us just not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, and so does Adam. Green Cove Springs has a history of military and government establishments and compounds, none of which are currently active. However, there is a significant amount of military infrastructure still in use as housing and places of business. It makes me wonder if this had something to do with some sort of test flight. Either way, we saw what we saw, even if we don't know what it is. Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around 7 or 8 at night. My father picked me up at the airport, and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color and had, well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of like ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white, all at the same time. And yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam. And when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which, if you've ever driven down I-95, is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, 
while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side, where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect, I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving, and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split for a few moments, it kept pace with the car. Then each half, while still on its side, shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. Ever since I was 13 in 2008, I've developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I've grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m., and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular-shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge, and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times, and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences, but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. I saw a UFO, and I just want to know if there's some kind of explanation for what I saw. I didn't have my phone with me, so I don't have any evidence. But, I did see a UFO. At first I thought it was a glare, but the moon was behind me and I was seeing Orion's belt and some other stars in front of me. The first one I saw was on the left. Then I realized it was moving in one direction, so it couldn't be a glare. It was going northward. I also don't think that it was a plane because of the lockdown. Planes weren't really allowed to fly, and if they were it was really limited. I definitely know what a plane looks and sounds like, and this was not it. The thing that I saw was just silently cruising in the sky. Seconds later, I saw one to the right. I saw small dots emitting light. It was as small as what stars look like at night, but they weren't twinkling, and the lighted dots were aligned in a constant position. I also saw that it changed its angle a bit, after I saw the lighted dots. I asked myself if they could have been birds, migrating or passing by, because sometimes flocks of birds fly in a V-shape, but that doesn't explain the glow. I'm not sure how high it was exactly in the sky, but it was definitely in the zone where a plane might fly, but it was way too big to be a plane. It was cruising for a good few seconds until it literally just vanished. Would there be any other explanation? Is that what a stealth bomber looks like at night? 
It was definitely a UFO because it was an object flying in the sky and I didn't know what it was. So it was an unidentified flying object. I just want to know if it was alien or not. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it, and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break, then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four-pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say om. I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way. And it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. It was just an odd encounter. So I'm currently 16 and this happened when I was three. I'm from New Zealand. We have this RNZAF Air Force base called Ohakia. Apparently, a lot of really mysterious things happen around Air Force bases, so I'm not sure if this is common or what. But it may be 2.30 in the morning. My dad and mom and I are in the car driving back from Wellington. I have family there. And we're maybe 10 seconds past the base of this tree. Well, it's a tree-like thing those big, tall, bush tree things that farms use for privacy. All of a sudden, there's a light slowly moving along the tree line. My dad thought it could have been a farmer out trimming hedges, but my mom says, not at nearly three in the morning. So we pull off to this rest area and watch this light. It's completely stopped moving and it's just spinning when another light joins it and spins in a counterclockwise triangle. Maybe two minutes later, another comes from literally thin air and joins the triangle, now having three points, and they just spin and spin and spin. 
Then they stop. Then they start again. After about five minutes, which seems like 10 years, they stop again and stay still for maybe five seconds. Then one flies straight up into the sky and disappears at warp speed. The other two lights just keep spinning when another flies off to the right and disappears. So now it's back to just one light spinning, it starts to move along the tree line again, and then it just flies off to the left and disappears also, never to be seen again. All this started and ended within 15 minutes. After that, we just drove back, but we're all looking around, amazed and terrified. To this day, we've never seen anything else like it. It started on my commute home from work. I got about halfway through the 20 minute walk and at roughly 10.10, I saw these two flying objects that were blinking red and white. I didn't think much of it being as I live near an airport. That is, until I saw them fly toward each other, hover for a moment, and then depart in opposite directions. It's something that I've never seen drones or planes do before, and it got me really suspicious. I began following one of them, and it kept variating between moving very quickly, slowing down, and hovering in midair. I kept on the trail of that one up until I saw two more on the opposite end of the horizon. I began chasing them down, one by one, trying to get videos and keeping notes on what I'd seen. The main thing that spooked me, aside from the weird movements, was the oblong shape of them. They were just far enough visually that I could only really see the shape through the horizontal row of blinking lights, of which there were three on each flying object. Each one would blink the same pattern, the red lights flashing one after another, and then a white flash at the end, occurring uniformly every few seconds. I only saw them do bizarre movements a handful of times, otherwise I was just chasing them as they sped by. There were at least five of them throughout my entire voyage, all around the town. I would truly love to believe that they were just regular aircraft, but every single thing about them was weird. I took a couple of videos, but they didn't really come out. My camera can't shoot that well in the dark. If anybody can point me in the direction of what these things might be, or what the light patterns might mean, or really anything at all, let me know. It's been haunting me all night. An Aswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unborn baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning that during the day, they could literally be anyone. This happened in Metro Manila in around 2011. My cousin told me the old man with the new neighbors asked me if he were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? She said the neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines, where witchcraft and aswans are still the norm. They were friendly enough though, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumors that they knew about Osman. When I was about eight months along, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps. Stop right above me. I was never a prayerful person, 
But at that moment, I called on gods and saints and angels and anything to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Aswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited. Seconds, minutes, but then we heard another jump and silence. Until this very day, I'm glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe that it happened and that it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Was he really an Aswang? Something weird and mysterious and unfinished, I suppose, but all's well that ends well, right? In 2014, my grandmother turned 86. She lives in Vietnam, and we live in Canada, but we decided that that should be the year we finally visited. It was my first time visiting my ancestral homeland. We've never really been able to afford a family trip to Vietnam before, but my mom convinced my dad, since she hadn't seen my grandmother, her mom, since 2006 when she visited us in Canada. We bought tickets in April and scheduled for August. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away in June. It sucked. Hard. Anyway, the Vietnamese have this superstition that for 49 days after someone dies, their spirit is still hanging around our mortal plane, waiting to be judged or reincarnated or whatever. So maybe three weeks after she died, one of my aunts was just tending to her market stall per usual. This frail old woman, most likely homeless, suddenly walks up to the stall. She starts talking to my aunt, saying something along the lines of, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I didn't want to leave you all so early. Speaking distinctly in a maternal tone, almost on the verge of tears. It was pretty shocking and unexpected, obviously. Right after she said that, the old woman's whole body shook. A couple of seconds later, this lady regained her senses, looked around kind of confused, and walked off. My aunt told us this when we visited in August, and I couldn't sleep that night, so thanks for that, auntie. They also believe that my grandmother chose to speak to my aunt through the old woman, because frail, weak people close to death themselves are believed to be easier to take control of. That's about all I know about that, but I thought I'd share. My family has experienced paranormal activity. We were living abroad in Southeast Asia, where spirituality is an integral part of life. We moved into a building on a hill overlooking the jungle when I was three, in an affluent neighborhood of the country's capital city. The building had many apartments and one big house at the bottom of the hill, which is where we lived. When I was five, we were hosting a dinner party, when all of a sudden we hear a bang. A guest bathroom, with doors on opposite sides of the room, had shut and locked itself on both sides. My dad had to use a screwdriver to open the lock, and there was nobody and nothing to be found inside. Creepy, right? It gets worse. My auntie came to visit shortly after, and she claimed to see an old woman every night wandering the top floor of the house. An entity my mom told me a few weeks ago she would often see when we lived there. The spirits were not malevolent, but seemed disturbed apparently. Before we left, we got a monk to come and check the place out. He said that the building had been constructed on top of an old Buddhist burial site, something that is not usually allowed and the spirits were not able to rest peacefully. 
Furthermore, he indicated that the banana tree outside of our kitchen was a hub for spirits to hang out. My parents confronted the landlord, who confirmed that the place was haunted. I'm not very spiritual at the moment, but some odd stuff has happened. My parents now always practice feng shui in our house. We moved back to said country a few years later, and we went to visit the place. I was 12 at the time. Sure enough, the building was completely abandoned and the landlord had put it up for sale. I live in England in a two-story flat, and I've always believed in the paranormal. But my dad does not believe in any type of ghost or anything paranormal. I never thought that this flat was haunted. However, as I got older, I started to feel uncomfortable by myself, and I would see shadows downstairs out of the corner of my eye. Now, there is an attic directly above our second floor but there's no way for us to enter it, as you can't access it from the flat. The only way to access this attic is by having a specific key that can open the attic, as it is Council Flats, which is above all my neighbor's house. However, the attic above my flat is the one which is blocked off, and there's no way to enter it. I have the last flat on the end of these 18 Council Flats. There are no neighbors above us just the attic that nobody can access without that key, and they still wouldn't be able to get above our flat. One night, about two years ago, all of the family was in bed. It was about three o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, I heard something crash above us. It was so loud that it woke the entire family up, and we all got up and stood on the landing together. After the bang, we heard three loud footsteps, and the sound of something being dragged behind those footsteps. It was so scary, especially since we knew that nobody could physically get up there. My dad was not convinced that it was a ghost. He thought that somebody, somehow, had gotten up into that attic. So he went outside to check to see if the communal attic door was opened. I followed him outside, and it was completely padlocked shut, with heavy chains around the lock. I tried to explain to him, how can there be anyone up in our part of the attic when it's blocked off and impossible to get to? We came back into the house and we were all pretty shaken up. My brother was quite young and was able to get back to sleep, but I was awake all night and found it very difficult to sleep. After this experience, I started to smell old cigarette smell every time I would enter the toilet area. It smelt so old and gross. After the event, my brother, my mom, and I were going away on holiday whilst my dad had to stay there and work. He told me that he slept with headphones on every night, as even he felt uncomfortable by himself. I have no idea what those noises were. As a family, we still can't figure it out. And ever since then, we've heard many more strange noises. I've been hearing knocks coming from the attic and from the walls for a while now. Recently, they've been happening coincidentally right under me. I'll move to one area and it will happen there. And then, on a separate occasion, I'll be in an entirely different room and still, it will knock above me or below me. I've had a history of sleep deprivation, anxiety, and depression. I've heard my name whispered in my ear, and something whisper, help me. It sounded like some kind of zombie. Recently, I've been having terrifying hallucinations. As I'm about to cross into the first stage of sleep, I always feel or hear something that wakes me up immediately, back and forth from being awake to the entering of the first stage of sleep. 
I feel something tug at my pillow and the mattress moving as if somebody's trying to lift it. Eventually, I figured all of this was a hallucination for multiple reasons. I've recorded when I felt something push the pillow behind me and there's nothing there. On other occasions, I have felt tremors caused by my body and shaking that felt exactly like what I thought something else was causing. But the noises and seeing things move on their own has been happening for a while now, way before my hallucinations. And those happened out of nowhere. I usually only have motion hallucinations, rather than seeing or hearing things. The knocking is really freaking me out. Could it be possible that I'm hallucinating all of this? Or is it actually real? Either way, it doesn't matter. I've told my parents about the experiences I've had, but they keep denying that it's real. I'm tired of living in fear. If anybody has any idea how to ignore it or get rid of it, I'd love to know. I have an attic in my house, and ever since I was young, I hated going up there. It was dark, as there was no light up there, and it was always absolutely freezing. It had a really bad energy, and my anxiety would skyrocket whenever I had to go up there with my dad. It felt like someone had set a timer, and time was running out, if that makes sense. Like I had to get out of there as soon as possible or something really bad would happen. In 2016, my parents decided to convert the attic and make it their bedroom. After this happened, I noticed a lot of unexplainable things going on. The first. One day, I was off school, and I was home alone. I was lying on my bed watching the Jeremy Kyle show, with both of my cats on the bed with me. Then I heard what sounded like somebody walking down the stairs from the attic. It's a very distinct sound, and I knew what it was. I paused the video and listened. I didn't hear anything, so I continued watching, now a little on edge. Two minutes later, I heard the footsteps again. My cat's ears perked up, and both of them were staring at my door. Peanut, my cat, started hissing and meowing and went to the end of my bed to hide. At this point, I was tearing up. I somehow managed to get out of bed and pull my drawers in front of the door. I sat in front of the door and called my dad, sobbing. I explained to him what was happening, and he said to get out of my room and look. Hell no. I begged him to call my neighbors to come in and get me. It was only after I called my dad five times he kept hanging up on me, that he finally called my neighbors. When my neighbors came in, they have a key, I flew down the stairs sobbing and shaking. My neighbor checked the entire house, but nobody was there. I didn't feel safe staying home for weeks after this. The second. My best friend and I would hang out after school at my house most days, and whenever we did, we would always hear noises from upstairs. One time, in particular, we were in the kitchen making noodles, and we heard banging upstairs. I assumed it was my cat and didn't think anything of it. My friend then shushed me and told me to listen. From upstairs, I could hear the sound of someone opening and closing a chest of drawers, and slamming my wardrobe doors. Now, my cats are loud and clever, but how does a cat open a drawer? It's a very distinct sound. So we ended up waiting in my back garden, holding a paint scraper and a knife until my dad came home. The third. This is by far one of the scariest stories. My dad, my sister, and I were all home. My dad called up the stairs to me and said he was going to the shops. Once he left, I went downstairs to grab some food. I asked my sister if she wanted anything to eat and she said yes. She was in the front room, so I was talking to her from the kitchen. My dad knocked on the door, and I yelled at her to get it. She didn't. 
I went to get the door, telling her off for being lazy. When I opened the door, in came my dad and my sister. After months of noises, banging, hearing people talking and walking around when I was home alone, I was sick of it. I felt anxious to be in my own home, and I had other things to worry about. So one day, I decided to try to talk to whatever it was that was in that house. I didn't use a Ouija board or anything like that. I just sat on my stairs and had a chat, I guess. I told them that I respected that they were in this house before, but that they were scaring me and stressing me out. I asked if they would be able to leave, or at the very least, to stop scaring me. After this, I've never had anything happen in my house. No banging, no noises, nothing. I can't definitively say that what I experienced was paranormal in nature, but here goes. When I was a kid, I lived in a one-story house that had a very small space that you could consider an attic. We didn't keep anything up there because it was so small. I don't even know where the entrance to it was, if there was one at all. But, and this started right when we moved in, after we'd go to bed, I would start hearing footsteps up there. I lived with my grandparents, by the way. I knew they were footsteps because they would move in a rhythm and go from one end of the house to the other. I lived in that house from when I was 8 to 12 years old and this happened every single night. I repeatedly tried telling my grandparents about this, but they always said it was just the house settling. I was never able to go to sleep or sleep very well as a kid. So while my grandparents would be asleep as soon as 8 p.m. fell, I'd be laying awake in bed, staring at the ceiling. It was always the most terrifying when the footsteps stopped right above me, like right over my bed. And then in a few seconds to minutes, they'd walk back to some other location up there. Nobody ever believed me that this was happening. My granddad had even found holes that had apparently been drilled in several of the walls one in the bathroom. He wrote it off as a previous owner running cables through the walls. I lived in that house for like four years, and I was convinced that someone was living in the ceiling above us, and would become active when they thought we'd gone to sleep. I will never forget that stuff. It always happened at the same time of night, too, right after we went to bed. And this was back in the late 90s to early 2000s, so I don't know if there could have been cameras or something that they could have been watching us on, but they definitely knew when we went to sleep. To this day, I'm still convinced that somebody was up there. Paranormal? I don't know. It's worth mentioning that one of the previous owner's kids did die in the house. They had a wolf-dog hybrid as a pet that mauled him in the living room. Anyway, I thought I'd share because literally nobody believed me, ever, to this day. But I know footsteps from houses settling, and these were footsteps. This would go on to the wee hours of the night, and I'd usually fall asleep when the footsteps had finally gone off to a different part of the house. I would like to preface this story by saying that I don't believe in the paranormal, but I can find no reasonable explanation as to what is causing this. Hopefully somebody is able to offer some idea of what it could be. Before my parents bought our house, the entryway to the attic used to be in what is now my closet. It got sealed up with a board and there's no way to get in there now through my room. Instead. You have to use stairs that you can bring down in the hallway to get up there. So there shouldn't be anything in my closet, or in the area above my closet in the attic. Yet I can hear the distinctive sound of something scratching in there. I looked through the closet and it's not at all big. You can barely fit two people inside of it. And I can't figure out what's making that noise. 
The only way into the attic is through the stairs, and the stairs, like I said, are in the hallway outside of my door. I would have to have heard them being brought down, and I never do. Also, the attic is pretty much filled with insulation, making it virtually impossible to walk around up there. So what the hell's making that noise? I have no idea how an animal could get up there either, since it's basically blocked off from the rest of the house and nobody's been up there in years. The noise is very loud and it keeps me awake. I can hear it even when I have headphones on with the volume all the way up. It honest to god sounds like something is trying to get out of the attic. Edit. We finally had exterminators come, and there were no evidence of rodents or anything else for that matter. I haven't been at that house in a month because I've been at my mom's, so I can't say whether or not the scratching has continued. This is unrelated, but maybe relevant. The fan in my room is disconnected from power. The circuit that powers it is an open circuit, so no electricity should go to the fan. The motor in the fan is broken as well, so it shouldn't be able to turn on. Yet sometimes at night, it will. There's no way to turn it off but to wait for it to stop on its own. I've also caught this happening with the kitchen fan, which can only be turned on with a remote that has no batteries in it. For a brief time in my childhood, we lived in a redone train station in Buttcrack, New Hampshire. Small town with like 400 people in it, but still a few things to do, and a decent amount of wealth. So the bottom floor of this building is a super popular local sub and pizza shop. We lived right over them. I was nine at the time, and my bedroom had a very old, decrepit door. Cliché, I know, but it really was like rotting wood. That door had stairs behind it that led to the attic. The whole attic was pretty run down, as if they had just never redone that part. Old, creaky, some weird smells, all that. I got terrible vibes from the attic. I was terrified to be in my room alone. I was nine, so I could have just been paranoid because I was interested in paranormal things at the time. We lived there for one year. I heard voices of people I knew, knocks on the door from the attic side, and the door would frequently slam itself open. I eventually asked my mom to install a heavy lock on it because it scared me so badly. We got the padlock, not anything crazy, but it was the same kind that you would put on a locker. Now that I had that, the door would just shake and shake, like someone was stuck in there and desperately trying to get out. That continued for a few months with no escalation, just the door seeming to be alive. Our kitty had found a way to sneak up to the attic and back through a rotted part of the door. One day we hadn't seen her for a while, so we checked up there. We found my cat dead in the corner of the attic. We thought it was maybe rat poison that we didn't know was up there, but the vet didn't find any sign of poison in her and said it was old age, but she was only five. I guess it's possible that my mom didn't want to spend more money trying to find out why the kitty died and lied to me, but who knows. Things got a lot worse after that night that we found our cat. I started to hear my mom up there a lot, and I would just assume that she was up there cleaning. She would just say pretty normal things someone would say talking to herself, and it was definitely her voice. And sometimes she would ask me stuff, like if I wanted anything at the store, or what I felt like for dinner, if I was going anywhere this weekend, things like that. Things she asked me pretty regularly. It was loud and clear and no different at all from her normal speech. And then I would answer the questions and get no reply. So I'd go up there and see that she wasn't up there. And sometimes she wasn't even home. I stopped checking after a while and I stopped replying too. My mom heard it herself twice, said she was cleaning my room and she heard someone in the attic. The first time she assumed it was just someone down in the pizza shop and there were weird acoustics. But the second time, it said my name in her voice and said, I'm back from the store, come help put stuff away. 
That's when my mom got scared, because obviously she knew it wasn't her, and that's when she finally believed me. It was like a recording of her talking. After we became more aware of it, it just stopped, but there was one more time that we felt it. My mother was cleaning in my room, and I heard her yell, No! And then she had a seizure, and I called my friend who called the cops. I moved out soon after. Still the weirdest and really the only undeniable experience I've ever had to this day. Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now, I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As someone who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There've been so many dreams about it, but a few stick out in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door to see an arm dangling from the opening into the attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't, because obviously, but I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream is that I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that it's threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive and I get my family out of there, and I go back to confront the thing. I see it, for the first time in all the dreams I had. It looked like a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again, just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. Wrong. It slowly reached down and pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up, it grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and begins to choke me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst when it finally let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one, or if it was the last, but I know it's been at least six months since I've had a dream about it. I'm very uneasy around attics now, and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind. If this thing is not my subconscious and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before. My hope is that my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me and left forever. This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt roads. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off, the paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of shit now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after I stared out at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside. So I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, 
like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around, just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but I couldn't figure out why she was staring at me like that. Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off. She was gone, just like that. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room, watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King movies or any movie my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way and that's why we clicked so much. But back to the story. Kat and I were sitting here watching this movie and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped, giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not even seconds after the first time. Now, I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how the hell this door is opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is her mom, who, I had figured out earlier, was just a tad bit creepy. You think it's just your mom? I asked her, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again. But then she said something that gave me chills, and still gives me chills thinking about it now. My mom isn't home, it's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her while she was staring at me, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend they've never met in a two-story house? Well, where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was trying to trick me. She is at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her and she notices the look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. If your mom is at work, then who was the lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time. But thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot. Above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing up, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling, and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I look over at her, and I can truly see the fear on her face. The footsteps stopped and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking, over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no younger brothers or sisters, and we're completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house, just grab her and run out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back to reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them in the attic and then hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty, and no one found them for months afterwards. It was this house. My heart started to pound and my eyes were wide with fear. I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them. The little kids, every day. But I've never seen the lady. You have, though. Earlier. After she told me this, 
I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside the house. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like it was in knots, like I'd walked into a horror movie myself, and I just wished the entire day had never happened. Fast forward years later. That day was the last day I had seen or heard from Cat. I remember her always coming to play outside my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public, though. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. So why not her? I've driven by that house maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe, just maybe, she was one of the kids that never made it out. This is the first time I think I've encountered something related to paranormal activity, but if anyone can help me understand what this might have been, please tell me. I live in a duplex with my roommate and friend who goes to college with me. The duplex isn't that big, and neither is the attic. It's small enough to where an average-sized person would have trouble even crawling through it. I also have one camera on the front window and one on the back. A few days ago, I had suddenly been awoken at about 4.30 a.m. when I checked my phone. I usually wake up at around 7 to 8 so I can get to work on time. At first, I didn't really understand why I was awake, so I decided to just try and fall asleep again. But after a few seconds, I heard what sounded like very loud footsteps walking above me. I was too afraid to get out of bed, so I just laid there. My first thought was that it must have been an illusion, but now I know this isn't true. When I suddenly woke up a few hours later, I went out to eat breakfast with my roommate. We asked how each other's sleep had been, and I decided to bring up the fact that I had heard something at around 4.30. He responded by saying that he had heard something at exactly 4.34 a.m. At this point, we were both a little freaked out, so we decided to open the hatch to the attic. But, like I said before, there was no way that anybody could fit up there. It's just too small. We decided to have a look at the camera footage, but there were no signs of any motion out of the ordinary. Nothing besides leaves blowing around. Our only thought was that someone had come from one of the sides of the houses and climbed to the top of the roof. I asked my neighbors if they had seen anything, and they said no, so that kind of eliminated one side. But I also knew that it wasn't the other side due to the fact that we sleep on that side and would most likely have woken up easily if there was a disturbance. Now we're stuck having to believe that maybe it was something paranormal. Since then, we haven't heard any noise, but it's only been a few days. Like I said earlier, if anybody can help us solve what this might have been, please do. So I just moved into a new house a few weeks ago, which I previously thought was completely empty and unfurnished. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, but I just got out of a pretty nasty situation in my old town and was looking for some seclusion. But from move-in day on, I have been hearing little knocks everywhere. I keep thinking it's kids playing in the woods, maybe throwing rocks at my house. But whenever I go look around outside, there's nobody there. I'm by myself out here, and I'm getting a little paranoid about people maybe following here from my old life. Always feels like someone's watching me. Last night, I heard a really loud thud in my attic, and I almost shit my pants. I was going to call the police, but then I started second-guessing whether or not I really heard it, because it wasn't followed by anything else, and there weren't any footsteps or anything like that. I was telling myself that it could have possibly been a squirrel that got caught up there, but it sounded more like a wooden beam had fallen on the attic floor. 
It was really loud and sounded dense. So after nearly sweating myself into a coma, I decided to actually go up there and check things out. When I get up there, it's dark and there's nothing. I spent a long time feeling around for anything that could have fallen. And finally, I see this box in the far corner of the room. I took it downstairs with me where I could actually see it, and it was really heavy. It's basically a big wooden box with a bunch of stick figures carved into it. I know there's something inside the box because I can hear it rattle when I move it. it sounds like there's more than one thing. The weirdest part is, though, there doesn't really seem to be a way to open it. There's no door or lid that I can open or find. There's no lock. It doesn't really have any crevices I can get my fingers in. There's just a bunch of carvings on it. Just stick figures, all doing kind of weird things. They look like they're dancing. Some look like they're holding hands. Does anybody know what this might be? I tried to Google some things, but I couldn't find anything. I kind of want to open it and see what's inside. I'm thinking of just breaking it, but I'm a little worried about what might happen if I do. What would you do? I've had many paranormal experiences growing up, and none can be compared to the other. But on this night, I saw something that I never thought I could see with my own eyes. I slept over at a friend's house one night, and that night as I laid on the floor next to her bed, my head by her feet facing the stairs, I closed my eyes to go to sleep. That's when I could feel someone staring at me. Their presence was dark, and something told me that I should open my eyes. And there he stood, at the top of the attic stairs. I couldn't see his face, nor his body, but just the outline of him, a completely dark shadow of a man. He stood over us, staring a hole through my very soul, it felt like, and I, completely unaware of how unreal he was, couldn't move, couldn't blink. I could only stare back. It wasn't until what seemed like minutes passed that I was able somehow to close my eyes again and fall back to sleep. The next morning, I had asked my friend if her siblings had one of their guy friends over, being that one of her sister's rooms was next to hers in the attic. She said no, nobody had been in the attic but us that night. I was confused. I told her about the man that I had seen. At that point, I still thought it was a real person. She turned pale white. She goes on to say how she felt like somebody was holding her down. She couldn't move, and she couldn't breathe. This apparently had happened in the night, but she didn't say anything because she thought I might judge her or something. Later on that day, her older sister, who we eventually told the story to as well, had told us about the man who had lived and died in that house years before their mother bought it. It was a man, in his early thirties. He ended up killing all of his children, and then himself. Since then, he's haunted the house and would always bother the females that stayed there. His children were all daughters. All she knew about that man is that nobody knows why he did it. I know that whoever this thing was, if it was the man or something else, it was paranormal in nature, but what I saw that night was tangible and real, and I will never forget it. So, I live alone, unless you want to include my cat, and then I live with a cat. I have a house with an attic conversion, but since it's just me, it's basically an empty room. I think the previous tenant used it as a bedroom. Obviously, when I first moved in, I did go up there to have a snoop around. There are two light switches for the room, one at the bottom of the stairs, and one that's a long string that you pull that's right in the middle of the room. 
There's a door at the top of the stairs that I always keep shut. I close every door behind me. An open door really bugs me. Now, after living in this house for about three months, I noticed that the door was open and the light was on. I could see the light on the wall opposite the door. No big deal. I obviously forgot to shut the door and turn the light off, I guess. I went and did it. Skip on about two weeks. I arrive home from work. It's early January and it's dark out. I can see the window to the room from outside and I can see that the light is on. My first thought is, shit, I've been robbed. I barge into my home and quickly sweep the first two floors expecting to find somebody. Nobody. Shit, they're still up there, I thought. I fly up my stairs and the door is shut but the light is still on. I swing the door open and nothing. I will say, I'm always very skeptical about stories when I hear somebody say they had a feeling of dread or felt like they were being watched. But I had these. I had this horrific feeling that I wasn't really alone up there. But it's a simple, empty box of a room. I tried my best to shrug it off, turn the light off, and shut the door. I've been living there nearly seven months now, and since that day, I get the same feeling when I walk past the stairs to the attic, day or night. The light is on at least twice a week, but now it switches itself off after a while. Recently, I've started hearing very loud bumps coming from the attic, which is right above my bedroom. The first time I heard it, I naturally assumed that somebody was trying to get in through the window. So again, I ran up there, but nothing. Lastly, my cat, who is tiny and during the night stays downstairs, refuses to go up there and has actually done the whole arched back hissing thing at the door. It could just be his personality, but given the situation and the fact that he never hisses at anything, ever, it really freaks me out. When I was younger, about nine, my parents and all of my siblings went on vacation to Germany, while me, my sister who is three years older than me, and my brother, who was in high school at the time, stayed home. We had our next door neighbors babysitting us. I live out in the country on 18 acres, so nobody is very close to us besides them. Anyway, my house has always been a little bit creepy in certain parts, but it comes and goes. The night before everything happened, my neighbor Fred fixed all of the locks in the house, specifically this one door by my parents' bedroom that we never use. I think I've probably used that door a total of 10 times, and I've lived here for 11 years. Their bedroom is on the first floor, and everybody else's is on the second. So he fixed all the locks and then latched them all shut. We only ever used the side door by the garage and the front door. So the next day we all went to school and my sister and I went to our singing and dancing group after that. Rachel, who was watching us, drove us. Fred worked and we picked him up on our way home. So just my brother was home. His room is right next to the attic. So we all get home from being gone all day, and my brother is freaking out. He said that while he was sleeping, the attic door, so to speak, fell onto the floor by his room. To get to the attic, you have to stand on a ladder, and you have to push the door up because it rests on a border on the wall. You have to slide the door up to sit on the floor of the attic, and this door fell down onto the floor which is wild because to do that it would have had to have been turned sideways and nobody was home we all get home and every single door in that house is wide open there are five different doors on the first floor so everybody's freaking out wondering what happened and we go upstairs and see the door sitting on the floor everybody goes into my parents room and i'm walking from the kitchen to their room I hear my name being called very quietly from upstairs. 
I walked into the room, and everybody else was in the room too. Nobody was upstairs. Nobody could have been calling me. It could have been an intruder or somebody trying to steal, but nothing was missing. And that hasn't been the only scary thing that's happened in my house. Either way, it gave us all quite the fright. And this happened a few years ago, when I was around the age of 18. My group of friends and I were staying at this friend's late grandparents' house in a ghost town in the mountains of Italy. The house is built on two floors, with a small courtyard on the front, and stairs connecting the two floors on the outside of the house, accessible from the courtyard. When this happened, we were chilling out in the courtyard, some other people and I were facing the entrance of the house, and we were able to see inside of the second floor, specifically the one central corridor with the door to the different rooms. Two people got inside the house and went to the bathroom, which is at the end of the corridor, on the right. A few minutes later, they got out and called out for us, asking if somebody had opened the trap door leading to the attic which is located at the very end of the corridor, right outside the bathroom. That's where things got weird. There was no way for someone to open the trap door, as you would have needed a ladder to get up there, since the ceilings are quite high, and the only ladder could be found at the ground floor, locked behind the front doors. Also, all of us who were facing in the front of the house and looking directly to the inside should have noticed if someone or something was moving. And similarly, the two people in the bathroom should have noticed something too, as the bathroom has one of those opaque glass doors. As soon as we all realized that there was no way somebody in the group could have done that, we all got inside the house, but nobody had the courage to really go up into the attic. So we just closed the door and tried to go on with the day but everybody kept feeling quite uneasy the entire time, seeing weird shadows or hearing steps coming from the attic. I reckon that could have easily been because of the suggestion, but still. I don't know how we managed to do that, but eventually we all went to sleep, and the morning after, some friends finally decided to go up and check the attic. The room was completely bare. The only thing they found up there was a hammer, standing on its head, in the middle of the room. It's fair to say, that only creeped us out all the more, and it really didn't make us want to look into whatever had happened. So again, they just got out of the attic and closed the door. We were all very glad to go back to the city later that day. This happened to me about a year ago. I often slept at my father's house, alongside my sister. When we slept over, specifically if we were upstairs, we would hear someone or something running in the attic. At first, it didn't scare us, and we continued to remain unfazed. We thought it must be pigeons or rats, but when we told our dad, he went to check the attic to see if it was animals, but there was nothing, and even if there could have been, there was literally no space for them to run. We have a very small attic, you can't even stand upright. Alongside some wooden panels blocking a straight path, there are boxes everywhere. Clutter is covering the whole floor, and there's no gap in between. It would have been completely impossible for them to run from one side to the other with such loud footsteps. So, we still don't know what's up in that attic, and frankly, I'm not sure we want to find out. Just a preface, 
I work nights, so I spend most of the time home alone while my brother is at work. Before I go to sleep in the morning, I'll lie in bed and browse Reddit for a bit. Yesterday, I'm in bed, just about to call it a day, when I hear something hit the counter in the kitchen. My aunt likes to walk in sometimes, but I checked the cameras. I'm lazy. And my car is the only one here. I immediately dismiss it and get back to my browsing. Maybe five minutes later, I hear solid footsteps coming down the hall. I drop everything and just listen. Unmistakable sounds of boots slowly walking up and eventually back down the hall. I text my brother to tell him since minor stuff happens sometimes. My dog stares at the walls and closets all the time. Doesn't bark, but just stares. And my brother and I joked for a little bit. I get the idea to try and record it on the off chance that I actually catch something. And I got extremely lucky this time. I took about five whole minutes of footage from my bed, since I was getting increasingly nervous about the whole thing. And I didn't want to get up, to be honest. I've trimmed the video and removed the empty film space. Included in this video, which starts off with multiple footsteps coming down the hall, boots. It cuts to a closer point of view with a single step and then a thud, ending with me looking out of my room door at the hallway. You can hear it on your phone if you listen closely, but with a Bluetooth speaker, you'll hear everything a lot better. Not going to try to speculate or rationalize anything, I just wanted to share the eeriness. Now that I was able to get this, I can include a couple of photos from months ago when my dog stared into the hallway for about 10 minutes. This will have some context now. When he didn't move for a while, I got a picture time stamped at 7.34 p.m. He eventually moved over and continued to stare at 7.48 p.m. It never really bothered me then, but now it makes a little more sense. Update. Since my last post about disembodied footsteps, things have gotten louder and weirder. I worked a half day last night, so I got home at about 1 a.m. I had to be quiet since my brother was sleeping in the room next to me. I finally got settled into bed and got a movie on Netflix. A while into it, I started hearing the same footsteps that I heard the other day, except this time it was a lot louder. Of course, I paused the movie and put all of my focus into listening. I stood by the cracked door for 10 to 20 minutes, trying to get a recording of it. I didn't get anything too special. A little while later, I heard them even louder and closer. It was coming from the attic. I stood on top of my bed and got the loudest recording yet. There is obviously someone or something in my attic. It wasn't long after that that my brother's alarm started going off and he got out of bed. I immediately went to him and he flipped out completely and grabbed his gun. I was going to tell him not to go up there, but he handed me his gun before I could. Screw it. I made it up the old ladder and looked toward my room. If there was someone up there, there's nowhere that they could hide when they heard me coming up. Thinking about heading up there again all the way to see if there's anything at all that could be making those noises. Happy birthday to me, I guess. I'm pretty sure my roommate's house is haunted but they don't believe in ghosts or souls much, so they don't think much of the weird things that happen around here. You can clearly hear footsteps in the attic. I used to live in an apartment, so you can tell what different sounds are when you hear them. With that, they are very distinctly the footsteps of someone pacing in the attic. There's only one way in or out of it, in my roommate's room, so I know it's not some squatter or something like that. Things in the house move around on their own, too. It happens in front of my friend and I a lot, to the point where we're kind of used to it. Even though we're used to it, I would be more at peace with it if I knew more about the spirits here. Any attempt to contact them has failed, so I assume they just don't want to talk. I haven't had any negative encounters with the spirit, though. The worst I've had is probably knocking over some stuff from the couch. 
I would still like to know who or what else is here, though, if that's not too much to ask. My brother used to live in the attic of the house we grew up in. It had an extremely dark and suffocating vibe. My brother went crazy in there. He would hear voices and he would be paralyzed, unable to move. He got an EEG and they didn't find any issues. After that, he had major behavioral issues and he had to live in this boarding school place for kids with behavior issues. He ended up ending his own life. And this was 25 years ago, so I've been able to heal a lot since then. But still. One day, I was on the second floor, and I heard a dripping, coming from the attic. I didn't want to go up there, but I needed to know what the cause of the dripping was. In the attic hallway, there was a hallway with three rooms connected to it, there was a random, big puddle of water. It felt wrong, and completely out of place. The ceiling above it looked totally normal. The dripping stopped once I came to the puddle, and I never heard it again. Nothing was wrong with the roof. My mom called a plumber and there were no pipes near the area. That was one of many strange things to happen in the house, but it was definitely the strangest, since there was physical evidence of something, but no physical evidence to back up what put it there. About a year and a half ago, I heard some scratching coming from inside my wall when I was in bed. When you walk into my house, you have to go up these stairs to a landing, and then there's another door made of glass that takes you into the rest of the house. The attic is above the stairs. When you go in through the glass door, it's basically just a long hallway with rooms coming off of it. Anyway, I heard the scratching a few times, but nobody else did. So I just thought, whatever, it's probably just me. It stopped for about a week, and then it sounded like someone was up there, crawling or dragging themselves around. This freaked me out, and I told my dad. He said it was probably just rats, so we got people out to check. Nothing was there. They said if there had been any animals, they would have left feces and other signs of their presence. They even checked under all the insulation, too. It carried on after this, so we put a large range of food up there, figuring something would eat it. Nope. Took it down about a week later, and nothing had been touched. At this point, we were pretty confused, so we put up cameras and left them for a week. The whole time they were up there, no sounds happened, which was odd because previously you could hear them all day and night. It was after the cameras got taken down that things got a bit weirder. You could get up to use the bathroom and the noise would follow you around the house. It happened to my stepmom and my sister. My dad didn't hear it though. Then stuff started going missing. Some raw chicken, hot chocolate. My dog would always look down the hall to the door and make that confused dog look. And at night, my stepmom and sister and I had a sense of pure dread, like we were being watched. We got pretty scared at one point, thinking it could be an actual human, but we would have seen them. Has anyone else had a similar experience? I'd love to know. About two weeks ago, my bigger brother and I started to hear random walking and running sounds from our attic. Our attic isn't accessed through a ladder or anything. We have a staircase going to the roof where there's a separate small room for the attic. At first when we heard the noises, we didn't care as we thought it could have been a random stray animal. A few days later, the walking turned into running and odd shuffling sounds. 
They mainly came at around 12 and 1 a.m. After we told this to our parents, they told us to investigate it the day after, and that's what we did. There was no one there, and we checked every corner, and everything seemed to be in its respective place. The next week, no event took place until Saturday. On Sunday, however, at daytime, we heard some running from across the rooms. The sound was from above, and a few things dropping. My brother and I went up and saw nobody, and nothing was dropped on the floor. We were very confused, but not scared. Not even creeped out. Just confused. Nothing happened on Monday. At the moment that I'm telling you this, I just heard the same running and things dropping. It's a Tuesday at around 1.10 in the morning. I can't seem to find any evidence of anything paranormal going on other than we can't find the source for what we're hearing. Any ideas? Some friends and I ventured into an old abandoned hospital that's pretty securely boarded up. We climbed through a broken window that was maybe eight inches at most. It was nighttime, and most of the large hospital campus is abandoned with welded doors and boarded windows. And though people had obviously gotten in before us, there was much less graffiti and damage than we're used to seeing in these places. The campus has several buildings, and we were clueless as to which one we were in, until we found a morgue in the basement and medical equipment strewn about. We didn't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary, except for the light in the attic. The building had no power, yet we could see from the top floor that a light was on above us. We couldn't get into the attic, as the only staircase up there had a chained and bolted door. It was a little odd, but I'm not sure if it was paranormal. Maybe there was a solar-powered light? Would the bulb ever go out? I don't know. It didn't scare us off. We did continue wandering around for a while, but nothing crazy happened. Still, sometimes I think about that light in the attic and I try to figure out what could have caused it, but I still haven't come up with a sufficient explanation. There's this little access to the attic in the place that we currently live in. We never really noticed it, up until our roommate pointed it out, trying to mess with us and scare us. So my best girlfriend and I were doing laundry one day in the garage. This thing is located in the garage above the door. I was staring up at it as she was sorting laundry. It moved open slightly, and I told her about it. And then it moved closed, and I told her again. She looked at it and we laughed, kind of creeped out, you know, a nervous kind of laugh. We tried to go about our day, but then we got paranoid. So we went inside and we were talking about it, trying to figure out what it might be. I kind of creeped her out by talking about all those videos, you know, the ones you see online of people finding out that other people were living in their attics. Well, we turned the air off and waited for it to shut down. We stood in the garage looking at this thing for like five solid minutes. We were going to go inside because nothing was happening. I looked at my girlfriend and said, let's go, nothing's gonna happen here. When I said that, the door flung open, fast. We ran inside screaming. The boys swear that it's from opening and closing the garage door but we weren't doing that when this happened, so we're still weirded out. I really still want to get it checked out, because even if it isn't paranormal, that could mean that there's somebody living up there. And if there's nobody living up there, well then, something's going on. Either way, I want to know.
My parents own a sprawling three-story manor built in 1912. This house has a finished bedroom in the attic, which is mildly weird on its own. But when I turned 14 and was going into high school, I begged them to empty the junk out and let me live there because I thought it would be totally awesome, like having an apartment away from the rest of my family. They agreed that I could do it and I got to paint it and put in new carpet and fill it with furniture that I picked out. All vintage, cause that's how I roll. The place was awesome, but the door didn't quite fit into the jam anymore, so it would swing open on its own. I wasn't exactly cool with having the door open to the rest of the attic in the middle of the night. I shut the door as tightly as it would go, and before I went to bed, I jammed it shut with my desk chair, really wedged it in there. I even had my sister test, and the door would not open from the attic side. Cool. I went to sleep. The next morning, I woke up feeling refreshed, until I noticed something. The desk chair was tucked back under the desk. The door was shoved open all the way so hard it had dented the wall. To this day, all present family members swear that they didn't do it, and I think I would have heard them anyhow. I decided that the ghosts in the attic didn't like me shutting them out. I left the door alone for the rest of my time living in that room, several years since I stayed at home while attending college. Freaking ghosts, man. This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like we disturbed the demon or spirit when we went in there. Everyone who went up there had a bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember me laying in bed everything a silent stone. I was peacefully watching TV, and then I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up and slowly check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally was persuaded to go and check. It sounded like at least five people whispering. But as soon as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing there was all my clothes, but they were swaying back and forth. And it couldn't have been the wind or anything like that, because I checked if the closet doors had made a little wind and the clothes didn't move. This went on every night for about two weeks. Then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, things being out of place, and things like that didn't quit. After a while, we got used to it, but that's when things just got worse. This one night, I had to take a shower, and I went to bed as usual. No whispers or anything, I just went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog at first, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described it as if it looked like something went inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but things just didn't stop. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store. And when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, thinking she was lost or something, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in, too, so I'm not sure how a little girl would have gotten there. Then after that, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed, and we eventually moved out. I don't know what it was. A demon? A lost spirit? I'm just glad I don't have to deal with it anymore.
I went to Sydney, Australia and tried the ghost tour at Q Station. Weird things happened there. Despite having a comfortable flight from Manila to Sydney, I still felt tired. After passing through immigration, I immediately went to the arrival hall, loaded my Opal card, and rode a train to my mate's flat in Burwood. It was raining when I arrived in Sydney. At only 18 degrees, the warm shower and the bed were the only two things that I looked forward to. It was still raining when I woke up. The overcast weather made the day bleak and gloomy. Then, I just remembered the things I watched online a few days ago, and one of them was the ghost tours in Sydney. I asked my mate about it, and the next thing I knew, he already booked us an extreme ghost tour on a weekend after my trip to Melbourne. Sydney was not a glamorous city back in the 19th century. Diseases such as smallpox, Spanish influenza, and bubonic plague were prevalent. To mitigate the spread of these infectious diseases, all ships entering Sydney Harbor must be checked by the doctors. Even if there was only one sick passenger on board, everybody was required to stay at the quarantine station for 40 days. Those who were sick were brought to the hospital for treatment. At least 16,000 people were brought here from the 1830s to 1984. 570 people died here. Today, Q Station serves as a hotel, a conference center, and a part of Sydney Harbour National Park. Our extreme ghost tour was scheduled at around 9 p.m. To beat the weekend traffic of North Sydney, we left Burwood at around 6 p.m. and drove all the way to Manly. We had our dinner there before heading to Q Station, located east of Manly Beach. We arrived at half past eight, way too early for the tour. So we went straight to the front desk and toured around. Some of the original relics like tombstones, luggage, and clothing are still there. It felt eerie upon seeing those personal belongings that once belonged to people who got quarantined here more than a hundred years ago. Disclaimer. We met up with the group at half past nine. Our guide, Bob, told us that we should not rationalize everything we would encounter during the tour. Jace and I are both air traffic controllers, and in our line of work, we rationalize everything. This time, we would have to leave everything behind and open up our senses. We were given EMF, or electromagnetic field sensors. This instrument detects an anomaly of the surrounding electromagnetic field. Experts believe that ghosts manifest themselves as a form of energy. First stop, the chamber. The tour started inside the chamber. There are two rooms. Both aren't that big, with a floor area approximately 50 square meters. We were locked inside for at least five minutes, just to observe everything. I didn't feel anything in the first room, except that it faintly smelled of hay. I didn't mind it because I thought it used to be a barn. But in the second room, I felt something. The surrounding air felt heavy, and I felt an unknown force pressing on my cheeks. It was quite difficult to breathe at some points. As we went out, Bob told us that it used to be a gas chamber. About 40 people were locked inside for sanitary reasons. Now, it all made sense as to why it felt so heavy inside, and why I felt claustrophobic inside the second room. The second stop was the hospital. It was quite a long hike to the quarantine hospital. During the early days, it was harder to get to the hospital. You would need to climb the steep walkways. Basically, when you're on top, you're completely isolated. The hospital is located near the cliff overlooking Sydney Harbor. There are several buildings around, including the quarters of the nurses and doctors. Hospitals, no matter how modern their facilities are, can get creepy at night. But this one was way creepier than I thought. We first entered the doctor's quarters. It was dark, but cold inside the room, and there were three bunk beds inside. 
As I sat and leaned on the lower bunk bed while listening to Bob's stories, I felt something was pinching my lower back. I shrieked, and Bob caught my attention. I told Bob that it was nothing. I lied. We went into the main hospital room. It was quite big, and there were six beds. Feeling brave, I lied down on one bed and tried to make some connections. I don't know how, but I just closed my eyes momentarily. I felt nothing, and honestly, the bed felt soft and comfortable. I transferred to an adjacent bed near the wall, and the moment that I lied down, it felt weird. It felt like something was pushing me, but not in a forcible manner. The room is connected to another room that had a darker history. Bob told us to open the door and asked if we felt something different. Everyone told him that it was colder in that room, despite the doors and windows being tightly shut. Some of our EMF detectors went crazy. According to Bob, there are four resident ghosts inside this room. Two children who love to play hide-and-seek inside the cupboard. A woman, and the malevolent spirit of an old man. There were stories circulating around that one group who stayed overnight in the hospital decided to record themselves singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and they caught something on the recording. They heard children giggling, a woman saying, Wait, wait, and an angry voice of a male shouting, Get out. Jace had his EMF detector pointed near the cupboard. It went crazy. So what he did, he got his phone and started recording himself singing the same song. Actually, we were all at the center of the room, and we didn't hear him singing. After we went out, we played back his recording. Believe it or not, he caught something on his recording. There weren't disembodied voices from children or from the women, but in the middle of his singing, someone was shouting in the background, F you, your singing stinks. Things got real. The third stop is the Gravedigger's House. The Gravedigger's House is one of the most haunted parts of the complex. It's so haunted that Bob won't dig deeper into its bloody history. It used to be the house of, of course, the Gravedigger and a doctor. Just a few steps from the house is the third class cabin. During that time, there were reports of missing girls and children. Eyewitness reports claimed that they saw some kids and girls entering the gravedigger's house. More so, the doctor was attached to the girls, especially the young ones. The house is a bungalow. It has two bedrooms with a small living room, dining room, and the kitchen and the bathroom are located at the back part. Bob left us in the house for at least 10 minutes. The first room to the right used to be the bedroom of the doctor. As I slowly entered the room, the atmosphere drastically changed. It felt cold and sad at the same time. I don't know, I just couldn't help but be sad in that room. I went out right away because I couldn't take the sadness any longer. The second room was rather weird. I was about to enter there, but something felt wrong. It felt like there was a force barring me from entering. Some of my groupmates checked their EMF and it went a bit crazy. I guess everybody was not welcome to come inside. The back portion, where the kitchen and the bathroom are located, was the scariest part of the house. It was dark, but that part of the house was faintly illuminated by the moon outside. I stayed there for at least three minutes, just to observe. I suddenly felt goosebumps all over my body. As I neared the bathroom, it felt sinister. I didn't go inside because my instincts told me not to. I managed to take photos inside the house. My phone didn't catch anything paranormal, but all the photos are super creepy. When everybody is outside, Bob confessed that the bathroom was the most haunted part of the house. Locals claimed that a girl was brutally murdered inside the bathroom, and that she got strangled by barbed wire. Fourth stop was the morgue. Firstly, I never like going to a morgue, especially if it's dark and abandoned. 
I was very nervous the moment that we entered the morgue. To add to the scare factor, they had a mannequin lying at the center, covered with a white cloth. I know it's staged, but it still creeps the hell out of me. While Bob was talking about history, it started to get cold, but weirdly only on my right side. No one was standing to my right. There was nothing there but a door that led to the laboratory. A cold breeze passed through the door. I wasn't paying attention to Bob's story, because I felt like somebody was standing beside me. I whispered to Jace about it, so he scanned his EMF, and suddenly there was a spike of energy. He told me to calm down, but I was so close to breaking down. As minutes went by, I started to feel goosebumps on my right arm, and I could feel that somebody was actually touching my arm. It was like a gentle caress, but definitely not human. I became uneasy after we went out of the morgue, and Bob noticed. He smiled and said, The resident ghost liked you, didn't he? Really, Bob? The fifth stop was the shower block. The shower block is the most haunted place in the whole Q station. During that time, those who were sick had to take a shower of carbonic acid, not water, at the shower block. The acid killed fleas and ticks in seconds. Two days after, your skin starts to peel off. It was dark and eerie as we entered the shower block. The stench was still there, and I felt lightheaded. The same feeling when you just got out of a boat ride. Bob told us that there are shadows lurking around the dark corners of the shower block. For 15 minutes, we were instructed to roam around and observe. He told us to go to the corner where we felt the most uncomfortable. I had goosebumps as we passed by the center aisle and turned right, since we both felt uneasy on this side. As we were walking back to the center aisle, I felt that somebody was watching us from behind. So, instinctively, we turned our heads slowly, and there we saw a dark figure peering from the corner of the block. I am pretty much sure that my mind was not playing tricks on me. The figure was tall, about seven feet, and it was darker than the dark. All of a sudden, it came right after us. I don't know what happened next, but Jace and I were back at the main door of the block in a jiffy. Whatever that thing was, it scared the crap out of me. The tour lasted for three hours. It was already 12.30 a.m. when we went back to the parking lot safe and sound. I honestly don't know what to feel after the tour. I was physically and mentally exhausted. Nonetheless, it was a great experience. It finally validated that I am sensitive to the paranormal. I do believe in ghosts, and I don't easily get scared by them. But my experience at Q Station was overwhelming. A lot can happen in three hours. I want to share a few things that have happened to me since moving to the land down under. I moved to Australia in 2018, built a home with my partner in far north Queensland. The area where we built is part of the Daintree Rainforest. We are surrounded by rainforest and the Coral Sea is about 50 meters through the dense bush. Things were relatively quiet, until about five weeks ago. Now, we are seeing Min Min lights, or spook lights. Little balls of light that are far too big and bright to be glow bugs, moving through the trees and about the property. We hear booms and bangs against the outside walls of our newly built home. We grab a flashlight and go out to see what's going on. The noise is so loud that if it had been a bird or a bat, the poor thing would have broken a neck or at least stunned itself. The property is fenced in, gated, and locked. There are no rocks or clouds of dirt on the concrete, nothing on the sides of our house as if kids were pulling a prank. It literally sounded like hands banging against the walls. We get up to go see, then come back in, get back in bed, and it happens again. 
It's like it's toying with us, being mischievous. The locals and aboriginals have told me about Yowie, which is similar to the United States version of Bigfoot. They've also told me about Bunyip and other Dreamtime creatures that reside in and make the Dane Tree their home. It is one of the oldest rainforests on the planet. We are surrounded by the beauty of nature, and now it's like every night is a new adventure. We don't know what might happen next. Nothing happens inside the home, just on the property. I've done research online and at the local library can't find anything other than the occasional yowie sighting. I've gotten in touch with a few ghost hunting teams and asked my questions. I'm waiting for a response to see if they might know anything. My partner's sister said that we may have built our home on a gravesite, but I doubt this. Not everything is built on a gravesite. It may just be the land itself. I know the Daintree is very special to the Aboriginal. It's sacred, in fact. Why is it that when things like this happen, I never have my cell phone in hand? It's like I'm so caught up in the moment, all I can do is experience it. But I'm going to try to capture something on film. I'd really like to know what's going on. I wanted to share an experience that still freaks me out just thinking about it. Just down the road from where I used to live a few years ago in southeast Australia is the opening into about a hundred acres of woodland and bush. I frequently went in there when I was younger to do the usual things, riding and camping, etc. I was out driving at about 11.30 p.m. with my girlfriend, and as we were in the area, I decided to show her the woodlands while we were there. She loves everything to do with nature, and it was summer, so it was extremely warm. I left my car with the lights shining into the trees as we weren't going in too far, and it was pitch black inside. The two of us just sat, having a smoke, chatting, and generally relaxing. She was sitting on a sort of map of the area that had been put in some plastic and I was keeping an eye on the trees as I had a feeling that something was just wrong. I've read stories before about people who felt like they were in danger, even though nothing around them was perceptibly off, and this was that same feeling. Every sense was almost reaching out, and my adrenaline was up, but there wasn't really anything in my eye line that seemed any different. After lighting another cigarette to calm my nerves, I scanned the tree line again and realized that it looked different from before. It was only after staring into the darkness that I saw that there was moonlight, which was now lighting up grass. Before, it couldn't reach the grass, and it dawned on me that that was because there was a black shape blocking it. I assumed it was a tree. The only way that I can describe it was that all sound just ceased and everything went dead silent. A few seconds later, this disgusting feeling of dread fell over me, and I saw motion in the dark of the path as this thing crawled toward us on all fours. I've seen nearly every animal in the outback here, and we don't have any large predators like in the United States or Europe. But somehow, I knew this thing was a predator, and it wasn't hiding itself from us just slowly crawling toward us. I don't know if my girlfriend saw it or not, as I couldn't look away, but just as it reached the line that my car lights were able to illuminate, it reared up onto two legs and just sat, staring at us. I'm 6'4", and this thing was about another meter taller than me, with arms that were far too long, that reached down near the ground. All I could make out was an off-white, almost yellowish fur on it, and in the dim light, could make out the silhouette of its head as being that of a dog or a wolf. I wasn't able to move as it stared at me, but it was at this point that my girlfriend gasped, which seemed to break me out of whatever was stopping me from thinking logically. 
I grabbed her by the arm and we sprinted to the car, slammed the doors and tore out of there as fast as I could. Both of us were too scared to speak until about a half an hour later. We've both discussed it many times, and the feeling that we had was what I imagine a rabbit sees when it catches a wolf or a fox looking at it, that this is something that would be able to end us with absolute ease if it chose to. Neither of us have ever been able to come up with any explanation for what it was, but it has definitely changed the way I view the woods and bush when I go camping or hiking now. Every time I go out, I think back to that day, and I wonder what it was, and if I'll ever see it again. This is by far the spookiest experience my family and I have ever had regarding the paranormal. I'm currently living in Australia, and this all started when I moved into my current house around three years ago. In my culture, we believe that whenever a family moves into a new home, a priest should come to perform various prayers to bless the house. However, when my mom bought the house, we immediately went on holiday for three months, so we were unable to perform the rituals. Everything started when we first came back to our house. Just some background. My mom raised me on her own, so it was just the two of us staying in the house at the time. I was still in high school, and my mom worked in the city, so we both took the train every morning. My mom always left home earlier than I did, so it was my job to lock up every morning. My mom worked late almost every day, so I would get home first and be home alone for at least five hours every day. One morning, as I left home, I began to feel paranoid that I had not locked the door. So, I went back to check it. The door was locked. Later that day, when I came home from school, I walked up my driveway to find that the door was standing wide open. I freaked out, but because I was brave enough, I went inside. Our kitchen is pretty close to the entrance, so I grabbed a knife and searched the entire house. There was no one there. I decided not to tell my mom because she was already really stressed with work, and I didn't want her to freak out. Over the next few days, other strange things started happening. For one, our garage door would randomly start opening whenever we were home. My mom was kind of scared, but then we thought maybe our neighbor's garage remote functioned at the same frequency or something, and it was activating our door too, so we dismissed it. It had been about two months since we were living in our new house, and everything seemed to be normal again. Until one day, when I was awoken in the middle of the night by my mom. She looked super scared and asked me if I had come to her room to wake her up. I said no, I was half asleep and I had no idea what she was rambling on about. She didn't believe me and made me swear that I hadn't. I always play scare pranks on my family so I can kind of see why. I swore I didn't and I asked her what was going on. My mom is a super light sleeper and so while she was sleeping, she heard somebody prop her door open. She looked up and saw the figure of a boy and thought it was me. So, she asked it what was wrong and blinked, and there was nothing there, but her door was still open. She called my name a few times, and there was no response, hence why she came into my room. I have to admit, given the stuff happening with the doors, I was kind of scared, but I convinced my mom that she was imagining things, and she went back to sleep. Ever since that night, up to this very day, my mom still sleeps with her door open and the living room light on, and I don't blame her, especially after what happened next. Two weeks after this incident occurred, my mom's best friend and her son and daughter, they were both around my age, came over from our homeland, Malaysia, to visit us. I was really excited, as I've always been close to them. One thing you should know about my aunt, she's had many experiences growing up with the paranormal, so she's super scared of ghosts. For this reason, her kids and I always used to play pranks on her. 
One day, the four of us were playing poker on the dining table while my mom was taking a nap in the living room. Suddenly, my mom rushes out of the living room, her eyes wide open, and she looked really scared. She asked who had woken her up from her nap. The four of us were completely dumbfounded as we'd been playing cards the entire time. She then told us that she felt someone tap her shoulder while she was asleep. When she opened her eyes, there were two feet on the floor, but when she blinked, the feet were gone and nobody was there. My mom was full on freaking out now, especially after what had happened the other night. Then my aunt, given how afraid she is of ghosts, started to freak out too. I didn't want her holiday to be ruined, so I managed to convince them that my mom was probably in the middle of a dream when she woke up, and she was probably just hallucinating. I know it sounds stupid, but hey, it worked. But then the next day, something else happened. My mom had gone to the shops to get groceries. The kids and I were playing video games in the living room, while their mom was having a shower. Suddenly we heard the bathroom door burst open and out runs my aunt wrapped in her towel. She screamed at us, telling us to stop trying to scare her and that it wasn't funny. The three of us were super confused and her daughter asked her what had happened. She told us that she knew that we were the ones knocking on the bathroom door even after she told us to stop three times. I know it probably seems like she was overreacting but I cannot emphasize how afraid of ghosts she is. I exchanged a concerned look with her kids and then told her that it genuinely was not us and that we'd been playing video games the entire time. Soon my mom got home and we told her what happened. Let's just say that my aunt started sleeping with her room lights on for the rest of the trip. Soon my aunt and her kids had gone home and it was back to me and my mom again. We were back to our regular routine. My mom was finally at peace and she hadn't seen anything for a while, apart from the same thing with the garage door every once in a while. The same, however, could not be said for me. It seemed that it had come to be my turn to be tormented. As I mentioned before with my mom at work, I would be home alone for a few hours every day. I began to start hearing things. The strange thing is, it would never occur while I was in the living room. Whenever I went to use the toilet or went to sit in my room, I would start hearing things coming from the living room and kitchen. It started out small, just the sound of some panting, like if you'd just run a long distance. But the minute that I entered the living room, nothing. There would be no sound at all. It soon started to get worse. I would hear footsteps pacing around outside my room, and spoons and pots falling in the kitchen. But every time that I stepped out into the living room, the noises would stop and everything would be just as I had left it. There was even a time when I thought I heard a kid laughing right outside the door when I was using the toilet. I decided not to tell my mom yet because she seemed to be getting over her experiences and I didn't want to scare her again. But one day I felt that I needed to tell her, and we decided that that day it was time we contacted our priest to perform the prayers for our house. It was the day that my best friend and his parents came over for dinner. It all started as an innocent dinner. My best friend and his family were Malaysian too, and we were having a great time talking about home while having a signature Malaysian meal. My friend's dad was telling us a story when all of a sudden, his face just froze, and his eyes widened. He honestly looked like he was having a stroke. His face contorted into a frown, and he just stared down at the table. My mom and I shared a worrying look, but my friend and his mom just continued eating like nothing was happening. Suddenly, his dad seemed to return to us, and he continues telling the story as if nothing just happened. He could see, though, that my mom and I looked worried. Suddenly, his wife tapped him on the shoulder and said, Just tell them. He frowned at his wife and just kept eating. There was an awkward silence for a few minutes, and then he finally decided to address the elephant in the room. He apologized for scaring us and assured us that there was no need to worry. He then went on to tell us about his life. Since he was a child, he'd been very religious, and from a young age, he felt a very close connection to God. 
He regularly meditated and was very spiritual. He was so spiritual that when he came into his mid-twenties, he had awoken a gift. He was able to see dead people. I kid you not. When he said this, I immediately looked at my friend, waiting for him to start laughing at some prank. But my friend's face was dead serious, and he continued looking at his dad as he told the story. He told us that he could see them everywhere, when he was walking his dog on the street, when he was sitting in the park, in people's houses, and even sometimes sitting on people who had been possessed. He said the spirits were drawn to him because they knew he could see them, and they would stalk him, begging him to help them reach the afterlife. He said there was simply nothing he could do, because these people had died before their time, and that they would simply have to wait on Earth until it was their time. Back home, he was regularly contacted by people having paranormal experiences to perform a cleansing to drive evil spirits away. He told us about some of those experiences, but I don't feel like it's my place to share them here. He then asked us something that gave me chills. Have you guys performed the prayers for your house yet? My mom refused to answer the question until he told her why he had asked it. He said that he didn't want to worry us, and that if we hadn't, we probably should. My mom continued to ask him why, until he finally conceded. And this is what he said. Remember when I had that moment, just now while I was talking? I had a visit. I won't tell you what it was, but it was the same spirit I saw standing at the front door when we came here. That's when my mom told him everything that had been happening. It's during this time that I decided to tell my mom about the things that I'd been hearing in the house. My friend's dad then told us that he didn't think it was a malicious spirit, but to be safe it was time for us to conduct the prayers for the house. Before he left, he asked my mom if he could see our altar in the prayer room. My mom took him, and we all followed him. As he stood in front of the altar, his body suddenly shook, as if he had just had a huge hiccup or something. He then put his hands together and bowed his head. Before leaving, he said, I can see why the two of you have not been hurt. You are both protected. And that concluded their visit. A week later, we arranged for a priest from our local temple to cleanse and bless our home. I promise you that since that day, nothing strange has ever happened in our house. Even the garage door has stopped opening on its own. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I've learned my lesson. I will never move into a new house without performing the rituals that my culture demands. A couple of years ago, I went on a study abroad trip with my university to Australia for a couple of months. We started in Darwin and traveled south. The bus ride itself was pretty uneventful, except for my friend and I being accidentally left at Devil's Marble for a few hours, but that's another story. We stayed at a hostel in Alice Springs and got up before dawn to drive to Uluru. The rest of the students had decided to go back to sleep for the bus ride, but I was looking out the window at what little I could make of the scenery. It was that time right before dawn when you're first able to make out your surroundings. The bus slowed down to park and made a turn into an empty lot, and that's when I saw it. An extremely large shadow walking through the bush. I'm a bad judge of height, but it was taller than any human I've ever seen, perhaps ten feet tall, with extremely elongated arms and legs. Even though there was enough light to make out the details of the landscape, the figure appeared completely, well, void of detail, like it was smooth, black, and featureless. The black was a stark contrast to the rest of the scenery, as there was a thin mist in the area. I've seen flashes of shadows driving before, or something out of the corner of my eye, but this was different. I was able to watch it for several slow seconds, as it walked in this odd, swaying, dipping motion with a distinct grace, moving effortlessly across the bush. I felt like as soon as I saw it, I'd been electrocuted. 
Every hair was standing on end, and my skin was prickling. I tried to wake my friend, but by the time she looked out the window, it was gone. I'm sure this could be explained away by possible sleep deprivation, or just seeing shadows, but I personally believe that what I saw was real. If anyone has any local legends about the area, I would love to hear them. I've never told this story to anyone before, simply due to not having any answers and thinking that there's nothing that can be gained from telling it. But eventually I figured, why not? Maybe somebody knows what I saw. Many, many years ago at Wangi Campgrounds in Queensland, Australia, my father, my friend and I were out camping for a couple of days. Usually it's packed, but we went during the week and got two days off school. I can't remember the reason. I think it was just because my dad had a few days off, but that's beside the point. Due to it being midweek, the grounds were empty. We've been here many, many times before, but never alone. However, we were excited due to having the whole grounds to ourselves. Cool, right? Now, we're no strangers to the Australian bush. We know what to look out for. We know how to play it safe. So at night, knowing that nobody was around to mess with our camp, we decided to go for a mini bushwalk to the other side of the river that runs along the grounds. When I say grounds, it's just a clearing in the middle of a bush, not a properly established grounds, and it's far away from all the roads. We got to the opposite riverside, and looking out to the river, we could see a bright light just near our campgrounds. Thinking it could have been the fire, I mean, we put it out, but they could easily relight, we walked back through the bush to our site, still able to see the large light. However, when we got to our side, we realized that it wasn't the fire. As we were able to be closer to the river this time, we saw that the light was over the river, not in it, but over it. We were somewhat scared, but thought that there had to be some explanation for it. Maybe a flashlight or a torch, something along those lines. Maybe a torch or something along those lines. But looking from where we were, there was nothing under it. The light was a good 70-ish centimeters above the water. And still. Dead still. The light itself was flickering, sort of like a fire. But it was in no way attached to anything. It was just a large ball, like between a tennis ball and a soccer ball, floating and giving off a strong fire-like light, but more like a light bulb center. This went on for maybe 30 minutes as we tried splashing the water and trying to figure out what it was, but it didn't move. It didn't do anything. It just floated at that one spot, in complete silence, unlike the sound a fire would make. My dad decided to go get the torch and his camera, and of course, being the scared 12-year-olds we were, we went with him. As soon as we got to the campsite, which was maybe only 100 meters away, the light was gone. We ran back with the torch, but there was nothing there, and no one there. No other campers. It was just... gone. We didn't really talk about it, because we didn't know what it was, or how it was there or why it was there. Min Min lights are something that are very popular in the Australian outback, and that's the only explanation that I've got for it. But they have no explanation, so it's a dead end. I just want to mention a few key points before I share some of the things that happened. I am not looking for attention. Everything contained within this story is 100% factual. I'm an Australian, and these occurrences happened on the central coast of New South Wales. 
I am an avid outdoorsman with a keen interest and in-depth knowledge of Australian native fauna. Each of these occurrences have a witness apart from myself. I don't claim these events are paranormal, yet I am, to this day, still without a reasonable explanation. Occurrence number one. I live on the New South Wales Central Coast in an area that has houses in close proximity to Brisbane Water National Park, literally within meters from some back fences. Myself and my partner hold a keen interest which sees us venture into the bushland regularly. For argument's sake, let's say we are avid bird watchers. A few weeks ago, the local fire service commenced backburning in parts of the Brisbane Water National Park over two days or so, which was obviously for hazard reduction. Most of the fire was directed at burning off leaf litter and dry debris, which covers the ground in an effort to reduce the chances of spot fires, which have, in the past, become large fires and threatened houses and caused neighboring suburbs to be evacuated. Because of the way the back burning was controlled, it completely burned off the debris, and basically 90% of flora that was over two or so feet seemed to have survived, except for some light charring, of course. Even some grass plants survived, while others were completely burned, including their underground roots, which left large round circles in the substrate. This meant that the canopy was fully intact, and this is an important point to the story. The fire was controlled so well that the left-hand side was completely obliterated by fire while the right-hand side was untouched. The path is about three to four feet wide at its widest points. Anyway, about 48 hours after the fire service had finished backburning, my partner and I ventured into a large patch of Brisbane Water National Park, along a track that we have walked no less than 200 times in the last decade. The first thing we noticed, of course, was the lack of small shrubs and ground cover, which had been replaced by a 3 to 4 centimeter layer of ash. It was also hard not to notice the smell and non-visible smokiness which irritated our throats and noses, but by far the most profound thing we noticed was just how quiet it was. Usually we hear birds chirping, snakes slithering into the underbrush, lizards scampering out of the way, and ducks splashing around in the creek that runs along the whole length of the walking track on the right. Across the creek, there are literally kilometers of bush in all directions, so it was a little odd that it was so desolate, even after backburning. We decided to press on, even though we were pretty sure that we weren't going to see any wildlife. We continued along the track for another 20 minutes or so, all the while chatting about nothing in particular, when all of a sudden we both jerk our heads to the left to see two vertical vines which stand at about six feet tall and four centimeters or so in circumference come toward us like they've been shook, held back and released, sort of like a slingshot. We immediately run over to the trees, four meters or so off the track, because we thought it might have been caused by wildlife. My first instinct was to look up, as it may have been a large bird fleeing but there were no birds at all in any of the trees, and we would have seen and heard the wings flapping and it breaking through the canopy. It wasn't any type of guanas, we've only had two types which occur naturally here, and both are arboreal and will take to the nearest tree when threatened. We checked every tree, every hollow log and any type of ground cover which survived the fire and found nothing. It definitely wasn't any type of marsupial, because it would have been spotted when we checked the trees and surrounding ground cover. It also wasn't any type of snake, as the only arboreal snake we have locally which weighs in kilos is the diamond python, which I could spot from a mile away. We continued walking for another three kilometers or so along the track, and the whole time felt like we were being watched. I was quite uneasy but that feeling completely left as soon as we turned around and backtracked and headed toward home. Occurrences 2 and 3 My partner and I went out on another adventure, but this time we were looking for nocturnal animals to photograph. 
We went to a waterfall, which was only about 15 minutes from our house, but is rather secluded and completely dead at night and on weekdays. Funnily enough, it becomes packed on the weekends during the day in the warmer months. The layout of the waterfall is basically a large parking lot at the stop of the waterfall, which has a small park with barbecues, tables, and a small block of toilets. From the parking lot, you can also access the very top of the waterfall, which is basically a rock escarpment with water running through it. You can also access stairs that take you down to both the middle of the waterfall, which is just a huge rock platform, and the very bottom of the waterfall. It takes about 20 minutes to walk from top to bottom. We parked the car and I grabbed my gear, which included my camera. We start making our way toward the top of the falls, which has a two-foot barrier you have to step over to access the rock escarpment. Right as I went to put my leg over the fence, I heard the most disturbing noise I have ever heard. It sounded like a human, moaning in pain, but to describe it the best I can, Imagine having 10 different people with 10 different voice qualities, all making the same moaning sound at the same time. I'm not one to frighten easily, but I have to admit, it sent chills up my spine. I told my partner to hurry up and get back to the car, and I locked the doors as soon as we got in and left in a hurry. Now, this place is pitch dark. There are zero lights, and there's no way in hell you'd be there without a torch. Not to mention, you would be able to tell if anybody was there by the cars parked in the parking lot, as this is not a place that you would walk to. When I told a close friend of mine, who also frequents the waterfall to photograph wildlife, he told me that he also had an experience the night before, which was the night after I was there. He had finished work late and thought he'd go for a quick walk around to see what he could find, this was in the Australian spring, when everything is out and about due to the warm and humid weather. He said he had parked his car and got about halfway down the stairs to the bottom of the falls when he came across a snake. He was photographing it when he heard the door of the toilet block being slammed repeatedly. He started running up the steps to get back to his car and said as he was running up, it sounded like something was going mental, slamming things within the toilet block. He got in his car and left. My friend and I decided to go check out the waterfall that night to see if we could find anything. We parked the car and went straight to the toilet block. We checked the block that he had heard the commotion from and found a reasonably large amount of blood inside the basin and a small pool in the basin's soap dish. We contemplated calling the police but weren't sure exactly what we would report. We left soon after and neither of us visited the place for over a month. Since then we've been back to this place multiple times without any incident. Occurrence number four, the last occurrence. Now on to last night. We headed out along a road on the central coast, which by day is rather busy due to the high number of residences and farms that are along this road, but by night is usually very quiet with a few cars using it sporadically, so I have my high beams on 95% of the time. We drove along this road for about 40 minutes in search of marsupials to photograph. This road intersects large masses of bush on both sides. I would also like to add at this point that this road is not straight or level by any means. There's a mixture of turns as well as slight to aggressive inclines and declines along basically the entirety of this road. After driving for 40 minutes without any luck, we decided to head back along the same route we'd taken. We were driving for about 10 to 15 minutes on our way back, when we hit one of the very slight gradual inclines along the road. When we were about halfway up the incline, I noticed something in the distance, maybe 200 to 250 meters or so, which I initially thought was a shadow being cast from residual lighting of my high beams. All of a sudden, it moved from the middle of the road to the right side. At this point, and while the figure was still in motion, I asked the passenger, and the person who's been present for the last three unexplained experiences, can you see that? To which they replied, yeah, what is that? 
We got to the top of the incline and onto level ground once again and stopped in the location that we saw it. I stopped and I pulled out one of my torches and surveyed where we'd seen it. To my surprise, where it had crossed to was a small property which was essentially a house with a very small paddock with horses out in the front. But what caught my attention was that the horses were not startled in the slightest and could actually see one of them close to the fence, calmly eating. After about two minutes of surveying the area, I continued along the road and asked my passenger exactly what they had seen. They relayed exactly what I had seen. A tall, six-ish foot but with about two and a half foot wide profile but rounded figure. It was very hard to gauge an exact height because since we were on an incline, the perspective was a little off. For instance, say a person was to walk in that exact spot. We would only be able to see them from the knees up due to the blind spot on the summit. My passenger added another piece of information, which was that it was rusty colored. I couldn't make out a color, but I have to admit that I was not paying as much of attention to it as I was the road. I was going at about 70 kilometers an hour, so I really had to focus on driving while also trying to get to the summit as quickly as possible to see what it was. I would also like to add another detail, which I find is rather strange. While I couldn't see the figure's complete leg area, it didn't seem to be walking in a normal fashion. It's almost like it was gliding across the road. I know that seems odd. If I had to liken the body shape to a known animal, it would definitely without a doubt be an orangutan, but standing a fair bit taller and not as hunched in the lower back area. So there you have it. I no longer live in that area. I now live 40 minutes north of there, but I still visit often due to having family there. I would like to point out that all of these incidents happened within about a six week period, which all seemed to start with the hazard reduction back burning. Australian summers are harsh. I've not had any weird happenings since then, and I still spend a ridiculous amount of my time out in the bush. I also work in a scientific field. I work with wildlife, so I know which animals are endemic to Australia, and I know that what I saw is not. When I was four years old, I was living in Australia, Gold Coast to be exact. I don't remember much at all about that age, which is pretty normal, but there is this one thing that keeps coming back into my mind to this very day. This wasn't just some nightmare the kids usually have. I was wide awake and I remember I felt everything that happened. I was put to bed by my parents sometime during the night. They left the room and I was all by myself. I remember trying to fall asleep, but I was suddenly interrupted by some creepy figure. I remember being pulled off my bed and dragged underneath the bed by my arms. I couldn't move at all and I was unable to speak. I remember seeing this very dark figure with bright eyes holding on to me. From that point on, I can't remember what happened. I don't know what that was or how it even happened. I'm pretty sure it was some kind of sleep paralysis, but if you have any idea, let me know. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late twenties and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets coldest in Toowoomba, and that night I remember it reaching negative four degrees Celsius, or about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark is a teacher there, and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block I finally reached the block and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what had happened. He said in a shaky voice, 
He's here. A ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak out. Dallin's is a boarding school, so I knew there was a small amount of people still there. However, the boarding block and admin block are far, far apart, and I was not about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff that he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. We were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers. The wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden it got really warm, and I mean a quick sudden boost in temperature kind of warm. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see what was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think about it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds, although it felt more like five hours. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill and into the forest. I got up and I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running toward the road until both he and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block to find another member of the faculty. We reached the block and we found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told that it was a really common thing to see if you stayed in the admin block too late, or if you were walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams. At least once a week, they say. Apparently he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. The faculty member, who was also a teacher, said that he had only seen the Burning Man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he said, all the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, the fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why, he concluded. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her thirties. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, he said. We just wanted to ask if you've ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe in her late sixties or early seventies, came out from the back and said, You two saw the Burning Man, didn't you? Mark replied, Yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came closer and said, Yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a time. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late, and if you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left, and Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. My dad told me this story from when he worked in a nursing home in Australia. It spooked me a bit, and I have no idea how he lasted as long as he did in that nursing home. For the record, my family are all skeptics, as far as I know. But I think this is the one story that would persuade me that ghosts are real. My dad worked the night shift, and he said that he had been told stories of deceased residents passing the front desk on the bottom floor. He said he even heard babies crying on the top floor. The nursing home used to be a maternity hospital. This crying would occur even though there was now no maternity clinic near it. There was a TV room on the bottom floor. It was on this floor where some of the residents who were kept in bed all night for their own safety were housed. He moved the chairs near the TV all the way back to the wall and locked the door. He came back an hour or so later whilst waiting for the porter. 
and the door was open, and one of the chairs was moved back across to the television. The door hadn't been forced. There were no windows in the room, and even if there were, the chair was too heavy to be blown back across the room. All the patients were accounted for. The porter arrived, and my dad asked him about the occurrence. The porter said, Oh yeah, that's Bob's chair. He doesn't like it to be away from the TV. My dad said, There is no Bob at this nursing home. The porter chuckled and said, There used to be. He's dead now. That's my dad's one and only experience with ghosts, and it chills me to the bone. I have quite a few stories I could tell, but I decided to start with this one because I think it illustrates a few things about me and my now husband. It was also the first time I really saw a ghost, right in front of me, rather than in my peripheral vision. I think I may be a bit of an empath, judging by the experiences that I've had over the last 50 odd years. My husband, Jay, however, is a skeptic. He says he would love to see a ghost, but doesn't expect to. He once took part in a study at a university one of those classic guess-which-card-I'm-holding-up experiments. This was in the 70s. Jay got so many wrong that it was statistically significant in the negative direction. He says that proves that there's no such thing. I think it indicates the opposite. I believe he actively blocks his own abilities to the point where he negates the paranormal around him. Being around him is like wearing psychic earplugs. It's very soothing. The following occurred in the early 80s when we were at university in northern New South Wales, Australia. Most of the students lived on campus, and the university had its own radio station to cater to them. A friend of ours, Gail, was a DJ at the time and had a midnight till dawn weekend shift. She invited us up to the station one night to tape some albums from the station's record collection. The radio station was located in a faculty building, about a 20-minute walk from the college where we all lived. Gail had the keys and locked all the doors behind us. The station consisted of two rooms, a large, rectangular room housing an office area, with two glass-walled studio booths partitioned off on one long side, and a storage room housing the library. The entrance door was in the long wall opposite Studio A. The door to the library was in the short wall next to Studio B. Other than the library, the entire area is visible from either of the two studios. Gail commenced her shift using Studio B, while Jay set up in Studio A with some blank cassette tapes and I headed into the library to pick some albums. The record library was fantastic. Four walls of floor-to-ceiling shelving, packed solid with classic rock LPs, I was standing on a chair, choosing some music from the top shelf, when I started feeling that there was someone, or something, behind me. Almost, but not quite touching me. I was telling myself not to turn around, that there's nothing there, and so on. But the feeling got so strong that I really wanted to get my back against the wall. I have personal space issues, and the sensation of anything being that close was just too much for me and I had to get out of there. I grabbed a couple of records, took them to Jay, and then I went to talk to Gail in Studio B. From where I was sitting, facing Gail, who had her back to the main room, I could see the entire radio station. Jay was in the studio to my right, and the main door was diagonally to my right. The one and only door to the record library was diagonally to my left, all clearly visible through the glass walls of the studio booths. I watched Jay get up, leave Studio A, walk across the office space from right to left behind Gail and enter the record library. As he disappeared into the library, a figure in blue came out of the library door, crossed rapidly from left to right behind Gail, and entered Studio A. I turned my head to look directly into Studio A, but nobody was there. About 15 minutes later, Jay came out of the record library and walked back to Studio A. Immediately, the blue figure shot out of Studio A, crossed behind Gale, and went back into the library. 
Gail must have seen my eyes following it, because she said, quite excitedly, You saw it, didn't you? I knew if there really was something here, you would know. It turns out that Gail had been feeling like she wasn't alone up there at night, and having heard some of my experiences, she decided to try an experiment. She kept her experiences to herself, and then waited to see if I picked up anything. Gee, thanks, Gail. It also turns out, I guess, that while Jay ain't afraid of no ghost, the ghosts seem to be afraid of him. I've always been a big fan of ghost stories and spooky things, but I've never had a story happen directly to me. I've always wanted to or have been excited by experiencing these things. I've just never had an incident that has made me fully commit to saying I've had a ghost experience. However, I usually ask people that I'm comfortable with, do you have any ghost stories? Most of the time I hear some pretty great stories. I have a lot from family, and some crazy ones from my girlfriend, who I think is like the boy from The Sixth Sense. I'm generally quite a skeptic, but I have fun getting a spooky story nonetheless. Last night when I was at work, I asked my boss if he has any ghost stories. He said that he did. He told me this story whilst cleaning up the bar that he owns. I can only take it as truth, as he admitted to me that he's still somewhat skeptical about it all. But the more he thinks about it, the more he thinks it was a ghost encounter, rather than just a strange occurrence. This is a story that he retold to me while we both admitted to getting goosebumps. My boss Tom was living in the UK and was moving out to Sydney, Australia to work on a big project that required long round-the-clock hours. This included working primarily in front of his laptop. Tom's wife's stepsister owned a house here in Sydney that was located in a rather old-timey area near the ports and docks. The stepsister was going away for a while and offered her townhouse for Tom to stay in whilst he was working on this crazy busy project. So he flew out and stayed there, by himself. The main bedroom was located on the top floor of the townhouse. At the far end of the room, there was a slant in the roof that only gave a small amount of distance to the floor and the roof. So the designers made a built-in wardrobe to make use of the awkward space. The bed was situated near the doors of these wardrobes, though I don't know how far. One night when Tom was asleep, he was woken up by the sound of deep sobbing. He woke up in a panic and was thinking that it was possibly a fox, as they roughly make the sound of a crying baby at times. The tone was kind of low and made him think that it was a man. He also noticed that the cries were coming from the wardrobe area, which also backed into the wall that was shared with the neighbors. Not thinking much about it, he thought maybe the neighbors were having a rough night and he tried to sleep again. This happened again the next night, and then the night after that. Eventually, Tom was woken up by the sobbing sound and started to get more suspicious of it rather than ignoring it. He sat up in bed and was looking at the wardrobe doors in the dark. He heard the cries for a moment until one of the wardrobe doors popped open right at the moment that he was sitting up paying attention to them. Tom jumped out of bed at this sight and raised his fist in the air, getting ready to punch or defend himself at whoever came out of it. But no one did. Nothing did. He stood there for a moment, then grabbed his bag and hurried downstairs. Tom, sitting in the lounge room downstairs, got his things and prepared for the day and decided to stay at a friend's house for the remaining days he had in Australia, because he was getting too spooked to go and sleep there another night. Trying to be rational about it, Tom thought that maybe the things in the wardrobe were pushed up against the door and it just popped open. The more he thinks about it, though, the more he thinks about how strange it was. He never spoke to his stepsister about it, out of embarrassment, I guess. Years later, they were at a family function, and he was talking to her about the time he stayed there, and asked her about her neighbors, and who lived next door. The stepsister said to him that the next door house had been unoccupied since she bought the place. Nobody was living there. I have strong reason to believe that Tom was telling the truth in this story, as you just tell when people are trying to get a rise out of you, you know? Or tell the best story in town? This just wasn't the case. 
Either way, after hearing that story, I just had to share it. This story happened many years ago, around the months of June and July. My family and I often go up and vacation at a cabin in Yungaburra, Cairns, Australia during the winter. We do this as we miss the cold days that we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during the winter, as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungaburra is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that if you blink, you'll miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 or more years of heritage. As usual with rich heritage and small towns, local folk legends from over the years accumulated. One of these legends ended up coming true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands, and it was next door to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up a somewhat steep dirt road that also leads to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. This dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungaburra. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungaburra. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, did not have anywhere to drive the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 and I decided that I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk, so after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized that not driving was a dumb idea, as it was about five Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper on and that was it. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder and I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway and God did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was very wrong. After I turned my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog. And then it surpassed heavy fog. And then I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, well, here we fucking go. Something's about to happen. Get it over and done with. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew that there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom and the last thing I wanted was to fall into it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, Son, is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mum. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed the light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up the steps and I heard the door open, so I knew that I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction that I had seen it last. I was calling out for my mom to turn it back on, and there was no reply. I finally ran into a wooden guardrail, literally, and some steps. I walked up the steps, and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I wasn't home. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying open in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There are three things you do in this type of situation. The three F's, if you will. Flight, fight, or freeze. And I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. 
I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mom's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then that I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorstep of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, My son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. It took a chunk out of my knee and I had cuts all along my hands. I still have some scars from it. I turned around and realized that I had not tripped over a stone. Well, not any stone. I had tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed, got up and started to run even more. I was screaming for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought that I got far enough away from the house. Until little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the metal at the end was just my life. Before I knew it, slam, I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out, and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night, and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me some time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over, and perhaps give me some insight into what I had experienced and what my dad saw. He and I sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend, according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first ones built, late 19th century, during the 1910s or something. A well-known mother, Anne was her name, had let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late, and as it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then, heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps and she told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she was not accompanied by her son. It wasn't until the next morning that they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He had hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently that of her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late, cold, dark nights mistaking them for her own lost son. The Yunga Burra Fog is one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I've gotten used to generic things, stuff moving, stuff missing, shadows, all that sort of thing. So I wanted to share something truly unique that happened to me. In 2013, I worked as a baker at a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It's still in business. It was a super old building, and it had a reputation for being haunted, at least among the staff. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. So I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m., unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that the dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. 
I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks that was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle managed to get on top of the tarp I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my co-workers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other co-worker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal things and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about these things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of the cabinet beneath the sink, when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words, and it had texture. It was like nothing I've ever heard before. It was like somebody was speaking from another dimension, almost filled with static. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't a song playing on the radio, because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my co-worker behind me, but after finding no other explanation, I turned around to face her and said, What was that noise? My co-worker looked at me and said, I thought it was you. We both froze in disbelief, and at the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. Neither of us could reach it. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on top of the espresso bar moving, so we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches in the air, wiggled a bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was so utterly in awe of what had just happened, I remember saying out loud, Okay, I get it now. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day it remains the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I've ever witnessed. I took this picture about three years ago in Bisbee, Arizona, and I'm just now sharing it because I've yet to find any explanation. I heavily believe in ghosts, and I believe this is one, but I'm looking for anyone who might tell me different also. I went to Bisbee because it's haunted, and I love going to haunted places, but I've never caught any evidence of experiences besides this. I took this picture with a flash at around 3 a.m facing into a completely empty courtyard. I was just walking around the whole town snapping dumb pictures to find anything. Not a single soul was out, and it was very late. I didn't see anybody when the flash lit up this area, and if I saw a person in a white dress standing in front of me, human or not, I would have freaked out, because I'm the jumpiest person ever, and I was alone. But I saw no one. I went back to my hotel room at the Copper Queen, and when I saw this, I just couldn't sleep. The first picture here is original. The second is with the exposure kicked all the way up on my iPhone's basic editing app. Also, I took a picture of faces around this tree, but I'm not going to post those because I honestly think it's just matrixing and my own brain messing with me. I would love to know if anybody has an explanation for the woman, though. In the fall of August 2013, I was set to begin my first semester at Arizona State University in Tempe, and I had to attend an orientation in the middle of campus. After making the 30-minute drive earlier than anticipated, 
My grandma pulled into the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church, where we exchanged conversation for about 15 minutes to kill time. There was a gardener in front of us tending the flowers, and only one black sedan parked directly next to us that I hadn't noticed earlier when we pulled in. As we unceremoniously prepared to get out of the car, something caught my grandma's eye in her periphery as she reached for her seatbelt button in the direction of my passenger seat. She quickly gasped, placing her right hand on her chest as she chuckled and then quipped, Wow, I thought I saw a ghost. Looking directly at her without turning as she let out another nervous chuckle, I asked her what the hell she was talking about. The parking lot at this point was dead silent, and the gardener was busy tending the flowers in the building opposite the church. Not expecting much, I slowly and nervously turned to my right, where the four-door black sedan was parked to the right of us, only to come in direct eye contact with what appeared to be a woman of Asian heritage, with a bob haircut and a pinstripe suit business attire, staring at us for no discernible reason. With the dead stare she was giving us, it could be assumed that she'd been staring for longer than we had noticed her. What made this individual terrifying was the lack of life in her eyes. I only looked for what felt like five seconds, but could feel that glassy, uncanny valley, lights are on but nobody's home kind of corpse appearance. The color of this entity's skin was a pale color that I could only associate with a corpse at the time. Her mouth moved slowly and developed into one of the most unsettling half-smiles I've ever seen as her dead eyes looked at my grandma and I, unwavering. In this deafening silence, my grandma and I turned back to each other, chuckled uncomfortably, and slowly got out of the car, refusing to look at the terrifying entity or the person in the car next to us. While my grandma claims that she forgot about this incident, she believes it probably did happen whenever I tell her about it. If anybody can help me with identifying this type of entity, or if you've seen something similar, I would really be appreciative. I know that certain areas of Tempe are haunted, and the campus as well, but I couldn't find any information on an incident like this. And this happened a few years back. I was visiting the U.S. in Arizona because my cousin was graduating from college. I promised that I would arrive a night before his graduation to help him put the house in party condition. I arrived on a pretty late flight and I didn't have my own car, so my cousin came to pick me up from the airport. It was about two o'clock in the morning and we were driving on a long road that was basically in the middle of nowhere. I was about to fall asleep, but my cousin woke me up and said that there was a wolf right in front of us next to the road. I had never seen a wolf in the wild before, so it was a little exciting. Just when we were about to drive past him, he stood up and started running, with only two feet. He was running right next to our car for about five seconds, and when we looked at him again, he looked more like a human who was wearing animal fur on his upper body. After telling the story to others, they told me that we probably saw a skinwalker. What do you guys think? Has anyone else experienced something like this? This happened about three years ago but it has really affected how I think about ghosts and the paranormal. When I tell friends, some of them find it very creepy, while others say that they don't believe in anything supernatural, and while it's odd, they feel there must be a natural explanation. I took a family vacation, me, my parents, and two siblings, over Christmas. All of us were already adults at this time, and while my family is agnostic and holds out judgment for the afterlife, none of us are religious or believe that there is a true afterlife with heaven or hell. 
That said, my parents thought it would be fun for us to stay at a haunted hotel in Jerome, Arizona, on our way to a resort town farther down the road. This whole town is supposedly haunted, but especially the hotel, which used to be a mental hospital that has long since been converted. We checked in and were given one of the most supposedly haunted suites because we needed two large adjoining rooms for everyone to fit. So far, everything's normal. Until we get to the room, my mom and sisters suddenly smell something that they described as putrid in a spot in one of our rooms. I couldn't smell it, so I dismissed it and moved on. We took a walk around town and I asked a bakery owner about the haunted stories and she said it's just accepted that sometimes things fly off her shelves at home, but nothing hostile. Here's where the weird stuff starts. We signed up for the nighttime tour of the hotel in a largish group of people and we were all given electromagnetic readers while we walk around and hear the stories of mental patients that had died there. Halfway through the tour, my dad and sister hear a sound and turn around to see the doorknob of a room next to them shaking and rattling incessantly. I didn't personally see it, so by this time I was getting bored. I always thought it would be cool if ghosts existed, but I don't really believe they can do anything to affect the physical world. I asked my other sister to take some Instagram pictures of me in a cool-looking couch in one of the supposedly haunted suites, and she took some quick shots. I passed my hand over the table in front of me to pose, when I felt an extremely cold chilling sensation in my hand and wrist, and I told her to stop. When I looked at the photos, I was shocked. I have a series of three photos where you can see that I'm switching around with a startled look on my face, shaking my hand, and there's a white cloud streaking around my hand and wrist in the photos that appears and disappears throughout the three pictures. Needless to say, I was scared. I was no longer willing to sleep on my own, so I took the bed with my mom. Yes, I know. My dad and sisters slept a bit and went to walk around in the middle of the night in the boiler room where they said they felt some weird stuff. I don't remember exactly what happened, but one of them felt a sudden strong chill on their back. Meanwhile, I was sleeping and my mom suddenly woke up and slammed her hand on the dresser. She said sorry and then went back to sleep. She's never been a sleepwalker or ever moved in her sleep, but whatever. I slept pretty deeply that night, but I kept being woken up by a super loud clanking and rattling in the halls that sounded like gurneys being wheeled back and forth. This is not a busy hotel, in the middle of the desert. In the morning, my family said that they heard it too, but when my dad and sisters walked around, they saw nothing. In the morning, my mom said she had a dream that there was a little boy and a young nurse talking to him. Then the nurse aged and became mean and scowling and raised her hand to hit the boy. She said she then heard a voice telling her to hit him herself. This is why she hit the dresser. Keep in mind that this was a mental hospital and one of the ghosts there is supposed to be a little boy, but no one knows why or how he died. Does anyone else have experiences like this? For me, the photos are really what made me believe that something was going on that was beyond the natural. Obviously, for privacy reasons, I don't want to share those photos, but they do exist. The fact that my family can confirm some of the things that happened also makes me not want to dismiss it so easily. But at the same time, I don't know how to explain any of this. I am a 23-year-old female, and I wanted to share what I would call my first real encounter. Even as a lifelong skeptic, I can't explain this one. If you're familiar with U.S. ghost hunting spots, you might have heard of the Copper Queen Hotel in Bisbee, Arizona. It's been open since 1902 and has been the subject of multiple paranormal investigations and shows and there are supposedly three documented ghosts that inhabit it. That of a drowned child, a man in a top hat, 
and a forlorn prostitute. My boyfriend Coop and I decided on Saturday morning that we would take a trip to make up for a missed birthday. We had never gone on a real trip together, so we didn't really plan it that well, or at all. We just realized we were about an hour and a half from Bisbee and decided to book a hotel once we got there. We chose the Copper Queen because it's the most prominent hotel in the area, and it's right in the middle of everything. We weren't aware of its reputation as a paranormal hotspot. The room itself was old looking, as to be expected with a hotel of that age. Yellowing wallpaper, splintering wood floors, dim lighting, all of it. The locks on the door were pretty flimsy, and you had to actively yank it shut or it would fall open again. We joked that it looked like the Tower of Terror. After a day of walking around, we came back to get changed. We heard a creaking noise, and I had Coop check under the bed, only half seriously, but I was still relieved that nobody and nothing was there. We grabbed a lighter and went out for a smoke, and then came back, showered and watched TV for a little, and then we turned out the lights. The moment we shut the lights off, there was a variety of clicks, creaks, and pops in very odd patterns. It being an old room, and us being a logical couple, we figured it was the old fan, or the wall-mounted AC. I was listening to this noise when I felt Coop freeze up next to me. Is that you? I responded, no, that was the AC. No, not that, he said. Seriously, is that you? I asked what he meant and waited a minute or so before asking again. Finally, he answered. I was trying to listen. Babe, I hear someone breathing. We reasoned that it was the room next door and settled back into our pillows. But then I remembered there wasn't another room on that side. Our room was the first on the landing, and the side we were closest to, the side that Coop would have been able to hear, if at all, was the main staircase. Coop, being a 21-year-old boy, is blessed with the ability to fall asleep within seconds. I could hear him snoring, and his legs were over mine, but I was too anxious to sleep. I then felt the lightest tap of the quilt, just next to my feet, on top of them. I froze, but tried to reason to myself that Coop had just twitched in his sleep. A few moments passed, and I thought I had imagined the whole thing, and then I felt a pinch and a tugging motion at the same time on the same area of the quilt. I woke Coop up and demanded he check under the bed. I was still reasoning that there was a non-supernatural explanation for the events, and it occurred to me that although we had checked before leaving for our walk, we hadn't checked after. The flimsy lock and the fact that the door was difficult to close made it seem likely that somebody could have snuck in. Coop was too groggy to be useful, so I grabbed my phone, turned the flashlight on, and leapt as far from the bed as I could while crouching to check what was under it. Nothing. We were both a little freaked out by this point and agreed to turn the TV back on to drown out anything weird. We turned on Futurama and settled back into bed for the third time. Again, Coop fell asleep within seconds. I was drifting off when I heard the audio on the TV cut somehow. It suddenly shifted tone to where it sounded like a grainy VHS instead of a streaming adult cartoon. I heard a woman say something about a phantom and then a blood-curdling scream from the television. At this point, I was too scared to open my eyes, so I steadied my breathing and pretended to be asleep. That's the last event I could recall, and upon checking out the next day, the manager asked if we had experienced anything. That's when we googled the hotel and found out about its history of hauntings. So there it is. Nothing too crazy compared to some other stories, but I've definitely never experienced anything like that before, and I don't have any explanation outside of the supernatural. This all started after my dad died last October. We quickly moved in with my grandparents. We lived in California, but now we're in Arizona. 
Anyway, a few months after that, I went swimming there in the pool. My mom was out there talking to me, and then she went inside to get me a towel. While she was still inside, maybe five minutes later, I went underwater. But before my head went under, I saw the glimpse of a black silhouette. I came back up, thinking that it was my mom. But I looked around, and she wasn't there. She came back outside about ten minutes after that and I told her all about it. She said that she had been seeing it too, but didn't tell me the specifics. The second and last time I saw it was the middle of last month. My mom and sister went back to California to get some of our stuff from the storage we have there. They've been gone two nights by this time. It was around 2.30 to 3.30 in the morning. I have insomnia, so I'm usually always up at this time. I was starting to get tired, and I dozed off at probably about 2.50. I was only asleep for about two minutes before I heard three loud-ass bangs on my door. I usually get jump-scared in my dreams by a fast movement, but never a loud noise, so I was pretty freaked out. I jumped up and looked around, but I didn't see anything. A few minutes later, I finally got the courage to get out of bed. I walked out of my room, and I went down to the restroom across the hall. Before I got into the doorway, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the silhouette again. I looked back, but nothing was there. I don't usually get scared, but that night, holy crap, I was terrified. I talked to my mom and sister about it, and my sister said that she hadn't seen it. But like I said, my mom has seen it. My mom thinks it's my dad, but it doesn't even look like him. And why would he be trying to scare us? Why would he show up as a shadow instead of just himself? No one else that I know has seen it, though. If anyone knows what this is or has heard something like it, please tell me. So, a little backstory. My partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally go and visit him. I live in Scotland. So, I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. While we both are interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences, whereas he tends to just humor me, not believing much of it himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment, but I saw, heard, and felt small things the first couple of days I was there. One morning in particular, at around 4 a.m., I was on the sofa, playing on my phone, dealing with jet lag, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to the shadow person phenomenon, just a dark humanoid shape, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned, almost as if it was startled to see somebody else in the room, never mind someone who could also see it. It did a sort of double take, and then disappeared, but the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I've come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy, with the exception of later that day, when I was taking a nap. I felt what I thought was my partner standing over me and watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and I felt the negative presence over me, as though trying to work out who I was and why I was there. I told it in very clear terms that it wasn't welcome, whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine. My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times, once to Jerome, and another to a recreation spot by a lake. I felt a little funny any time we were driving around or near or on the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us traveling through their land. But nothing felt bad, just sort of a curiosity. But one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix after a day at the lake, we were all chatting away in the car, 
when we got into reservation territory. I got that not-alone feeling again, but still, it was curious, though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation, and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down, when in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know he was Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anybody else had seen him, they all said no, despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, completely white, clothes, hair, and everything, with an aura of hazy light around him, simply standing watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. It was comforting. I don't really know why I'm telling anybody this, other than I felt that I needed a lighter story to go with the spookier one at the beginning. I hope you enjoyed, and if you've ever had similar experiences, I'd be happy to know about them. This happened about a year ago in Tucson, Arizona. It was my first time visiting Arizona, and I had no idea how many allegedly haunted places were in the small downtown area of Tucson. It was really exciting for me, as someone who was basically born obsessed with the paranormal and with mysteries in general. I was there with two other females, a friend that I traveled there with and an acquaintance who lived there and was hosting us. It was our first night there, and the woman we were staying with took us out to see the city and have a few drinks. We visited a couple supposedly haunted bars and did a quick round of karaoke before we started walking home. By this time, our host was clearly pretty drunk, but my friend and I were very chill and clear-headed. The house we were staying at was located on the same street, and just a couple of blocks away from the oldest bar in Tucson. It was about 1.30 in the morning. We were talking and laughing, just enjoying the night. The streets weren't empty, but there also weren't many people out. When we turned the corner onto her street, the bar was about two blocks ahead of us and was brightly lit, but the area we were currently in was fairly dark. I was kind of looking down when my friend said, Um, you guys? Don't freak out, but there's a guy in a cape walking toward us right now. I looked up and my stomach flipped. There was a man in a thick black hooded cloak heading in our direction. I instantly felt uncomfortable because he was moving with a slow, steady, heavy gait, and he was walking down the very middle of the street, which seemed really odd. As soon as we noticed him, he began moving from the center of the road and veering off toward his left, as if he was intending to come up onto the sidewalk and face us. My heart instantly began racing and I pulled my friend closer to me. We kept walking but slowed down just a little, anticipating his move onto the sidewalk. There were cars lined up along the sidewalk, parked at a diagonal, and the man stepped between two cars in order to reach the sidewalk but he didn't emerge. As we came closer to where he should have been, I was afraid he was going to jump out from between the cars, but he wasn't there at all. He wasn't in any of the cars either. This would have been enough to totally freak me out, but at that moment I looked up, and there he was, now nearly 20 feet ahead of us, walking down the very middle of the street again, but this time walking away from us and toward the bar. At this point, I knew something very weird was going on, and I became absolutely fixated on him, like I wanted to study every little nuance of his movement, just trying to process what was even going on. I could see his black boots sticking out from the bottom hem of the cloak. It went all the way down to his ankles. I watched how the fabric swayed heavily with his lumbered steps. He looked huge and powerful. He looked just as solid and as real as me or my friends or anyone else. As he drew closer to the bar, he began again veering off toward the sidewalk and the entrance to the bar. 
The bar was on the same side of the street as us, and we were about one block away by this time. He stepped up onto the sidewalk and headed directly for the entrance. At this point, two women walked out of the bar and walked right past him. I mean, should have brushed up against him or ran into him, but never even acknowledged his presence. They then stood outside, just a foot or two away from him, talking and flipping their hair, never even glancing back once. They definitely did not see him. At this same instant, I noticed that he had stopped at the entrance to the bar. There's a really big, super bright sign just about the entrance that glows the name of the bar, so he was perfectly illuminated now. With him standing there, I had a clear perspective of his height. He was taller than the top of the door. The tip of his hood was only a few inches below the bottom of the lit up sign. He had his head slightly down, and I noticed that his feet seemed to be stuck mid-step. It was the strangest thing. It was almost like looking at a computer glitch. One foot was in front of the other, slightly raised up with the heel touching the ground, but he was just rocking back and forth like he was stuck in the motion of taking the step. Then our drunk friend, who had noticed none of this, said something, and I glanced in her direction. When I looked back at him a millisecond later, he was gone. We even went into the bar and he was nowhere there, and there's nowhere he could have gone. They had CCTV cameras with the videos being displayed right there above the bar, but I was too shy to ask if they could check for footage. This experience has absolutely haunted me ever since. His presence didn't necessarily feel scary, although I was afraid right at first when I thought he was some creepy dude wandering the streets in a cape. But when I realized he wasn't human, I felt calm and almost comforted by his energy. I couldn't stop talking about it afterward and wondering what it was we saw. We passed by that bar several more times over the rest of our stay, and each time there was a person just standing there leaning up against a pole outside the bar, who either followed us for a block or tried to talk to us, and it just seemed odd. My friend strangely began kind of seeming to detach herself from me as the days progressed. We were roommates at the time, and when we got home from the trip, she dropped me off at our apartment and went straight to her boyfriend's house. I didn't see or hear from her for almost a week. It really felt like she was trying to avoid me. I started spiraling into a deep depression. Within four months, our friendship had completely deteriorated in the worst way. We ended up moving out of the apartment that summer, and were no longer friends at all. Although there are clear circumstances that led to this and I take responsibility for my role in the friendship breakup, I always wonder if that encounter in Arizona influenced any of it to happen, because when I look back it really seemed like there was some kind of turning point in the way she felt toward me after that. Just to be clear, ever since we stopped being friends, my life has been richer and more joyous and more fulfilling than ever. All these things in my life practically rearranged themselves when she and I began fighting, and now I'm genuinely happier, and I feel more loved and supported than I ever have. Whether or not that cloaked entity had anything to do with it, I'm very grateful to have had that experience. It's the most potent, paranormal, and mysterious experience I've had to date. I'm wondering if anyone else has ever seen anything like this before, or had their lives dramatically changed after encountering the other side. My father had training in Phoenix this week, so we left Las Vegas on Sunday and passed through Jerome for dinner. We didn't stay, but we planned to pass through the town before, so we watched Ghost Adventures and did a tad bit of research on the hotel. The Jerome Grand Hotel in Arizona is apparently haunted, and we thought that was kind of cool. We got to Jerome around 6 p.m. and went to the hotel to eat dinner at the Asylum restaurant inside. When we first got there, I had to use the restroom. Entering the male's bathroom closet to the restaurant, I walked into an empty bathroom with the three urinals out of order and just one stall near the very end. I supposed that they left the bathrooms the same from when it was a hospital, 
since it looked like one of the blue and whitish old hospital rooms. Being in that bathroom gave me a very eerie feeling. Not hearing a sound made me constantly on alert for the unexplained footsteps or disembodied voices or breaths. I didn't notice anything except how much I was shaking, but when I finally exited the restroom, the unsettling feeling that I felt within carried throughout the rest of the building. We then just sat down for dinner about an hour or two, and nothing weird happened during that. Then, when we were finished with dinner at around 8 p.m., my dad wanted to get going because we needed to get to the hotel in Phoenix for his training that week, but I was desperate to at least check out the hotel part of the building and see room 23, supposedly the room with the most activity in the hotel. So before we left, we took a visit to the floor above the restaurant, and my father got a picture of me in front of the door to that room. After that, I decided to just pull out my phone and take some live pictures. I only took three the first two being down the hallway from room 23, which had no weird anomalies in them, and the final picture being just a quick one of the stairs closest to room 23 that led to the floor above. After that, we finally exited the building and went back to our ride to Phoenix. I didn't look at the photos directly after taking them, and only remembered to give them a look after I couldn't get any service a little while after exiting Jerome. That's when I saw the first two photos, and despite being a little disappointed that I didn't receive anything, finally came to the last photo I took real quick before I left, and I noticed what looked like an orb moving down the stairs. There have been stories of the spirit of a little girl roaming the property, and the orb moving in a hop-like pattern down the stairs seemed, in my opinion, to be a pretty childish gesture, as I commonly hopped down the stairs when I was younger. A few days after we visited Jerome, while we were sleeping at a hotel in Phoenix, I had just fallen asleep before I dramatically awoke after dreaming or visualizing the image of electricity slowly moving through a solenoid before reaching a core, which then caused me to wake up. It had the similar feeling of when you wake up from that feeling of falling, but this felt a little different. I'm not sure if it's related to my time at the Jerome Grand Hotel, due to the fact that I haven't experienced anything else, but I thought I would share it anyway, just in case. This happened on a family trip to Texas. We rented an RV to travel across the state with. We live in Florida. We left on a Tuesday. We were off to Texas to visit my cousin and her kids, so the family decided since we're here, why not go to Arizona to see the Grand Canyon, Mystery Mountain, OK Corral, and the Painted Desert. The interesting part of the story happened when heading into Mystery Mountain. We had to travel around this dark, deserted track around the mountain with no guardrail. And if you opened your door, you were looking down a cliff. So we traveled, and my father had rented an SUV to make his trip. He calls it white-knuckling when you drive some dangerous roads. We didn't see any other lights than the ones from our headlights, and finally we get all the way to the bottom. All of the men get out of the car to use the bathroom. Like I said, no lights on the way up or behind us. No one leading up to the track we had taken. Then, we see something strange. A motorcycle passes us, with a female and a male on it. It was not going that fast. The thing that was odd, other than the fact that we didn't see their lights, is that the bike went about 30 feet and then disappeared. We saw all of it and then, poof, nothing. To this day, none of us can explain what happened. This is a story that happened to me years ago that I never really talk about much. I thought it might be interesting to tell the story. When I was a teenager, I made money by babysitting. 
On this particular night, I was working at a house a few minutes from my home, so I had been able to work later than usual. The family had two little girls that I was watching, around four to seven years old. First, to give a bit of background on what the home looked like, which will be important later, the house had two floors and two staircases that led to the upstairs. One set was off the kitchen, and the other was in the foyer. This home had an alarm system that would beep three times when any door was opened, although it would not say which door it was. I was sitting in the kitchen at around 11 p.m. and coloring to pass the time at the kids' table. The parents had said they would be home between 11.30 and midnight, and I was starting to get antsy to go home. I heard the alarm for the door and got up, expecting to see the parents coming in. When they didn't, I went back to what I was doing. About 15 minutes later, it went off again. This time I felt a little creeped out, so I went around checking all the doors, which I all found to be shut tight and locked. I sat back down, figuring that there must be some kind of glitch in the system. Within about a minute, the door alarm went off twice, as if two doors had been opened in quick succession, and as I stood up, I heard a little girl screaming bloody murder. I raced up the stairs into the girl's shared room, and I found them both sleeping soundly. I checked all the nooks and crannies of their room, and I remember feeling that the only thing that seemed different was that the book that I had read to them was on the floor instead of on the bookshelf. I ended up checking the stairs and the other rooms as I felt pretty unsure of the girl's safety, but I found nothing, and all the doors were still locked. I ended up sitting back down in the kitchen, feeling stupid, and not long after, the alarm beeped once, really loudly, which I had never heard before, and the panel didn't seem to give an explanation for what this meant. After that, everything stopped, and the parents came home not long after. I managed to convince myself at the time that I was just imagining things, but after all this time, I can still remember the fearful scream very clearly. Nothing too exciting, but something that I've never been able to forget. I know this story is probably the most cliché, horror movie plot sounding thing in the world, but I assure you that it's 100% real. For reference, this happened in 2013. There's this family that I babysit for. They go to church with my folks and are truly the nicest people I've ever met. They're devout, non-denominational Christians, and they don't believe in ghosts or spirits or even demons, really, just as a background. They also live in the boondocks of suburban Georgia. I mean, they're not too far away from civilization, maybe five minutes to the nearest 7-Eleven, but they're far enough removed from society that you can't see their house from the nearest paved road. The dad's a contractor. He bought the land and built the place himself. It's actually really nice, but it's in the middle of the forest, which makes the place creepy from the get-go but I digress. The house itself is a one-story ranch style. The front door opens into the living area, and the bedrooms are off down the hall to your left. The kitchen and dining area is to your right, and beyond that, the garage. The first and only time I stepped foot into the place was August of 2013. Like I said, we live in Georgia, so it feels like Satan's armpit outside, but the house is freezing. Not air conditioning cold, either. It's that unnerving, bone-chilly kind of cold that no amount of blankets can rectify. I actually checked the thermostat a few times during my stay, and it was set on 76. My teeth shouldn't have been chattering. Something else that's weird, and I feel like it ought to be mentioned before we get started proper, it's dark in the house. Even with the lights on, it's hard to see into the next room and that's in broad daylight. At night, it's even worse. I never really understood how they lived there. 
I'm not one for sunny days, but I do like to see where I'm going. Anyway, so the parents leave for wherever they were headed, and the kids, a boy about six and a girl about three, are fed, washed, and in bed by 8.30. Now I'm left to my own devices, and I end up channel surfing. For a while, maybe an hour, everything is hunky-dory. And then I hear the garage door open. A minute later, I hear the back door, the door that leads from the kitchen into the garage, open and shut, and footsteps wander around the kitchen. The kitchen floor is made of stonework, so it has a pretty distinct sound when it's trod upon, especially by dress shoes. My first thought was, oh, they're home early, fantastic. So I turned the TV off, straightened up the couch where I had been lounging, and prepared to greet them. But I look down the hallway, and it's dark. All the lights are off at that end of the house. Now, if you look down the hallway, you can see into the kitchen, but you're looking directly at the door that leads to the garage. There's nobody there. Nobody opened the garage door, and nobody is in the kitchen. Meaning that nobody just made a hell of a lot of noise that I can't explain. So I'm freaked, but I do the thing that everybody does. I go to check it out just to make sure. Except that uh, I flipped on light switches because I've seen enough horror movies to know that wandering around in the pitch darkness is no bueno. I checked everything out. Nada. Door's still locked. Garage hasn't budged. Now I know I heard what I heard. I'm pretty sure it wasn't something in the show that I was watching. I legitimately thought the parents were home. Whatever. I shake it off and settle back down again. Maybe my mind is playing tricks on me. Isn't that what everybody says the first time something weird happens? Another 15 minutes go by and I'm engrossed in one of the Harry Potter movies when, during a lull in the film, I hear it again. Garage door, back door opening and shutting, footsteps in the kitchen. Only this time it's accompanied by voices. I mute Harry and look over the back of the couch, fully expecting to see Ma and Pa strolling into the living room. Of course, there's nothing there. After maybe a minute, the voices disappear. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but there were definitely at least two, and one of them was definitely male. Once again, I get up and go look in the kitchen, flicking on lights as I go. This time, I'm greeted by something new. The refrigerator door is standing wide open. They have one of those fancy stainless steel gizmos and the thing swinging back and forth like a leaf in the wind. Now this is haunting 101, right? Every ghost learns to stomp around noisily and open doors on their first day, I guess. But this thing had a childproof locking mechanism on it. Great. So now ghosts can not only open doors, they can solve complex tasks to accomplish the feat. I shut the fridge and wander back down the hallway again, but I don't get into the living area good before it sounds like all hell's broken loose in the kitchen. It's kind of hard to describe the loudness of this noise. It was as if every piece of china these people owned had been taken out of the cupboards and hurled to the ground simultaneously, ceramic shattering against stone. Well, great, now I'm in trouble. Casper's gone and destroyed the flatware, and I'm going to be blamed for it. I run back down the hallway, but the kitchen is in order. Not the remotest sign of damage. The noise wakes up the kids, and they come out of their rooms rubbing their eyes, asking me what's happened. My skin is crawling, but I don't want to upset them. So I lie, and I tell them that I'm sorry, but it was just something on TV and that the noise got a little louder than I expected. The boy buys the fib. He toddles off back to bed like a good little soldier, but the girl isn't so convinced. In fact, she looks directly past me, down the hallway to the kitchen, as if she knows exactly what it was that woke her up. She sees that I've muted the Chamber of Secrets and asks if she can stay with me for a while, just until she feels like she can go back to sleep. I'm freaked out enough at this point to agree. Having a three-year-old for company is better than none at all, right? 
So together we settle back on the couch. She ends up curling up right next to me and nodding off in a matter of minutes. For a while, things are peaceful. The movie ends and I'm sitting there watching the credits scroll and listening to the theme music when, for no apparent reason, the fireplace next to the TV bursts into flames. Reminder, these people live in the woods. They don't have any newfangled, fancy pants, gas fireplace that you would expect to see in a house in a subdivision. They use actual wood and kindling and actual matches. So while there's always the possibility that they had lit a fire and just didn't put it out all the way, please also remember that we're in Georgia in August. Nobody in their right mind burns a fire in the dog days of summer in the South. It just doesn't happen. But here I am, staring at the roaring, cozy-looking fire, and about that time, I hear the garage door again. This time, however, it's actually the parents. They come traipsing in, jangling keys and dropping their crap on the counter, turning on lights and calling out for me. Dad makes his way into the living room and notices the fire. If you were cold, you could have just adjusted the thermostat, he says. Curious, but not upset that I've apparently decided to set up camp in his living room. I tell him that I didn't start it, and that it started all on its own. He just kind of looks at me funny and mentions that they haven't used the fireplace since the winter before, so there shouldn't be any reason for it to be lit, which I already knew, but ultimately just sort of brushes it off. I figure, whatever, he's obviously got bigger balls than I do if that doesn't freak him out. The mother comes in and picks up the little girl to take her back to bed. She's still half asleep, and I can hear her tell her mom, the old man lit the fire again. Now I know she's half asleep and could very well have just been dream talking, but I somehow doubt that, and I can guarantee you that there was no old man in that house with me, at least not one that I could see. I don't stick around to answer any questions about why the girl was out of bed or who the old man was that she was talking about. The dad pays for my time and I dip out as quickly as I can while still being polite about it. I never went back there to babysit the kids, and just four months after my experience, they moved out of the house that the father had built from the ground up. They said it was something to do with his business, taking him into another town. Funny though, they sold it to another couple in the church, who also moved out within three months of moving in. They wouldn't talk about why, just made vague excuses when my parents asked about it. I don't know who lives there now, if anyone. My partner and I are good friends with another couple that we often go over to hang out with. We'll call them Ashley and David. We go to their house about twice a week, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happens. We usually just hang out and talk for hours, with a few beers. David has mentioned a few times that he has seen Ashley's deceased brother around the house. Ashley always rolls her eyes and says that she doesn't believe in things like that. Ashley took her brother's passing very hard, and she was very close with him. Fast forward to today. Ashley has a son, and we'll call him Adam. She called me and asked me to watch him since he was home sick from school while she goes to work. I agreed and came straight over. Everything was normal. Adam was at the dining room table. He was playing a game on the laptop, still in his pajamas. He's a great kid, never complains or gives anybody trouble. I went to the restroom, which is down the hallway past the living room. This bathroom shares a wall with the master bedroom bathroom wall. As I'm doing my business, I heard the water turn on and off twice from that bathroom, followed by talking. I can hear what sounds like two people talking very fast, but it was muffled. I didn't think much of this. I figured Adam must have wandered in there with the two dogs. He's nine and talks to the dogs like most kids do. I came out of the bathroom to find him still in the same position at the kitchen table, 
and the dog sleeping on the couch. I asked him, hey buddy, did you go into your mom's bathroom and have the water on? He looked puzzled and said, no, I haven't left this table and I don't go in there. I then went to the kitchen sink and noticed it was dry. So the water I heard being turned on had to have come from the master bathroom. What about the talking I heard? I chalked it up to maybe the next door neighbors. A few hours go by and Adam is on the couch with me, watching TV as well as the dogs. I start hearing things being moved in the master bedroom, almost like someone is cleaning up, picking things up and setting them back down. The dogs then start to bark and run to the master bedroom door. This repeated itself every half hour or so until David came home. I explained my experience and he just smiled and nodded. I asked him what he was smiling about and he said, Ashley's brother's ashes are in the bedroom and she recently got the ashes of her stepdad from her sister. She mixed the ashes. That's probably the talking that you heard her brother, and her stepdad. They used to sit in the garage together and just chatter away through the night. At this point, I am creeped out. David is glad that someone believes him now. I told Ashley about my experience, but she refuses to believe any of it. I personally think she's in denial, which I don't blame her for. It's scary stuff, and it's hard to believe unless you experience it for yourself. I've never seen anything paranormal, and I hope I never do, because just hearing things gives me enough chills to last a while. This happened when I was 12 and had just started babysitting our neighbor's three-year-old girl. I am a twin, so at that age my sister and I did everything together, even babysitting. The house next door was built in the 1800s and brought a lot of history. My grandparents actually owned it at one time before inheriting the house next door, the house we lived in. I grew up in an all-female household. My grandfather passed away when we were young, so at the current house it was my grandma, my single mother, my twin sister and I, and our younger sister. I attribute some of the experiences to poltergeists due to the family makeup. I have read several hypotheses where poltergeist activity happens a lot around young females. Anyway, back to the story. My twin and I are at the house built in the 1800s. It's our first night ever babysitting, and it's the parents' first night away from their three-year-old daughter. The daughter screams and screams at the top of her lungs due to the separation from her parents. This goes on and on. My sister and I tried playing with her, talking to her, singing to her, but nothing worked. This was in the mid-90s, so we, as 12-year-olds, did not have cell phones. We used our neighbor's house phone to call my grandma and mom to see what we might do to calm her down. It ends up that they have the answer. Put in a VHS of Barney. It worked like a charm. The kid calms down and goes to bed as scheduled at 8pm with no further issues. My twin and I are sitting on the couch watching TV when at about 9.30 the entire house starts shaking and there's this loud pounding noise. It seems to be coming from the entire house and not one area. We had no idea what to do. We were pretty responsible at that age, so we ran upstairs to check on the baby. She's sound asleep, not even phased with what's going on. We pick up the cordless phone to call my mom and grandma, but the phone is just static. No dial tone and no other phone in the house. This is New York, so there are no earthquakes and no quarries in the area. My sister and I have seen too many horror films and we aren't separating. So we huddle at the top of the stairs where we can keep an eye on the baby but also be in the hallway light. After 10 full minutes, the pounding and shaking finally stops. We try the phone again and it works this time. My mom and grandma, 
didn't hear or feel anything. Both my sister and I were sure, with how loud it was and how violently the house was shaking, that it had to be felt next door and that it had to be something going on in the area, but no one else felt or heard anything. It was such a bizarre experience. We stayed the remainder of the evening with no issues, and we didn't mention it to the parents as we didn't want to come across as crazy as our mom and grandma had already made us feel that we were. We never again experienced anything like that when babysitting. We even returned to that house again, but had no further issues. Last year, my husband and I were babysitting our niece and nephew. Their family lives about an hour and a half from where we live. On this particular visit, their parents were out late, so we didn't actually begin to head home until about one or two in the morning. The area that we live in is in the southeast of the United States, and it is very heavily wooded in most areas. The roads are pretty secluded, and houses are usually far apart from one another and can be miles back off of the actual roads themselves. When we left, my husband was driving and I was in the passenger seat. We'd been traveling down an empty road for probably 45 minutes. There were no houses off to the side, just guardrails and woods. It was slightly foggy as well, but not bad enough to impair vision. I'm not sure how to transition into the next part, other than saying that suddenly, something really weird happened. I was staring straight ahead, also assuming that my husband was as well since he was driving, and a man just appeared partially in the road on my side. He wasn't fully in the road, but enough to alarm an unsuspecting driver in the middle of the night. He was a young man, blonde, and he was wearing a white tank top and brownish-orange pants. He had nothing with him. He was just standing there. I recall the weirdest part of this entire encounter was the way that he was standing and how he was looking at me. He had his back partially turned toward the car as if he was walking, but stopped in his tracks. His head was turned facing the car and his eyes were locked, and I mean locked, on mine. I know that sounds like bull, especially being as we were going 55 miles per hour with bright headlights on and it was the middle of the night. It's probably impossible that he even saw me, let alone locked eyes with me. But that's exactly why this freaked me out so much. We passed him as quickly as we came upon him and then he was gone. I looked at my husband and laughed and said, that was freaking weird. He just looks at me and says, what are you talking about? After asking him several more times, it was determined that he didn't see this person. From my point of view, it was impossible that he didn't see him. This person was almost in the road and was a striking contrast to the surrounding scenery due to the bright clothes he was wearing and how the headlights really displayed that. I didn't even consider this to be linked to a paranormal occurrence until after I realized that I was the only witness and also after I gave more thought into how the whole scenario made me feel really... off. Just how this person really seemed to be looking right at me. I just don't know what to think. If I was going to have a paranormal experience, I guess I should be thankful that it was just this, because I suppose it could have been much worse. I was around 12 when I had gotten a babysitting job with a family across town. This family was new to the area and just recently bought the house next to my best friend's place. My first day over was to get familiar with the kids and the house. The parents stayed and evaluated me and of course answered any questions I had. I spent my time playing and keeping the children occupied. A boy named Devin, age 4 and a girl named Cameron, age seven. 
so I had my work cut out for me. Cameron wanted me to go to her room so she could show me her toys. I followed her up the two flights of stairs, but as we came to the top of the stairs, I felt strangely lightheaded and the hair on my arms rose up. I had an intense feeling of being watched, like there was someone else up there with us. I tried to ignore this sensation and continued with my duties of finding Cameron's favorite doll so we could go back downstairs. At the end of the day, it was decided that I was a good match and I was to come back on Saturday morning. As I headed home, I couldn't shake that feeling that I had gotten upstairs. I told myself, nah, it's nothing. And I brushed it off to just being in a new place with unfamiliar surroundings. That Saturday morning, I showed up to a busy home as the parents tried to get out the door and show me the last minute things I needed for the day ahead. The kids were up in their PJs eating breakfast and already talking to me about all the fun things they wanted to do today. After the parents left, I ushered the kids off to get changed. As I was cleaning up the breakfast dishes, I heard a loud bang coming from the dining room. I ran into the room and found one of the false ceiling tiles had fallen from its place. Puzzled, I tried to put it back up, but it was not an easy task. After some struggling, I managed to fit it back in. I thought, how could this thing have fallen out by itself? The day went on, and now it's close to lunchtime. The kids are watching TV, and I'm in the kitchen making something for lunch, when again I hear a loud bang coming from the dining area. I look, and sure enough, that tile has come out again. This time, I leave it for the parents to see when they get home. I figured maybe they could fix it. Now the kids wanted to play hide and seek. We started off with Cameron seeking and myself and Devin hiding. As Cameron started to count, we scurried around trying to find the best hiding place. I found the downstairs bathroom to be the best place for me. It was easy enough for Cameron to find me and I hid Devin close to me so I could keep an eye on him. As I entered the bathroom, I closed the door quietly behind me. I walked a few steps into the room and was now facing the mirror. As I was looking at my reflection, I also noticed something behind me, moving. It was the closet door directly behind me, slowly opening. The closet door opened halfway and then slowly closed again on its own. I had that same feeling come over me, the one that I had when I was upstairs on my first day. Wide-eyed with fear, I turned the bathroom door and ran out. All I could think was, what just happened? I was really starting to worry that this house was haunted, and I now had every horror movie I ever watched playing through my head. Now I'm finding that I'm really uncomfortable, but I decide that it's best to just keep occupied. I break out a board game for us to play in the living room floor. Hungry Hungry Hippo, I think it was. We were playing for around 20 minutes before I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, moving. I turned my head to see what it was. A child's shoe was tumbling across the floor, all by itself. The kid stopped and watched in utter confusion. I was in disbelief. Cameron let out a scream and she ran for the door. I grabbed Devin and followed. We went to my friend's house next door and told her mom everything. I'm not sure if she believed me, but we stayed over there until the parents got home. When they showed up, we told them what we saw. I don't think they believed me either. I showed the panel that had fallen out. Apparently it's been an issue since they moved in. And as for the rest of my accounts, they chalked it up to a child's excessive imagination. I know what I saw and what I felt. I wasn't imagining. I later found out a bit of history about the house. Apparently, a man died in that house of a heart attack upstairs in a room above the dining room, right above where the panel kept falling out. Sometimes I think it was his spirit still in that house, Maybe he was just trying to play with us. A 
About 13 years ago, my sister lived in a house in a not-so-great neighborhood. You'd come through the kitchen and then the dining room and turn left into the living room. Behind the living room was a hall to the main bathroom and all the bedrooms. The couch was positioned with its back to the hallway. At the end of the hall was a bedroom that always creeped us out. We didn't ever go in there or in the half bath that was inside of it. She mostly has boxes in there. Well, my niece's nursery was right beside that room, and we always had weird stuff happen in there. One time, my sister was asleep and heard a voice scream one of my niece's names in her ear. She got up and ran into the nursery and saw a dark figure over the crib. My niece had gotten tangled in the crib bumpers. The figure looked at her and disappeared. Now, that was the least creepy thing. Whenever I was over, I used to have nightmares about the main bathroom being covered in blood. I have a lot of nightmares, though, so I never thought anything of it. Until one night, I was supposed to be babysitting while she went out on a date night. I was laying on her couch, and she was in the bathroom taking a shower. I'm just hanging out, and I hear her call my name. I called back, What? And she yelled back, Nothing. I just shook it off as her being annoyed, and it happened three more times. Finally, I got up and stormed to the bathroom door and knocked as loud as I could. I said, you're gonna wake up the girls, why do you keep calling me? She was quiet for a second and said, I'm not calling you. I was pretty creeped out, but I went to sit back on the couch to wait for her to be done showering. Then I heard the door of the back bedroom creak. I turned around, looked down the hall, and saw the door open by itself. And then, in my sister's voice, I heard something say, Hey, come here. Nope. She moved out soon after. All kinds of crazy things happened there. We later found out that a man killed his mother in her bathroom and then killed himself, just a few years before my sister lived there. We couldn't remember the address when we found the news story, but it was on the same street and it looked like the house. It would also explain the nightmares I had, so I'm pretty sure that it was definitely that house. This creepy encounter occurred in the fall of 2001. My family lived in a nice house in the middle of some dense woods. A few of my friends consistently brought their four-wheelers with them when they came to spend the night. We had a huge yellow four-wheeler and rode pretty much constantly that year. The woods behind my parents' house had trails, every which way, that snaked around and down the haulers and to the roads. My friends and I, 11 to 12 years old at the time, had these big plans to get street signs and put them on the trees so that all of our trails would have their names proudly displayed. One day, a friend came to stay and we rode around on the trails for hours. When we became bored of the trails, we took off on the main road to a fire training center about three miles away. The fire training center was down a one-lane gravel road with trees butting up to the side so close that a car would get scratched going down it. At the end of the road was a pole gate to keep people like us out. On the way there, we passed by a small pickup truck with two men in it. When we got to the little trail that went down and around the gate, we saw a dead dog wrapped up in a blanket, blocking the path. We decided to turn around because I didn't want to run over the thing. So we started heading back on the main road, and again, about halfway back, we passed the small pickup truck with the men. My friend and I joke that the men are following us because they know we saw the dog that they dropped off and that they hadn't buried it the way they should have. We get almost back to my house and decide we can probably find another trail around the dog, maybe on the other side of the gate. So off we go. We turn on to the little gravel road and go to the end. There is no other trail, no other way around. 
but the dog is kind of laying on half of the blanket. So we sit there for a few minutes while I try to convince my friend if she just tugs on the edge of the blanket, we could move the blanket and the dog out of the way without actually touching or disturbing it. She's not budging, but I really want to ride on the other side of the gate. After a few minutes, it's clear that she is not touching the blanket, so we turn around to head back home. We start back down the gravel road, and after a second, we turn to the straight part. Panic set in quickly. The small pickup is sitting in the road, blocking our only exit. The trees touch both sides of the truck, so there's no going around it. Two large men sit staring at us. After what feels like forever, I whip the four-wheeler around and go through the trail anyway. We get around the gate into safety. Were they watching me try to persuade her to move the blanket? Could they see us the whole time? Were they still moving until we got to the clear part? What would have happened if I hadn't given up on the blanket? Those questions scare me now as much as they did back then. That gravel road only goes to the fire training center, which is blocked off by a large metal gate. A car that pulls down there is only able to back the entire way out onto the main road. Anyway, we soon forgot about it, and it really didn't change much. I like to think that our town is really safe, and that the men were just curious about what the heck we were doing going back and forth. But when I read some stories, I think about what it could have been, how it could have gone differently, and it really freaks me out. I was a child of divorce, and as such, was often taken by my dad on weekends when I was a kid. He spent most of that time waxing his car at my grandparents who lived out in nowhere North Carolina since he lived in a condo with no hoses to wash his precious. Ignored, my brother and I were typically left to our own devices and wandered the fields and woods around my granddad's land, which was about a half hour drive from civilization. My family owned the neighboring homes and great swatches of land between and behind the homes so we could pretty much explore out there for hours. All this said, there were some really disturbing things that happened there, and I personally think they're either too absurd or too subtle to have been my childhood imagination. You can decide for yourselves, though, and I'd love to hear what you guys think might have been going on. Here are some things I remember. My great uncle was the kind of a jack of all trades. He bought and sold used cars. He also bought wrecks to strip and scrap dumping the useless husks in a field and the woods up a trail behind his house. My brother and I called this place the car graveyard. On its own, it was eerie, with cars all the way back from the 50s in various states of disrepair. I used to climb inside them, until I got into one that was tacky, with what might have been dried blood. Sometimes I'd find bones out there, deer mostly, but they'd be in odd places like skulls on car hoods. My guess is that it was just poachers on his land messing around because he didn't hunt, but who knows. I never saw any with skin or fur. One day, my brother and I were going to the car graveyard, but up the trail to it, we started to hear what sounded like pained moaning up ahead, where the derelicts were. We turned tail that day. Oddest, perhaps, from the car graveyard, was the one time we actually went really far back to see just how deep the cars went. It continued into the woods for a while, with trees sometimes growing right out of the wrecks. My brother and I saw something ahead that looked like fog or mist, which reminds me of another story, but that's for another day. We didn't think much about it because we were kids, but this was mid-afternoon and the mist was only in one area. We passed on through and felt inexplicably weird and decided to give up on seeing just how far back it went. When we got back to my granddad's place, things seemed off. It was really hard to explain. My dad looked like my dad and acted like him, but he didn't feel the same. My brother felt this same dissonance too, 
and we got this wild idea that when we crossed the fog, we somehow stepped into another dimension, maybe just slightly different from our own. Maybe it was just stupid kid stuff, but I still remember how oppressive this feeling of not belonging was. We booked it back across the fog again, and when we came back, everything immediately felt as right as rain. We went back as an adult to that same spot. No fog, but there was a particularly off-putting sensation. A few other odd things happened out there, but not in the car graveyard. We heard laughter coming from a hole in the woods. I swore that I saw the stereotypical sheet ghost near the woods, but as soon as I looked, they vanished. I regularly saw a face in the shadows between the trees across the field. It reminded me of Morlock from the 60s time machine. I saw a log truck carrying a bear on its back that was as tall as a house. It was probably some fiberglass thing for a store or putt-putt golf, but it was still a really odd thing to see. I hesitate to add this one because it's just so goofy, but what the heck. One day my brother and I were messing with my granddad's walkie-talkies, and we saw this really odd looking bird in the sky. We joked that it looked like a flying monkey from the Wizard of Oz, and said, flying monkey, flying monkey, come in flying monkey, into the walkie-talkies. Another voice came through and said, someone get me a flying banana. A bit spooked, we went into the kitchen and took a banana to leave it outside, and we stayed indoors for the rest of that visit. When we left, only the peel was sitting outside. That's about all I got for that area. A few things happened inside the house too, but that's not really pertinent to this story. So I used to live near an infamous road. It's a thin road with no street lines, has only a few houses at the end, and is lined with thick woods. There were no street lights. We heard stories like ghosts being spotted in the woods, weird beasts, creepy vibes, and a penny thrown off a small bridge coming back to you. Things like that. Urban legends, really. My boyfriend and I decided to drive down it one night in his car. It was a small stick shift car. The road had several pull-offs where you could park and sit. We pulled off at the first one and took some footage of the woods. Nothing happened. So we continued driving to the next pull-off. We parked and shut off the car. We heard some rustling, but we both assume that it's an animal moving away from the sound of the car parking. We sat there for a few seconds in the dark of the woods. We heard something hit the car like a rock or something. Then we heard several pounds on the truck and the roof. At this point, we decided to drive off. He attempted to start the car to no avail. He tried this several times before it eventually did start. He then put it in gear and stepped on the gas, but the car stood still. I was freaking out and told him to stop messing around. He said he wasn't. Then the car, while in first gear and the gas was depressed, began to be pulled backwards. Against all logic, the car was fighting to go forward against something that wasn't visible. The taillights lit up the forest behind us and there was absolutely nothing there. Out of nowhere, the car miraculously just jumps forward and we drove away from the pull-off. Blown away by this experience, we decided to find another pull-off. This was stupid. The one we found was before the bridge where pennies are thrown. We go over to the bridge and throw a penny. We hear it hit the small stream. We look back at the car and we swear that we see somebody walk behind it. So we rush back to the car, but there's no sign of anyone. This was the last straw, so we decided to get off that road ASAP. We get in the car and we speed off. As we're driving, something small hits and chips our windshield. It did not sound like a rock. It sounded like a penny. Whatever was on that road wanted us gone, and we haven't gone back since. Let 
Last year, I was backpacking deep in the mountains in Montana. I was near Libby, Montana, about three hours west of Glacier National Park. I was hiking alone, and I expected to encounter bears, moose, etc. I'm experienced, and I know how to handle them, so I wasn't scared. But this time, I was way out in the middle of nowhere, with nobody around for miles. Also, no cell service anywhere, and I didn't have my emergency beacon with me. Usually, I expect to see other hikers on the trail, but not here. Nope. I was out there completely alone, and I knew it. Well, it was like nine miles to my camp up at Cedar Lake. About halfway, the trail opened up, and I was in a somewhat clear area and had better visibility of what was around me. There were still trees and green undergrowth covering the ground. A few minutes later, I see something quickly scurry across the trail, maybe 50 feet in front of me. I stopped, froze, and waited. The creature noticed me and then stood up in the undergrowth, but still almost completely covered by the tall grass and shrubs. It was about three feet tall, pitch black, 50 to 60 pounds, and obviously very quick and intelligent. I assumed it was a baby black bear at first, so I didn't move or make a sound, and I got my bear spray ready, fully expecting an angry mama bear to come roaring out of the trees at me. But thankfully, that didn't happen, because I surely would have been attacked or at least bluff charged. All I could see was its face through the tall grass. The creature stared at me invasively for about 30 seconds. I was staring back at it. I didn't move a muscle. Then, suddenly, it huffed loudly at me and then ran through the grass up the side of the hill and I never saw it again. The sound it made was a lot deeper than you would expect from something that small. It was like a bear's growl. You could almost feel it inside your chest. Very unsettling. I stood there silently and waited for another few minutes to see if Mama Bear was nearby and that it was indeed a cub, but nothing came. I gingerly passed through that area on the trail and kept hiking. My research tells me it may have been an otter or a mink, but I've seen them before, and this wasn't like anything I've seen before. It was the way it moved. I only saw it for a second, but it almost slithered on the ground like a reptile and then stood up on its hind legs and watched me, making me feel really uncomfortable. There was something sinister about it. I checked for tracks, but I couldn't find any. I have no idea what that thing was. Before I get into my story, I'd like to give a little background about my dog growing up. His name was Fonzie because he had long black hair with a white patch on his chest. Growing up, he was my best friend and protector. He was a mix of Chow and German Shepherd. And if you've ever met a Chow, I'm sure you're well aware that once they imprint on you, they won't accept anyone but you. And they are fearless protectors which was just multiplied with the mix of German Shepherd. When I was eight, we lived in the foothills of Mount Baker in the Pacific Northwest. It was a not so populated area. One evening around dusk outside my house, Fonzie and I were up to our usual shenanigans. He would sit behind me as I shot my BB gun at some targets I had set up on the tree line. All of a sudden, he moved in front of me and started growling, which only happened when he felt that I was in danger. Right after he got between the tree line and me, about 20 feet, a very deep and loud, almost clicking sound came from the trees. Limbs were breaking and you could hear the ground pounding. We were both terrified. He started whimpering, which he never did. We both ran into the house. I looked out the window to see if whatever it was had come out of the woods, but nothing emerged. I told my dad about it, but he didn't believe me. He jokingly said, oh yeah, it was probably Bigfoot. But I've never heard of any Bigfoot story where it charged someone. 
black bears tend to stay away from loud dogs, and it was way too loud to be a cougar. So that's my story. It was by far the most terrifying experience of my life, and it still haunts me to this day as a 31-year-old man. I live in a tiny town in northern BC. We are surrounded by a lot of untouched forests and beautiful rivers. My family lives out in the country and we're about 10 minutes away from an uninhabited valley. It had an old road going through it from ages ago and it had an old pioneer homestead that we could make our way down to. I think some loser kids burnt it down around 2000 or 2001 though. Even from a young age, I hated going to this place with my family. I had no reason to despise it so much. Everyone that visited was always in awe of how beautiful it was down there. But I always just got this sick feeling in my stomach. My sighting was from when I was very young, so I realize not many will believe it, but it stuck with me. My family was showing a cousin from Australia this place. Our town is boring, so outdoor stuff is really all we have to offer and I was sitting on my dad's shoulders while the adults walked around. Now the road we were on had large shrubs on either side. In BC, we have a berry called Saskatoons, and the bushes on this stretch were tall and thick. Because I was on my dad's shoulders, I could see over these, but nobody else could. I remember looking over, and on the other side of these bushes was this big field with a dense forest on the other side. I saw something massive and stark white walking on two legs into those trees. As a dumb kid, I yelled out, Polar bear! Which my parents obviously ignored because there are absolutely no polar bears here. And that was that. I still have no idea what I saw. But I'm sure there could be a rational explanation involving an albino animal, possibly an overactive kid's imagination. My neighbor, who is also the closest thing that I've had to a grandfather, lives in a spot that overlooks a large field with a valley below. You pass his home to get onto the property that I had my sighting on. A few years ago, he told us of a night that he watched what he thought was a helicopter coming in to land in the large field below his home. Right as he looked at it, it was landing, and then it shot straight up and disappeared into the sky. He's a pretty serious guy, and he said this in front of my parents, so I doubt he would lie. He's convinced that he witnessed a UFO. At that point, I thought, all right, maybe there was something to what I saw. And then, my younger sister had a sighting. She was driving home on our country road after a late shift. She remembered seeing two dark silhouettes of people, no reflective clothing or anything, walking in the pitch black and thinking, wow, what idiots. Just then, one of these things turns and glances at her. She told me that it had green eye shine, which she knew that humans shouldn't have, yet it was human shaped. She glanced quickly down at her clock and then back up and whatever she had seen had completely disappeared in front of her. I'm still not sure what I saw that day but given that my neighbor and my sister have seen things that are strange in the same general area, I'm thinking maybe I wasn't such an imaginative kid after all. I am an avid hiker and backpacker. Most of the time I hike by myself and I sleep out in the woods by myself. I have a good amount of time in the backcountry, and up until this incident, I would never have claimed to have experienced anything even remotely paranormal. Ticks, in my book, are the real scary monsters. This past weekend, I set out for a solo hike in the Catskill Mountains in New York. When I arrived at the trailhead, two other hikers, not together, also pulled up. 
This area has no marked trails, so any landmark worth getting to is technically a bushwhack. After some friendly salutation, the three of us established that we had generally similar itineraries and we decided to head up to the highland together. Eventually, one of the guys fell behind, and after waiting for a bit, the other guy, we can call him New Hiker Bro, and I figured that he changed his plans, and so we pushed on. We summited two peaks together and then decided to extend the trip a bit in search of an 80-year-old plane crash that is situated in a very rugged area in between the ridge lines of the peaks we bagged. After some more, heavier bushwhacking, we found the wreck. I knew that people had died in the crash, but I had read about a number of plane crashes in the Catskills at the time. I didn't remember the exact details of this particular relic. I just knew it was there. It's certainly a somber experience when you happen on any place that you know somebody took their last breath, especially in such a violent way. But besides just a general feeling of sympathy and melancholy, I can't say that I felt any sort of eerie vibes. It was a beautiful day, and the post-hike beer was the next waypoint. New hiker bro and I silently walked around the wreck, taking pictures and video, and being careful not to touch anything. Our individual wanderings had put us about 25 to 30 yards away from each other, and in between us was a water drainage, so we couldn't really hear each other, even if we wanted to talk. We explored in continued silence for about 20 minutes when I closed my camera. As soon as my viewfinder snapped into the camera body, I heard a deep male voice that did not sound like new hiker bro say, Nice shot. The best way I can describe the timber of the voice was like a compressed amplified whisper, almost like Christian Bale's Batman, but with more tonal quality and with sort of a digital texture to it. It sounded close, but also like it was in surround sound. The woods can do some really funky things with sound, all very rooted in good old fashioned science, especially when we're on the side of a mountain in between two ridge lines and next to a drainage. I just assumed it was somebody, and I looked up from the direction I thought it came, half expecting to see the other hiker that we'd been separated from earlier. We had discussed the plane crash on our way up, so I thought it was just him being funny. He wasn't there, though. Nobody was there in any direction. New hiker bro was down the ridge a bit, and he was busy framing a shot by now about 40 yards away from me. I made my way to him and asked if he had said something. He had not. To be honest, the creepy still didn't set in until about 10 minutes later. I just figured it was someone's voice carrying from somewhere up the ridge line above us. But as we made our way back to the more established herd path, the more I thought about it, the more the creep creeped in. I distinctively heard, nice shot. I would swear by it, to anyone, on anything. As we got back to easier ground, New Hiker Bro filled me in on the specific details of the plane crash, three souls on board for a military training mission post-World War II. They went off course in bad weather. Two of their remains were found. One never was. I never shared what I heard with New Hiker Bro. I don't think anybody wants to walk out of the woods with a total stranger spewing ghost stories in real time. Honestly, I still feel like there's got to be an explanation, but I just can't get over the nice shot part, especially right as I closed my camera. This probably has nothing to do with it, but I also think it's kind of interesting that, like the people on the plane, we walked into the woods as a group of three, and one of us, for lack of a better term, went missing. I do wildlife photography, so I go hiking every Sunday and have been for about a year now. With the frequency with which I go hiking, it might be surprising that I have two experiences, 
or maybe not, I'm not sure about frequency. Both my experiences take place in the western part of Wisconsin. My first experience was at a semi-defunct state campground in the middle of summer. I say semi-defunct because there was a newer gravel parking lot by the gravel road and a gated off-road leading deeper into what used to be a paved parking lot and paved RV and campsites. It's about a mile from the gravel parking lot to the paved lot, and this walk goes just fine. The road continues past the paved lot for about a mile, and then splits into almost non-existent trails. It was after I got past the paved lot that things started to get strange. I started to get a feeling that was hard to describe. It just felt wrong. Every step I took came with the thought, you shouldn't take another step. You should turn around. This feeling kept growing and growing in intensity until I got to the end of the road and I just couldn't take it anymore. I turned back and went back because I had the strong feeling that if I went on a trail, something very bad would happen. The walk back to the gravel lot was just fine and by the time I got to the lot, the feeling was completely gone. I looked for agates on the gravel road. The second one I will say I think was probably just a deer, but I'll let you decide. This hike was in the early fall. I went off trail, down a gully, and followed a small creek. All in all, it was a good hike, until I rounded a bend and saw a cave. My initial thought was to go check it out. Then that nagging feeling came and was like, no, something bad is in there. I was admittedly thinking more along the lines of a homeless person or something like that. Not that homeless people are bad, just that I didn't want to get into an altercation. As soon as I turned away, I had that same being watched feeling that so many people describe, and I just had to get out of there. So I backtracked my steps and was about two miles into the hike back, when that feeling suddenly got much, much stronger. Eyes darting all over the place, I was literally almost walking sideways on the trail. Then all of a sudden, there was a huge crash behind me, and to the right. I didn't see anything before or after this crash. This is where I think it might have been a deer, but I didn't see anything. This feeling intensified all the way until I got into my car and locked the doors. It got better as I collected myself in the car. I don't know how to explain these. Could just be an overactive fight or flight response but they stick out so much from all of my other experiences that I can't help but think of them and wonder if I had tuned in to something else. I was a sophomore in high school when this happened, and I haven't gone back. It's midsummer in New England, and my best friend, let's call him Andy, and I are hanging out. I live on conservation land, so aside from the houses at the very front, there are no other developments, and woodlands that span for acres and acres are all around. The state put down some paths, so I suggested that we go exploring. We geared up, I brought my pocket knife, sprayed myself down in bug spray, and headed out my backyard. We hadn't explored too much, but I knew the area somewhat well, so we decided to hell with the trails. We're going to be real men and forge our own path. We enter the woods, thickly forested with pine, maple, and oak trees, and make notches in the trees on the way so we can find our way back. It's around noon, so I'm not too worried about it getting dark. After all, the sun sets around 8 p.m. in the summer, but just in case. We walk deeper and deeper into the woods. About 15 minutes and the forest is alive. Bugs, frogs, birds, everything in this forest is loud. Slightly irritating, truthfully, but it's nice to take in the sights and the sounds. Soon we stumble upon a peculiar scene. A perfect circle probably 20 feet in diameter, that spans from the ground all the way to the sky. I'm perplexed, but Andy is curious, so we decide to go in. 
The first thing I noticed is that the overgrown weeds and grass that surrounded us stopped at the perimeters. All vegetation past that line was dead. Not bare, but dead, crunching under our feet. I don't just mean the grass either, but the tree limbs that extended in were also completely bare. Leaves down the branch until it crossed the line, then nothing. Being the middle of summer, nothing should be dead. And I've never seen a branch behave like that. I'm feeling an extreme unease. I turn to Andy and ask him if he feels it. He says he feels like we're being watched. And I agree. It's then that we notice the strangest sense. The entire forest has gone silent. Not in rest, but in what feels like suspense. I'm feeling very uneasy now, and I know that we need to leave. We run out of there, following our tree marks, and when we got back to my house, the forest was alive again. Ever since then, every summer, every winter, a snarl of branches, sometimes leafed, sometimes not, reveals our path through the forest. I swear that whatever was watching us from that circle peers through and wants us to come back. My dad was an outdoorsman all of his life, and he had a few favorite hunting spots in central Wisconsin. My whole family spent countless amounts of time out in the woods of central Wisconsin and know them pretty well. Sometimes we'd take trips to just hang out in the woods throughout the year. Anyway, my dad isn't here anymore, but we still take random trips out into the woods just to get away. My brothers tend to spend more time out in the woods than I do, and more than the rest of the family does, as they went out there with dad the most. It's a sentimental thing. Two years ago, my family was having a get-together one spring or summer weekend. After dinner, my brothers went out into the woods to see what wildlife would be out. As one is a photographer, he's always trying to get shots of owls. Plus, they also wanted to check out one of the spots they like to camp at. I don't remember what time it was when they came back, but they were acting off. Then one of them started talking about something really messed up that was going on not too far from one of their camping spots. My mom and my sister and I, almost at the same time, asked them what it was. They said they were out walking around one of their campsites and wandered off just a little ways from it, only to stumble upon what looked like a bloodbath. They said blood was just everywhere. There were also peppers, corn husks, and some rocks that were all situated oddly, with blood all over everything. It looked like someone had even recently dug a hole, like to bury something. Now, at first I was about to say bullshit, because in the past they would come back with some BS story that you could tell they were making up. But this time was different. There was not even a hint of a smile or a laugh on either of their faces. They said that the disturbed ground where the hole was dug and filled in looked like it was big enough to put a small animal or maybe a human baby in. They just couldn't stop talking about the amount of blood that was all over. We told them they should call the sheriff's department as it could be something serious. It wouldn't be the first time that a body was found out in these parts. They wanted to, but then decided not to because they'd been drinking. Naturally, we were pissed at them for just wanting to leave it alone. I kept putting the pressure on them to report it, and three days later, one finally did. He'd been asking some of the people at his work about what they thought it could be, and one had mentioned that in their culture, it wasn't unusual to find a place out in the woods to perform a ceremony and bury a baby if it had passed away. That really unsettled my brother, as cemeteries are where the dead logically go to be laid to rest, and the amount of blood still had him on edge, so that's what made him finally report it. After the area was investigated by authorities, what they dug up from the hole turned out to be a rabbit, not a human. The sheriff did say that he really appreciated him reporting it anyway, because there really are all kinds of strange things that happen out in rural areas, 
It never hurts to be cautious and report suspicious things. Back in the early 1990s, I was a kid, around 13 at the time of this incident. And I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot, out in a very rural area in southeastern Arkansas. When I say very rural, I mean it was a series of networked dirt roads to get out to their house. The closest neighbors besides my aunt and uncle, who lived about a quarter of a mile up the road, was over a mile and a half away. This was very backwoods and isolated from most civilization. The closest town was a 10 mile trip. It's in the middle of farmland and mostly woods. They had lived in this house since my mother was a child and had both grown up just a ways down the road. Anyway, there was a general store roughly three to four miles down the network of dirt roads. This was your typical country general store run by an old lady and her husband and its only customers really consisted of the people who lived out there in BFE. One day my grandmother asked me if I wanted to walk to the general store and get her some milk, eggs, and a few other miscellaneous items, and I told her I would. She gave me some money and I headed on my way. It was fairly early in the day and I had plenty of time to get back before dark, which I always made sure to do when I was out roaming about. Things can get mighty creepy out in the backwoods of Arkansas after nightfall. It's a darkness unlike most people who have lived primarily in cities or towns have ever experienced. Me being a 13 year old, I had poor time management skills. I stopped at the bottom of a hill next to this small wooden bridge you have to cross and messed around at the creek catching crawdads and such. And I kind of just messed around the whole way to the store. By the time I left the store, I realized it was quickly approaching dark. This was fall, and darkness set upon the land pretty early in the day. I didn't want to be walking those lonely, secluded roads through the woods alone in the dark, so I hurried as fast as I could, running and sprinting as much as possible. But it wasn't enough. By the time I had made it back to the bottom of the hill near the bridge, it was almost completely dark, and there was an eerie sort of glow brought about by a very bright, nearly full moon that was rising. At the top of the hill, the road was perfectly straight and flat, with woods on the left side and a large field on the right. About a half mile up from the top of the hill is my grandparents' house, and you can see it from there. As I top the hill, I can see the faint glow of the lights at their house, and I feel a sense of relief because I was kind of freaking out a little bit. But knowing that I was so close and could see the house offered me a little bit of comfort. The field on the right was somewhat illuminated by the glow of the moon, and my eyes had adjusted to the darkness rather well at this point. As I walked up the road, I heard something from the left, behind me on the wooded side of the road. It sounded like leaves being rustled. I turned to look, and I see nothing at first. But then as my eyes begin to focus, I see something in the ditch. A black, shadowy shape, slowly moving toward me. At first I thought it was a dog, but then I realized it was much too large to be a dog. And then I realized it wasn't actually walking on four legs. It was crawling like a person would. I stared for a moment out of sheer confusion, trying to figure out what I was seeing. And then a jolt of fear shot through me as it dawned on me that whatever this thing was, it had been trying to sneak up on me. At that exact moment, this thing stood upright out of the ditch on two legs like a person. It had the shape of a human, long arms, legs, and was proportioned as such. It stood roughly seven to eight feet in height and was completely covered in black or maybe dark brown hair. Its face was dark in color, and I can't recall seeing much in the way of features due to it being night. It was no bear, that's for certain or any other kind of animal that I had ever seen for that matter. I immediately dropped the bag of stuff I had been carrying and bolted as fast as my legs could take me toward my grandparents' house. I heard a heavy breathing, guttural, growling kind of sound behind me, and I heard this thing's footsteps running up behind me on the gravel as it gave chase. I didn't turn around, 
I was certain that it would grab me at any moment. Then I heard it crash off into the woods and let out an earth-shattering, ungodly scream unlike anything I have ever heard before or since. I'm positive this thing could have easily caught me had it wanted to, but for some reason, it let me go. By the time I reached my grandparents, my heart felt as if it would explode from the combination of the adrenaline rush I had, from being scared beyond any type of fear I had ever felt before or since, and from full-on sprinting as hard and as fast as possible for about a half mile straight. I flew into the house and, in an incoherent mess of hyperactive gibberish, tried to explain to my grandparents what had just happened. My grandmother didn't really seem to believe me, but did believe that something had scared me and acted rather weird about the whole thing. She tried to convince me that it was just a dog or some other animal. The next morning I woke up and found my grandpa sitting outside whittling wood underneath a shade tree in the front yard, as he often liked to do. I went and sat down beside him in one of the old metal lawn chairs. He was a very rational man, down to earth, and had grown up in and hunted that area his entire life. He knew every square inch of it, mapped into his mind. He knew every type of critter and creature that lived in those woods, what noise they made, where to find them, how to catch them. I had only been hunting with him for a couple of years, but had been going out into those woods with him since a pretty young age, on walks and things like that. He had passed a lot of his knowledge down to me during those adventures. I spoke to him about what had happened to me the night before, and told him that I knew what I saw. It wasn't my overactive imagination. I wasn't making it up. And it definitely wasn't a dog. He knew that I wasn't just some dumb 13-year-old kid, and he knew that I knew the things he taught me. He stopped whittling, looked me right in the eyes, and said, I know what you saw. I've seen it before, too. There's things out in them woods that people don't understand and that a person ought not go fooling with. I remember those words clearly to this day, because it gave me affirmation, but at the same time made me realize that whatever I had seen was very real in existence and beyond my understanding. My grandpa then went on to tell me that far back in the woods there are some cliffs, and at the bottom of one of those cliffs is a cave. He told me that the cave is where the creature lived. He had once stumbled upon it a long time ago when he was hunting. He said he was standing on the top of the cliff looking at it when a creature fitting the same description as mine emerged and began screaming wildly at him and throwing rocks. He said he took a shot at it, missed, and then this thing gave chase. But my grandpa was on top of the cliff, so in order to get to him, this thing had to go around a pretty good distance and then up, which he said it quickly began to do, so he hightailed it out of there in a hurry. He said the whole way back home he felt as if he were being watched, and he kept hearing twigs snap behind him. He was certain that this thing was following him, stalking him. He made it home, and as he reached his front porch, he turned and looked back at the woods from where he'd come, and he saw it peeking out at him from behind a tree. Later that night, he said that he and my grandmother awoke in the early morning hours to large rocks being thrown at the house and ungodly howling noises from outside, and this thing trying to get into the house. He said he could hear it walking around the front porch, rattling the doorknobs, banging on windows, and it sounded like it was muttering to itself in a low, deep, garbled voice. But it didn't sound like a language just a bunch of gibberish. After a while, the thing went back to throwing some more rocks and howling. So, my grandpa grabbed his shotgun and fired it out the front door a few times into the darkness and into the direction of the howling. He said he heard it run back into the woods. He didn't know if he'd hit it or not. He said that was the last he'd ever seen nor heard from it, but over the years, an occasional farmer's cow would be mutilated or someone's hunting dog would go inexplicably missing or someone would have a story about some strange creature they'd seen. He also said it scared my grandmother beyond words, and she has absolutely refused to ever talk about it or even acknowledge that it happened, 
which explains her odd behavior when I told her what happened to me. I know it's a pretty far-fetched story, and you can believe it or not. It makes no difference to me. I know what I saw, and my grandpa knew what he saw, and neither of us have ever felt the need to convince anyone else of it. In fact, until today, I have never actually spoken of it to anyone other than my grandpa, and he passed away roughly 10 years ago. This might not be the scariest story, but it sure put fear into us at the time. Years ago, a friend and I decided to go raccoon hunting on a large wooded piece of family land by a lake. We met at his house at about 11 p.m. and set off walking the half mile down the dirt road to the woods. We talked in low voices, catching up on things, and then we quieted down when we reached the fence where the property line was. We loaded our 22s and started looking for signs of our prey. The woods weren't totally quiet. They were full of country sounds, frogs singing on the lake, owls hooting back and forth in the trees, even mice running over the leaves that had fallen the previous fall. I was amazed how much noise a tiny little rodent could make. This whole time, we weren't really talking, just steadily walking through the dead leaves and pausing to listen to the sounds around us. Suddenly, completely out of the blue, the woods went dead silent. No frogs, no mice, no owls, nothing. My friend and I stopped in our tracks at the exact same time and commented on the silence. We stood there for a minute or so in dead silence, listening for a larger animal. We're not in bear country, so it couldn't be that. We listened for branches breaking, something that would indicate why everything went quiet, but there was nothing but the sound of our breathing. At the same time we agreed we should go, we clicked the safeties off on our rifles and got out of there as hastily but also as cautiously as we could manage, feeling a surge of adrenaline as we went. We didn't think to unload our rifles until we were a little more than halfway back to his house. Later. We both admitted that the silence dropping like that triggered something akin to an anxiety attack. I've been back to those woods several times since then, both in the daytime and at night, and I've never experienced anything close to that feeling. I have a few creepy backwoods stories, and this one may be a little out there. It's more than just creepy woods, and I can't explain it. It could have been some sort of mass hysteria or a group hallucination that lasted multiple days, maybe even shared sleep paralysis, but I doubt it. The story starts like this. About 10 years ago, I'm a cocky little brat, 18 year old dude who thinks he has the world by the balls. The world had me by the balls, I later discovered, and I was with my very serious girlfriend of two years and counting. First time I ever dated a girl, and I really felt like I was in love and could see myself marrying this girl. Thank God that didn't happen, but that's another story. So my parents are really strict conservative Christians. They'd never let me and my girlfriend Caitlin share a room at night. Caitlin's parents couldn't have given less of a crap. They let us drink and we had our own bedroom upstairs. Looking back, her mom was kinda not the best mother, but she was nice enough. One weekend in summer, Caitlin and her parents asked if I'd like to come up three hours north to her grandparents' town for their anniversary. This place is hours away from civilization, as secluded as it gets. See Amish people the whole way up, northern Michigan. I said, hell yeah. Her grandparents are wealthy and fun and I knew it'd be a good time but too many people stayed in their big lovely house, so we had to rent a cabin, in the woods. This cabin is at least 20 minutes from the village or town or whatever. Right away it seemed off. It's back in the woods off this creepy, secluded, quiet dirt road. Everything silent. 
the houses next to us were dead silent and empty. It was just us. I'm not worried about it at all because I have this wonderful and fleeting confidence that alcohol and the possibility of getting some action this weekend will give a young man. PBR and hormones, baby. So I'll skip the daytime activities as they don't matter here. We just had a regular fun time with family. And we returned to our cabin for the night. Our room was upstairs in this sort of loft area. The cabin was oldish and rustic and just empty. Not physically empty, just void of something. The kind of emptiness you can feel. But hey, we're way out in the woods and no one has probably been here in ages. Of course it feels dead in here. That night was when it happened, and I'm positive that I'll miss a bunch of details as I blocked it out of my memory until I saw this subreddit and it all came back. I'm sleeping in this god-awful mattress next to Caitlin, and I drift off and have the most horrible nightmares. They weren't dreams, though. It was exactly real. It was as though my soul was able to move around and interact with the bedroom our bodies were lying fast in asleep. But I was awake. My body was asleep, but I was somehow completely mobile without a body. The bedroom was dark and the moonlight from the window lit up the center of the room. And there were so many people there, all deceased, standing in a circle chanting. In the center of their circle, I see a little girl with blonde hair, maybe seven years old, and she's in this white dress, almost glowing in the most disturbing way. The people turn to me as they notice that I'm watching and aware. They slowly approach me, all chanting and murmuring. I can't remember the words exactly, but I'm positive they were performing a ritual and sacrificing or murdering this little girl. It was kind of like the scene from Rosemary's Baby, something that I never saw until very recently, by the way. They came at me with their hands outstretched, looking dead and rotten. And as they begin to strangle me, I wake up and Waking up is usually when everything goes back to normal. But I wake up and I see the rocking chair is rocking, like flying, as if somebody slammed it. At this point, I'm like, nope, F this. I close my eyes and just pray and hope that the sun will rise. It didn't. I fell back asleep. The next dream goes like this. I'm on a roller coaster with all sorts of people and it's going straight up to the sky, like into heaven. I'm happy and stoked and cheering, and right before we get through the pearly gates, the roller coaster goes down, straight down, into the earth and into the fire and into hell. And I can hear blood-curdling screams for help. So much agony and terror. It was the most awful thing I've ever experienced. I could feel the burn of the fire and the pain of the screams surrounding me. Finally, I wake up and the sun's up. I'm covered in sweat. And I look over to see my girlfriend in the fetal position, shaking and crying. I ask her what's wrong, knowing that I already know the answer, but hoping it was something else. All she could say was, the girl, the girl. I asked her what happened and she said she saw a little girl in a white dress standing in the middle of the room staring at us and dancing. She claimed she wasn't even asleep. She went on to explain how she'd wake up periodically to see the rocking chair just rocking its butt off. I hadn't even told her what I had seen, and she just confirmed everything, which made everything so much worse. I don't have an exciting end to this story. The next night and the night after, I didn't sleep. There was a Pawn Stars marathon on TV, thank God, and I stayed up all night with the lights on, blasting Pawn Stars to stay awake. I didn't sleep again until the car ride home. Caitlin and I talked about it maybe once or twice and then never spoke of it again. I'll never actually know what happened that night or if I was just crazy. All I can say for sure is I'm never going anywhere near that town again. As much as I'd like answers, I think I'd rather just forget about this one.
I want to begin by clarifying that the majority of this post is a prelude to my actual upcoming amateur investigation. What I'll be documenting in this post is essentially a compilation of stories I've been told, some retellings of others, and also what little I've already checked out myself. I will not claim validity to any of the accounts I'm about to give you. All I can be certain of is that I trust dearly the person from which I continue to get a lot of these stories, as they are the mother of a close friend I've known for over 10 years. Honestly, some of this stuff gets a little weird for belief, but I intend to put that to the test however I can, soon. The place I call my hometown and current town is a Kentucky county comprised of old coal mining towns that at one time had a bustling economy. Let's call it Arling. Unfortunately, coal mining died a slow and painful death, and so has my home. This saddens me greatly. Arling is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, nestled into the heart of one of the oldest mountain ranges on Earth. The Appalachian Mountains have a tangible, natural spirit to them. I also believe they are host to a variety of things we do not understand. I, along with my girlfriend and roommate, often hike on old trails around the county in hopes of finding interesting sights to see. We are always looking for somewhere neat to hike far out into the sticks. I had a friend of mine ask some of his work buddies if they knew of any rural pathways to test out. One of them mentioned that his father had hiked a path ascending a mountain beside what we'll call the Old Lake, and that the place scared him to death. The Old Lake is part of a forsaken wildlife management area, about 10 miles outside of town toward the state line, at the base of Mount Mason. The government property lines only go so far. Beyond that is private land owned by a local wealthy family, presumably abandoned as well. The man's father told of how he had once hiked along the ascending trail that follows the creek from the lake and up into the mountains, past the wildlife management area boundaries. I will refer to this trail as Lonesome Creek. The man crested a hill and prepared to briefly rest upon a flat spot. He quickly took notice of a shady campsite that had evidently been set up on the flat for some time. The site was unremarkable at first glance, nothing there but a fire pit surrounded by wooden chairs. But he could just barely see something else beyond the tree line. It looked as though someone haphazardly poked big sticks into the surrounding forest. A closer look revealed that what he was looking at were pikes staked into the dirt and adorned with several cat heads. The man's hair raised up as he felt something out there put its eyes on him, as he put it. He quickly put distance between himself and Lonesome Creek and never again so much as visited the old lake. After hearing this story, it dawned on me that I had been told something similar years ago. This story, too, implied possible ritualistic activity on Mount Mason. As it goes, a mutual friend and his cousin had taken their ATVs on Lonesome Creek at night. Sometime into their ride, the pair spotted a makeshift sitting area right in the middle of the trail. It was shabbily constructed with a few chairs, as well as, quote, something like what a preacher puts his Bible on. A pulpit, I think, is what he meant. Even more frightening was a recently doused fire in front of the pulpit. Someone had been there just before they arrived. The two riders killed their engines and unseated themselves, looking around the ridge with their flashlights. As the silence soaked in, they could make out faint voices just beyond some trees on a steep incline near a ridge. Needless to say, they didn't bother shining their lights and left in a hurry. They probed no further. Remembering this incident was enough to have me look deeper into this harrowing mystery. The occult aspect of Appalachia has always intrigued me. Everything from folk magic to the blackest of practices pervades the history of the hill folk and their predominantly Scots-Irish ancestors who emigrated long ago. In the spirit of curiosity, my girlfriend and I took a midday ride up to the backside of the old lake, opposite from the frequented dockside where families boat and fish. The road was in rough shape, and upon arrival, it was obvious from the massive amount of trash that the Department of Fish and Wildlife had long abandoned this wildlife management area. 
We walked up the seemingly well-traveled path against the downward stream of the titular creek. After reaching the marked end of the wildlife management area, about a half mile in, we decided it was wise to go no farther. The sheer seclusion of the place pulled me in, but I needed to take time to plan carefully and gather up a few willing folks to walk along the old Lonesome Creek Trail. A quick check of Google Maps confirmed the garbage-ridden lakeside to indeed be the bottom of the trail. The path appeared to follow the creek up to a massive rocky ridge that wraps around the side of Mount Mason, leading to an overview of the newer, larger lake a few miles over. Finding out where to go was simple enough. I suspected that getting there would not be as such. The following Saturday, I managed to gather and prepare four of my friends to set out to the old lake. Two of us came with firearms and the other two brought knives and mace. Confident yet anxious, we left the dirty lakeside and headed up parallel to the creek. The lower part of the trail was lined with large jutting rocks that formed caves below and continued up the mountainside. These enormous jagged pieces seemed to have fallen long ago from the massive ridge, above which topped Mount Mason like a crown. Past the caves and closer to the lowest part of the ridge, the trail aligned into a rocky old creek bed, now diverted and empty. We stopped to rest at the bottom of a switchback, now at high enough elevation to be cradled by a lower portion of the ridge overhanging the trail's connecting elbow. After some respite under the stone's shade, we began our ascent to the top. The path soon wound away from the creek and continued to repeatedly switch back and forth up the side of a steep, stunningly green hill. Studded into the landscape were small scattered stones laid upon by long fallen trees, all covered in moss of a believably ancient color. From this point on, the trail was faint but identifiable. Despite the trash of the trailhead, this high up forest looked absolutely untouched. After mounting the hill, we wound through thick growth made of a tree I'd never seen. Low hanging branches of a round profile surrounded the thin trunk, appearing like a cross between a weeping willow and an acorn tree. Beside that, there were quite a few other types of foliage that I had also never seen before. Once atop the hill, we finally checked in on Google Maps to see how far along the trail we were. To our dismay, we were pinpointed way off the trail on the map. This startled me considering there was only one visible trail along the whole path. What was even more startling is that we ended up on a trail not listed by Google Maps. Admittedly, this wasn't too worrisome since the pathway was fairly defined, despite not seeing much action. We assessed that we should make the best of the situation anyway and press on a little farther to make good use of the remaining daylight. Google Maps showed that we were near a rock crawling and ATV tourist attraction on the state line called Hole in the Rock, a wagon tunnel that cut through the mountain's crown near the top. However, the last and only check-in for the area was five years prior. Apparently, we had found ourselves on an old wagon trail stretching from our side through the tunnel and into the next on the other side. The place was old for sure. Exciting was the notion of trekking through an archaic commerce road, passing over the old Native American land of Mount Mason. Interesting stuff. We resolved to find the wagon tunnel and descend before dark but we didn't make it there in time before having to turn around. I'll go ahead and tell you that nothing exciting happened, about which I am both disappointed and relieved. After hiking back down without incident, as expected, we left behind the old lake. It was hard not to dwell upon the chilling isolation felt at Lonesome Creek. The land was empty and quiet, not at all marred by frequent travel. I'm deadly serious when I tell you that this place had a very different energy than your typical nature trail. It evoked an unsettling combination of serenity and oppression. I found it to be the perfect place for strangeness in the primordial wilderness. Lonesome Creek seemed as isolated from the rest of Arling as Appalachia is to the rest of America. It can be easily ascertained that isolation of the spirit would certainly breed desolation of the soul. Yesterday, I rang up a lady we'll call Marla, whom I've known for quite a long time. 
Marla has been investigating the weird and wild for almost 20 years and has written a few books about local Kentucky myths, folklore, and paranormal stories. She has, with her own resources, even helped find the identity of an early 20th century cold case victim. Conveniently enough, it just also happens that she and her family live about a mile from the old lake. I knew that if anyone could point me to something, it would be Marla. To be quite honest, I didn't expect the volume or magnitude of some of the things she told me on that phone call. I have no bias toward the truth of the two stories I've already recounted. This is different to me. I believe this woman with everything in me, and I do not consider myself naive. I will relay to you the information she has given me, which consists of her own experiences as well as the accounts of her family members. I will do my best to tell them faithfully. When Marla married and moved to the old Lake Road, it seemed nice enough, rural and quiet. She had her first child in 1993, who would grow up to be one of my best friends. When he was barely a toddler, his maternal and paternal grandfathers often took him into the woods across the road from their house, through their family cemetery, and up a long dirt path. One day, Marla received a call from her father, asking her to tell her father-in-law, who lived on the same property as Marla and her husband, not to take her son into the mountains that day. He said he'd seen some strange folk camping up there who seemed a little suspect. Her father must have been pretty concerned, because later that evening, the state police showed up at the cemetery. The authorities informed Marla that they had to run off some people up on the mountain, but that they appeared to be trying to set up a site to regularly meet and loiter for whatever purpose. Before leaving the cemetery, the policeman she was speaking to told her plainly, between me and you, they were doing some strange things up there. When pressed, he would not say, just shook his head and declined to answer. About a year later, Marla got the gall to go with her husband up to where the police had run off the loitering creeps. She claimed to have found small animal bones scattered around a clearly once established site and a concrete slab fitted into the dirt and etched with what she described as obviously evil symbology. This was a time before cell phones, so she has no photo evidence. The next weird experience to befall Marla didn't come for almost six years. It seemed to have spooked her more than anything else she's told me. One evening, Marla thought it would be fun to take her son, then age seven, on a walk to the old lake to check out the creek, catch salamanders and find rocks as they often did along the river, which runs behind their property. They made their way to the lake and followed Lonesome Creek up toward the initial incline and past the Mark Wildlife Management Area. Apart from the creek babble, Marla caught ear of what sounded like loud voices farther into the woods. As she and her son continued up to face the second incline, it became evident that a group of people were gathered toward Mason's crown. A loud voice echoed from above, booming and fervent like that of a typical Southern preacher. The voice spoke rapidly and was periodically answered by a group of voices which spoke in unison. Marla and her son listened closely. The chanting began to cease and everything fell quiet. The eerie silence was broken by the man's booming voice, angrily shouting in Marla's direction from high atop the ridge. Marla grabbed her son and ran all the way back down to the trailhead, fearing that whomever had gathered there had seen her and was warding her off. Like the others, she's never since been back to Lonesome Creek. Years after her experience with the chanting voices, Marla recounted a time her father and father-in-law had been part of something unexplainable when traveling the trail from the Kentucky side of Mount Mason. Though they followed a path that both had walked many times before, the two men became disoriented and got lost. Marla's father said that an anxious feeling washed over him, and suddenly it was as if they simply were somewhere else entirely. They made it home unharmed in an amount of time they described as unusually short, but were never able to explain the event. It was later realized that they had somehow ended up on the other side of the state line on Mount Mason, way out there. This was not her only account of this phenomenon. Just two years after the incident her father described, two fish and wildlife officials showed up at her house in the middle of basically nowhere, the men admitted that they had no clue where they were. 
They told Marla that they were trying to get to their destination on the neighbor state side, but somehow became lost and ended up on the Kentucky side. I find it unsettling that despite having maps and being otherwise very familiar with their territory, they ended up miles and miles off track. Marlin noted that both were visibly shaken by the experience. As time has crept almost 20 years past, Marla has searched for answers to her experiences and those of her family, but has found few. The only presumption she's gleaned is that there have been unexplainable forces in these mountains since they were settled and probably long before. Appalachia is closely tied with various oddities and old traditions, both good and bad, benign covens of witches yet existent within unbroken bloodlines, wannabe satanic sects composed of lunatics who gain pleasure through the infliction of suffering, old secret societies once prominent but that have since died with the coal country's prosperous towns dotted across all of rural Appalachia. There is much to be uncovered and there's even more that should be altogether left alone. If you think about it for a moment, this sort of place really is a perfect hiding place for things of a darker nature. An isolated mountain range with an ancient soul, wherein you can find whatever old secrets you might be looking for. My dilemma is whether or not trying to find them is a good idea. The things I've written are the only bits of information that Marla has given me relevant to the ill air at Lonesome Creek and Mount Mason. There's much more that she has shared with me regarding other areas in Arling and surrounding counties as well. I fully intend on going back to follow the stream of Lonesome Creek itself up the mountain and onto that ridge. I want to be fully prepared to investigate the secrets of the creepy old wagon trail where dark things surely take place. Interestingly enough, I have discovered that a wealthy old family in Arling owns the suspect property along the ridge. Maybe next time we will find the path to get there. Marla and I are supposed to meet in person so that I can write some of her stories down for good detail. I look forward to that. And I will continue to share with you whatever I'm able. So, a little background to set the mood, and this is all 100% true. I grew up in central New York, between Parrish and Mexico. You can look up Happy Valley and see just how creepy it is. Surrounded by woods, farms, fields, gravel pits, and swamps. I'm outside roughly 90% of my day. I do firewood, logging, farming, hunting, fishing, and trapping. I'm certainly used to the creepy shit in the woods, so much so that there's a predator light on my walking stick, which is a backwards-facing LED light. People deter tigers from leapfrogging on them by wearing masks on the back of their heads, but we only have fishers, coyotes, and the occasional wandering bear. So every night on the wood line, I have a pimp fire pit set up that I use pretty much every single night. It's not uncommon to see raccoons and foxes. We feed the birds and even have a huge turkey and deer feeder. My house is basically a safe haven. We constantly have critters running amok in the daytime and especially at night in the shadows. So you get used to the random ground leaf flutter, twig snapping, chittering critters in the forest nooks and crannies staring at you, wondering if you're going to eat that last hot dog. It can be unnerving, honestly. But then, there's my clicky buddy who always says goodnight to me. It began when I moved into a good buddy's house. He and I are very much alike. Hard-working outdoorsmen who hunt, trap, and collect firewood. I've recently gone through some changes in my life and I was lucky enough to move in with him, which is only four miles away from where I grew up. Every night, after working or running through a trap line, I'd work on my fire pit, which is in a clearing we made to store firewood right on the edge of the forest. I'd hear this clicking, like a slower version of the predator's clicks. 
The sound was kind of random at first, but then I noticed it reacting to me moving. Grabbing a beer, click, click. Packing a pipe, click. Building up the fire or taking a leak, click, click. At first it freaked me out, like to the point of carrying a bigger knife than I should. Some nights a loaded 223. A couple of those wandering bears came within a quarter mile of my fire pit, so. I wear a headlamp, I have a lit lantern by me, a roaring fire, a machete, the walking stick, so I'm pretty comfy, even though I'm kind of crapping my pants as I yell at the darkness to come and get me. So when the fire dies down, no more smoke for the pipe or hot dogs for my belly, I'll start packing up my stuff and get ready to head inside. Click, click. I look around for eye shine. Nothing. I move closer to the woods, stray a little to reposition my headlamp casting shadows. Click. I've even clicked back, and it kind of responded to me a few times, but I could just be stoned out of my gourd. I mean, it's freaked me out so much a few times, I've literally built up the fire just to walk away. My fire pit is built for that kind of thing. I'm literally a pro at having fires. When I did, click, click. Now, we do have nocturnal flying squirrels here, and one trick the squirrels, all squirrels, do is that they'll hide on the opposite sides of trees as you pass by. You'll never see or hear them. You won't know that they're there. Unless a friend is walking 20 feet in the same direction and you're both looking up at the trees, the squirrels can't hide from both of you. But I don't think this is what I'm hearing. It would make sense since I can't see whatever's making the noise, but they tend to chitter more than click click. So now it's been over a year or so of hearing this sound and I'm nowhere closer to finding out what it is. I've come to accept it. I'll even leave some food at the edge of the wood line, beginning of a trail for it, which is usually where I relieve myself and then go back to the fire or inside. So almost every night I'll hear the clicks and I'll say goodnight back, or call its mom a dirty name. I mean, I don't speak click, who knows what I'm saying, but I click back anyway, and then I head inside. I suppose this isn't a scary story. It's just creepy, and I wanted to share it. My friend and I were hiking in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We were just going camping for one day, and the trail was part of the Appalachian Trail, near the very start of it. My friend told me a story about one of his friends, and said that he heard voices and footsteps at night near Blood Mountain. He said that he had to night hike because the noises were so intense. We found a campsite and we set up shop. As it got darker, we got a bad feeling, like something was watching us. And then it started. We saw a pair of red glowing eyes about 100 to 150 feet away from our fire. Then my friend goes to dunk his head in the creek near our tent and he explains that something pushed him into the water. His shirt was soaked and he hit his nose on a rock and was bleeding. After that, we heard a woman's voice. He was speaking, but we couldn't really make out the words. We heard it in front of us, behind us, and to the left of us over the creek. It could have been a hiker, but to the left, there was no trail. And if it was somebody night hiking, they weren't using a flashlight. We also heard footsteps around us and sticks snapping. Finally, we just got in the tent and tried to sleep. My friend fell asleep before I did. 
and I heard twigs snapping right next to my head outside of the tent. That was pretty much our entire night, but it was very, very creepy. If you decide to go camping in Blue Ridge, just know there are things out there lurking in the night. It might seem stupid, but this sound has bugged me since the day I first heard it back in May. I could swear that I've never heard anything like this. I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve. It's not like a park. It's wild and no human activity is allowed, except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month. It's because it's the habitat of a very rare bird, but I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog, but still, it was a super sunny day and the place isn't dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river. And if you avoid getting super close to it, you'll have no problems with it. Everything was great until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear this very strange noise coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now, it was super weird since I've read all the info of the reserve and it says that whenever they make monitoring operations, they deny access. And I was pretty sure that I was the only person there. This place only has one entrance and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. There are no cars except for mine and not a soul out there. The closest structure is about 25 kilometers away from that place. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Something like this has never happened before. My dog, a lab, has heard many noises in the woods, even louder than this one, but has never gotten nervous. I'll try to explain what the sound was like. The best way I can describe it is that it was like a loud metallic bang, like when you hit a stick against a metallic can, immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing. Like when you try to start an old tractor and it won't. It occurred three or four times per minute and lasted about seven to eight seconds each time. The noise made my dog and I very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And in my life, I've heard much scarier sounds, like thunder and lightning striking close to the ground, very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out. So I decided to pack everything up, head back to the car, and leave the area as soon as possible. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it. And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close. No matter where I went or how far I parked my car, around an hour of hiking from the spot I first heard it, it always sounded like it was the same distance away, like it was following us, maintaining about 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired too, as soon as I calmed down, and I barely managed the drive to my home, trying not to fall asleep the whole way. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off. So I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask them on the reserve or at the office, it was closed that day. Nobody has ever been able to tell me what produced that noise. Plus, as I said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. Maybe those things are connected. What do you think? I 
live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about 7 o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12-gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then, I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears. But this was far too heavy to be a deer or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12-gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footsteps stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything, but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming, closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me. And when I looked back, the eyes were there, but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour, 
It was now 5.30 in the morning, and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved, for a second, until the eyes moved into place there, looking right at me. We made eye contact, and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore, but it does show up. Sometimes, when I'm in the living room watching a movie or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night, but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night, and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident, and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days, actually, but I'm sure it'll be back soon. Where I live, we have had relatively few bid cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m., he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no streetlights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human-sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then, it would gradually grow fainter, then stop, as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance. Then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things 
while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch, right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open, and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed and thankfully he did. I sat vigil listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. So this happened relatively recently. My friends and I were living at a cabin in Lake Tahoe in California. It was in May, so not snowing, but the nights got down to near freezing temperatures. We had gotten some firewood burning in the fireplace and the three of us were chilling around it. We were drinking scotch and had turned down all the lights all the way down in the cabin. The nearby houses were about 300 yards out and they had their lights down as well. We heard creaking on our roof for two to three seconds, which stopped. That was followed by what sounded like a bag or something mildly heavy dropping on the roof. Then it was followed by the scariest, heaviest rumble any of us had ever heard. The entire roof shook, but nothing else in the house did. So we knew it wasn't an earthquake. We almost felt like something broke the roof and was coming down the stairs to get us. We screamed and picked up the hot fire pokers and searched through the cabin, tapping walls and the attic area. We looked up the chimney for raccoons as they tend to hide there. 
Also, this wasn't the first night we had had the fire. If a raccoon mama was nesting, she would have fell through the chimney. We found nothing. We saw our neighboring house turn on their lights, and they came out with searchlights. They had heard a similar sound. We all thought a bear had run from our roof to theirs, but it's unusual for a bear to do that. The neighbor's dog was quiet through it all. I checked that there was no way out from the chimney besides up, so if something was in there, it couldn't have escaped the roof without popping the lid, which was intact. We don't know what it was. For the next two nights, we had a fire up. Nothing. Not sure what it was, and perhaps I'll never know. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow. And feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. Can't explain it, I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to deer to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke some time in the middle of the night to hear something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, 
I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs, because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big, as I could hear its weight, if that makes sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until eventually I fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. This incident happened in 1963 in BC. I was 22 and on my honeymoon when I saw a creature, what I would later call a Bigfoot. I saw it in the clear light of day, free of any obstruction, and I have thought about it every day since. My husband and I were camping in the Broken Islands. It was early June and the weather was beautiful. It was about seven in the evening and I walked to the edge of the water and began to wade out. The water came up to just below my shorts. I stood there and admired the beauty. The sun had not started to set yet, and there was a peaceful stillness at that moment. My husband was asleep in the tent, and I thought to wake him so we could cook dinner together. I turned back toward the beach, and it was standing there, motionless. I didn't hear it make a sound. The beachhead was gravel, and rocks that crunched and clicked as we moved around were everywhere, but I didn't hear this thing at all. I couldn't understand what I was looking at and just stood, frozen. My eyes were going all over its body, trying to comprehend. I thought it was a naked man at first. It was taller than me by a wide margin. I was five foot eight and this probably was over a foot taller. It was lean and lanky, like a basketball player. It hunched at the shoulders, had long arms that hung at its sides in a non-threatening manner. It had long fingers with black nails. It stood with its legs close together and had long feet, just like its hands and fingers. It had a round head and the face looked like a person but different. Something was off. The body was covered in a brownish hair, but its body outline was still visible. The hair stuck up like an orangutan. The skin on the hands, feet, and face was visible and grayish, dusty and ashy looking. Its eyes were black, and I couldn't see any other color. We just stood there, looking at each other. I was stunned and it was indifferent. He never looked away, but he had an expression of indifference. I said, hello, in a broken half whisper. I couldn't think of what else to do. He smiled at me. His lips peeled back, revealing large teeth like a horse's. They looked too big and square for the mouth. When I looked at it in the face, the eyes at that moment, I realized that this was not a person. It was like a person, but it was something different. A wave of nausea overtook me. I began to vomit and felt faint. The world started to spin. I moved toward the shore and fell on my hands and knees. 
I heaved with such force into the dirt. The spinning stopped and I sat up. He was gone. I was there on my knees and just kept replaying the incident in my head for I don't know how long. I stripped off my clothes and cleaned myself in the water. The sun was beginning to set and I got dressed and lay next to my husband. I don't remember sleeping, just fever, chills, and dizziness. We left the next day. I never told my husband what I saw. We split up five years later. I live in Texas. I've remarried, had children, grandchildren, gotten divorced again, and remarried again. I never told a soul about what I saw. I would go to the library and look for books about monsters, trying to understand what it was, that thing I saw. Bigfoot became popular in the late 60s and 70s. I saw the infamous PGF footage. That's not like what I saw. What I stood staring at, what changed me forever, was something else. I came from a typical Texas, all-American family. I wasn't supposed to see this. Now I'm someone with a secret, something I could never talk about in my real life. My interest in this subject has been a complete secret. No one who knows me would ever guess. I have never said this out loud, but in 1963, I saw a Bigfoot. First of all, I don't know if this will be scary to you. It was for me when it happened, and I still get a little frightened when I remember it. I can assure you this story is 100% true. Every time I see those involved, I ask them to remember, and they do, so I'm not crazy. So my story starts when I was 15 years old, in 2012. Three of my very best friends and I, I'll call them Luke, 17, Lewis, 16, and Gary, 15, decided to go camping. And since our dads all worked in the military, we had access to some woods that weren't very far from our homes, three miles at most. Of course, we weren't trained on anything, but since I lived some time in the middle of the Amazon forest, I had confidence that I could handle a night not very far from my house. It was July, which is winter here in Brazil, and it was really cold, like five degrees Celsius kind of cold. And things were going pretty much as you would expect from a camp in the woods. We pretty much sat there and chatted until about one o'clock in the morning. Then, we decided to take shifts in duos to watch our tents for any animals that could be near. We were afraid of jaguars, but probably the most that could get near us would be some capybaras that are pretty common in the region. At around 4 a.m., Gary, my duo, was outside the tent, calling for me to stay up with him. But as it was so cold, I wanted to stay inside saying that no animal would go near us with the noise we were making. After like five minutes of back and forth between us, we noticed that we could not hear any kind of forest noises, like crickets, owls, or twigs breaking due to animals passing by. A feeling of uneasiness started to grow between us. Now, I know this whole thing of no forest noise sounds a little cliché, but I swear this is real when something weird is about to happen. When this feeling appeared, we stopped arguing and started to pay attention for what was happening around us. We didn't want to wake up Luke and Lewis because we thought we were just being silly and that nothing would happen. And we were just working ourselves up. And then, from the middle of the woods, we hear a scream. It sounded like a woman screaming but at the same time, it didn't. The scream sounded human, but something was off. It had some kind of animalistic tone behind it, 
It's really hard to explain. I've searched all over the internet, and I can't find any creature that sounded like this. I firmly believe it wasn't a human screaming. Besides, what would a woman be doing in those woods, alone, at night? With a sound, Luke and Lewis woke up, a little disoriented, while Gary and I jumped out of the tent and grabbed some sticks. That was the only thing we had that could serve as a weapon. Needless to say, we did not sleep the rest of the night, as we not so patiently awaited the morning to come. After what felt like hours, but probably was no more than five minutes, the forest resumed its regular noises, and we calmed down a little bit. When the sun rose, we packed our things as fast as we could, and left. When we were getting outside of the forest, we told the military that was guarding the woods what we heard, but I'm not really sure if they believed some random teenagers. I'm still friends with those guys that camped with me, and as I said, Every time I see them, I ask if they remember, and they all say that they do. It was not a jaguar or any kind of animal, like I said, that I've ever heard before. Even after research, I can't find anything that sounds like it. To this day, we don't know what kind of danger we might have been in. My friends, we'll call them Amy and Serafina, have lived most of their lives in the suburbs and cities. They never have been to the backwoods by any stretch of the imagination, but they were even more inexperienced with camping when they were juniors in college. They borrowed a tent, sleeping bags, and a nylon insulated cooler, packed them in Amy's Toyota hatchback, and drove to a state park in southern Minnesota. Down-to-earth Amy noted all the warning signs about black bear thwarting best practices at the park entrance, but didn't push spacey artistic Serafina too much about these. A mix of excitement and tiredness gripped them both after their long drive, the setting up of the two-person tent, and making dinner. They ate dinner at the campsite's little wooden picnic table, enjoying the sounds of the birds. Amy, the driver, was the most tired and turned in for the night first. She was grateful that Serafina had volunteered to clean up after dinner and dispose of the garbage. Amy was asleep when Serafina entered the tent not long after. Hours passed. Amy shook deep sleeping Serafina, who immediately knew why Amy woke her and began shivering in her sleeping bag. Fierce and desperate animals were locked in a midnight battle on, under, and around the picnic table. Did you pack the food and the garbage back in the car? Amy mouthed to Serafina. Serafina shook her head and tried to hold in the tears. In fact, Serafina had left their much enjoyed box of Cheez Its right in the middle of the table, and the garbage bag and soft sided cooler right beneath. The growls and snarls outside the tent were replaced on one side of the conflict by squeals and screams and rustling farther and farther away into the woods. There was a moment of silence. Then, snuffling, snorting, and groaning. Something big was outside the tent, low to the ground. It had a musky stench. The girls didn't dare turn on their flashlights. An outline of an enormous, inhuman face, a snuffling muzzle, was pressed into the cheap fabric of the tent. Sarah and Amy clutched each other, shivering uncontrollably, squeezing together in the middle of the tent, as far away as possible from the face pressing into the nylon. Finally, the bear noisily moved off to worry the last scraps from their dinner into the woods. After dawn, when they dared to unzip the tent, Amy and Serafina gasped at the scene. The Cheez-Its box, their used paper plates and towels, 
All their food and all their garbage had been ripped to shreds and scattered all over the campsite and the nearby woods. There were confused tracks and scratches on and around the picnic table. Worst of all were the bear tracks, which circled around and around their tent, and a snout-shaped shallow ditch at intervals where the bear had apparently snuffled with only one-sixth of an inch flimsy tent cloth, dividing it from my friends. It might not be paranormal, but it was still one of the scariest things that ever happened to them in the backwoods. I always wanted to try the car life thing after watching so many YouTubers who lived in their cars and vans and traveled around the country. I lived in Fort Lauderdale for five years and thought I would be stuck there and that was it. Then the pandemic hit and when I checked my bank account, I was back paid thousands of dollars. Before I know it, I'm packing up all my stuff and the landlord said I could leave all my furniture and that was fine. Now I'm on 95 heading north, laughing and actually leaving. I couldn't believe it. I managed to get a hang of the whole car life thing and became more comfortable stealth parking in different places and not being detected. I hadn't done any off-grid stuff yet, but I was more comfortable by the time I reached Lake Tahoe. I was hiking and asked some guy with his dog, a local, if he knew where I could sleep in my car because Tahoe seemed tricky. He said there was a place up in the mountains called Hope Valley. It sounded good, so off I went. Lake Tahoe is already very high in altitude, so this was a few thousand feet higher than that. As I reached the area, I saw a small parking lot that was an entrance to a wildlife nature preserve. It was closed and empty, so that would do. I'm all settled in with my blanket and the sun is setting and the temperature plummets. Before I know it, it's pitch black and visibility is zero. I start to hear wolves howling and at this point, I'm game. This was the experience I wanted. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. I was living what I would normally be watching on YouTube in my apartment. Before the sun went down, I noticed there were garbage cans that were overfilled about 15 feet from the car at the entrance to the preserve. I finally drifted off to sleep and I was awakened by something at 3 a.m. You couldn't see anything anywhere. It was so dark. And then I heard footsteps, heavy ones, right outside my door. At this point, I am freaking out being a New York City boy. Then something brushes up against the car. I'm scared and I don't know what to do. I wait for a couple of minutes. Then I open the door run around the car as fast as I could and got into the driver's side. I drove down the mountain and slept in a Motel 6 parking lot like a baby. Never made it through my first and only off-grid car camping adventure, and I won't forget it. The only other time that trip that something creepy happened was in Mount Shasta. I drove halfway up the mountain, parked on the side of the road, and got out and started walking to this trail. I made it about 70 yards in and heard a low growl. I've never ran so hard back to my car in my life. The rest of the trip was the best hiking I've ever done, which was in Montana. I'm a scout leader in Ireland, and my friend group are all outdoorsy people, so I've done my fair share of outdoor adventures. One time, we were away camping down on a site in Roscommon. 
There were about four of us in a dome tent that night, and each one of us heard rustling and moving around outside our tent during the night. We were all scared shitless and didn't mention it to each other until the next morning over breakfast with the others from our group. It wasn't until then that the two others in the other tents spoke up about hearing rustling right outside of their tents as well and something rubbing along their tent wall. Well, we were all convinced that it had to be a wild animal since there were no other people on our site. We had two nights left. It wasn't our first or our last time there. We've stayed there roughly around 15 times, give or take. And while I believe there are wild deer around, I've never seen them in person. Not once. There are always people down there on the site where we stay. So surely, wild animals would stay clear of that area and wouldn't come right up to the tent walls, right? Another time, while wild camping near Glindalo, several of us in a tent woke up several times to the sound of the zipper on our tent door. It wasn't just a small zipper noise. It was as if the exterior door were being fully zipped open or closed. There were two tents, so two groups, but we all decided to kip in together because of how cold it was. So it was nobody from our group joking with us. It could easily have been another group, but while wild camping, the chances of another person or group being close to you are slim. Once we looked around and knew that the door, to our knowledge, hadn't been zipped, and that we weren't in immediate danger, we chose to ignore it. It happened a few times that night. You kind of learn, while camping, to ignore weird noises and movements outdoors. Most nights spent camping, you don't get much sleep, really. You're always conscious of being in the wilderness, and so exposed. It might not be the creepiest of stories, most of our weird camping or hiking experiences have happened abroad, to be fair. But all the same, it still hasn't put us off camping or being outdoors. Even if we can't be sure what's out there. So, I was a wildland firefighter back in the day, in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion, but I worked in the southern portion of the forest, which was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on only had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one that was about two and a half hours away up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly just made people play on their phones, but I digress. So as for the creepy story, I want to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some odd things working up there as well. There was one night that he told me he was cowboy camping, which, if you don't know, means sleeping outside without a tent. And he kept getting a weird, mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around, even yelling, but nobody was there. He told me that he wasn't below any trees, 
so he's sure that it wasn't sap. He never slept outside there, ever again, which leads me to believe he was telling me the truth. As for my story, I have had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early, because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double-wide trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still. That's when I hear one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side, facing the window, and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence there. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me, and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice began to change to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the F outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice, not my coworkers anymore. I lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually, it stopped and I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but it felt a little bit too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but whatever it was, it was really creepy. This took place in a small city in Alaska where I grew up. One night at approximately 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., I was lying awake. I'm a very light sleeper and I often have trouble falling asleep. At about that time, I started hearing what sounded like an obnoxious mix of possibly a clarinet or a trumpet playing loud screeches. No harmony just squeaks and honks in the cold night air. I sat for a while on my bed. I couldn't sleep. It was loud enough for me to hear inside. I went out the front door and stood on the porch and just listened. It sounded like whoever was playing it was a few blocks away, but at the same time, it was as though you could hear it in every direction. It was autumn and very cold at the time, I was so frustrated by the screeching in the late hour that I actually yelled out, shut up, thinking it was a kid playing a prank. About a year or two later, when I had nearly forgotten about it, I heard the sound again, this time in the daytime in the winter air. It lasted for a few hours and then quit. It wasn't until probably five years after this that I watched a video on YouTube called Trumpets in the Sky about people around the world hearing the exact same noises and not being able to find any explanation for them. It literally gave me the chills. But now it has me wondering, has anyone else experienced the same thing? I live in northern Alabama. I was out rock hounding solo today to a place that my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived. It's a very secluded area of the creek with a rock bar in the middle of the creek and with a small patch of woods to the left and a dense forest on the right. I crossed the creek and set up my gear on the rock bar, grabbed a bag, 
and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in, I kept looking up at the forest. I don't know why, but I just kept getting an eerie feeling. Every now and then, I'd hear a couple of thumps out there, but, you know, nature, so I didn't think anything of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow. I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? Ten minutes go by and I'm walking farther up the creek, and damn it if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yep, I just heard a cat meow. How strange. Something really did seem off though, and I started to feel uneasy, so much so that I turned around and headed back to my site. Something about the meow just wasn't right. It wasn't a painful meow, but just a matter of fact meow, if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek back, I definitely heard a cat meow. I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat, but instantly I feel cold, clammy, and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded like someone or something was imitating a cat. I keep focused on getting back to my site and about five minutes later, I hear another single meow. Here's where I realize that things are getting really strange. The meow always sounded the exact same distance from me, no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reached my site and pulled out my drinks and plopped down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded, and this time, I knew with everything in me that it was not a cat that was following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started to trek across the creek to the path to my car. There was another long meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down in a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and I was really starting to lose my mind. I get my keys and mace out and I put my gear on me so that I can dive into my car and rearrange later. And that's exactly what I did. I nearly crapped myself finding the courage to make it to my car, but I did and I hightail it out of there, fast. I know that the rational answer is that somebody was out there messing with me, but how did they get back there and why? It's like 200 acres of forest. People don't go back there all that often. I'd have to believe that somebody went back there, sat around and waited for somebody to mess with. And how did they follow me without me hearing a crunch or anything? To this day, I can't explain what in the world happened that day, but something was off. All during my childhood, up until recently, I had thought that ghouls were just spooky, imaginative, scary monsters that would come out on Halloween night. But now, I know differently. I now believe they are synonymous with the creatures we know as crawlers. In Arabic folklore, the ghoul is said to dwell in cemeteries and other uninhabited places. Some say that a ghoul is a desert-dwelling, shape-shifting demon that can assume the guise of an animal. It lures unwary people into the desert or into abandoned places to slay and devour them. The creature also preys on young children, drinks blood, steals coins, and eats the dead. It can also take the form of a human. It is a particularly monstrous character, believed to inhabit the wilderness of Afghanistan and Iran. The Galu demons were known to be part of the underworld, 
and were thought to carry their victims off to the land of the dead to devour them. People who traveled near cemeteries and abandoned buildings or through desert wastelands were warned to be especially vigilant against these creatures. They were thought to be bipedal, though with a hunched form, and were known to crawl and sometimes run on all four limbs like an animal. I knew there was a reason why I kept warning people to stay away from the forests and surrounding areas. Since we have fewer deserts in the United States, these creatures are frequently encountered in wooded areas in addition to cemeteries. After years of research, I've come to the conclusion that crawlers are actually demons, interdimensional demons. The late great Father Malachi Martin, in his book Hostage to the Devil, stated, quote, There is a dimension that is devoid of love and compassion, all the qualities that make us human, end quote. I believe it is from that dimension which these demon crawlers come. People from the Middle East are far more familiar with the ghouls. They are able to shapeshift and spend time in cemeteries as they feed off the flesh of the dead. Like I said, I used to think these were just stories meant for Halloween and scaring kids. But the more research I do, the more I believe they're real. And I think we all ought to be vigilant. A few months ago, I read a terrifying post about something that happened in the backwoods in Canyon Lake, Texas. I had commented that I nearly threw my phone because I used to live there for a few years. I truly don't know where to begin this story. I moved there my junior year of high school. My family's house was built from the ground up on the south side of the lake. My parents didn't know that this was the side of the lake that most people avoided. I don't mean to be offensive, it's just most of the people that I knew lived on the north side. I never really understood why, until the event started happening. The house was finished the summer going into my junior year. When we officially moved in, things were great. A few months into me beginning school is when things turned incredibly dark. It all began when my dad put his guitar in our family room by the fireplace. I would come home and something would string the guitar strings so violently it sounded as if somebody had knocked it over. I began waking up to my dad being completely weirded out because all of our cabinet doors and the doors on the first floor would be open. It escalated dramatically from here. We would hear something in the woods just outside of the porch lights continually. First, we thought it was an injured animal but dead deer and other wildlife would appear on our property every few weeks. Then we began to see inhuman things. Guests would see something walking in the hallways, opening drawers, and would see a girl in our guest house. My dad constantly hosted events and parties, including his ex-military friends. They would ask us why we were coming to their rooms at night and opening the drawers and closets and then walking out. My dad didn't believe me until his friends began commenting on figures and people in the house. The worst night was when all the doors began opening and slamming and it sounded as if somebody was walking up and down the stairs, going into every room, opening and closing the doors. I could go on and on about the things I saw in that house it was one of the scariest times of my life. All in all, don't go to Canyon Lake. About a year and a half ago, my girlfriend and I went down to Ohio Pile State Park we frequent there as we live an hour away 
and it's one of the best parks within a day's trip for us to hike and swim, mushroom hunt, and explore in general. So one day, we got bored of the normal hiking areas and places that we had already been. So we decided to drive around the back roads, deeper into the woods of the park. No map, just deciding which way to turn when we got to intersections and going from there. We pass a random old cemetery. It couldn't have been a mile or more down the road when we noticed a more dirt-like road, kind of dilapidated with a chain in front of it so cars couldn't go in. We decided to park the car and go explore the trail in general. There were no signs for no trespassing or anything like that, so we continued on. I'll never forget the eerie feeling I had as soon as we made it onto the trail or road. Just a general sense of, you shouldn't be here. But I don't listen to that feeling. My girlfriend seems intrigued. There's no one at all around, and it seems like a beautiful secluded area. We head back some more and we notice that up a cutoff was an abandoned visitor center, so obviously we had to go check it out. This is when things started to get really creepy. We were about a hundred feet away from the building when that alarm in my head that said you shouldn't be here intensified immensely but I was curious about the building still. And my girlfriend at this time is freaking out internally. She wants to leave and she feels uneasy and unwelcome. I want to explore the building because I love abandoned places. In the amount of time it took us to cover that 100 feet, I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent. There were no bugs anymore, no birds not even the sound of branches swaying in the wind. We get up to the building and my girlfriend is pleading that we go back. I said, let's just take a step in and then we can go. I'm approaching the stairs to the door from the left side and no joke, straight out of a cheesy horror movie, a bird out of nowhere flies into the window of the building not five seconds later, I heard what sounded like either a log or a very large branch cracking on the other side of the building. I'd like to clarify that there was no way it was a small branch or twig. It sounded almost like a tree breaking directly on the other side of the building. I pulled out my pistol and walked quickly backwards, facing the building and I told my girlfriend to walk as quickly and as quietly as she could back to the car. We hopped in and left as quickly as the car would go and drive. I'm still not entirely sure what happened. I know that black bears do reportedly live in the area, though you don't see them too often, and I've never seen one there. But like I said, I suppose it's a possibility, although it doesn't really explain the bird. The second possibility that comes to mind is that it was another human. But the thing that broke didn't sound like a human walking over a branch and breaking it. Like I said, it sounded like a tree snapping when it starts to fall. I've recently gotten into Appalachian folklore and stories, and I've been reading about Wendigos, skinwalkers, crawlers, and such. So for my question, I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a similar experience in Pennsylvania or in general, and if so, what happened and what do you think it could have been? My girlfriend and I could never figure out why we felt so afraid. Like I said, it could have been an animal and the bird could have been a coincidence, but we both felt an overwhelming feeling like we shouldn't be there. And it still gives me goosebumps. I live in northeastern America, in a pretty rural place with lots of hills, not too many neighbors, and a lot of forest. Just tonight, I was headed with my mother down our backyard, which is large and relatively clear for about a hundred feet. Then it switches to woods. 
We got to about 30 feet before the woods, and I caught sight of some eyes reflecting in my headlamp. They were a good 50 to 100 feet away, and I assumed that they belonged to deer. But a few things convinced me that they might not be. Around where I live, deer will run away if you make enough noise. And we were talking pretty loudly, but the eyes weren't moving. They kept staring directly at us, which is incredibly unlike deer in this area. On top of that, the pair of eyes on the right were very low to the ground and very wide set, too far apart to be deer considering the distance. We stood for a minute remarking on them and neither pair of eyes looked away. So since we were spooked, we headed back up to the house, got my brother and a machete and a bat and a metal pole. I know, a little overkill, but our area has been a little scary lately. We headed back down. I expected the eyes to be gone by that point. I mean, that's how these things usually go, right? But no, they were still there in slightly different spots than they had been, but not much farther from where they'd been previously. They stared just as steadily as they had before. So we retreated back inside. The logical answer is deer, but the lack of running away, intent staring, and wide set eyes feel like that option is ruled out. Another thought is wild dogs, but we don't really have those in our area. It's possible it could have been a black bear, but those are notoriously scared of people. If anyone has thoughts on what this might have been, let me know. Edit. As an update, just to provide more information, there were no visible signs of anything in the area as far as I could tell. The next day I looked for marks on the trees from climbing and saw none. There's a good amount of greenery covering the ground, so it's difficult to look for scat. But there were no signs of any animals having lied down on the ground. We've still been unable to find any evidence that it was something natural. A few years ago, in the northern part of Sweden, I'm going out for a nice evening of fishing. I'm what I guess is called a fishing supervisor. I check that the other fishermen got their licenses, and I do this at a certain area of lakes and streams. This was in late summer, and I had just been doing my rounds, which I usually end by going to a small lake and fly fishing for some trout. This lake or pond is pretty deep in the forest and I rarely see other people out there. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen someone else out there. This lake looks kind of like a crater. It's a perfectly round circle, perhaps 100 meters in diameter, and it contains a natural population of perch and trout. It was a warm summer evening with a slight breeze. The birds were chirping and the fish were rising to inspect the spawning insects on the surface. I rig my gear and aim for one of the fish, rising to the right in front of me. At the moment that my fly lands on the surface, it's like somebody pressed the pause button on time. The sun hides behind a cloud. The wind stops blowing. The birds are suddenly silent and the fish stops eating. A smell rises from the ground that I'm standing on. It smells like something dead, something rotten, almost as though I had a carcass buried under my feet. All of a sudden, I'm aware that there's something walking out of the forest behind me, maybe 10 to 15 meters away. It's like I can see it out of the corner of my eye, but still can't see it at the same time. Every hair on my body is on end, and suddenly it's very cold all around me. The thing watching me just stands there, and I don't have the courage to turn around at all. 
I see my fly sink to the bottom, but I can't move. I can't do anything about it because I don't dare to move. Then the wind hits me and it carries the awful smell away. The sun hits me again, a bird is singing somewhere in the forest and the almost overwhelming feeling of being watched lets go of me. I turn around and there's nothing there. On the lake, the fish start rising again. I packed my gear and threw the backpack on my back and ran for it. I ran through the forest to my car. I hit the gas and I drove like a maniac until I found the big road and civilization once more. I pulled over to the side of the road and just said to myself, what the heck was that? My heart was still racing. I haven't visited the lake since this happened and I don't know anybody else who has either so I'm not sure if anybody else has experienced something similar. I've probably visited this place 20 times or more before this happened, and nothing like that had ever happened. The only thing I'm ever really afraid of out there is bears. I do fish at a lot of ponds and lakes that are pretty deep in the forest. There's always a lot of wildlife in these places. Deer, moose, foxes, and the occasional wolf or bobcat and maybe a bear. I've never been afraid of meeting anybody or any scary person. In fact, other than being cautious about wildlife, I have never really been afraid of anything, except when visiting this particular lake from that point on. I like to look out for new, out-of-the-way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways, and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip, about 10 years ago, I'm in western Pennsylvania, and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out-of-the-way stream that I had found on the map. I'm in the country, it's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I'm really close to where this stream is supposed to be, so I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction that I believe the stream is located. The road starts out in okay shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets weird. It's mid-afternoon, but the canopy of the trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me, so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely, if ever, gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random places in the road, first sporadically and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It almost looks like they were placed there on purpose. My car is four wheel drive, but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger. Combined with this is how tight the road is now. Driving around them starts to get a little sketchy. I'm now driving very slowly so I don't pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. The road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn, but I stop as I see the road continuing down on this weird trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around, but it's also at this point that I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but if I didn't want to get my front end caught on something that might be pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck, I just couldn't do it. I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you're bound to just get enough room to turn around shortly. 
As I make my way driving this weird downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first, it's just garbage. Bottles, boxes, wrappers. Then I start seeing toys. Kids toys. Lots of them. Like an uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they've been there for years, and some look fairly new. The amount of clothing I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not like one random mattress. Lots of them. All over the place, and there are dirty and dark stains on them. My gut is now screaming at me to get out of there, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out what my next move is, I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me, I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse dodging all of the random rocks all of the way back up and out. I do this until the path levels out again. I was in full F this mode, and I just risk making the three-point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank, and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. Worst case? I don't even want to think about it. All I know is ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts to tell me to get out, I get out. I was off-roading with some buddies back home in eastern New Brunswick, on the Bay of Fundy. There's this trail we go on that ends on the water, and it's at the site of an old ammunition depot from World War II. We've been here many times during the day, and sometimes at night. You can drive into and through this massive old structure, and up the hill is the admin building for this site. It's pretty far into the woods. At the very top of that hill are some grave markers from hundreds of years ago. We were told that they were old private graves. We live on the coast, not at all something that I would doubt being a real thing. We were in there one night in the big building having a fire, and we all saw and heard something quite large scramble up the side of the building and then start running on top of it. Now, there are a dozen of us there, so it's clearly not just one person seeing something crazy. There is nothing in the woods of eastern Canada that should be able to climb as quickly as what we saw. A black bear? Maybe. But this thing basically ran up the side of a four-story tall structure and then ran across the top of it in moments. Needless to say, we got in our trucks and hightailed it out of there. On another occasion, we were exploring the admin building, which is three stories tall. It's concrete and it's been abandoned since World War II. We go all the way to the top. Nothing weird happens. But as we're coming back, we notice something weird on the second floor. An entire room is filled with lit candles, but there's nobody around whatsoever. We ran out of there so fast. This one, I will admit, could have been an elaborate prank, since lots of people would go and mess around there since it was a fun off-road trail with some history. But the thing that climbed up the building, to this day, that still mystifies me.
This story happened to me in the backwoods. It's not paranormal, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. I work in forestry, and I had a bear that was clearly not afraid of me and did not want to leave me alone. I pulled into our campsite at around 1 a.m. with the truck and trailer, and it's just me out there. I've got to set up two generators, one for the trailer so I don't freeze to death, and one to keep the equipment that we use warm so we can actually use it in the morning and the batteries don't die. I also got there late because I was having truck problems. I had no idea what the cause of them was. It kept dying and then it would be fine, repeating this process over and over. I set up the generator for the trailer and as I was getting the second one out of the truck, I hear a branch snap loudly. I stop and listen, and I can hear more branches snapping and some rustling in the trees. About 50 meters away into the trees, this noise keeps happening, and it's getting closer. I thought it was a person at first, so I yelled, who's there, and got no reply. The noises come right up to the edge of the clearing I'm in, a circle maybe 40 meters across and then they stop. I know whoever it is is just sitting there watching me. After about 15 seconds of me listening hard, half in the truck, I see two eyes appear, and then they rise up to about six feet in the air. I could tell it was a bear by the way it moved, which was actually a relief, because for one, it meant that it wasn't a skinwalker, and two, because I knew that there were only black bears around there and no grizzlies. But I didn't have anything to really defend myself with. No bear spray or gun or bear bangers, anything like that. I yelled at the bear. Nothing. I hopped in the truck and pulled the air horn out. It didn't even move. I slowly walked over to the trailer, which was still hooked up to the truck, and grabbed a pot and pan and just started smashing them together at it while yelling. It still didn't move at all. It just stood there, staring at me. It wasn't making any noises either. No huffing or pawing at the ground like I knew bears do if they get upset. But that didn't exactly put my mind at ease, considering that this thing was clearly not afraid of me. Eventually, after about 15 minutes of making loud noises and it doing nothing but staring at me, it finally dropped to the ground, turned around, and started to walk away. I waited for about five minutes since I still had to set up the second generator, which I had to bring closer to the bear. Picture a triangle. I was at one corner, the bear was at another, and where I needed to bring the generator was at the third. Right as I pulled the generator out of the truck, I hear branches snapping again, and it's coming back. It came back to the edge of the clearing and did the exact same thing. Stood there, staring at me, and wouldn't leave with all the noise I was making. Again, after another 15 minutes of it sitting there, motionless, it left again, and I quietly dragged the generator out, started it, ran back to the other generator, started that one, got in the trailer and shut the door and watched out the window for a while at where it kept coming back to. It never showed up again. Maybe it did after I went to bed, but there was no sign of it in the morning. I know it's not the most insane thing that's ever happened to anybody, but it was intensely disturbing, knowing that this thing could easily kill me and wasn't afraid of me and didn't want to leave. It remained so perfectly still, staring at me for such a long time, and I couldn't do anything about it because I had half set up the trailer already and I couldn't leave quickly. Even if I could, there was no guarantee my truck would even start, and I still had a job to do that required me leaving the probably illusionary safety of the truck and go closer to the bear in a way that would mean that if it decided I was worth the trouble, it could get to me faster than I could get back into the truck. I've had other experiences. I had a grizzly charge my truck down at top speed up north, 
then decided halfway to me that I was a lot bigger than it was and wasn't worth it. Everybody knows bears are fast, but there's a difference between reading the number 50 kilometers per hour or even seeing a video and seeing it in person. An animal that big has no right to move that quickly. It just seems unnatural. I've also heard plenty of very odd noises at night. And the feeling of being watched at night is nearly constant. I stay overnight way in the middle of nowhere alone on a regular basis for my job. And it's very easy to psych yourself out late at night alone with no way to contact anyone except for unreliable GPS text messaging and hours from anything resembling civilization. I've been doing this for years and I'm still not used to it. I've definitely encountered a skinwalker or something like it once, but that's another story for another time and was before I started this job. Anyway, that's my bear that wouldn't leave me alone story. Hope you enjoyed it. For some background, I'm 23 and I have lived in the country all my life, growing up on the east side of Lake Winnipeg and moving to the west side as a teenager. This story takes place when I was 17, and it's true. A few years after my family moved, I started dating my boyfriend at the time. I lived within the small town, but my boyfriend lived about 15 minutes out, surrounded by woods. His only neighbor was about a mile down. I'm using miles because country roads here are done in mile sections, not kilometers. On a September night, I was at his house watching movies and things like that. I wanted to go out for a cigarette at about 2 a.m. He said he didn't want one, but for some reason, I felt scared to go outside by myself, probably because I was really tired and kind of out of it. So I made him come out with me anyway. We go out onto the front deck in the dark. He's looking at his phone. I'm smoking and enjoying that crisp fall air. Then I heard this distant cry come from the direction of the neighbor's house. It kind of sounded like it could be a dog or a coyote. I asked my boyfriend what he thought it was, to which he replied he thought it was the neighbor's dog. We were both leaning against the house, listening to it and we noticed that it was slowly getting louder, as though it was getting closer. Then it changed in pitch and tone dramatically and became guttural. It sounded something like a human screeching for their life, but it definitely wasn't human. The type of scream that just immediately makes you feel sick to your stomach and terrified. My blood turned to ice the back of my neck was prickling and we both just froze. We were just staring at each other, looking around and then back to each other, but our feet would move. I don't think I can even fully explain what it sounded like. Again, I've lived in the country all my life. This didn't sound like any wildlife that I have ever heard of. I know people's first response is that cougars and coyotes and foxes can sound like people, but I know firsthand what those calls sound like, and this wasn't that. We listened to that awful sound getting closer and louder for probably two minutes before my boyfriend grabbed my arm and rushed inside. We never lock our doors where I'm from, but damn did we lock every door and window in the house that night. We jumped into bed, freaking out, trying to make sense of what the heck that was. And we could still somewhat hear it, even from where we were inside. We laid there silently for about 10 minutes. And then out of nowhere, it just stopped. Obviously, we didn't sleep much. The next day, we drove past the neighbor's house and dog was fine, just chilling in the driveway. Nothing was out of the ordinary and it never happened again. To this day, that sound freaks me out.
My friends and I are on our way from Chicago back to our home in Evansville, Indiana. As such, we have to drive through the Midwestern country to get there. Pitch black highways surrounded by trees and cornfields. About four hours away from home, my friend screams and I look up. We hit a deer going 50. The poor guy bounced off the front end and was probably dead on impact. We come to a stop and commiserate, call our parents, etc. We're stranded on a quiet highway in the middle of nowhere, trees to our right and a few houses a bit far off to our left, all surrounded by cornfields, of course. My friend is standing outside surveying the damage when we hear a scream, a man's scream, a bit far off to our left. My other friend and I look at each other, wide-eyed. A few minutes pass and we hear one again. I make a joke about skinwalkers and my friend gets back in the car. A bit later, after calling 911, we heard another scream, a woman this time, and it seemed closer. We're waiting on the deputy and nervously joking about whether it's skinwalkers or just crazy woodland people. And my friend facing the trees suddenly laughs nervously and rolls up the window. She goes, I just heard clicking noises outside my window and I'm rolling it up because I'm not going to pretend like I just didn't hear that. I know that clicking noises are often a thing with skinwalker stories and things like that. We're not really sure what happened. We think maybe something was trying to lure us out into the woods, but we didn't go, obviously. Obviously we survived too, but I don't think any of us are going to forget that experience anytime soon. This event occurred in early fall of 1971 or 1972. I'm not sure what jogged this memory, but it's probably something to do with reading a lot of off-the-grid weirdness on Reddit. Also, some of the details are a bit gray, but the gist of the story begins here. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps and bogs and boggy swamps and other things that were similar to swamps and bogs. Our patrol, probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to you guessed it, the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front of the shelter, you'd be standing ankle deep in water. Then it just got deeper and darker and boggier from there. We mucked about on Saturday until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter, cooked dinner and just chilled out until it got dark. And it was crazy dark. No other campers around, just the light of our slowly dying fire. We begin to hear a slow splashing sound coming from the swamp, maybe 100 feet out from our fire. One of the guys yelled something toward the sound and everything went quiet. A minute later, the splashing began again, but slower and more methodical. This time it was within 15 feet of the fire, but it was out of the fire's light. None of us were really concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured that it was just a deer or a raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly, the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This perked us up, wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight, and pointed it toward the noise. 
his light hit something, and he yelled, It's a man! and ran to the swamp burn. I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam, and then heard fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out in the darkness. So what did we do? We tried to figure out what the hell just happened, then crawled into our sleeping bags and somehow fell asleep. Nothing else did happen, and we went home the next day as scheduled. We had lots of stories about what it might have been, if it was a real person, if it was a ghost. Thinking back on it now, it must have been a piney, a local who knew the area really well. This man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to come check us out though, so it's still pretty creepy, even if it was just a man. The pines can be great and also eerie, and that weekend was both. Last night, my boyfriend and I were downstairs. It's a raised ranch style home. And we were just watching a movie and he went up to the window to crack it for some fresh air. We live in the Northeast and a couple of days ago, we got a good amount of snow. Now we do live in an area where wildlife is fairly common. He stood at the window and just stopped what he was doing in a complete stare. I asked, and babe, what's going on? He said, you have to come here and look at this. I got up off the couch and made my way to the window. We saw footprints and nothing like I have ever seen before. I've grown up in the woods my entire life. The men in my family are big into hunting. They're pretty big outdoorsmen. I can pretty much look at any track and know what it is. The back tracks looked like deer or rabbit, and the front ones looked like some type of bird, like a turkey, for example. The space in between them was fairly large. Whatever it was had a pretty big stride. Whatever it was looked like it had been circling the window, then to the side of the house, which our bedroom window is right above that. Also, where a cherry tree is, there's a second set of prints it looked like something started walking from the tree and just stopped. My first thought was, okay, something was just sniffing around and turned around. Well, there are no tracks back. They just completely stop. I've looked up every single possible animal that it could be, and absolutely nothing I've been able to find matches. This morning, my boyfriend went out there and looked around. My dog was with him. And as he was sniffing around, his fur was up, on high alert. He's not unfamiliar with wildlife, and this is probably the third time in his whole life that I've ever seen his fur go up like that. He said that the tracks didn't make any sense at all, that they appeared and just disappeared, and that there was no distinct pattern to them whatsoever. I know what you might be thinking. Did the snow cover them up? Maybe the wind covered the rest. We haven't had any more snow, and the snow that we do have is fairly hard. I can see my dog's tracks perfectly. Two nights ago, when these footprints could have been left, I was watching a movie down there scrolling through Reddit. I had this really weird feeling that came over me, like I was being watched. I literally pulled the blinds shut. A couple of hours later, I could hear this bush start moving outside. I figured it was just the wind, or an animal. There's this big, fat blue jay who does have a nest in there. But then I started to hear this faint clicking noise. This is the second time that I've heard that noise. The last time was when I lived two hours away, again in the middle of nowhere, and I was walking my dog at night. It made me physically ill. I figured I was just being paranoid. I was reading creepy stuff on Reddit, so I calmed myself down, telling myself that it was all in my head. We have cameras, but nothing on that side of the house, and there was nothing on any of my cameras. 
if anybody knows what these footprints might be, if it is in fact an animal, that would be great. I'm actually kind of scared. For the last three days, I've been having really bad anxiety. I just can't pinpoint it. I just feel like something is wrong or something bad is going to happen. My internal radar is going off in every possible way, kind of like a gut feeling. But like I said, I just can't put my finger on it. Something just feels incredibly off. I go hunting in southern Illinois on property that my family owns. The place is my second home, and I have spent countless hours exploring all around every inch of it. Caught all the fish in the area, hunted every legal game, and spotted the rest. So when I say that I've never had an experience like this, just remember that this was my domain that I felt comfortable in, in any weather, at any time, with any equipment or lack thereof. Two deer seasons ago, I had pulled into the farm at probably 4.40 in the morning. It was November, so there were at least two hours left until sunlight. I pulled my stuff out of the truck and walked into the woods. I have my shotgun and a revolver and knife on my belt, an elbow light clipped to the front of me, a thermos of coffee and a backpack with a book and a couple of other things for cleaning my deer should I get lucky. So I walk off the drive and into the woods. The tree stand I'm going to is less than a mile away, but through some dense second growth forest and down a rather steep hill, across some bottoms, then a lung burning steep climb to get to another ridge. I always dread the hike, but it's a good spot, so I do it often. I make it down to the bottoms, slush through the icy muck and get to climbing. With my flashlight clipped to my chest, I keep needing to physically turn my body to throw the beam around and see trees that I recognize to determine my path. This, of course, always gives the forest a horror movie vibe, even on the best of days. The leaves and underbrush are encased in frost, so every one of my steps comes with a solid crunch, no matter how quiet I'm trying to be. This time, though, I noticed there was more noise than usual. Something else was crunching close by, too. I walked about a quarter of the way up the hill, listening to my company the whole time, seeming to stay the same distance away as I moved. Naturally, I think to myself that I'm going to have a quick hunting day, so I plop my butt down next to a tree. I can't shoot until first light, but I'm hoping that if I stay really still, that whatever I'm hearing will just lounge around until then. So I click off my light, unsling the shotgun, and lay it over my knees to wait. Except I don't hear anything now. Whatever it was must have been spooked by my flashlight spinning all around as I sat. I still stayed a bit sipping some coffee to make sure, but after about 15 minutes or so of dead silence, I gave up. I probably didn't make it even four steps before the second moving thing starts up again. At this point, I'm still not freaked out. I stay facing the way I am and flip the light off again and sidestep behind a tree. Sure enough, I don't hear anything. Two minutes of sitting there frustrated before I start moving again. And my new friend does too. This is when I started to get freaked out because I worked my way up the hill, stopping to turn and look every so often. When I stopped, the sound would go on for just an infinitesimally longer amount of time than my own steps. Like something seeing me stop and doing its very best to stop before I heard it. This happened no less than four times. And by now I'm sweating bullets and freezing cold because I'm sweating bullets in the middle of winter. I abandoned my thermos near a tree so I could hold my flashlight and my revolver at the same time. The last hundred feet or so to my stand was done backwards so that I could be facing the noise and, in theory, keep it from moving. 
and I didn't hear anything again after that. I got up into my stand and smoked like five cigarettes in a row. It gave me a sense of security being up in a tree behind camouflage. Still, I only hunted for like an hour of daylight and went back early. And I wasn't moving slow heading back to the truck, even with the sun shining bright. I haven't told my family about this because they wouldn't believe me, but damn it was freaky. The sound and when it decided to happen felt very human, which it likely was as poachers and trespassers occasionally wander onto our property. Still, ever since then when I go hunting, I'm much better about letting people know where I'm going and for how long. The woods behind my house have always been odd. About a year ago, I had an encounter with something. To this day, I don't know what, but I know it's back and I know it wants me. Things were quiet. We started to all forget about the mystery woodland encounter from last year. For the most part, my girlfriend and I had moved on from it. That was until two months ago on a cold February morning. My girlfriend discovered that one of our chicken's legs had been snapped in half. I took her to the vet and they were as confused as I was. There was no sign of any attack or any clear indication of who or what had done this. They recommended that I put her down, but I just couldn't do it. I believed that maybe with some rehab and a safe environment, she would heal. I took her home and I put her in the pool house. I went about my days thinking nothing of it. To this day, she hops around on one foot, but she's thriving. Anyway, a week goes by and I come out one morning to find another chicken that had both legs snapped clean in half. I ran over as fast as I could to find a similar situation. There was no sign of attack or any blood to be found. I took her to the vet and unfortunately, I had to put her down. At this point, I had a chilling feeling as to what might be going on here. I think it's back. The next day, I set up cameras facing those woods. I spent $700 on the best trail cams and the most well-reviewed SD cards I could find, and I was determined to capture it this time. I made a rule that I would check them every day, twice a day, so as not to miss anything. Every time, I would find nothing. Just some cats and my chickens doing animal stuff. Since we found that first chicken, I haven't been able to sleep. I've had night terrors, nightmares, and sleep paralysis almost every night. I kept having a dream about the woods. Something chasing me. Something attacking me or getting lost in there. I'm constantly on edge, and it seems like every noise makes me jump. Yesterday morning, I went to check the cameras. They're gone. They're just gone. I was baffled and in utter disbelief. I hid these cameras so well that not even my girlfriend could find them. And yet, they're gone. I searched everywhere for these things. Every inch of my yard, every nook and cranny of the house and pool house. There is no trace of them. Angry, confused, and upset, I put on my boots, a thick jacket, and I headed into the woods. I was determined to figure out what this thing was and what it wanted with me. Remember now, those woods are dense and thick. Everything is overgrown and muddy, or so I thought. I push my way through vines and bushes, around trees and stumps, and I stumbled upon something I wish I had never found, a clearing. I stopped for a moment to try to understand what I was looking at. I wish I could share some kind of satellite view to prove that this clearing can't possibly exist. But then it dawned on me, 
Where the hell am I? How long have I been walking? Did I go the wrong way? Am I lost? Amongst all my confusion, something catches my eye. It's one of my trail cams smashed on the ground. How the hell did this end up here? It was at this time that I realized how absolutely silent it was. I mean, I could hear my own heart beating. Reality set in and I had the immediate urge to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. This is where I'm at a complete loss. I took what I thought was maybe a hundred steps through some dense vines and brush, and there I was, at the back of my property. It felt like it took a minute or two of scrambling to get through the thick overgrowth, and I was back. Still absolutely panicking, I continued onward until I got to the back door. I bolted the door and locked myself in the bedroom. I haven't said a word to anyone today. I called out of work, and it's been about 18 hours, and all I can think about is going back in. I'm scared, I can't sleep, and somehow I know that it's watching me through my bedroom window. In southeast Michigan, there's a mountain bike trail called the DTE Foundation Trail, just north of Chelsea, Michigan. For a mountain biker, it has three major sections, more still under development, including connectors to a larger network, but I digress. Green Loop is easy flow. Came is big climbs, big downhills with jumps, super flow technical climbs, intermediate. Wind Loop, Long flow with grinding climbs and long downhills. Technical features, intermediate. Sugar loop is fast flow and major speed, but more technical, difficult. The usual flow is you start on the green loop and move on to the big cane, then the wind, then the sugar, then back up the loops to the trailhead. There's a Michigan-based blogger named Kai Juno that summed up the creepy part of this forest. This is what Kaijuno wrote. Quote, I know I've made a post about it before, but I can't find it. But the most like bone chilling thing you can ever experience is the silence when you're walking in the woods. Like it's the woods. There's always birds and bugs and frogs and stuff, but sometimes it will just go completely dead silent. Sometimes it feels like even the breeze stops, like the animals can sense a predator nearby that's even bigger and scarier than you. So what does this mountain bike trail system have to do with the silence? The west side of the wind loop. Things just happen there. I've been to DTE so many times and the uneasy feeling never goes away on the west side of the wind. I'll pass riders who have taken some bad falls and require a medevac. There's a spot where the forest looks pretty open, but it's quiet. Unless there's a storm moving through the area, you don't hear a thing. This section is about 500 to 600 feet directly south of the intersection of Gilnan Drive and Sugarloaf Lake Road. There used to be a trail that branched off to the left, and after a tree fell over, nobody ever opened it back up. There's always this heavy musk in that area specifically. I know the smell of deer and it isn't a bat. Something else lives in that area and it creeps me out. Part of me thinks it's a mountain lion, but those sightings are super rare and have been mostly a little bit more west or in the upper peninsula. The most perplexing thing is that this is really close to Sugarloaf Lake and there are some people living out there, so there shouldn't be a reason for this unease. I'm not the only person that's felt it, but yeah, there's something really not right with the forest there.
Not too long ago, my brother was telling my mom about something that my dad had said to him quite a few years ago that always puzzled him. My dad passed away over 10 years ago, so I can't ask him about it and it really bugs me that I can't get more information. My dad loved being in the woods. They were like a second home to him. Whenever we would take a family trip into the woods, I could ask him what any animal sound was that I heard from the area and he could tell me exactly what animal was making it and any other details I asked. He grew up on a farm, spent time as a forest ranger working in the fire towers, and he enjoyed hunting, so he knew nature pretty well. The woods that we would take family trips to, he was also very familiar with, as some of the fire towers that he worked in were still standing in the area. I think nowadays only one does. My brother said that there was a weekend that my dad decided to take a trip to the woods by himself to do some small game hunting. Not unusual at all for him. The strange part was that my dad came home early. From where we lived at the time, it took two and a half hours and sometimes longer depending on traffic to get to the woods that he liked. He didn't spend the night, even though he had brought everything he needed to camp for two nights. Both my mom and my brother remember him coming home early. Only, my dad never mentioned why to my mom, and only let it slip to my brother once. My dad told my brother that he heard something making a sound in the woods. A sound that he had never heard before in all his life. He knew it wasn't from any of the animals in those woods. The sound made him pack up and head home during the night. My brother tried to press him for more details, but he quickly changed the subject and never wanted to discuss it again. He never described what type of sound it was. He just said that it wasn't from any of the animals that inhabited those woods. None of the natural ones, anyway. My dad was never easily spooked, especially by nature. Whatever he heard, we have no idea. But it sure got to him good. It eats at me that I can't ask him about it. I really want more details. My brothers still take trips to those woods, and they've never heard anything out of the ordinary while out there. So maybe we'll never know. My uncle has a large stretch of wooded property in Missouri, about an hour and a half drive from St. Louis. He has a cabin, a small man-made lake, and trails throughout the woods. When we visited, we would spend a lot of time driving ATVs down the trails. One of the trails leads to an abandoned mining area. The area has a toppled over mine shaft, a couple of cement buildings, a sheet metal storage shed for core samples, and a sheet metal building with showers and a couple of rooms. There's a metal fence separating two sections of it that, for a while, was still mostly intact. All of it is in disrepair and hasn't been used for mining for many decades, perhaps a century. All of this lies in a large open area that has no trees, just sand and mud flats, which made it the perfect place to drive four-wheelers. We'd visit a few times each year, and we would take the four-wheelers out to the flats and have a great time riding. We never felt unsafe, and sometimes we would even go out at night to stargaze. Eventually, we started to notice that these sights pop up at the edge of the woods around the flats, like sticks stuck in the ground in lines or circular patterns with small burn piles. There were usually shotgun shells, bullet casings, and beer cans spread around. Sometimes we would see spray-painted symbols on pieces of trash or trees. Basically, it looked like people shooting targets and drinking out on the flats with a touch of weirdness with the symbols. So we didn't think much of it and just decided that we wouldn't go out at night and we started carrying guns with us when we went out, just in case. What finally did it for me and kept me from going out there was when we discovered that the fence had been nearly completely destroyed. 
Only the posts were left, and on every post someone had stuck a can or a jar of something on top. And all throughout the flats and on the trails that ran its perimeter, we would find cans and containers stuck onto the ends of tree branches. Again, it wasn't anything too weird. Like, we know people go out and break stuff and do other dumb things. What got us was the scope of it. The fence was probably a half mile in length, and every single section of metal mesh had been removed, which would have required considerable time and energy, even with bolt cutters. And that alone wouldn't be too weird, because people loot metal for scrap all the time. The thing is, none of it was gone. It was just laid on the ground next to the fence. And then somebody had taken the time to cap the posts with cans and other containers. Then to boot, they had taken the time to place items on the ends of tree branches every 50 feet or so, all along maybe two miles of the trails and on the perimeter of the sand flats. That was the last time I went out there. It's been 10 years and I've moved states and I have limited contact with that part of my family, so I don't really know if anything else has happened. I know it's probably nothing paranormal, just some weird human activity out in the backwoods of Missouri, but it was still pretty creepy. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves were of his slaves. Now in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields. Basically a cleared out area where there are no trees just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is a tree house that you sit in and wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on a green field, number one, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normally enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he is going to go out for a short walk to see if maybe he sees any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was still pretty light out. So I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things start to get strange. I sat there for a freaking eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he still wasn't back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or that he had gotten lost. However, he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight or dusk hour of the day, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening and waiting for a deer to walk out onto the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. 
That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I really wanted my dad back. A short time passed and it's now pitch black and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was quickly turning into a panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch black woods where I had just seen a freaking ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted as if he hadn't been gone long at all. I asked him where the hell he'd been and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around, and came back. That timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was very unlike him to leave me alone for that long. He was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. I don't know who the ghost was that I saw. I don't know if my dad went through some kind of time warp where time sped up. I don't really know. What I do know is that I never went hunting there again, and I don't plan on ever going back. I was hunting for black bear one day, back in the early 2000s. The area I was hunting in was northern Clinton County. My ex-brother-in-law and I enjoyed the area and spent many a season scouting and hunting these lands. This part of the country is filled with long hollows, steep inclines, and hard to access trails. We both like to do our own thing and hunt separate terrains. I would often dive down into the hollows while he scoured the ridgelines, hoping to get a shot at whatever I pushed over the tops. We both carried pretty bumped up two-way radios to keep a general idea where we were, although often the terrain made it too difficult for good reception. This day was a typical Pennsylvania bear season day. It was on the Wednesday of the season, third and last day of the brief season it was back then. The woods were quiet with no distant whooping and yodeling of various opening day camps pushing drives through the woods. The weather was cold, gray, and windy when we separated to begin our hunt and continued on throughout the day. I spent the day still hunting down this long hollow, south of a little town in north central Clinton County, with the idea of meeting my brother-in-law at the top of a ridge at the agreed upon time of 4 p.m giving us plenty of time to hike together the few miles back to his truck. After hunting all day, I found an old game trail that appeared to meander its way back up to the ridge line toward where I knew he would be waiting. After close to an hour, maybe 3.30, I made my way two-thirds of the way to the top. Stopping often, I scoured the slope for that jet-black fur of a roaming bear. Along the trail, I came upon a long-ago used fire ring. It was very rudimentary in its build, and appeared to be used only once. The ring's rocks were covered in lichen, and only had the faintest of traces of black from a long-ago fire. I found it odd that a fire ring would be here, considering the steepness of the slope, but it was a very small, somewhat leveled edge. There I figured I would sit and eat the rest of my packed food and sit still, hoping to catch a final chance to see a bear. All the while, it felt odd, somewhat unwelcoming, like I shouldn't be there. Almost felt like I was a forbidden interloper on someone's valued spot. I sat for maybe 20 minutes, 
and then thought that it was time to continue the trek upward toward my buddy. As I stood, I slung my backpack on and reached down to sling my rifle over my left shoulder. As I stood up, I heard my name called loudly. It didn't really sound like it was behind me, rather all around in my head. Just as I was going to turn around, my rifle was slapped off of my shoulder. I felt the force, heard the sound of something slap against the wood of the stock, and I crouched quickly to save my gun from dashing onto the rocks at my feet. I grabbed it in the nick of time, and quickly turned around with a mouthful of profanities for whoever I thought was going to be my brother-in-law, joking with me. There was nobody there at all. There's absolutely no way that anyone had rushed off without me either seeing or hearing them. I felt a sick feeling in my churning stomach. Chills went all over my body. I muttered a few Hail Marys and sped up to the top of the ridge, met my bud, and quickly we hiked our way out of the woods to his truck in the spreading dark of the evening. This event has bothered me for years, and I've never been back in those particular woods since. Someday, I hope to. Maybe. The basement door at my house never shuts unless you push it closed. It opens up if you don't close it all the way. And sometimes I've had dreams of a person that had a blue aura or something around it and an old military uniform coming up the stairs and opening the door. The same with my cousin. Independently, she saw the same thing. A few days ago, I came up out of the basement, and, as I was about to close the door, it slammed shut, all on its own. I freaked out, and then I heard noises from down there, like somebody was walking on the stairs. I didn't check because every time I got close to the door, there was a weird noise, kind of like somebody clearing their throat. It freaked me out. When I was in middle school, seventh grade to be exact, we lived in this house that had a basement that would not stay locked, even with a bolt lock. Every night, we would lock that basement door, and every morning, we would wake up to find it standing wide open. The basement was a dirt basement, so my mom had in the back of her head that somebody was probably murdered in the house and then buried in the basement. But if that were true, none of us were going to go down there and find out. After all, my mother was a single mother of two young boys. In the room where the basement door was, you would often hear muffled voices, people having conversations, but they were always muffled like they were far away or whispering. However, you could distinctly make out a male voice and a female voice. My mother was a nurse who worked night shifts at the local hospital, so on the weekends I would always have a friend to spend the night. On a Saturday night, while myself, my brother, and my friend were sitting in the living room playing Sega, yes, this was ages ago, we heard a woman scream coming from the room with the basement. My mother would go to work at about 3 a.m. and work until about noon the following day, sometimes later. So, when we heard the woman scream, it was about 4.30 a.m. on a weekend night, with just us boys alone in the house. After the scream, we quickly turned off the television and Sega, and ran for my mother's room, where we all decided to sleep on her queen-sized bed while she was at work. The next morning, about 9 a.m., a few hours before my mother got home from work, my friend said that my mom came home last night, even though she was supposed to be at work. According to him, he woke up and saw a woman standing at my mother's bedroom door. 
After he saw her standing there, she told him, Go back to bed. Everything's okay. About ten years later, during our family Christmas, we were all talking about the same house with the creepy basement and its basement dwellers. Finally, after all those years, my mother revealed to my brother and I that she woke up several times to see someone standing at the doorway of her bedroom. She said she didn't want to tell us because it would scare us. However, according to my mother, she saw several times a woman standing at her bedroom door. It gives me goosebumps to this day. This happened in 2005 to 2006. I was 16 to 17 and living at home in my parents' basement. I had just started dating a girl a little younger than me that claimed she had the ability to communicate with spirits. I was pretty skeptical of her abilities, but being a teenage boy, I didn't really think too much of it as I was attracted to her and that was all that mattered. I had just gotten home from a soccer game I had early that morning, and I walked downstairs and everything was pulled up from under our staircase in our laundry room. I asked my dad why everything was out, and he told me that instead of using the litter box, the cats had been going under the stairs, so he had to get under there and clean it all up. I helped him a little bit and then went to my room to shower as my girlfriend was coming over. So I hop in the shower, and about 10 minutes into the shower, I start hearing a very loud, aggressive banging on the door. It made me jump, but of course, I just thought my dad needed something from me. So I shouted, One second, Dad. I'm just in the shower. Not even two seconds go by, and I hear more frantic banging. I'm a little annoyed at this point, and I just go, Dude, I'm in the shower. One second. A couple more seconds go by, and more banging persists. Finally, I'm getting pretty mad, so I reach out of my shower to grab a towel, storm over to the door, and angrily open it. I shout down, Okay, what do you want? I'm taking a shower. And of course, nobody was there. I'm a little weirded out at this point. I had chills run down my spine. The basement always creeped me out. So, I poke my head out and look to the other side of the basement, thinking maybe he was storming off or something, and there it is. A black figure standing there, as if I had caught him off guard. No eyes. No mouth. Just a figure, standing there looking at me. We stared at each other for a second or two, and then he moved across the hallway toward the laundry room. I slammed the door shut and started hyperventilating. What was I going to do? I had to pass the laundry room to get upstairs. I quickly got dressed and gingerly opened my door and looked to the other side of the basement. Nothing. No sign of the figure. I tiptoed up toward the other side of the basement until I could see the stairs, and I ran up them. The first thing I did was call out for my dad. My mom heard me and answered, He's in the garage. I ran out to the garage and said kind of awkwardly, Hey, Dad? Were you banging on my bedroom door like five minutes ago? My dad turned and looked at me kind of confused and said, No? Why? I didn't know what to say. I think I was in shock. I realized that whatever that thing was physically hit my door. If it could do that, what else was it capable of? So I'm sitting there in the garage with this blank look on my face and I hear the dogs start barking inside. At this point, I realized that my girlfriend must have pulled in the front of the house. So I run to the house and meet her at the front door and try to play it off like everything is normal. She walks in and has a worried look on her face. She goes, what did you do? I was like, what do you mean? She goes, you've changed something about the house. Whatever you've changed, you need to change it back, now. I explained to her that the cats made a mess under the stairs, so my dad had to pull everything out to clean it. 
She told me to put everything back the way it was, and we did. For the five or six more years that I lived in that basement, I never had a problem. I didn't see anything. But every time I walked past that laundry room, I got goosebumps. Although my experience starts off like every haunting movie, I promise that this is exactly how it went down. My best friend flips houses and found this huge Victorian mansion that went into foreclosure. It was up for auction, and he was the only bidder. He paid next to nothing for this house. His plan was to demolish and update as much as he could on his own. I was there almost every day to help in any way that I could. It got me out of my house, kept my mind off things, and taught me a thing or two about renovating a house. It was a win-win for both of us. Beside the whole place having a cold, abandoned feeling, the only place that my stomach turned was in a specific room in the basement. I felt like I could pinpoint the exact corner where the bad vibes were coming from and I voiced this to my friend and his girlfriend many times. I could barely step foot in this room. It felt like an invisible barrier was in front of me. Once I went into the room, I felt sick, bothered, and sad. This has never happened to me before. One night, we were out on the front porch when a neighbor came over and started talking to us about the history of the house. He said that it was one of the first ones built in the town, and was once a part of the Underground Railroad. At one time it was a firehouse, and later, it was used as a funeral home. We thought it was pretty cool, and went to Google to find out more. Unfortunately, all of the history stuff like that was only at the library, so our search stopped there. One day I arrived at the house before my friend did. He told me to go inside and start getting things ready. Side note, at this point the only working bathroom was in the basement, and I was the only one in the house. I started getting things ready on the main floor, but kept catching glimpses of things out of the corner of my eye. It happened enough times to thoroughly freak me out. Some time passed, and my friend still wasn't there, when my urge to pee became too great to ignore. I only had one inside option, in the bathroom, in the basement, next to the creepy room. I was about 25 at the time, but still, I was so afraid to go into that basement that I peed outside in broad daylight where numerous neighbors could have seen. I'm also a girl, so it was pretty clear what I was doing. That's how scared I was. After my friend's girlfriend had some creepy vibes, she decided to find a medium to come stay the night and do a full-blown Ghost Adventures lockdown. I'm super into creepy stuff, so I was excited to be a part of it and hear if they found anything interesting. They did not want to know anything about the house or any of the experiences that we had had before they did their investigation. The next day after the lockdown, we sat down with the medium and her team to discuss their findings. I kid you not that the medium says they found the spirit of a slave that had not crossed over. He was in the basement of the house when it was part of the Underground Railroad. The medium noted that he was afraid of people and saw him cowering in this one corner. It was the same room and the exact corner that had made me feel so uneasy and sick to my stomach. I visibly turned white and every hair on my body was sticking up. The medium noticed my reaction and I told her about the weird vibes and the stories that the neighbor told us. She told me that she could tell I was sensitive and in tune to other energies around us that other people can't see and feel. I've been dating my boyfriend for about three years now. 
we live with his grandparents. Now, his grandma is really into paranormal and supernatural things, and I remember that she told me when my boyfriend and I first started dating that she saw her dead aunt in the bathroom. When she told me this, I'm not too sure if I believed her because I can be skeptical about paranormal things at times. Fast forward and my boyfriend and I are staying in her finished basement. One night, I was up pretty late, playing around and doing my makeup in the bathroom while my boyfriend was asleep. I saw something that looked like smoke fill the air, and I had this extremely uneasy feeling come over me. I felt the need to get out of that bathroom immediately, so I did. I ran out of the bathroom and flung myself onto the bed next to my boyfriend. Right when I laid down, I felt little pieces of my hair start to move. We sleep with a fan on high speed, and I like to sleep with my blanket over my head, so naturally I thought it was the fan blowing my hair. I tucked it back under the blanket. This happened seconds later, and it weirded me out. I eventually began to fall asleep when I woke back up. This was around 4 a.m. I felt pressure against my legs, as if someone was sitting down on the bed next to me, and I could feel the blanket moving on the back of my legs. Obviously, I freaked out and sat up, but I saw absolutely nothing. I ended up getting myself to fall back asleep, but when my boyfriend got up for work at about 6 a.m., the basement door that leads to the woods in his backyard was wide open. This is the weirdest house I've ever lived in, and that was my first experience there but there ended up being a lot more where that came from. As I mentioned in the last story, my boyfriend and I live in the basement of his grandparents' house. One night, my boyfriend went upstairs to make us some food. I was sitting on the bed playing around on my phone downstairs by myself. I didn't hear him come back downstairs, but I saw something walk across the foot of the bed into the bathroom. Me, thinking that it was him, started talking to him. I'm the kind of girl that can tend to ramble and he's not much of a talker, so I just kept on jabbering along thinking he was in there. But then I actually heard him come down the stairs and he flung the door open. I was really freaked out because I had legitimately seen somebody walk across the room. But what really freaked me out was what happened two days later. I was sitting on the bed while my boyfriend was at work, talking to one of my friends on the Snapchat video thing. I looked up and I saw a smoky black silhouette of a person walk across the room and into the bathroom. What made this so much scarier than the last time was that one, it happened in broad daylight, and two, it was completely in front of me, not just out of the corner of my eye like a couple of days before. When I told my boyfriend about this, he laughed at me and said, yeah, I hear footsteps run down the stairs, stop at the door, and then run back up. This scared me and weirded me out because he didn't even seem afraid of it. I would have been terrified. I think this was the first time that I ever really saw a ghost or whatever that basement entity was. I think the scariest thing is that I don't know what it is. A lot of people have seen actual things in this house and I'm scared I'm going to see a full ghost one day, or whatever this thing is. When I was 17, my brother, mom, grandma, and I lived in a centennial house. With it being over a hundred years old, I figured that there had to be a ghost or two. A lot of strange occurrences happened, and I always felt like I was being watched, especially in the basement. It was a basement with four different rooms. One door opened into a storage room to the left, and a sump pump room my brother's room right across the hallway, and the other room next to his was the laundry room. 
One summer day, we had just gotten home from a camping trip. I was thirsty and a bit hungry, so I went into the kitchen to make me something to eat. Note that my kitchen has sliding glass doors to the outside, and just right to it another door leading to the basement. I was standing at the counter when I heard my brother call my name and ask if I wanted a smoke. I'm like, yeah, where are you? The sound came very clearly from the basement, but since there's a deck outside my glass door, I figured he could have been outside. I had dark curtains, and they weren't drawn. I walk up the basement door and yell down again, asking if he's down there. No answer. I'm like, okay, fine. He'll come find me if he wants to smoke. So I walk to the front of the house, through my grandma's living room, and into the other living room, and out to the front door to our van to grab my backpack and purse. As I go outside, my brother and his girlfriend at the time were unloading the van. I asked if they had called my name, and he was very confused. I told him what I had just heard, and the very short conversation we had just had. He and his girlfriend both assured me that they had been outside unloading our camping stuff in the garage, and hadn't been anywhere near me. It sent chills down my spine. I limited my time going downstairs from then on. I still don't know what it was. As an adult, I don't really believe in ghosts. As a younger person, I had a couple of experiences that were kind of tough to find a good explanation for. This was one, if not the first, of a few events that I consider to be major events. My childhood home, and where my mother still resides today, was the setting for a couple of these events. It is a house that she and my father built when I was around three or four years old, prior to their divorce three or four years later. It's a one-story, three-bedroom brick house with a basement. The basement has a garage door that opens up on one side of the house, a single door and a couple of windows on the rear of the house, and the rest is enclosed by a sloped earth berm. The basement is not a finished or heated space, and it has served numerous purposes throughout the years. It's been a small workshop for lawn machinery and motorcycles, a playroom area complete with a pool table, and, more than anything else, a storage area for miscellaneous junk accrued through the years. It has a longer, around 12-foot-high wooden staircase that has never been finished or enclosed that opens up into the home's main hallway. When I was around 12 years old, I was home alone one afternoon after getting off the school bus. It was a typical spring day with nothing out of the ordinary going on. I was eating a snack and watching TV when I thought I heard a noise in the house. I muted the television, got up, and walked around, checking the entire house. I didn't find anything abnormal, nor did I hear any strange sounds. I sat back down and unmuted the television. After a few minutes passed, I thought I heard something again. Again, I repeated the process of muting the TV and walking around the house to check things. Again, there was nothing obvious. I once again resumed my activities, and once again, after a few moments, I heard something. This time, it sounded initially like the sound was coming from the hallway or the basement. I walked to the door that leads to the basement and stood there for a moment, listening. To my surprise and absolute terror, I heard the distinct and loud sound of two feet stomping up the wooden staircase toward the door. Reflexively, I hit the door with an open palm and shouted, Hey! I made sure both the knob lock and the chain lock on the door were fastened, and I darted out the front of the house. I took off up a dirt path, bound for my grandfather's house a couple hundred yards away. I found him quickly and informed him of what was going on. I was completely sure that there was someone in the basement and that he had to go back with me to search the house. 
We went back immediately and couldn't have been away more than seven or eight minutes of total time. We started upstairs and found nothing out of the ordinary. We opened the basement door and ventured down. There was absolutely nothing there. The doors were locked. The windows were locked and still had the screens in them. There weren't any loose pipes or anything that could make a hammering sound similar to the distinct sound of someone bounding up those wooden steps. I was uneasy the rest of the evening, and I never thought about that basement the same way after that. I don't know what it was that made the sound, but it wasn't anything natural or a living, breathing creature. My dad works for a contracting company in St. Louis, Missouri. The building's interior is exactly the same as it was in the 1960s, all except for the dust and deterioration. The actual date of construction is 1910. It's only a five-story tall building. It's nothing immensely big. It was previously used as a law firm, but when the firm left, they decided not to take anything with them. There were tons of law books, paintings, desks, etc. But the basement. Back in 1960, they started to renovate it, but never finished. So the basement is an extremely dilapidated 1910s paint falling off, broken glass ridden, rusting freight elevator, deadly tetanus infested nail cesspit. But my dad and I went in there anyway. Keep this in mind. My dad coaches boxing as a hobby and he's huge, all muscle. He's fought all his life. And even he is scared of that basement. Every time we go down there, something is different. The first time I remember going down there, the plaster on the walls of a hallway had fallen, and I mean all of it. The whole hallway was stripped down to its bare structure. I assumed, of course, it was because of the renovation, but my dad said, what's all this shit? It wasn't here before. So we go down the hallway, and yeah, in and of itself, it's nothing really special, but there was a metal chair in the middle of this dark hallway and for whatever reason, it just freaked me out. My dad turned on the lights and they worked for a second, but then they all busted. Some of them just fizzled out, probably because of how old they were. So down the hall, there was a boiler room. It contained this rubberized trench coat, rubberized to avoid stains, and a bowling ball bag. Inside the bowling ball bag was a cleaver with what I assume was a deer bone handle. After that, we left. A few weeks later, we came back down and all the plaster on the floor was gone. We went to the end of the hallway and the boiler room door was closed. Maybe we closed it, but I don't remember doing that at all. It doesn't seem like our priority would have been to close that door when we were getting out of there. By the way, nobody has the key to the building except my dad. He and I are the only ones to enter the building ever. At the end, there was a T-shaped intersection. On the wall, there were three identical pictures of the same exact priest with a deadpan expression. His eyes were glazed over like he was possessed or couldn't see or something. We came back after a few months near Christmas. We only made it down the steps and immediately left. There was a Christmas tree, little lights blinking, and a Santa Claus doll with the most indescribably creepy grin I've ever seen in my life. Something was definitely going on in that basement. Every night, I walk down the stairs to the basement and then into my gaming room to unwind with some video games. As I reach the bottom of the stairs, I turn on the light, but I keep it dimmed just so I can make my way to my room. At about midnight, it's time to go to sleep. So I open the door of my gaming room to find the lights completely turned off. I deliberately keep the switch at halfway 
and when I go to the staircase, they're always pulled all the way down. I've always thought that it was my wife who would come downstairs and shut them off. I politely asked her why she would shut the lights off, and she replied, I've never gone downstairs to shut the lights off, not even once. For context, I've seen shadowy images run by in the basement. I dismissed it as being fatigue. However, when my niece was just three years old, she said that there was a boy with red eyes on the staircase. We thought it was just her childhood imagination. Then when my son was two to three years old, he ran into my arms after staring at the staircase. I asked him what was wrong, and finally he said, there's spooky with red eyes. Could entities actually physically manipulate the light switch? I can't explain what's going on. In September, my partner and I signed the lease on a dream apartment. I was ridiculously excited, and I kept telling everybody I knew all about it, to the point where I was probably pretty annoying. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me at work, and of course, I told her the news of our new place. She asked me where it was, and when I told her the location, she turned pale and seemed uncomfortable at best, and flat out scared at worst. She asked to see a picture of the inside, and when I showed her, she let out a long sigh of relief, then proceeded to tell me one of the creepiest stories I have ever heard. It turns out that about five years ago, she had lived in the house directly next to mine with her sister and boyfriend. Starting almost immediately when they moved in, they began hearing noises out in the kitchen area at night when they were sleeping. And occasionally, they woke up to the cabinets or kitchen tools being opened or scattered around. Eventually, they started to hear what sounded like kids talking in low voices in the kitchen at night, occasional crying and crashes that sounded far off, but still somewhere in the house. Around this time, my friend and her sister started to fight a lot, and she said that they'd both been feeling extremely irritable about everything. Their house was broken into while they were all at work one night, but nothing was stolen except for some cheap costume jewelry. There was cash, valuable jewelry, and designer clothing in the house, but all of it was left untouched. Later in the same month, they received a visit from the cops who said a neighbor had called about screaming and crying coming from the house and had reported that they had left their children alone when they went out. They didn't have kids. The cops were called a few other times and finally got a search warrant. Somehow, they ended up finding a trap door under the kitchen window area that was covered in a layer of leaves and dirt. They found out that it was the remains of a very old root cellar. I live in one of the oldest cities in America, and much of the structures are built on top of older structures. That's not the surprising part. One thing led to another in the search down there, and the police recovered some very old skeletal remains of two children. Nobody seemed to know if the skeletons or the root cellar were there first. During all of this, my friend and her sister broke their lease and moved out of there immediately, as they were terrified to be there any longer. I went through with my lease and I live in the building next door to where all this happened. My apartment is an old adobe market that was converted into an apartment in the 70s, and it's been an absolute dream to live here. No scary vibes or noises at all. The couple who live in that house now seem pretty nice and keep to themselves. We all have high adobe privacy walls and coyote fences, and I feel tempted to see if they know about all of this. But I'm afraid it might make them uncomfortable if I approach them about it. In any case, 
That was the wildest story I've ever heard. First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement, and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So, my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out, when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started, when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat, coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her, since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time, and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet, which had the door closed. She opened the door, and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop, and... Rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor-length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence, some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us, since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, 
but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason, neither of us really understood. We were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in, and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended, or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear anxiety, and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise, and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked, and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with, and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable, and after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs, eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there, and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us, or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since.
This happened in the summer of 2019 when I went to visit my cousins in India. They had recently built a new kitchen and two modernized bedrooms in the basement. Initially, I thought it was a sweet gesture that my cousin allowed me to stay in his room and make it my own for the month that I stayed there. Little did I know that I would soon be encountering some unexplainable things. This will be a pretty long story as I want to explain it thoroughly enough so you can imagine the situation clearly. The first incident, the home alone incident. I was told by my cousin that he needed to go out with some friends and would return in the next 15 minutes or so. No one else was at home except for the maid. I tend to get vibes of areas pretty quickly and it's safe to say that the basement made me feel pretty uneasy. I was hesitant. However, I had nothing to do upstairs and the TV was downstairs in my room. So I went down there with my cousin's dog. The room felt incredibly cold, which is strange for a room in India in the summer. I hadn't turned on the air conditioning and nobody else had been downstairs, not even the maid. I went to get the remote from the cabinet under the TV. It was a pretty loose cabinet. Sometimes it would swing open by itself. So it felt strange that I was unable to open it despite tugging on it pretty hard. The dog began to shuffle backward whilst staring at something in front of me next to the cabinet. There was nothing there, not even an insect. The entire month that I was there, this was the sole time that I ever heard a sound from that dog. He's typically pretty quiet, but the sound he made wasn't a bark. It's hard to describe, but it's almost like he was in pain, almost screaming. It wasn't a pleasant sound at all. The dog then ran back upstairs. He's quite a lazy dog, so it was kind of odd to see him run at such a speed. Suddenly the room went back to its normal warm temperature and the cabinet swung open. I nearly fell on the floor from the force that I had applied to the cabinet to try to open it. I put on a movie and I tried to calm down. My cousin came in around a few minutes later and I told him what happened. He was also very confused by the noise which the dog made and he opened the cabinet in front of me with just two fingers trying to show me how easy it was to open. The second incident, the anklets. My cousin's sister and I were both having a late night talk one night at around two or 3 a.m. Everyone else was asleep upstairs in their rooms. Suddenly, we both heard anklets moving upstairs and then we heard it getting louder. It was going down the stairs and coming toward us. Initially, I got excited, thinking it was my other cousin's sister who decided to join us. However, I was confused as to why she would suddenly decide to join in, despite previously saying she didn't want to, and hence going to sleep a few hours prior. My cousin's sister's next to me. We'll call her M. M is very brave and jokey, so I was incredibly concerned when I saw how shocked she looked. I asked her what was wrong, and she said, no one in the house wears anklets, and they don't own any either. I thought it was an intruder. At this point, the anklet noise had just reached the bottom of the stairs and was turning around the bend to enter the kitchen, which was located directly outside the room. I stood behind the wall with M, and we were ready to trap whoever this person was. The anklets stepped up the step and the sound stopped directly outside the door where we stood. There was no one there. We were incredibly confused, so we checked all over the basement and turned on all of the lights. We then called my other cousin's sister, but she was still sleeping, so she didn't pick up. We went straight back into bed and I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep that night. Incident three. The blanket. This happened two nights after the anklet incident. I had finished watching yet another movie and was ready to sleep at around 3 a.m. 
This time, my cousin's brother said he would sleep on a mattress, which was laid across the floor by the end of the bed, in order to make me feel better if I was scared, since M was out that night, and I was too traumatized by the anklet incident. My cousin's brother was already asleep, and I was about to sleep as well. I'm sure many of you can relate to me when I say that I sleep by curling up. So I did just that and laid on my side. As my eyes were getting heavier, I began to notice that my blanket was being pulled down. Of course, this couldn't have been me as I was curled up and my hands were gripping onto the blanket at the top near my face. I thought it was the dog, but then I remembered he went to sleep hours ago, upstairs. Everyone's doors are shut upstairs when they sleep, so there was no way that he could have come downstairs, and I would have noticed if he did. Then I thought maybe it was my cousin pulling on it in his sleep. I was too tired, so I tried to sleep again. The tugging happened again, but this time more aggressively. The blanket was actually snatched out of my hand from the force. I also felt pressure at the end of the bed, as if someone was sitting there. I turned my torch on, but nothing was there. You could see that the blanket had been pulled as it was very uneven on that side. I tried to wake my cousin up, but he wasn't anywhere near that end of the bed, and he was in deep sleep. I called my other cousin on the phone. He lives about a half an hour away from that house and I put him on speaker so that we could both shout my cousin's name for him to wake up, but he didn't. Needless to say, I was stuck there and couldn't sleep, so I sat up with the light on for the rest of the night. I pretty much looked like a zombie at this point from lack of sleep. The last incident, but not the least scary, was the face. So this happened around a week after the blanket incident. M was sleeping beside me again, as I was far too scared to sleep alone at this point. I had just said goodnight to her, and we were about to fall asleep. Again, this was around two or three in the morning. I actually started sleeping, but then I felt incredibly uneasy. That feeling like you're being watched. I suddenly woke up and directly stared into the face of something pale. Something or someone, who knows. I couldn't see eyes, but the shape looked like it should have been a face. Despite not seeing eyes, I still felt like I was being watched. I let out a small squeal because I was so scared. My voice just abandoned me and woke up to see if I was okay as soon as that face disappeared. As soon as I began telling her what I saw, we heard the gate crash outside the room. To put this into perspective, if you walk out of the room and kitchen and continue walking straight within the basement, there are stairs which lead to a heavy metal gate so that you can get onto the main road. There was no one walking around on the streets that night. There usually never is, especially at that time of night. Even if a kid tried knocking on the gate outside, the sound would be too deep for what we heard. The gate crashing sound, which I'm talking about, is the sound it makes if someone were to open it and then slam it shut. Sometimes M's dad leaves for work very early in the morning and returns later in the evening. However, later that day when M and I went upstairs for breakfast, he had just woken up and it wasn't him. Even if it had been, why would he use the basement gate instead of the main door to leave the house, which was upstairs? In conclusion, it was a very weird experience. I don't know what I experienced, honestly, but something was up with that basement. I was never sure whether I should believe in the paranormal or not. Sure. I'd heard strange noises home alone at night, or felt the energy in the house shift to something more sinister in a matter of seconds. But what I experienced in August of 2021 convinced me. 
It's taken a long time to process what I had experienced. I've mostly tried to pretend that it didn't happen. And to be honest, I really wish it hadn't. For context, last August, I had moved into the guest bedroom in our basement. I'm 15, and having the entire basement to myself for most of the day and all night was awesome. I immediately began to regret my decision, though, as I discovered how unsettling the energy in my basement is. It's really hard to explain, but it just feels off, especially at night. I was literally always on edge whenever I was down there. Sleeping was quite difficult, as I was never really calm. I often felt an overwhelming presence watching over me, and I was really hating my decision. But I knew my mom would be upset if I changed my mind so soon, so I endured the hell I was living in. I quickly need to describe the layout of my basement so you can understand where everything is taking place. Once you enter my basement, there's a large living area. Attached to that is a hallway that leads to where I've been sleeping. So I woke up at around 1 to 2 in the morning to the sounds of about four voices in the living area of the basement. I could never actually make out what they were talking about, maybe because I had just woken up but I'm pretty sure they were speaking in another language or maybe very broken English. As I was listening to the voices, I heard quiet footsteps approaching my door. The only way that I was sure they were footsteps was because the floor in our basement, especially in the hallway, is very creaky. I pulled the covers over my head and shut my eyes. I fell asleep almost immediately and nothing else happened that night. I've also felt people touch me in the basement, but usually those experiences are comforting. I usually believe that to be my father who passed away in 2015, as I've only felt those when I'm sad or angry. Still paranormal, but unrelated to the experience I just told you about. Either way, that experience in the basement terrified me, and I'm still not sure how to explain it. So I'm on staff duty and finishing up. It's 5.05 a.m. The gym opens at five o'clock sharp. I'm supposed to bring the master key over and unlock the gym and sit down here while people PT, since we had a few incidents of misconduct. So I get the key and my things and come down to the basement where the gym is. There are no windows and the lights are on a sensor with a switch. When flipped on, they come on and stay on until the motion sensors go to sleep. Then you have to walk into the center of the room and wave to get them back on. When flipped off, they're off, and that's that. So I open the door and hit the switch, and nothing. It clicks, but no lights come on. So having just watched scary videos all night at staff duty, I prop the door open with some plates by the entrance and get out my phone and turn on the flashlight. I flip the switch in the other direction since they aren't labeled, and in the army up and down might as well be the same thing. It clicks and no light. Now I'm noticing that I can hear the other light on the far side of the room click all on its own. Well, that's not creepy and it may realistically be a short in the shitty wiring. I flip the switch up again and hear the far switch click a half a second later. So light in hand, I decide to find my balls and walk out there and wave at the sensor. I start walking and I'm pretty sure I should be tripping the sensor, but the only light is from the emergency sign and now across the room by a weight machine is a reflection off the metal like someone's down there with me. I walk back and flip the switch down. This time, I don't hear the other switch click and the lights come on. Bad feelings banished. Victory. Only, I decide to walk back out, 
carefully watching the sensor. By the time it picks me up, I'm significantly closer to that one weight machine than I was the first time, which means I wasn't in sensor range, which means someone or something else set off the grid for me. Or maybe it's all just a bug in the wiring. Back when I was still going to high school, I spent the night at my best friend's place. He lived in a basement. I woke up and went to the bathroom, and as soon as I got back to the room and laid back down, I closed my eyes. Then, I felt like someone or something was staring at me. I opened my eyes and saw a pale child staring me in the face. His dark eyes felt like they were staring into my soul. I yelled out for my friend, and as soon as he came into the room, the child disappeared. I told him what happened, and of course he didn't believe me. But now he says that apparently everybody who's ever slept in that room has seen him. His girlfriend, his brothers, and me. But he has never seen the boy. To this day, I can still remember what he looks like. I want to start this off by saying that I live in my mom's basement. Many people have said that they think it's haunted. Weird things have happened, like the washer turning on by itself, and sometimes even clothes appearing folded when they hadn't been folded previously. That's in the back room, though there's a larger main part that I live in. My bed and TV are set up where our pool table used to be placed when I was younger. In the middle of the night, when everyone else in the house was asleep, I used to hear people playing pool so that area is no stranger to spirits. When I first moved down there around two months ago, I woke up to a dark figure standing a few feet away from me. It didn't seem threatening, it was just a little weird. I've also had other paranormal experiences. I don't know if they're related to the entities in the basement or what, but I guess I'll share them here too. For instance, yesterday, my YouTube showed numerous profile pictures that weren't mine, but only on my Apple TV and only on the top corner icon when I would click on the profile. It would show my normal one, which is just the standard issued one. But then on the Apple TV, all these other ones appeared. I just stared at it for a minute, confused, then got up to look at the picture and it had something to do with God. I couldn't really read it because of how small the icon was, but it seemed to be some type of Bible verse. Then, before my eyes, the profile picture changed again to what looked like a picture of Jesus. So seeing this, I ran to my computer, figuring somebody was on my account and I should probably change my password. But that's when I discovered that the icon on my account there was totally normal. No one knew had logged into my account, and there were only three devices on that account, my computer, my Apple TV, and my Xbox. So I once again looked back at the TV and the icon was now different. This time I could actually read it. It said, the power of Christ compels you. This slightly shook me to my core and I ran back to my computer to change my password. Eventually the profile icon went back to normal on its own a few hours later which was also somehow slightly alarming. Like I said, I don't know if this has anything to do with what's going on in the basement, but my TV's in the basement, so maybe. I hope this made sense. I don't know if anything like this has happened to anyone else, but please let me know if it has.
Let me set the scene. I used to own a house near the mountains on the northern side of Colorado. This was a period of time where I had just gotten fired from a job because of pandemic related reasons and was home alone. I lived with my roommate at the time, but he went out to some club that night, leaving me home alone with my dog. I hate to even think of this, and this is the first time I've ever told anybody besides my neighbors. It was around 8 p.m. on a Friday, and I was watching Friends on TV. While watching, I heard what sounded like boxes shuffling around in the basement. My dog immediately noticed this and brought his head up. Our basement wasn't finished, and we had a window down there which wasn't in good shape, so I had just brushed it off thinking that the wind was making noises. After a while, the noises never stopped. I decided to grab my light and head down there with my dog. I grabbed my light from the kitchen and opened the door to the basement. I started walking down the stairs, calling my dog. The only odd thing was that my dog wouldn't come down with me and was making that little high-pitched noise the dogs make when they aren't happy or whatever. He refused to go down into the basement and just stood at the top of the stairs. To give you perspective on how my basement was laid out, all of my extra stuff from my childhood, like clothes and things like that, were piled in the back right corner. So when you walked down the stairs, on the very right was where all that stuff was. And all my roommate's stuff was right next to mine on the left. There was a bench with all of the previous owner's stuff that they had left there too. While going down there, the sound was still very clear and it was getting louder the farther I got in. I saw the window opened and making noises and decided to go and close it, thinking it was nothing else. As soon as I closed it, it felt like a hand grabbed my leg, but it wasn't a normal hand. It was super hot. My legs were swooped back and I fell down. All I can remember from this point on was my dog barking extremely loudly. I then woke up and found myself in the closet of my roommate's bedroom. I walked downstairs and looked at the time, and it was three o'clock. My roommate wasn't back yet. I literally looked at the clock and grabbed my phone and dog and ran outside the front door. I went over to the neighbors, which was a mile away. I ran there with bare feet. I didn't have a car at the time. When I got to the neighbors, whom I barely knew, I ringed the doorbell extremely fast. About a minute later, a man opened the door and asked why I was ringing his doorbell this late at night. I could tell he was quite frustrated with me. I told him everything, and he said that the previous owners moved out because the husband of the house ended up hanging himself in the basement. We talked for a bit while I let my dog run around in the back. I called my roommate to not go home and to come over to the neighbors. Around an hour later, he showed up and we all just sat there talking about what had happened. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, I headed back to my house with my roommate to find the sofa flipped, all the doors open, and the cabinets in the kitchen all open with dishes broken on the floor. I decided to go live with my sister and sell the house around two months later. To this day, I'm not sure what that was and I haven't had any other experiences. I had just broken up with my girlfriend at the time. I heard that ghosts, especially when they die like that, thrive off of bad energy or whatever, so maybe that's why everything happened. I don't know. But if you have a way to explain it, let me know. I like stories about the paranormal, but I've never personally experienced anything, and I tend to be pretty skeptical about them. However, there was a weird experience that I wanted to share and see what people thought about. Back in 2009, I was in college a couple of hours away from home. My grandparents, who I lived with through the last two years of high school, were away from home at their second property, 
where they were building their retirement home for the weekend, and I wanted to get off campus. So my friends, let's call them Jess and Nina, and I decided to go to the house for the weekend. My friend Jess claims to be sensitive. She has told me stories about things coming into her room when she was growing up, and I can tell she's genuine. But to my knowledge, science has yet to demonstrate the existence of any kind of life after death, so I remain skeptical. I could tell something was off as soon as we pulled up to the house. I'm grabbing my bag from the truck, and I look over to her to see her staring up at the house. I ask her if she's okay, and she just says one word, occupado, and then proceeds to grab her bag from the truck and we all head inside. Let me give you the layout. The house was built in the 80s and my grandparents bought the place in 99. The previous owner had died in the home, in his sleep, I think. It was a two-story brick home that backed up to a lake. It was quite a nice place to live, but there were also parts of the house that always used to creep me out for some reason. The front sitting room and dining room upstairs and the stairs to the basement where I lived in high school. But like I said, I never experienced anything. Anyway, my grandparents knew that we were coming down for the weekend, but they were going to be gone for a while. So they shut off all the water in the house, except for to the downstairs bathroom. We all go inside and a few hours later, Jess decides to go downstairs to use the bathroom. Nina and I stay upstairs watching a movie. She's gone for quite some time, and when she comes back upstairs, she asks us what we wanted while she was in the bathroom. Nina and I just look at each other, confused. We hadn't left the room and we hadn't called for her. We didn't know what she was talking about. She asks if either one of us had come downstairs and tried to turn the bathroom door handle while she was in there. We looked at her, incredulous, and tell her that we had not. She grows pale, and my heart starts to race. I think someone is in my house. Nina and I grab knives from the kitchen and go room to room searching for an intruder. We find nothing. The house is quiet for the rest of the weekend. I still think about that sometimes. I don't know what it was. Maybe my friend was daydreaming, and maybe she got into her own head. Maybe she was messing with us, although she swears up and down that she wasn't, and she looked genuinely terrified. Maybe there was someone in the house, though I'm pretty sure we would have heard them opening a door. Also, there was a security system that beeped if any door or window were opened. I just don't know. What do you think? This happened to me many years ago. I was maybe 10. I'm 23 now. My sister and I were over at her friend's house, which she had told us was haunted during prior visits. It was just us. Her mom was at work and her little sister was at daycare. We were down in the basement, which was half finished. It was furnished, but the walls had no siding yet. We were messing around down there, jumping on the couch, just doing kid stuff. We decided we were hungry, so we headed upstairs, shut the basement lights off, and took an immediate right at the top of the stairs into the kitchen. We were in there maybe a few minutes making sandwiches, when all of a sudden we heard the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard come from the basement. It was absolutely terrifying. I don't know if three kids have ever gotten out of a house so fast. We sat on the curb across the street until her mom got home. I've had several encounters with what I presume to be the paranormal, but that was by far the most horrifying and memorable. It still gives me the creeps to talk about it, and to this day I'll sometimes text my sister to ask if she remembers it, just to make sure I'm not crazy.
So, I decided to post this after the sixth person who has come into my basement has said that they feel off, overwhelmed, and like they're being watched. I usually bring them down to play billiards, and I have my old PS2 and Xbox 360 down there as well. The basement is finished, painted, and carpeted, and there's an office down there too. They always leave saying that they all felt the same things, and that they're so put off by it that they never want to go into my basement again. Yesterday, one of my friends left his mask in my basement, went back down to get it by himself, and said that he felt like his heart was beating out of his chest. I also want to note that when we first moved in, for the first month or so, we would find an unreasonable amount of dead centipedes across the basement floor, but only in the room with the billiards table. The office room never had a single centipede in it. All of a sudden, the centipedes just stopped. Never saw one again. It's been two years. I felt the same weirdness, but I always ignored it. I'm usually afraid of basements because I generally don't like being underground, so it wasn't unusual to me. But then everyone else started talking about it. I've also noticed that my house has become more active as in lights turning on and off when nobody's home, doors opening and closing for no reason, doorknobs jiggling aggressively, things moving to very peculiar places. I really don't know what to do with this. Back in 2014 to 2015, I was in high school and living with my parents. My parents were heavy on Christianity growing up, so I was raised going to church two times a week. My mom is extremely spiritual as well. Anyway, for years, my mom kept telling everybody that there was a lot of spiritual warfare that was going on in our house. Everybody in my family just thought she was crazy but I strongly believe that it was true. My sister started going down the wrong path. My dad was apparently cheating on my mom for years, things like that. My parents started noticing some weird type of feces in our basement window wells. So one night my mom asked me to help her find out what it was by going into the basement with the lights off and only using a flashlight. We went down there and were quietly waiting to see if we could figure out what it was, when all of a sudden we heard a whisper that was so loud, it almost felt like it was coming from a surround sound speaker. It was almost as if somebody came right up into both of our ears and whispered. It immediately sent chills down my whole body and my mom too. We both froze for a second and my mom said, what was that? Was that you? And I said, no, what was that? We both bolted up the stairs screaming and we refused to go back down that night. My dad tried to say that we were just crazy and hearing things. I've never felt so uncomfortable and violated in my entire life. Something definitely whispered into our ears, but we couldn't make out what it had said. Still to this day, thinking about it freaks me out. Since then, my parents divorced and sold the house. Growing up, I had experienced a few strange things in that house, and my sisters did as well. Sometimes we would hear what almost sounded like a phone vibrating in the basement, but we couldn't ever figure out where it was coming from. It happened multiple times in the span of five years. I truly believe that there was a demonic entity messing with my family. My husband told me this story the other day. This security guard, now a middle-aged man, had no idea that the two of us were active on Reddit, but he wanted us to tell his story. So here it is. I was a young man back then, 
and had been working on the job for a few years now. I was a security guard working the security detail in a large shopping mall. Back then, shopping malls were a new phenomenon in the country and people had no idea how to guard them properly. There weren't exactly a lot of us on the security detail. I was joined by a very young man, inexperienced. It was probably the first time he'd been on a job like this. And this older gentleman who had been working security all across the area. I had only been on the job for about a fortnight. We were all just sitting around on our posts. I had expected another slow night at the mall. Things didn't really happen in our part of the city. It must have been around midnight when I started hearing the clanking of chains from the basement area. The sound was so loud that it startled me. I sat up in my seat and became attentive. Maybe I was mistaken. But as the clanking continued, I realized it was definitely coming from the basement area. Confused, I paced around for a bit until the younger guard came running toward me. He asked me about the sound. I told him I had no idea what it was. After a bit of discussion, we decided to go check it out. We grabbed a torch, informed the older gentleman, and started descending into the basement below. The mall had shops in the basement, but the sound was coming from the storage area, and that was extremely unusual. No one had access to the basement except for a handful of employees, including the three of us. There was only a single elevator that could take you to that floor and a set of stairs. The young guard and I opted for the stairs, mainly because we wanted to surprise or potentially scare whoever was making those sounds. By the time we descended to the ground floor, our torch turned off. This alarmed the two of us. We were already creeped out. The young man had already started to sweat. I told him not to worry, reminded him that we had guns if something went south, and opened a small single door that opened into the basement. As you can expect, it was pitch black. All we could hear was the clanking now louder and right in front of us. I was afraid for my life. We could have been attacked at any moment. My heart started to race. I banged the flashlight on my leg and it sprung to life. There was an empty chair right in front of us, a few meters from the door. The clinking continued. Shaking, I pointed the flashlight around and saw the most bizarre scene unfolding. Metal chains, where they'd come from, I had no idea. We had no chains in storage, were being moved from one end of the basement to the other. I could see them gleam in the torch's light. I was stunned. No one was carrying them. The young guard I had brought with me was already screaming. I pointed the flashlight around until it landed on the chair. Only now, there was a middle-aged man sitting on it. Looking at us, he had a terrifying expression on his face. He was clearly angry. A weird gust of wind blew by me and the torch fell to the floor. The young man screamed again and became unconscious. All the while, the chains continued moving. I was so frightened that I ran, leaving the young man on the floor of the basement with God knows what. Something I still feel bad about to this day. So I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. First, our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear somebody walking around in the office at night sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally I'd hear talking. 
My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and that the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Maybe on the pipes, but no one was ever awake during the other things. Second, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress pacing. My parents just said it was the shadow of somebody outside. We were on a hill overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. Third, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging really loudly, so loudly that it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said it was just my brother pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyway, on to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with my parents and I. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room. So when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my stuff downstairs, painted it and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day and he casually says, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked as obviously he was kidding, right? My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. I figured he was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing and stuff like that. She had to go to the bathroom, so she closes the door and I was just kind of zoning out. All of a sudden she goes, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard somebody laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out and I assumed that my brother put her up to it since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle and then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but nobody's there. I checked the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm. So nobody could have come or gone through there without everyone knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I told her what just happened. She then told me that my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He said he was kidding because, quote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and that's when he got legitimately creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl. I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today to ask me about this. He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. So something just happened in the basement and I thought I'd tell you about it. Here's a little house layout to help a bit. 
Our living room has two ways to enter, one from the kitchen and one from the front door. The staircase leads right down to the front door. The way to the living room from the front door has you pass a hallway that has closets and the door to the basement. So it's 1.39 in the morning and I'm done scrolling through social media and decide to sleep. However, I want to cuddle with my kitty while I rest. I have a kitty sleeping on the headboard, but she's so peaceful I don't want to interrupt her. So I decide to head down to the main floor to find one of my other two cats. Down the stairs, I see my fluffy Newfoundland dog sleeping by the front door, as usual. I decide to take the way through the kitchen to grab a snack. Then I come into the living room and I see my other cat sleeping in their cat tree. They look so peaceful, I decide it would be rude if I let one sleep and took the other one to cuddle with. So I let them sleep and started my way back into my room through the hallway. As I come to the archway from the living room to that hallway, the basement door slams all the way open, hitting a table that we have behind it. I'm scared out of my mind and immediately turn around to go the way through the kitchen. As I approach the front door, I pet my dog and I remember thinking, maybe I'll see a ghost down the hallway. I can take a peek. My biggest fear is ghosts and demons, so I have no idea why I did this. I don't even walk to the hallway. I just peek around the wall. The basement door is swaying back and forth gently. I get even more scared and run to the top of the stairs, into my room, shut the door, pull up Reddit, and basically now dreading the fact that I have to pee because I don't want to leave my room. I want to say that it's the air conditioning, but down that hall, there are no vents. The only vent is in the laundry room, which is past a weirdly long hallway and it has a door. I have no idea what could have made that door do that. So I live in a basement in my parents-in-law's house. My wife never goes down to my room in the basement. I'm almost always in there alone. Since I've lived in there, a few things have been happening that I dismissed as ventilation or something else, such as my door slowly creeping open. Frankly, I wouldn't even have noticed it opening if it weren't for the green indicator light of something that I have plugged into the wall outside of my room. At night, if I have to leave my room, I exit and make an immediate left, and I dip into the bathroom for restroom use. I can almost always sense an entity in the living area or bar area of the basement. This feeling is compounded when I exit the bathroom and my reflection appears on the wall out sliding doors. Sometimes I don't have a face in my reflection. I quickly re-enter my bedroom and shut and lock the door. Some nights there's a knocking from within the mattress that wakes me up, usually between 3 and 3.15 in the morning. I have no way of dealing with this other than risking it and fleeing upstairs to my son's room. My son is three, has autism, and frequently says, that's scary, over and over in the basement, looking toward the bathroom and living areas. The light switches that I have access to when leaving the room frequently cease to function right when I need them, or will flicker out almost violently as I'm on the staircase halfway up and out of the basement. I can hear rustling in the middle of the night sometimes as well, and I usually convince myself that it's a mouse. Lately, this has graduated to the sound of footsteps in the ceiling in the middle of the night. Most recently, when I heard those footsteps, no one was home but me, and I searched the house, wielding a knife for an intruder, to find no one. I think this entity is aware that I know it exists. I once interacted with it via the mirror, and it contorted my face. I have no idea what this is, or if I should be concerned.
This all happened when I was a kid. I was spending the weekend at my mom's house. My parents were separated, and I woke up one morning and watched some cartoons in her room while she slept. Eventually, I turned the TV off and went downstairs to make a bowl of cereal. I sat down at the table, which was about 10 feet from the open basement door. As I was eating, I heard my mom call me very loudly from the basement. The only things down there were a washing and drying machine and a toilet. I walked over to the door and peeked down there, and it was pitch black. That's when I remembered that my mom was asleep upstairs and hadn't come past me at all. So I freaked out, ran upstairs to her room, and sure enough, she was there asleep. There was no way that it could have been her, and it was just us in the house. The apartment gave me off, strange, and creepy vibes. My mom and I and a few other people all hated the feeling that you would get in the basement and the back room upstairs would give off very negative energy. Every time you went in there, you would start feeling kind of sad and very alert. She never used that room. It only had a couple of boxes in it for the five or so years that she lived there. Has anyone else had similar experiences? My brother and I were staying the night at our grandma's house. For context, her house is in the middle of the ghetto. My brother and I were watching TV, and my grandma was at the store. Suddenly, my brother says, want to go in the basement? Not trying to sound like I was weak, I said yes. Now, this was the worst decision of the month. So we go into the basement, and it is really creepy. When we reach the bottom of the staircase, the door shuts behind us. I just shake it off as natural, but still a little uneasy. We go into the garage because her garage is in the basement. So we start going through there and we find a rusty pipe and a motorcycle handlebar and some faint writing on the wall. Obviously there were other things like lawnmowers and stuff like that. All of a sudden we hear BAM like a metal door slamming. It was the laundry room door. So my brother and I are crabbing our pants, so we run back upstairs, scared out of our minds. Later that night, we start to fall asleep. Grandma's asleep. And then we hear what sounds like all of the basement doors opening and slamming. My grandma's not awake, and we end up falling asleep. We tell grandma about it the next day. And she just laughs and says, oh, that's just Jim messing with you. Then she explains that Jim was the old house owner who died there. That didn't really help us, but I guess it eased our minds a little bit. I have this problem since I've moved in to where I currently live. It's a rather basic problem. The lights in the basement go out at night. At first, I thought it was just the light bulb itself, so naturally, I changed it. Yet, whenever I wanted to grab something from the basement and it happened to be around 1 to 5 a.m., the light just wouldn't go on. I changed the bulb several times and it did nothing. The strangest thing is that I can literally have it turned on all evening, and it's fine. Then I watch it go dark at night. It annoyed me to the point where I recently called an electrician to check if everything was all right with the wiring. Maybe it's some sort of automatic switch that turns it off during the night, right? Long story short, I paid quite some money for him to check everything, and he found nothing. I can't blame him since everything works perfectly fine during the day. The next thing I did was set up different lights inside of the room, a light with a battery. At this point, I got a little freaked out since it turned off as well. 
I carried it back upstairs, and after a minute or so, it worked perfectly fine again. I carried it back downstairs, and after a few seconds, it went out. I'm not exactly on the edge, because my house isn't really haunted. I don't have bad dreams, no poltergeist activity or anything. It's literally just this strange light situation. As you can probably tell, I'm quite the skeptic. But could this actually be something paranormal? Could it be something natural? Magnetic fields or something? I'm not experienced with these kinds of things. Maybe there are other things I could try. I just think it's really weird that the lights in the basement, all of them, go out at night. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror. The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time. My cousin was 14, her brother was 12, and my brother was 8. We were in their basement one night, while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together, and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room, and on the same wall was a projector. My cousin, 12-year-old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector, while my cousin and I, she was a 14-year-old girl, were sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage, as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head, as if they were right behind my ear. But it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out, and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more, and when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years, and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement, with or without other people there. Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards, and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, 
But I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. I saw a story pop up on my Reddit feed about a black-eyed kid. It scared me because I saw a black-eyed kid once, and it haunts me to this day. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal. I lived in a small and remote village. One night, I woke up and I thought I heard something at my door. I got up, cracked the door, and I saw nothing there. I thought perhaps it was a deer or a porcupine, but there was nothing. I closed the door, turned around, and got back into bed. The second I turned around, I saw a child, black outline, white face, black hair, and deep black eyes. I laid there, stunned. I quickly pulled the covers over my face. The moment I did that, I woke up. I guess it was a dream. The same night sequence in the dream was reality. It was freaky. It felt so real. I can remember that boy's outline and eyes. A week or so later, my host father unexpectedly passed away. It was devastating to the family and entire community. For a long time, I thought that encounter was a bad omen. At times, I try to think that it wasn't related at all. It was weird timing, and it scared me then. And it still scares me now. For some background, this happened back in the 80s. I was between 9 and 10. I was an only child at this point and my mother was a single mom. She had taken all the money that she had and bought a trailer and some land and moved out to the country. I can still remember how she installed the septic system, installed the plumbing and an electrical pole and how we wired that to the house. This had given me great fascination with electricity. I was always helping her with these projects. I grew up knowing a lot more than most kids about these kinds of things. We lived in a rural area in East Texas on a two-acre tract of land. Houses were sparse and situated quite far apart, so not a heavily populated area. I was a lonely kid for the most part living out there, but I digress. I'll move on to the day they came. My mom was busy with something in her room, which was situated at the far end of the 72-foot trailer we lived in. I went to the kitchen for something and heard a knock at the door. I went to open it and found four kids standing outside, two boys and two girls. I opened the screen door and the larger of the boys asked, Can we use your phone? We need to call our mom. I was immediately suspicious because where had these kids come from? I lived here a few years and knew all the kids in the neighborhood. I remember looking at the larger boy's eyes and thinking something was different about him, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I shrugged and opened the screen wider and let them in. I left the front door open as I took them into the kitchen and pointed to where the phone was. The larger boy picked up the phone as my mom called to me. I ran into my mom's room and she said, Who's in the house? I told her, a bunch of kids wanted to use the phone. She looked angry and said, You don't let anyone in the house. Tell them to leave. I walked out of her room and back to the kitchen to tell them that they had to go and found the phone off the hook. The front door was still open and the screen door was closed. I ran to the door and outside to look for the kids, but they were nowhere to be found. They couldn't have had time to walk or run across two acres to get to the street. So, where were they? After that happened, life was super weird. Mom was always getting sick, unable to find sustainable work, and became heavily paranoid. She got into damaging relationships with men. Of the most weird occurrences were when she didn't have the ability to pay the phone bill. So the phone company came and disconnected the phone. However, we kept getting calls. I rarely ever answered the phone, 
So when my mom told me this, I was skeptical and I didn't really believe her. Then one day she was busy outside and the phone rang, so I answered it. I heard a woman say hello on the other end. It sounded just like my aunt and then it all just went to static. When my mom came back in, I told her what had occurred. So she went to a neighbor's and called the phone company to ask them to check the line, that our phone was still ringing. They came out, inspected the line and the pole and came inside and told my mom, there's no way you're getting phone calls. The line is completely disconnected. It's cut at the pole. This happened constantly, even after my mom moved the trailer to another city. In that city, she had failed to pay the bill again, and again we kept getting phone calls that ended in dead air, or strange voices, or static. Their linesman told her the same thing, that there was no way our phone was ringing. But yet, it was. To this day, I really don't know what to make of any of that, but it was also around this time that I began to experience things like words of knowledge, clairaudient experiences, where I would know things that I had never learned, and I would hear things just before they happened in physical reality. I mostly kept those experiences to myself and I would just think, how weird. When mom sold that trailer, we never had those weird phone experiences again, and the clairaudience also went away. There were a few other weird occurrences too. While still living in the country, I was sitting on my mom's bed next to her. She was saying, it feels like there's bugs crawling all over me. I got off the bed and walked over to her dresser, and for some reason, I felt the need to look up. On the ceiling, there were tons of tiny spiders. I am not exaggerating when I say there could have been millions of itsy, bitsy, tiny little spiders. I knew my mom would freak out, so I just said, Mom, please get up and leave the room. She looked at me with a look of concern and asked why. I said, just trust me, get out of the room. She then gave me a look like I was simply being impossible, so finally I said, look up. I have never seen her leave a room so fast after she looked up and saw that mess. Literal arachnophobia. We fumigated the house directly after that several times a year. It could be unrelated, but I've never seen anything like that before or since. After we'd moved the trailer to another city, some lights would either dim or get brighter and brighter when we turned them on until they literally popped. When mom called the electric company, they sent an electrician out to inspect. He climbed the pole and when he went to test one of the lines, it literally popped him off the pole and he flew to the ground. He was okay, though a little shocked, pun intended, and shaken. The electric company's stance on the issue is that there was a miswiring at the pole. It was most likely that they missed the ground. Again, could be unrelated, but the circuit breakers never tripped during these episodes. In hindsight, it was all just really, really weird. I had this really strange experience last year, and my brother just told me about BEKs, and I feel like that's what I saw. So last year during Christmas time, my sister and I were having a hard emotional night and we decided to go around looking at Christmas lights. I was driving and we were just crying and talking and looking at the decorations. There was a meteor shower that night, and we ended up on this super creepy back road with nothing around. No houses or buildings, no street lights, just woods. Somehow we both saw a meteor falling in the sky as I was driving, and we both screamed with shock and excitement. As we looked back down the road, there was a small child on the side of the road. It had a backpack and was just staring at the car with this insanely scary grimace on its face, with huge black sunken in eyes. It didn't move its body but its head was moving with the car as we drove past, tracking us. We freaked the hell out, screaming and crying and just in utter shock of what the heck was that. It filled us with such terror and we were both so distraught and upset. 
We couldn't stop shaking and crying, and we couldn't rid ourselves of this horrible feeling. I felt guilty for stopping if it was somebody that needed help, but it was in the middle of nowhere, in winter, late at night. Nothing was around that road, and there was just no reason for someone to be there. They weren't trying to flag us down for help, just staring. We called the cops and went home and couldn't sleep all night. No joke, I still have PTSD when I drive at night. I drew a picture when I got home, so I would never forget what it looked like. But sometimes I wish I could. My story isn't as scary as it is odd. This happened about 10 to 12 years ago, and I'm not sure if it was the real thing or not. When I was about 10 or 11, I went to the mall with my mom and we went into Sears. We were headed toward the main part of the mall and we passed by a lady. I remember that she had a baby stroller and two kids following her, one boy and one girl. They looked a few years younger than me, the boy probably eight and the girl looked about six. I distinctly remember those kids having fully black eyes and pale veiny skin. I kind of felt guilty looking at them because I thought they had a condition, so I looked away. I never forgot about those kids and I would think about it from time to time until recently I looked up their condition. I searched pictures, websites, and different keywords to try to find a disease or something. Nothing. Earlier today, it clicked that what I witnessed could have been paranormal. I had known about black-eyed children for a few years, but I never put two and two together. This raised so many questions rather than answers for me. Why were they following her if they were BEKs? What happened to that lady? I wonder if what I saw is truly paranormal but I don't think I really want that answer. I hope to gain some insight, advice, or help about what happened two weeks ago. I'm a little bit familiar with the black-eyed children phenomenon but I need some help to identify what exactly happened to help two family members who haven't been right since the sighting. In 2013, I moved with my family into a foreclosed six bedroom home on 14 acres, straight up in the middle of nowhere in the Poconos. My father and I noticed very weird things going on the second we moved in, but my mother and sister seemed not to notice. Everyone other than my dad and I and my entire family are the oh it was the wind type of people. I won't go into everything that happened there as it would fall under a different category, but there is some evidence that the entire area of where this house is located is haunted. Now historically speaking with actual evidence, people settled here around the old mill area long ago and brutally killed many Iroquois Indians. This area is very spread out over miles of heavily wooded mountains. Two weeks ago, my uncle on my mother's side and his girlfriend came to visit my parents' home. They do this quite often, as my parents always have people over for beer, games, bonfires, and things like that. I just wanted to start off by saying my uncle is a non-believer, a Harley rider who, to this day, I have never seen really get scared of anything or anyone before this. My uncle and his girlfriend are playing foosball with my parents when they realize that it's 12.30 in the morning, so they decide to head home. They take all the back roads, and once they turn onto Running Valley Road, about six minutes from the house, my uncle's girlfriend sees two figures. They were pretty far away at this point, but it was two small figures waiting to cross the road. Just to mention, there was nothing out there no houses besides one abandoned one that was still two miles up the road. Nothing else. The only thing in the vicinity is a cave. These figures were attempting to cross the road to go into the woods, which was very odd because of the time and location. 
They are now approaching these figures. Headlights start to shine directly on them. Both my uncle and his girlfriend see two young girls aged about 9 to 11 years old. One is much bigger than the other, wearing what my uncle best describes as early 1900s church clothing, like dresses to the knee with white cotton shawls and cropped sweaters. Weird, right? I mean, what the heck are two 10-year-old girls doing out at 12.30 a.m. in the middle of nowhere wearing church clothing? They also noticed that the bigger child had her arms wrapped around the smaller one, like you would do if she was hurt or scared or cold. At this point, my uncle's girlfriend is like, it's children, we have to stop and help. Now at this point, the truck is almost right next to the little girls. Both had their heads held down. So then, the bigger of the two starts to pick her head up to look at the passing vehicle. Then both my uncle and his girlfriend notice that the girl has no eyes, just black holes, as if they'd been carved straight out of her face. The girlfriend says, what the F was that? You saw that, right? Tur turn around, go back right now. My uncle, scared shitless, takes off, flying to get home. They get home and get into an argument because she wants to drive back and see what was up. She grabs her own car keys and my uncle basically was like, you are not going back there. We are never going on that road again. He calls my parents in an extreme panic tells them, and then they start bugging because they know that he would never lie or be that freaked out if it wasn't warranted. So my mom starts to tell me everything. Mind you, my family knows nothing of black-eyed kids and had never heard of it before. I send my mom an article to forward to my uncle with some of the very basic info. Young kids, no or black eyes, dreadful feeling, sometimes outdated clothing, things like that. Now my whole family is bugging out. I don't know what you guys think. Let me know if you have ever experienced something similar, or if you think they encountered something else altogether. A few months back, I was driving down a dirt road near where I live, out in the middle of nowhere, and my radio started going fuzzy and switched to a different song. Right about then, I see two kids, a boy and a girl, the ages I would guess would be at most eight years old, sitting down and playing on the side of the road, not near any houses, which is very strange considering how dangerous it is for kids to be alone on these roads. I see people going way faster than the speed limit all the time, so no responsible parent would let their kids play like this. I was concerned about their safety, so I pulled up beside them and asked if their parents knew they were out here. Without even looking up at me, they just said, yes. I said, okay, well, be careful out here and watch for cars, and I drove off. I didn't see their eyes as they kept their heads down. And our conversation was not long, but something seemed off about the whole thing. Around a month after that, I stumble upon r slash black eyed kid stories on Reddit. And before that, I had never heard of BEKs. It got me thinking, maybe these kids could have been related to that phenomenon. But I really can't say for sure since I never got a look at their faces. Here's where the story gets really spooky. I went to buy some weed. It's legal here, and I went to a dispensary that is also legal. And when I pulled up to the shop, a black SUV pulled up beside me. It was an older guy, maybe in his 50s, dressed in black. While waiting for my weed, this guy was on his phone, and I overheard him spell out my first and last name. Like, who is this guy, and how does he know who I am? So I get my weed, and as I'm leaving, I look at his license plate and it says, remember me. I was a little freaked out and too scared to confront this man. I didn't even bother looking at his face because I didn't know what the hell was going on. I mean, was my life in danger? Does he work for the government? Is he an alien? I don't know. One last thing, probably a coincidence, but when I got home, I played a random playlist on Spotify. 
And guess what the first song that came on was called? Yep, Remember Me. I can't remember the artist. I really don't know what to believe, but since this has happened, my aunt died of a brain aneurysm and my mom has been diagnosed with cancer. I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but please pray for my family's safety. We could really use some positive vibes right now. I don't know if it's related to these kids and that guy, or maybe it's all just a coincidence, but either way, it's got me thinking. About six months ago or so in South Texas, I was visiting my family in a decently sized RV park in a rundown side of town. It was maybe 10 p.m. or so at the time and the dog had to go out. My dog only does his business at the end of the street in a buddy of mine's lawn and has issues passing due to a tumor in his back. So I always stop at the end of the street and kind of watch the stars and stuff and wait for him. Well, I looked down the street near the entrance to the park, and under this lonesome streetlight, I saw a silhouette of a child, maybe 9 to 12 years old, just standing there, almost in a T pose, but not quite. The odd thing I noticed was the hands, which were open enough where it was almost like a crab, like in the sense that you could see the thumb, etc., and the fingers had zero movement. I was puzzled trying to figure out how this figure was so dark under the streetlight, even though it was literally like seeing someone just enough to make out the outline in the darkness. I mean, zero light was reflected on this kid. Just utter darkness, like a void. The only thing I could think was that somebody was pulling a random prank and actually put a cutout or a mannequin even in the middle of the road. But again, I was still confused how it remained so pitch black directly under a light source that bright. I didn't walk up to it because of two reasons. One, being my dog, who was still trying to do his business. And second, I have a keen sense of picking up on negative energy. And it was the same vibe I felt in the haunted house I grew up in, where I also had several spiritual encounters. I sat there staring for more than a few minutes just focusing on fine points of this silhouette, looking for the slightest flinch of movement, but I never saw it. It was at this time I figured I would pull out my phone and try to zoom up on this figure, but oddly, the screen in my camera mode was pitch black, so I couldn't make anything out, and when I did zoom up to where I surely thought the figure should be, I saw nothing but the street light through the lens. A couple actually began to walk behind this kid around this time, and I noticed that they didn't even glance at or acknowledge this kid standing maybe six feet or less from them as they walked by. What was super weird was as they passed under the same streetlight, you could make out everything, from facial expressions down to what clothes they were wearing, but the kid remained solid black. They were walking their dog, and even the dog didn't seem to notice, which is odd. I gave up and glanced down to put my phone in my pocket, and when I looked up, the figure was gone. It just vanished in that second or two of looking away. At this point, I was getting really confused and just wanted to get home. The creep factor was through the roof. I turned around and began to walk back when all of a sudden, fast-paced running was coming up behind me. Startled but trying to keep my composure, I quickly turned around and saw this gray blur just zoom past. The thing that stuck out the most was for sure the very gray skin and what I swear were black eyes from just the slight bit of eye contact that I had. It was a kid. Then right as this kid is passing by, he says, Ha, I scared you. And boom, dude's gone just like that. Poof. He was moving way too fast for any person. By the time I got home, I began researching what this area has as far as legends go, and I stumbled across BEKs. I guess Texas is very aware of BEKs and has had several sightings, starting from some dude in Abilene who was a reporter. 
It wasn't until I did some more research and talked to some other Redditors before I became totally convinced that this had to have been a BEK encounter. This happened a couple of years ago. My husband and I were up late, worrying about our dog. She had thrown up something red and we thought she wasn't feeling well. Turns out she had jumped on the dining room table and ate some of my roses in a vase, so she ended up being just fine. But the husband and I were worried and we hadn't realized that she had eaten the roses yet, so we decided to go to the vet. It was about 10 or 11, I'm pretty sure, at night. When we stepped outside the door, we looked to our left at the cul-de-sac that's next to the neighborhood. It's an empty road except for one house. An old man and his dog live there. And there's a CrossFit gym. In the middle of the cul-de-sac, there's this little girl, maybe four or five. She's riding this old metal tricycle in a circle. The tricycle was making this constant squeak, squeak sound. So that in and of itself was pretty creepy. There was just something off about it. The way she was riding the tricycle, it just didn't seem right. My husband and I both remember her being under some kind of light, but there's no street light where she was at. I felt creeped out, but more confused and worried than anything. I started to head toward her, but my husband pulled me away and said we gotta go. He was pretty freaked out by her. I didn't really get a good look at her eyes. When my husband pulled me away, the squeaking abruptly stopped, and I heard a little voice say, Mommy, I don't really remember everything else that well. Everything happened pretty fast. But I glanced back after she stopped pedaling, and as my husband was pulling me away, and there was just something weird about her face. I vaguely remember thinking that her eyes were black but I didn't get a good look, and I didn't know about BEKs at the time, so I really didn't have a framework in which to process this. I just learned about BEKs recently. Does anyone else think that this might have been a BEK encounter? sure exactly what I saw, but I'm not sure where else to go looking for information, so maybe you can help. Recently, I have moved into a new place. It's a duplex, and my grandmother lives next door, on the other side. The actual house has good energy, and there's a massive beautiful backyard. Before this event, I had felt quite safe and comfortable, except for just getting used to the new noises around here. For context, I'm using the living room as a bedroom. The front door has a rectangle eye-level glass panel, but the glass is distorted. There's also a security screen, so there's a black steel X across the panel as well. Right across from the front door are two double glass doors into the living room, which is the bedroom now, which I keep open, and my bed is right through that. I know it's bad feng shui, but it's the only way the room works. So from my bed, I can see the glass panel and vice versa. There's an outdoor sensor light that turns on when it senses movement. The other day, my grandmother put up some pink wind chimes outside my door, and you could see them through the glass panel from my bed, albeit distorted. Around 11.30 p.m. or midnight, I was just about to go to sleep and I turned the lights off when suddenly I saw the outdoor sensor light flick on. Through the glass panel, I swear I saw what at first looked like a woman with pale like white skin and really dark exaggerated makeup, almost like drag makeup. She had black eyebrows and eyeliner that was heavily drawn out and it looked like whoever it was had a pink hat on, but in retrospect, I think it was the wind chimes. 
I was unbelievably terrified. I quickly jumped out of the bed and out of sight of the panel and called my grandmother, trying to figure out who this could be. We spent 20 minutes on the phone whilst I turned on all the lights. The figure was gone when I started doing that. I turned the sensor light to always be on. I closed my double doors so that there was less of a view of the panel. When I finally got back into bed, I found out that the sensor light has two parts, one that can be turned permanently on, and one that comes on just with movement, right outside the door. I saw that light come on again, and I jumped out of sight before I could even look. My grandmother insists that it was probably an animal that triggered the sensor, or the wind chimes, but I never heard the wind chimes and I don't think an animal could be large enough to set it off, or look like a woman wearing heavy makeup. Further, I cannot shake the image of that face out of my head. The only way I can describe the energy of it was that it was like the being, or whatever it was, was sizing me up. It was just staring, and it felt like it was deciding whether to try and come in and take me or not. I am fully aware that I sound crazy, but I cannot shake the feeling that there was some sort of energy there. Now, in the daytime, my cat has been going crazy, crying at all the doors and windows. He's never been like this before. It's really creeping me out. The actual house feels safe, and if there is some sort of energy out there, it feels like for some reason it can't get inside even if it wants to. I've taken down the wind chimes and put tinfoil over the glass, so basically, I just wanted people to hear me out and tell me what they think. If it could have been something normal, or if it was just the fear in my brain turning the wind chimes and the distorted glass into some weird face, I'll take it. But I just can't get over the feeling I had. I'm not really sure what's going on, but I wanted to throw this story out there to see if maybe somebody had any ideas. I've had sleep paralysis often for the past three years or so, and when I say often, I mean like three to five times a week. It's always a similar experience. I currently live at my mom's house with my son, as I left my son's dad who was extremely abusive. I'm working hard to get back on my feet. I moved in with her last May, so the sleep paralysis happened before I moved back, whenever I was still with my son's father. The current setup of the room that my son and I sleep in is as follows. It's a very large loft room, with a half bath and a small living room with a TV. My son has some insane separation anxiety, so he sleeps in the same room as me, and our beds are next to each other, in a T-shape. I'm at the top, and he's next to me, sideways. Underneath the loft is one of my parents' three other living rooms. So every single time that this sleep paralysis happens, I see a young child, similar to the look of my son who's about six. The child has dirty blonde hair and is wearing some old-looking dirty clothes, like as if he was a child from the 30s or 40s. I can't ever really see the eyes because the hair on his head is covering them. The child is just moving his hands up and down my right leg, and as he's stroking my leg, he's just staring at me with this huge smile, which has some really sharp teeth. All I think of when I wake up every morning is Cheshire the Cat from Alice in Wonderland. The child always asks me to call his mom as he's stroking my leg, either to call his mom or to get him a bunny salad. I don't even know what that is. And obviously I'm trying to move or scream and I can't. It's always the exact same thing that happens. So Monday night was the last time I had an instance of sleep paralysis. What I didn't know was that my mom was downstairs that night, starting to pass one of her kidney stones. She and I both have a kidney disease where we get infections and stones very often so it's not out of the ordinary for her to be up in the middle of the night. She said it was about 3 a.m., and she could hear someone moving around in the loft, moving from the bathroom to the bed, 
and then moving the bed around. So she walks up the steps, but sees that both my son and I are dead asleep. So she goes back down the stairs and hears it again. This time it's right where my bed is, so she just stays on the steps, listening to the noises of somebody getting on and off my bed, but doesn't see anything. I guess she thought nothing of it and went back downstairs, where she eventually fell asleep. The next morning, she was telling me that she was hearing sounds in the loft, and that's when I told her about my sleep paralysis. She just said, weird, and moved on with her day. I don't know what I'm dealing with here. I don't know if it's just my brain playing with me, or what. I did find out later something very interesting, though. Bunny salad was a thing in the 1930s. Food disguises were popular in the 30s, including pigs in blankets, mushrooms made out of cream cheese, and bunny salad made from a canned pear half. I think it's so crazy that bunny salad is actually something that existed. This kid told me about it multiple times and asked for it, but I had never heard about it before. The whole thing is just so unsettling. I had to get up at 7 a.m. to do some chores, and as soon as I was done, I felt really sleepy, and I wanted to get some rest, because I'd only fallen asleep at about 2 a.m. the night before. I was starting to fall asleep, and at that point, I felt that it was going to be some weird astral projection or dream experience, because that always happens when I haven't rested well, and I'm more vulnerable. I was in a room that was pretty similar to my own, but the colors were a bit different, and I had two light bulbs on my ceiling. So this girl that's in my room starts talking to me. She's right behind the bed frame. And she starts asking me weirdly specific questions that she shouldn't even be able to ask me. The first light bulb starts flickering, and I suddenly started to feel this demonic energy around me. So I looked at the girl, and when I pointed out what was happening to the lights, the other light bulb just went off completely, and the girl went silent, and her eyes changed to black, as if the lights in the room were keeping her from looking like her real self. At that point, I felt like I couldn't wake up, and my first and only instinct, and what I ended up doing, was to start scratching at her face and eyes. I think in this weird state that I was in, I managed to poke her eyes out, after which I woke up really dizzy. The strange thing is, I don't believe that it was something I saw or read about in real life that caused me to dream about this, because frankly enough, I hadn't even heard of black-eyed kids in around four or five years. They hadn't even been on my radar. That's the last time I had ever heard or read something about them. I don't know if this was one of them or something else, but it was definitely weird. This happened to my wife and I after exiting a movie in Mexico City. That day, we were pretty broke. I just had money for the movies, but not for the parking. Here in Mexico, all the public parking costs. So we decided to park the car behind the shopping mall on a back alley. When we were out of the movie, the shopping mall access to the back alley was closed, so we had to walk our way up there. When we were about to arrive to the car, a small looking kid around six to seven years old pulled my shirt from behind asking for some spare change. This is something pretty common in Mexico. There are beggars everywhere. I said, sorry kid, I'm broke. I have no spare change. The situation smelled fishy, so I opened the car with the remote key and made signs to my wife to enter the car fast. The kid asked again. The whole time he was looking to the floor, and it was a really dark alley, so I wasn't able to see his face clearly. I was using my phone flashlight to see around. That's when something makes my radar go crazy. I remember the hour. 
I see on my watch that it's 1.33 in the morning. In my city, no baker kids are out at that time, especially on an alley like that, unless they're trying something sketchy, like to rob you or worse. Without looking back, I rushed inside the car and placed the locks on it. That's when, while viewing the rearview mirror, I saw him staring directly at us. His eyes were like a void, a deep, dark black that made all of my body enter this fight or flight stance, a smile so evil that it got my heart racing incredibly fast. He ran next to my door and knocked on the glass while staring directly at me, asking for money over and over again. He tried to open the door by pulling the handle restlessly, and as soon as he left the handle alone by a second, I turned on the car and made a run for our safety. This kid started running behind us, almost at the same speed of the car, while screaming at us. Finally, we reached a highly transited avenue and the kid was nowhere to be seen. Needless to say, my wife and I were scared shitless. From time to time, we drive by there at one to three in the morning, trying to find that kid again, but we've never seen him. Also, I would like to add that the public illumination service doesn't work on that alley. It was really hard to see the kid. I don't really know what to make of it, but it gives me nightmares up to this very day. So when I was like 13, my mom and her boyfriend had to go to the hospital and nobody would be able to get my brother to the bus stop the next morning because they had to stay overnight. So I got to miss school the next day to take my brother. After I made sure my brother got on the bus and all that, I went home and cleaned and did random stuff that a 13 year old would do. It was around 1145 when there was a knock on my door Thinking it was the mailman or a neighbor or something like that, I opened the door and said hello. There was this kid at my door. He couldn't have been much older than me at the time, but he had bangs that were covering his eyes, which I found weird because it was like 107 degrees out. This kid was super still. I thought one of my friends put a mannequin there or something like that, but then it spoke. It sounded like a robot or something like it was programmed to say what it was saying. My mother said to ask someone for a phone in fear that I get lost. Do you have a phone? He said, like some freaking 1950s kid. At this point, I was absolutely crapping my pants because one, I'm a 13 year old girl and this older boy dressed like a burglar was at my door with his half face covered. Two, for some reason, I just couldn't look away. I felt like if I moved or said anything other than yes, I'd explode. And three, I saw two other boys around the same age standing in my driveway, dressed the exact same way that the one in front of me was. Baggy jeans, dark hoodie, and scuffed up vans. So I started to stutter and shake my head. It was the only thing I could do. I finally got out a no, then started to close my door. But this guy put his foot in the way. Then the other two started to walk up and I was like, hell no. I grabbed the bat by the door and threatened him. If you don't leave right now, I'll kick your effing ass and then I'll call the cops. I shouted loudly enough so that at least one of my neighbors could hear, I hope. Now I was this short girl with SpongeBob pajama pants on. I was in no way threatening. He moved his foot and stepped back into the middle of the other two perfectly, like it was choreographed. Then the far right one said in the exact same tone and voice as the first, I'm sorry to bother you. I'll just come again later and ask. Internally, I was planning my funeral. Just as I was about to close the door, the first one smiled, looked up, and his eyes were completely black. The other two looked and did the same thing, and they were exactly the same. I was like, nope, and slammed the door shut and called my neighbor, who was this big ass 20 something year old dude. He ran over and looked for them all around my house, but he said they were gone. 
When I told my mom all of this, she didn't believe me and told her that I was clearly lying. Said me, the girl with absolutely no social life and is afraid of her own shadow, was lying. Well, I wasn't lying and it definitely happened. And it was terrifying. I have spent decades in the military intelligence community, so I don't want to put too much information out there about myself on a public forum. However, I am curious if there are any other experiences that overlap my own. We lived off base in this rundown community that looks like any other rundown community you would find next to a military installation. The apartment complex itself was nice by the standards of the rest of the buildings in our area. At about 12.30 in the morning, on a Friday morning, I was woken up by a series of knocks on my heavy wooden door. I have a rule. One series of knocks is just people messing with the neighbors. But if they really need something, they'll knock twice. Yep, there came the second series of knocks. I expected it to be someone from work trying to get a hold of me. My cell phone had died. It had happened before. I opened the door and stared down at this kid that I estimate to have been somewhere around six years old. There was so much about this kid that was just bizarre. The eyes feature suggested in BEKs seems kind of trivial. I can't say with 100% confidence that his eyes were all black. I just don't know, because the rest of him was such a mess. When I look at people I don't know, I have a habit of avoiding eye contact. The rest of his description is as follows. His clothing was a gray, filthy hooded sweatshirt, with the hood up halfway, with matching sweatpants. The shoes were unremarkable. The skin complexion, for lack of a better phrase, was extremely pale. I don't know if there were blemishes in the way of freckles or scars on the skin, or if he was just really dirty, but there were some marks. His hair was possibly reddish brown, messy, dirty, and short. His face was in this grimace of hatred. His expression was like somebody who was sucking on the world's most sour candies. And here's the worst part of it. The body odor he was radiating was like something I have never smelled before or since. I've smelled decomposing bodies in war. The closest smell that I can relate to was in ranger school. In ranger school, due to the lack of food and rest, often the guy's bodies would start to consume muscle for energy. Combined with the lack of bathing opportunities, this creates an odor that is hard to top. But this kid's smelled like weaponized foulness. I asked, can I help you? In a flat voice, void of inflection, he said, my parents don't like you. I responded, uh, what? He stated, you'll be okay if you give us something great. I slammed the door on him because I thought he was just screwing with me. He let out this, no! I could hear him on the other side throwing a tantrum, like you see toddlers in the store doing when their parents won't let them have something. Definitely a very strange thing to do at midnight. However, kids running around the dilapidated neighborhood unsupervised was a pretty common occurrence. I just chalked it up to bad parenting. I showered and threw my clothes out because I didn't want that stench on me. And I went back to bed because I had to be up again in four hours. Strangely, the stench didn't seem to linger. It's like it went with him. I saw this kid on three other occasions. The second time, I was going out to my car in the morning, and he was standing in the parking lot, glaring at me. When I came home, he was staring at me, standing in the same spot. Then when I looked out the window hours later, he was still in the same spot, glaring with that same sneer at nothing. I asked my wife what she made of him, and she said he wasn't bothering anything, which was a pretty low bar for that neighborhood. Kids would often run around vandalizing people's vehicles and apartments. I thought about calling the authorities, but what was I going to say? There's this weird kid. He might need help because he's weird. Oh, and he stinks. 
The truth is, I hated this kid. Now, I have three kids of my own, so I don't just out and out hate other kids. But I hated this one. I hated his smell. I hated that he existed. I felt like he was trying to target and bully me for some reason. No, I didn't want to help this kid. Also, I had these paranoid thoughts of, if this kid hates me as much as I hate him, he's gonna lie to the cops and tell them I had harmed him. It could affect my security clearance. It's best to just ignore him and this will all go away. One time, I saw him interacting with kids outside, so I knew he wasn't just a figment of my imagination. However, he didn't play with them like a typical kid would. This girl would come up and grab him by the arm, and he would just stand there and glare at her. There were kids running around him, and he just stared at them with that grimace, unmoving. My wife wanted me to share this experience that I had back in 2011. At the time, I worked in the office of a regional command. I've read into various truly bizarre government programs, however, thinking about it, I still don't know what to make of this kid. I don't know what to get out of writing this. Maybe someone knows more about this kid, or has had other similar experiences. It's certainly not extraordinary, like some of the other experiences that people on Reddit have had. I'm not saying this kid was magical or demonic, I don't know. I can't rule out that he was truly just some kind of unfortunate kid. Maybe the right thing to do would have been to get him help. However, I just can't get past the hatred that I had for him, for no reason. Between that and the smell, my experience wasn't that bizarre otherwise. What I do know is that I'm fine with never seeing that kid again. Maybe these BEK experiences can be explained by kids just being extra weird. But either way, I'm glad my experience is over. I have started with a new routine, so I bought a bike. Decided that I would go on an 11pm to midnight stroll before heading home to sleep. Suffice to say, I didn't after this. There's a canal system in Glasgow perfect for cycling, so I followed it quite far out, with my light and bell at the ready in case I crossed paths with someone, although that's probably not likely given the time of night. I got off my bike at a bench. Behind this bench there's a brick wall and behind those bricks were disused railway tracks, decommissioned in the 1950s. My phone started to play up, and the light from my phone seemed a bit weaker than usual. I followed the light across the muddy canal, and to my horror, I saw what looked like a boy and a girl in the small island in the middle. I asked if they were okay, but I didn't get much of a response. I asked again if they needed my help or if I could call the fire brigade or police or whatever. Just as I said that, my phone died. I now only had the moonlight to go on. Remembering the light from my bike, I turned it on and scanned the area again. There was no one there. Thank God nothing came out of this other than that. I was absolutely shitting myself on the way home. I cycled home and freaked out a bit, turned my phone on, and when I got home, it had 61% battery. So what the hell happened? Nobody believes me, but I guess I don't expect them to. I would like to know what the heck I saw, though. I've only shared this experience with a few people in the years since it happened. It was the first Tuesday of the Pennsylvania deer season, December 3rd, 2013. I've always been an avid hunter, and I would wake up very early in the morning to get into the woods before daylight. I would be in the woods at 4.30 in the morning. Having to hunt on state game lands meant beating other people into the woods to get a decent spot. When I got to the parking area at about 4.15, nobody else was there. 
So I walked into the woods, not using a flashlight, just walking by moonlight. I walked through a field into the tree line and started on the path to my spot. I came to the intersection in the path. One way went left and down the mountain. The other way went right. I went right because my spot was on the other side. Roughly 50 yards after making the right-hand turn, I smelled what I could only describe as hot garbage. It hit me in the face. Like, I mean hot dumpster juice in the middle of August. So I stopped dead, turned on my flashlight, expecting to see piles of garbage, but nothing. No garbage, nothing dead, just that hot garbage smell. Keep in mind this is in December, it's cold out, high 20s to low 30s. So even if there was garbage, it shouldn't smell that bad. So I kinda thought nothing of it. I followed the path to my spot, which was down over the ridge from the garbage smell, roughly 40 feet down. That leads into a grass field where I would sit. I set up my seat, got settled in for about two minutes, and that's when the rocks started coming down the ridge. The first rock startled me, causing me to turn on my light again, scanning the field hoping to see eye reflection of a deer, but nothing was there. I sat back down. Another rock comes down the ridge. This time I stand up to go into the grass field with a flashlight and the pistol that I carry while hunting. I scanned again. Nothing. I purposefully waited in that field for about five minutes. Now I'm getting angry, assuming that another hunter is messing with me because I'm in their spot. I sit down again. The third rock, sounding larger than the others, comes tumbling down the ridge. I don't get up this time. Not two minutes after that, another rock, not tumbled, but sounded as though it was thrown off the ridge and landed in the field. Now I'm pissed. I gathered up my gear and started back up to the trail, to the ridge. I get on top of the ridge, scanning with my light the whole time. Nothing. No eyes, no other hunter. I get to the spot where I had smelled the hot garbage. Nothing, including the smell. It's just gone. Finally, it all clicked in my head. It may not have been another person. It might have been something else. I've heard stories of people's Bigfoot experiences, a lot of which remark about how bad they smell and about rocks being thrown. I thought, screw this. I all but ran out of the woods, and to top it off, no other vehicles were in the parking area when I got out of the woods. This took place in Pennsylvania State Game Lands 229, outside of Tremont, in Schuylkill County. I later came to find out that a coworker of mine had actually seen a bipedal cross in front of his car within two miles of the location of my experience. So maybe they're real, I don't know, but I definitely had an experience that I won't soon forget. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska and her dad had lived there for quite a while, so they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the meadow and the stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. 
While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. I can't explain it. I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six-cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four-wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill, overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods, to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent, and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke some time in the middle of the night to hear something, or someone, walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs, because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was, it sounded big. I could hear its weight, if that makes any sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until, somehow, I eventually fell asleep. The next morning I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft, and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I will always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. My grandparents, along with my grandma's sister and her husband, would go to Ontario, Canada every year for a fishing vacation. The area in Ontario is about 200 miles north of International Falls, Minnesota. During these vacations, they would go park by the garbage dump at dusk and watch the bears come out. Sadly, the local bear population had been reduced to eating garbage due to the presence of humans. 
Being from the south side of Chicago, it was fun and interesting for my grandparents, particularly my grandma. One evening, my grandma and my Aunt Beth were parked on the rim of the dump and sitting in Beth's car, looking down at the bears in the dump below. While my grandma sees one bear on his hind legs, he turns and makes eye contact with her. To her dismay, she realized that this was not a bear. It was Bigfoot. He looked at me with such evil in his eyes, she said. She screamed at Beth to start the car and to get out of there. Beth, hearing the tone of my grandma's voice, did what she said without asking any questions until they were a safe distance away. After they got out of there, Beth pulled over and my grandma told her what she saw. My grandma passed away in 1993. She was a wonderful person and had an open mind to what is now referred to as high strangeness. I think that's where I get my interest in it. I keep hearing howls and human-like whoops near the area where I'm camping in Utah. There's a lot of strange activity, such as strange smells around the tents, like a dirty wild animal, noises, and even items being thrown and damaged. I am convinced that it is not a bear, and so are my friends. But we're unsure as to what to do since the activity seems to be more frequent and sort of aggressive. The dogs act up by barking and whimpering on certain nights, as if there were a larger animal nearby. There's also the occasional feeling that we're being watched during the night, and some of us have had rocks thrown at us while walking out down between the two hills. These two hills kind of make a small canyon by a gorge. We have flattened the soil where we think it is at night, hoping to get tracks, but so far, we've gotten nothing. We have read about bears, but we have come to the conclusion that this is not a bear. It could be nothing, but I am certain that something is not right about whatever is stalking us. One of my friends just reported that while collecting dry firewood, he saw a large ape with shaggy red-brown fur standing at a good eight feet tall. He said it was far up a hill, kind of crouched, observing him from above. Yeah, we're pretty sure it's not a bear. I thought I'd share one of my Bigfoot experiences. I grew up in Oregon. As most Oregonians do, we did a lot of camping. One particular trip we were at was at our favorite site on the east side of Hills Creek Reservoir. I don't remember the date exactly, but I was probably 14 to 15 years old, around 1999. My tent was fairly close to the water, maybe 40 feet back while my parents' tent with my younger siblings was about 200 feet farther back into the woods. I was maybe 15 feet from the fire, and our kitchen was set up about 30 feet west of me on a raised area. Everyone went to bed while I stayed up around an hour longer with my dog. We eventually went to bed. I get all cozy and my dog perks up with alert. I wasn't too worried, as I could hear frogs and crickets. And then... Everything went dead silent. The frogs and crickets stopped. I could hear something coming through the woods from the direction of the lake. It sounded large. I thought maybe a bear or a deer. My dog starts growling, and I do my very best to keep her quiet. The walking sound gets to the raised area of the camp, where our kitchen is. I hear some of the stuff move around. I manage to slowly unzip part of the tent window. It's very dark, not much of a moon, and the fire was dying. But I could vaguely see something. Then, a very large figure steps down from the raised area, 
about a four to five foot drop and walks directly toward my tent. My heart is pounding. The dog starts shaking and growling. Thankfully, no bark is released. The figure moves past my tent within five to six feet and makes its way back to the road and back through the woods. It took huge, broad steps, each with a deep thump. Ten minutes later, the frogs and crickets came back. At the time that this happened, I didn't really know what was going on. I just had the impression that the woods outside of my house were very creepy. I only recently decided that I think it was a Bigfoot, after doing a lot of research and seeing a lot of similarities between my own story and other people's stories who have had encounters. My family started building a house in rural South Georgia when I was 12, and we moved in once it was finished a few months after I turned 13. It was a few miles outside of the town we lived in, a plantation town on the Florida-Georgia border. We lived there until I graduated from high school in 2013. The first thing I don't actually remember happening, but my dad told me about it a few months ago. Apparently the first night my family slept in the new house, when none of the windows had curtains or blinds yet, I came into my parents' bedroom and asked to sleep with them. I did this a lot as a little kid, but it was pretty unusual by the time I was 13. My dad said that I told him I saw a face looking into my window, and that it scared me. The rest of all of this I remember pretty clearly. One time, my sister and I were jumping on a trampoline in our backyard, and all of a sudden we heard something whistle at us. It came from the side of the house, near our garage. I can't explain exactly why it was so terrifying, but it scared us to death. We jumped off the trampoline and sprinted inside, slamming the door behind us. It was just so weird, because we had already met the neighbors at that point, and we didn't have many, and it didn't make sense that they would hide from us and whistle. They would have just walked up to us. Plus, we hadn't seen any people approaching. My sister has told me that she saw something hiding behind the trash can next to the house, but I didn't see that. She doesn't remember the whistling part, but I swear I'll never forget it. It was just so bizarre. I think that she might have seen something and remembered what she saw, while I only remembered what I heard. Sometimes I think that I remember seeing a dog or something run to the side of the house from the woods, like, super fast but I don't know for sure if that actually happened. Anyway, that was one of the single freakiest things that has ever happened to me. I know it sounds mundane, but in the moment, it was bone chilling, and I still get chills thinking about it. Anyway, after that, my dad decided to build a privacy fence around our backyard, and we got two dogs a little bit after that. The yard was pretty big, and my sister and I were both pretty athletic. We would put on headphones and play in the yard while we listened to music, kick a soccer ball, run laps around the yard, play fetch with the dogs, things like that. Sometimes we did this with each other, and sometimes by ourselves. At night, I always thought I would see some sort of cone-shaped head looking at me over the fence, but if I did a double take to make sure that I wasn't seeing things, the head would be gone. Other times, I'd be out in the yard by myself. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I would feel like I was being watched. This was always scarier to me than when I thought I saw things. I swear it was like I knew that something was watching me, and it was overwhelming. I would stop what I was doing immediately, and go inside. This happened all the time. Other times, I'd be shooting basketball in our driveway, or going for a jog through the neighborhood, it was a developing subdivision, not a house out in the woods by itself, and I would get that same freaky feeling. After we got our licenses, I think I actually saw one while I was driving. 
We were with another friend who also lived outside the city limits on the way to her house. Our friend was in the front seat and my sister was in the back seat. We were coming around this bend not too far away from our neighborhood and all of a sudden my friend and I saw this super tall brown thing on the side of the road. It was very tall, ancient. It looked like a really old man with a long beard and a distorted face. It was slender too, not bulky. My friend and I saw it at the same time and both said, what was that? I guess my sister was on her phone or something because I remember that she asked us what we saw, but we'd already passed it by the time she looked out her window. My friend and I both agreed that it was a man in a mask trying to scare people, but I don't think either of us believed that. From then on out, every time I drove past that spot, I would try to see if there were any weird trees or something that we maybe could have thought was a person with a mask, but it just looked like a regular patch of woods. Another time, a different friend was playing with us outside as the sun was setting. We were walking down this empty road that no houses had been built on yet, and to our left was some woods with miles and miles of ATV trails. All of a sudden, he just goes, run. We didn't ask questions. We all sprinted back to the house. When we got back, he was shaken up, and he said that he saw something, but he never did tell us what it was. My sister and I are both grown now, and our parents sold the house and moved out of state when we were in college, so we haven't been back for years. But after I did some research and started putting some pieces together, I asked my sister if she thought the house we grew up in was creepy, and she said it absolutely was. She would feel like she was being watched in the yard too, and remembers seeing shadows moving in the woods. She said she'll never forget seeing something hiding behind the trash can that one time. She even independently googled Bigfoot sightings in the town we grew up in, and found an article about a rash of sightings that happened while we were in middle school. Anyway, we both believe that that's why we were so creeped out by the woods outside of our house, that there was probably a Bigfoot, maybe more than one, living out there. I never connected all of these weird things until I started listening to Bigfoot podcasts and stuff like that, but now that I've put the pieces together, I feel like I can't unsee it. Today is February 11th of 2020, and I have just had an encounter less than an hour ago. So I'm hanging with my friend. We're going up on top of a mountain just to go up there. We had no real reason to go up there. We just wanted to. So we get up there and turn the car off. It's completely dead silent. It's really foggy from all the rain that we've been getting, and it just seems to put me and my friend on edge. So we're sitting there with our windows cracked because we were vaping, and all of a sudden, we hear something in the woods, off to our left. He turns down the music, and we both listen. We can see and hear the bushes rustling. First, it would be in one spot, and then ten seconds later, it would be in another. My friend opens the door, and I grab his wrist and pull him back into the car. I ask him if he's crazy, and he tells me no, He's just curious. I tell him that being curious is what gets people killed in horror movies and I'll be damned if I let you die with me present. He looks at me, disappointed, and then gets back in the car and closes the door. We continue to sit there and listen. We hear the same stuff for about two minutes. And then, it suddenly stops. We both look around and he starts hitting my shoulder with a sense of panic. I go, what do you want? He points to a gravel driveway that leads up to the power lines we were parked under. At the top of the hill, we both see a tall figure standing there, staring us down. I could see the faint red glow in its eyes. I could see my friend's chest rising and falling in the faint light that our phones were emitting. 
I felt fine, but I could definitely tell that my friend was not. It wasn't until the figure starts walking toward us with an alarming speed that I scream at my friend to snap out of it. He starts the car and hauls ass down the mountain. When we got off the mountain, we both looked at each other, asking each other non-verbally what the heck we just saw. I knew what I saw. I know it was Bigfoot. My friend wasn't so sure. He's not a believer. But after tonight, I feel like our believer community has grown by one. A couple of years ago, my boyfriend and I were in the woods, near a dam. It was about 3 a.m., and we were just pulling an adventurous all-nighter and enjoying each other's company. The area is located in the south shore of Massachusetts. As I've said, there's a dam with a stone wall and an area with picnic tables nearby. There's a path that goes into the woods. Lots of people fish here, and it seems like a pretty benign place. I've been here many times during the day, but never at night. We made our way to the path and went into the woods. We found a stone bench and were there for quite a while when suddenly we heard what sounded like a large grunt or exhale. We stayed silent for a moment and waited until we heard it again, grunting and exhaling repeatedly. My boyfriend said, whatever it is has big lungs. We could hear it moving, not toward us, but almost as if it were passing us to the left, then to the right. It sounded close enough to get to us, but it never showed itself. We didn't run out, but proceeded at a regular pace down the path that would bring us out. The noises continued as we left and sounded farther and farther away, so it didn't follow us. There are certainly bears in Massachusetts, but not in this area. I even went on Google Maps to see if there was a farm nearby or something, but there wasn't. I cannot understand what this was, but whatever it was, sounded beastly. So I live way out in the thick of it. This place looks like a Bob Ross painting. I have a little cabin with a loft that I sleep in and an outhouse just a few steps away. Not a bad place, except for the stupid ghost noises that happen nearly every night. So it's pretty cold and the cabin is somewhat new, 2019-ish. So with extreme cold, there's going to be some creaks. But I am not hearing creaks. I hear footsteps in the snow just outside the windows, despite there being no footsteps in the 10 inches of snow that's all around my cabin. There's thumping along the walls, even though there aren't any trees that are close enough to touch the cabin. Even if there were, for the whole time I've been here, there hasn't been wind faster than like 5 miles an hour. They like to do their thumping by my heating oil tank, which makes a nice metallic clanging sound. Originally, I thought it was someone trying to steal my oil, but again, no footprints other than my own. Sometimes I could hear faint footsteps directly below me while I'm trying to sleep. Ever since I put one of my spare Bibles down there, the ghostly activity has been contained to outside the cabin. So at this time, I'm pretty used to it, but it's annoying when I hear something banging on the side of the cabin while I'm trying to sleep. Is there a way that I could at least get them to help with rent since they won't leave? In whole seriousness, I don't really know what to do. I was raised in the bush, so I know that if I hear some weird noises in the woods during the night, I should just mind my own business. And I know that I don't want to get mixed up in ghosts and spirits. So how can I make it clear to them that they are not to go into the cabin? Edit, here are some clarifications. My CO2 detector is in the clear. I'm pretty active. I work full time, go to church, go to the gym, and I visit my fiance often, so I don't think it's cabin fever. Someone told me that heating oil tanks just randomly make noises, and yeah, that makes sense. 
But this isn't an occasional thump. It's a bang, 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 like someone's knocking on the door. When snow slides off the roof, sure, it makes a good thump, but these noises happen all the time. Snowing, not snowing, negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit all the way to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but always during the night. Local history isn't much to go off of. I'm still poking around, but from what I can see, this is just mining land. Miners just strolled in and started their mining. Simple as. Still no tracks in the snow other than my own, nothing big enough to make footstep sounds. There were squirrel footprints on the front porch this morning, but other than that, not a thing. And squirrels don't usually bang on your door. There are trees kind of close to the outhouse, but not close enough to bump into it when the wind blows. If you have any other ideas, though, I'd be happy to hear them. For our anniversary, my wife and I rented a cabin around Divide, Colorado. Our last night there, it started to snow. We were laying in bed, just relaxing, and we started to clearly hear footsteps on the front porch of the cabin. Nobody should have been around. I went to check, and nobody was there. Being a believer in Bigfoot, I thought, well, maybe it's something like that. So I looked out the windows and there was no sign of anything anywhere. There was fresh snow on the ground and there were no prints. That's what I really thought was weird. I laid back down and it happened again. So I got up, looked around, and there weren't any prints or anything. It happened a third time after that. I couldn't figure out why there were no prints when we clearly heard footsteps on the front porch. Then, we heard this wrestling noise coming from the roof. That happened a couple of times too, but I chose not to go outside to look. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin I was playing some games on my phone and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow, but then I saw it again. And this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it, since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment, so I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer. Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs. When it finally hit me, I was alone in the cabin. So whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers and it was freezing cold outside. 
I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams. This happened to me when I was in high school, living with my parents. One night, I went out with friends. I drank a couple of beers and I went back home. I was just a little tipsy, not drunk, and I decided to take a shower before going to bed. It was about one to two in the morning. The shower cabin that we had wasn't fixed to the floor or the walls. It was like a capsule, but it was very heavy and hard to move. I entered the shower and after a few minutes, the cabin started swinging left to right and it was very loud. I was standing trying not to move and it stopped, but as soon as I continued to shower again, it started swinging again. I stepped outside and there was my dad banging on the bathroom door asking what I was doing because the noise woke him up. I just got dressed and went to bed. The next morning, my dad asked me again what that noise was, and I tried to explain what happened. He said that I was just drunk and fell in the shower, so I moved the cabin. But that did not happen. I know that it didn't happen. I wasn't drunk. I had had maybe two beers. And I was standing the whole time. I had never fallen. It moved by itself, something that should have been impossible. I went to the bathroom and tried very hard to move or swing the cabin back and forth, but it was impossible. I still have no idea what happened that night. My grandparents used to live in the Ozarks in a tiny house in the woods. I loved it there. Being from West Texas, it was always nice to resort to a place with trees. After a year or two of living in the house, my grandparents decided to renovate it to make it look like a log cabin. I had always felt something really unsettling about the house and I warned them to be careful because renovating the house could stir up unpleased spirits. They went ahead with the renovations, gorgeous woodwork on the house with two beautiful decks looking out onto the mountains and an entire new living area in the basement. It was so pretty and I was really excited to stay there in the summer. When I arrived though, the atmosphere was tense it felt angry, even though my grandparents were very welcoming. It was quite strange. I got an official tour, and for the most part, the interior was the same. Then we went to the basement. I was overwhelmed with fear. I was hesitant to go down alone, and when I would, I could never stay for long. I always slept upstairs. I never felt safe down there. One day, I was making my way down the stairs to get some laundry, which was located across from the basement. 
I had only taken about three steps down when I suddenly felt cold and couldn't move. I just felt petrified. It wasn't too long before I felt a force on my back and the next thing I knew, I was sliding down the stairs. I was still so petrified that I couldn't even scream. It was a silent fall. When I could move again, I rushed for my clothes and ran back up the stairs and I didn't go back down for days. A week or so went by. It was July 3rd. It was storming all day, but still pretty warm outside. My grandparents had left for a party down the street and I had decided to stay and hold down the fort all alone. I was upstairs in their big open loft on their computer, just killing some time. It was still storming outside and it was the last moments of daylight. I was listening to music with headphones over my head, browsing YouTube and the like. I felt a familiar cold breeze, but instead of my entire body, it was just my neck. And instead of it being extended like wind, it was brief. It was like somebody was right behind me and just blew on my neck. I wasn't moving. I was too scared to even breathe. I just stayed still, the headphones still on my head. All of a sudden, my headphones flew off with such force that they hit the computer screen in front of me. I screamed, ran, and panicked. I tried turning on the TV, but all it was was startling loud static. I tried turning it off, but it wouldn't. Trying to calm my nerves, I looked at a painting of a meadow that my grandparents had hanging by the TV, and I saw it. I saw a man with the most sinister evil face I've ever seen, with empty white eyes. I felt so much fear staring into them. Trust me, he'd never been there before. I ran outside in the rain, shoeless and terrified. I walked to the house where my grandparents were, and I never explained what happened. My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there, and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. I was up near Antelope Lake, California, exploring this old mining town known as Lucky S with my girlfriend and her parents. There were a total of four of us. Lucky S is out in the middle of nowhere on this seemingly endless fire road. Then it just appears from the forest and you suddenly find yourself between at least four cabins, all in different stages of collapsing. When we got there, it was in the middle of the day, no later than 2 p.m. with clear skies. Knowing I was going into buildings that may or may not be haunted, I wanted to try to capture anything and everything that I could. So I brought my Nikon to take photos. We explored four or five cabins, ate some food, 
and then walked about a quarter mile farther up the road to the second half of this run downtown. While my girlfriend's dad was examining some old piece of large machinery and explaining how it used to work, I walked off alone to check out the next cabin. There were no steps leading up to this one, so the easiest way inside the structure was to either get a running start and jump in or pull yourself up by grabbing onto either side of the doorway. I elected for the run and jump version and totally ripped my shorts down the leg. I'm in this rundown cabin and I take a shot of my girlfriend and her parents outside the other building. I turn and take shots of the holes in the roof of the cabin I'm in and then I hear an odd noise, like one of them is shuffling debris just outside the doorway that I jumped through. So I stop and stand still, listening. Then I hear an obviously loud knocking coming from the doorway. I quickly turned and I see all three of the people that I'm with still outside the structure across the way. No one was near me. So I turn back toward the other end of the cabin, the one that I'm in, and I just stare toward the doorway. Seconds later, there's more shuffling, followed by three obvious footsteps. The first one is the loudest, I think, because of how you have to enter the building. You can't just step in. So these three footsteps sounded like they walked right toward me and then stopped. I stood there for a few more seconds and then slowly walked toward the doorway. After that, I never heard anything again. It was my first and only experience like this. I wasn't alone. It was in the middle of the day. It was outside and it was very sunny and bright. So I guess that's the least scary way to experience this. In any case, I'll take it. Either way, there was nobody near me and nobody in the cabin with me that could have made that sound. So I don't know what happened, but it definitely wasn't natural. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too. And when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for, I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I did and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. 
Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight, and I asked my mom, who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party, and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. I was up north at my uncle's cabin when I saw something really strange. I'm laying in bed at night, and it was like one o'clock in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. We're surrounded by trees everywhere. I'm laying on the bed upstairs, and I'm staring outside at the windows which are downstairs, because I can see it from where I'm at. The windows are very large. From the far left window, I see this massive bright white orb floating above the deck or porch. It moves back and forth between the one window and the other. I can't fully remember if I saw it pass over or behind one of the blind spots between the windows, but it just kept going back and forth multiple times with some speed. I gaze at the window and watch the orb travel from one side of the window to the other side multiple times. The size of the orb, from what I can remember, would be about the size of a large watermelon. I know that it was not the moon. Even when the porch is wet, the light of the moon doesn't really reflect. It was just my dad, my grandpa, and I there. There's also one other important thing. This place is where my uncle David's ashes are buried. Not my uncle the owner, but my mom's other brother. He's not buried near the porch of the house though but I still wonder if it might have been him. Our family has a small cabin up north that we go to when the summers get too hot. Our cabin has four rooms and a loft. There's a kitchen area, a living area, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and the loft. The rooms are tiny and our family is big, so we're always bunking up and sleeping on air mattresses all over the place. This particular weekend was 4th of July and the whole family came up to the cabin. Once everybody got settled in and had lunch, we all wanted to go for a walk in the woods. It was a beautiful day, and we all started to venture out. My nephew, who was four at the time, started to get a bit fussy and tired, so I took him back to the cabin with me for a short nap. I set up the air mattress up in the loft, and I put him down for a nap. It was almost 1 p.m., and I figured he could nap for 30 or 40 minutes and then be ready to go back out and play afterwards. My nephew then wanted me to lay down next to him, so I did, and we both started to fall asleep. I finally woke up by the motion of the air mattress moving. 
I figured my nephew had maybe rolled over to the other side or something. But now I was awake, and I could feel the sun on my face from the small window above. I glanced over to my nephew, and he was fast asleep, not facing me. I started to nod off again, but then I was woken up by the same motion of the air mattress moving. It's that sound, you know? The swooshing of the air. It felt like somebody had just sat down on the air mattress at my feet. So I look up and I see nothing. My nephew is still sleeping in the same spot. So then I just lay there, awake, and my eyes were still focused on the lower part of the air mattress, down by my feet, when all of a sudden, an area of the mattress started to depress, you know, like when someone had just sat down on it and made the indentation. I heard that same swooshing sound of a rush of air, and I screamed. My nephew woke up and I grabbed him, and we ran down the stairs and out the door. We waited outside until the rest of my family returned from their walk in the woods, and when I told the story, my sister-in-law told me that her mother had experienced paranormal stuff at the cabin for years. Thanks for letting us know. To this day, I still don't know and can't really explain what it was, but nothing like that has ever happened to me since. I don't know about the rest of the family though. My story takes place on the big island of Hawaii when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad was into hunting wild boar and sheep. Sometimes he would take the family with him to stay at a cabin that my uncles had built. I can't say exactly where the cabin is located, but to get there, you would have to take a turn off the main highway onto an unmarked road and then drive about an hour up the mountain off-road through the woods to reach the cabin and hunting grounds. It's a small one-story cabin, and the front door is just a sliding glass door. Across from the sliding door are the three bedrooms that had two bunks in each room, no doors. The bathroom was just an outhouse with no lights or running water. We had to walk through some bushes and trees to get to it. It was a nice little spot, not ventilated well and cold, but quaint. I couldn't help but feel like there were a lot of spirits there, mostly because my uncle said that a huge battle took place near the cabin during ancient times. I immediately think, damn, night marchers. To some, night marchers are just a part of Hawaiian folklore, but to native Hawaiians, they are very real. I was already creeped out by that place. I remember feeling really vulnerable. At some point during the trip, my cousin, sister, and I started wandering around outside of the cabin in the open area. It was basically a field of lava rock covered with grass, weeds, and trees that lined the outer edges of the perimeter. We were bored, so we grabbed some hammers and started smashing the small lava tubes to see if we could find something. The lava tubes we were smashing weren't giant, like caves, but just small hollow pockets or bubbles of air that formed during lava flows and hardened over time. You could just tap your shoe on them and tell that it was a pocket by the sound. Well, let's just say be careful what you wish for, because in one lava tube in particular, we found something. We smashed it, looked inside, and what we saw sent chills down our spines. It was a pile of bones, sitting on long, brown bird feathers. It didn't look like human bones, but like some kind of animal, maybe a chicken. Okay, you're thinking, wow, that's not scary at all. But the bones were perfectly preserved and still had some pink and reddish color to them. They seemed fresh. So we started pondering how the bones had gotten there. There was no physical way that a person could have put those there. And why wouldn't they have gotten destroyed by the lava? 
The bones had to have been there for hundreds of years at least, because the volcano was no longer active. It was as if the lava flow went around the bones and hardened over it, protecting it almost. The only explanation we could think of was that it had been an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, and that we shouldn't mess with it. We immediately covered the opening with rocks and got the hell out of there. We never told our parents. The next morning, my dad asks us if anybody went to the outhouse early in the morning. We all say no. Oh, that's weird, he says. I woke up and saw somebody standing at the sliding door, so I thought maybe somebody had gone to the bathroom. We look at each other, horrified. Like, what if it was the person that left the offering, and we totally disturbed it and now we're screwed? We asked for more details. He said that it was too dark to tell who it was exactly, but that it was a large man, and that he just stood there at the door, staring into our cabin. My dad tried to play it off like maybe he was just dreaming, but I was terrified fearing that I had disturbed someone's offering to the gods and they were mad at me. It could have been a human, sure, but it seemed really unlikely given our location. There were no other cabins or homes built at the hunting grounds, nowhere near them. Either way, I never stayed there again. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 at Jellystone Park. It's the one right beside the nature trail. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until after we had gotten home. It turns out that my sister, who was eight, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason to find a tall man standing by the bed with his arms crossed and an angry look on his face. At first, we thought the figure was my dad and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see a man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, you don't belong here or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C-82 is something that we reminisce about often. We've been curious if anyone else has experienced anything strange there. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Laurie, Virginia and experienced anything paranormal, we would love to hear your story. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead. And while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room, mom, dad, me, two brothers and sister. In the middle of the night, 
I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door slowly to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there. But everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those boot steps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. When I was younger, I used to spend hours in the woods behind my house. One time, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I was in the woods and I saw some stepping stones that led into a clearing. Those stones had never been there before. I peeked into the clearing and saw this little cabin with smoke coming from the chimney. It was surrounded by a well manicured lawn. Although it looked peaceful, charming even, something in my head said, run. So I did. About a week later, I went back into the woods to the same spot and the clearing was normal again. No stones, no cabin, just a basic clearing, the same one that I had grown up with. I haven't stepped into those woods again ever since and it's been about 20 years. I don't know what that cabin was, how it appeared or why it disappeared. And I don't know what would have happened if I had followed the steps and gone up to it. But to this day, I'm just very glad that I didn't.
This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall. And I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come. 
Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Huey. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day. And I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road. So if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations. Once right next to the house, once in front of us, 
which would have been in the back in the woods. And the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. We were on our trip to Yellowstone from California. We were a group of seven adults. We took a flight to fly to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then we drove up to Henry Lake, Idaho, where we had booked a cabin. We reached the cabin at about 5 p.m. on the first day. This was a huge cabin with a living room, kitchen, one master bedroom, and a dining room downstairs with a set of stairs on either side to go upstairs. Also, there was an entrance into the kitchen as well as the landing outside the master bedroom from outside, apart from the main entrance that ended up in the living room. There were about four bedrooms and three bathrooms upstairs, a very old and rustic looking cabin. We didn't feel anything bad during that entire evening. However, the nighttime did feel very eerie. My husband and I slept in one of the bedrooms. One of the couples used the master bedroom downstairs and another took the master bedroom upstairs that was farther down the hallway from our room. The only single guy in the group took the bedroom next to us. So on our first night there, we all went to our respective rooms at about 11 p.m. since we had plans to leave early for Yellowstone the next day. My husband and I both fell asleep as soon as we hit the bed. I don't know what time it was, but I suddenly woke up with a scream. At the same time, my husband woke up with a scream too. While I do have nightmares and have in the past where I would cry in my sleep, it was the first time that I had ever screamed, and I don't remember having any dreams or nightmares that night. My husband has never had nightmares, so it was unusual for him to wake up that night too. The guy in the next room was on the phone talking to somebody. He heard our screams and came in to check on us. We assured him we were okay. Again, we all went to bed, but I kept having weird feelings throughout the night, and I was completely unable to sleep until I saw the sunlight coming through the window. We all woke up at around 9 a.m., and we were discussing the incident. The other two couples were unaware of it, but they did mention hearing random footsteps throughout the night, thinking that we were up walking around. We were there for five days and we didn't experience any other events for the rest of the stay, but the cabin gave out significant negative energy and not a single one of us wants to stay there again. We would leave as early in the morning as we could and come back late at night just to sleep. We haven't had any other experiences like that ever again. So a couple of my friends and I were staying at my family's cabin for a week in the summer. A lot of weird stuff happened throughout the entire week. The last day we were there, was the day of the creepiest and most unexplainable part. One of the first days after my parents left, one of my friends went out for a little run late at night. After about five minutes, he comes sprinting back to the cabin and tells us that he saw a black figure in the woods beside him. We all thought that it was weird, but we didn't really think much of it. The day after, nothing really happened except for when we were in the jacuzzi. This was around one to three in the morning. We started talking about the scariest dreams we had ever had. And so we all told each other. But then one of my friends begins telling the rest of us that when he was younger, he used to not only dream, but also see in real life, this tall black figure in his room at night. And that it was a really serious thing because he started getting really emotional about it and started crying as he was telling us. As he's telling us the story, I hear footsteps in the woods below us, but I decided not to tell the rest of them until the next day. Regardless, 
we were all pretty spooked at this point. The last day, we didn't really have anything planned, so we just hung out at the cabin. When it started getting late, around one to two in the morning, one of my friends told us that his towel kept falling off the hook that he had hung it on. This happened probably around three times. When he hung it up the last time, I saw him do it. He hung it properly, and there was no way that it could have just fallen off by itself. But we went to check on it later, just in case, and it had fallen off. His blanket, which had been folded on the bed the last time we checked, was now spread out on the floor. Cabinets in the bathroom also kept opening by themselves. At around 4 a.m., we all decided that we should probably get some sleep, and so we did. And because we were all scared, two of my friends stayed in my room for the night. Just as I was going to sleep, my friend who was on the floor asked if I could hear the rustling noises coming from the kitchen and living room. I said no, so the three of us slowly walked out through the hallway into the living room. And just as I enter and turn on my phone's flashlight, I felt my stomach drop more than I ever have before. The couch and chair cushions had been flipped upright, like they were standing vertically, and the pelts in the chairs had been thrown onto the floor. Since we were so freaked out, we got everybody out of the cabin, and for some dumb reason we called the cops. Of course, they couldn't do anything, they were probably just thinking that we were a bunch of kids on some strong drugs, but we weren't. It was about 5 a.m. at this point, and we didn't get any sleep that night. I know it doesn't exactly sound scary, but I had never had anything paranormal happen to me before, and it was probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. So I live in Arizona, and every time I go visit my grandma up in Prescott, I have the same dream about waking up in the room that I always stay in and looking out the window. Prescott is a forest area in Arizona, for reference. Each time I look out the window, there's the same completely white figure standing outside in the forest, watching me intently. The first few times I had the dream, I was terrified of the figure. That was up until recently. The last time I visited the cabin, I had the dream, like always, but I viewed the figure in a different light, and I just felt a deep sorrow. I walked into another room of the house and looked out the glass door so that I could get a better view of it, and I sympathized with it. I sat down beside the door and we stared at each other, separated by a thin sheet of glass, but we felt so far apart, and I woke up. I haven't had that dream since because I haven't been to the cabin in a while, but I have extremely vivid dreams each night about random things. This is the only really recurring dream that I have though, and it's only when I stay there. Is there any kind of paranormal explanation to this? Or is it just another one of my crazy dreams? My family and I lead a pretty exhausting life. I was busy with school, they were busy with work and bills, so we barely ever got any breaks. However, during the holiday school break in around December, my father decided that it would be best if my half-sister and I went to a secluded cabin in Alaska that his mother bought when they were fleeing the war in their country in order to relieve some stress for us. She's obviously way older than me and has three kids who are already married and have children of their own. We have some strange family stuff because of age gaps. Anyway, she was supposed to take care of me. Everything went fine when we arrived there, and we slept in the same room upstairs. Except my bed was in front of the glass doors leading to the balcony, and hers was right by the door. 
It was around two in the morning and I was still awake, using up all of my mobile data to chat with friends who also had trouble sleeping. Suddenly, I heard a loud thud that jolted me to my senses. My half-sister only rolled over in the bed and complained about the sound. Then she went back to sleep again. Once I made sure she wasn't awake, I quickly abandoned my bed and opened the glass door, and then I went out on the balcony. It had a small wooden chair with a mug that my sister had been drinking coffee out of earlier. At first, I saw the other cabin where an elderly couple was staying with their grandchildren and two big German Shepherd dogs that slept outside. So at first I thought they may have knocked something over. The couple had big barrels outside of their house for some reason. But then something else caught my attention, and it wasn't anything ordinary. It was the figure of a woman who walked calmly out of the forest surrounding the trail that leads to the small bundle of cabins there. The moment that I noticed her, she just looked up at me, and I immediately bolted back inside. I forced myself to sleep quickly that night. I woke up at around 4 a.m. and had to go to the bathroom, but I was too lazy to get up for a while. So I rolled over, and the first thing I see is a woman with all gray features, despite there being a light outside, tapping on the glass. I just ran quietly toward the bathroom because I was still feeling really sleepy. I thought maybe I was just seeing things. When I came back, I noticed that she wasn't there, but I still got really creeped out, so I woke up my sister, who checked everything, including downstairs, but there wasn't anything there. I remember that the dogs barked a lot that night. The next morning, I told her about everything, and she asked if I was sure that it wasn't just a bad dream, and then promised to call the police if the woman kept showing up. Two days later, and a lot of barking, but no woman. My sister invited the couple across the way over for coffee. I remember that the old man also mentioned seeing a woman outside, who was digging in the snow and dirt with her hands in the middle of night, and that when he yelled, What are you doing here? loudly at her. She just ran off into the forest. Nothing really happened later, except the power going off and on constantly. The couple's dog acting really weird, and footsteps in the snow that weren't there before showing up in front of our cabin. We just wrote that off as other people staying at the cabin looking at ours when we were out grocery shopping, though. But I don't know. What I remember clear as day, though, was that when I was upstairs playing with the old couple's grandchildren once, the mug that was still on the balcony just fell off the chair and shattered, despite no one being there. There was no wind, either. After that, the dog started barking again. It scared me, so I took the kids downstairs. When we returned home, though, my mother jokingly said that maybe the place is haunted. And that seriously has me thinking that maybe it really is. I don't know how to confirm if there's anything paranormal about this, or if there's some creepy robber lady going around the cabins scaring people and digging in the snow in the middle of winter. Either way, it was definitely freaky. My father, mother, and I make frequent trips to the Smoky Mountains and stay in the cabins that they have near Pigeon Forge. However, this particular trip still haunts me to this day. About eight years ago, we stayed in a cabin that had an alarm system. It was already dark outside when we reached the cabin and got settled in. We set the alarm and thought that we would all watch a movie together. While we were watching the movie, the security alarm system went off. The alarm was only supposed to go off if a door was opened. We checked the cabin from top to bottom to find nothing out of the ordinary. The next morning, we called the company that rented the cabin to us to have them check out the alarm system. 
Someone came in and checked out the system and said that he'd been called out to our cabin multiple times within the past month with the same problem. Since it's only the first day at the cabin, I'm already feeling a little bit creeped out. I noticed that there was a book on the table that guests could sign and talk about how much they love the cabin. As I was reading more and more stories, I noticed that many of them mentioned feeling unsafe, and some even mentioned that they found wet footprints on the deck where the hot tub is. I told my family about these stories, and they told me that they're just trying to tell scary stories to get other guests spooked. I agreed with her, and we went about our day. The same night, we went to bed like normal. My father slept in the basement of the cabin. I slept on the main floor beside the kitchen, and my mother slept on the top floor. My dad snores so loudly that we all sleep far away from each other, including my mom. It was about 2 a.m., and I was woken up by the fridge door closing. I looked at the bright light from the fridge that was pouring into my room from the crack underneath my closed bedroom door. I noticed that the light would come on and then go off as the fridge door seemed to continue to be open and closed. I assumed that it was one of my parents leaning on the fridge door trying to decide what they wanted for a late night snack. However, I felt weird and I didn't even consider to get out of bed and join in on the snack. The fridge light disappeared slowly, and I heard footsteps walk away from my bedroom and head in the direction of the steps that go up to my mom's room. The footsteps seemed to stop for a second, then start the trip up the stairs. All of a sudden, they stopped. I assumed that it was my mom and that she had made it to her room, so I just fell back asleep. The next morning I wake up and I go directly to my mom and I asked her what she decided to eat last night. She looked at me and said, what? I told her that I thought she was at the fridge last night, opening and closing the fridge, because I heard her go back up the stairs after a while around 2 a.m. She looked at me and said, I thought that was you. At this time in my life, I was known to sleepwalk every now and then. She said, I saw you standing at the top of the stairs last night around that time. I assumed you were just sleepwalking because you just looked at me and then went back downstairs. I clearly had not done this. So at this point, I start to freak out and I honestly got sick to my stomach. The rest of the trip, I slept with my mother on the very top floor. I didn't experience anything else the rest of the trip and never went anywhere alone. A couple of months go by after our trip, when my dad tells me he was looking to rent another cabin for a trip. We went to go look at the cabin that we'd rented out the last time, and found out that the cabin had been closed and was no longer available to rent. Out of curiosity, he did some research, and found out that many guests experienced something odd in that cabin. The complaints ranged from people feeling generally unsafe to people thinking someone was in the cabin that shouldn't have been, to people leaving before their vacation was over without any explanation at all. I'm not sure what my mom and I experienced that night at the cabin, but I now know that we aren't the only ones that went through something similar. I recently started a new job for a commercial cleaning service. It's great money, long hours, and hard work. This week, I've been working about an hour from where I live, stripping homes affected by flooding. For the past two days, my partner and I have been working in an isolated cabin, basically with just woods all around. The building has been gutted at this point. Today was supposed to be the final day that he and I were there. But instead, he got called off on a death cleanup. I've been there this entire day, working alone, with only natural lighting and little for heat. At one point, I went to grab food, but came back, checked the time on my phone to see how long I'd been gone, and set it on the only remaining counter. 
I went off to the other end of the house and worked about another two hours over there before getting a drink and checking the time on my phone. My phone wasn't there. It wasn't anywhere. I spent 30 minutes with a lantern, looking in every possible spot. I tried to track it from home, though it's somehow off, with 50% battery when I last checked. No one came in the building. I didn't move it or turn it off. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it. Yesterday, when my partner left, I had a tool vanish as well. It was to my left. I was sitting on a small stool and using it very frequently. When I reached for it again, I couldn't find it. I got up and thought maybe I wasn't paying attention, and I set it in an odd spot or something. But no. Apparently it no longer exists. I checked again today. I've been on these sites plenty of times before, and I've never had so many important items go missing. I've heard screams from the woods, heard things move around as I stood still to listen closer, and the entire job I've never had such an uncomfortable feeling of being watched. My boss visited the job and just told me tonight that she was feeling the same way. Perhaps this is all in my head, or perhaps there's a thieving ghost. I'll be there for a couple hours more in the morning, so I don't know, maybe I should burn some sage or something, but I want my stuff back. My friends and I rented a cabin in the mountains of Puerto Rico. There was myself, another girl Abby, and then four guys. My brother Steve, Abby's brother Dave, and both of our boyfriends, Danny and Carl. The cabin belongs to a family friend of Carl's. So we arrive and everything is stocked up. Fridge is full and all the cupboards are too. Result? We straight away dump our stuff in the hallway, not even bothering to check the rooms, and grab a beer. It had been a long trip, and we wanted to relax and unwind first. We even started the fire. After dinner, we all went outside to look at the stars for some time. I seriously couldn't get over how clear, how beautiful it was outside. It looked like we were the only cabin that was occupied. Through the tall trees, we could see another cabin but it didn't have their lights on, so it must be empty. We get back inside and open some more beer, and we start to play cards. We were all laughing and having a great time when Carl told us to be quiet and held his hand out. Whatever, dude, no one likes a sore loser, Dave taunted. Carl responded that he was being serious and told us to be quiet again. We could hear what sounded like hooves on the roof. It sounded like someone was taking a massive stride and walking back and forth. It must be some animal, I suggested. I mean, with our cabin being the only one with heat and lights, maybe that attracted something? Abby said, oh my gosh, what if it's a bear? Can a bear get up there? We all moaned and rolled our eyes. The guys, trying to act all tough, said that they would go outside and try to scare away whatever it was. Abby and I were left just warming ourselves by the fire. Not even two minutes later, they called us outside to show us that absolutely nothing was on the roof. We even stepped back a few feet to get a clear view of the roof, and they were right. There was nothing there. I laughed at Abby saying that a flying bear was the culprit and turned to go back inside. Danny stopped me by putting his hand above the door. Danny, what the f- He cut me off mid-sentence. He was standing with his arm above the door, staring into the trees. Everyone else was standing still, frozen, looking in the direction that Danny was. I followed his gaze. In the tree, right near the clearing of the cabin, I could make out two men? They looked like they had hooves on their lower feet and were squatting, holding on to branches. I thought this was the way that the trees had just been designed at first. You know, the way branches grow and you see things. 
it being dark, our eyes playing tricks on us, and seeing things that weren't really there. But then I focused in on them again. The one closest to us moved its arm to get a better grip of the branch above its head, and they continued to stare at us. We were all running inside the cabin in a matter of seconds. We double-locked the door and even pushed the bookshelves and sofa up against it. I quickly turned the only light we had off, and all we had was the warm glow from the fire reflecting on our terrified faces. We sat by it and discussed exactly what everyone saw, and everybody described the same beings. We had beer, vodka, and took to eating breakfast cereal out of the box because we were too scared to head to the kitchen, where there was a window that had no curtains or blinds. Thank God we didn't open it earlier in the day. We listened to scratching, banging on the front door, and more hooves for most of the night. The scratching echoed from the kitchen and the hallway, then immediately would start on the front door again straight after. The sounds on the roof came back, too, periodically. No one slept that night. In the morning, we all got the hell out of there. We took to staying at a really crappy, run-down, two-star hotel, but anything was better than that cabin. I've had a ton of paranormal experiences, yet the one that I had this weekend was one of the scariest. This past weekend, my wife Mary, our three sons and I were up at the family cabin. We purchased this cabin about six months ago. From day one, we've seen shadows, lights, and movement throughout the place. Everybody went to bed around 10.30 and I went into the kitchen to sneak a bite of the pan cookies that my wife had made earlier. As I was cutting off a piece, I heard a female voice whisper, Hey, what are you doing in here? It immediately unnerved me, and I said, Mary? Without turning around. I finally looked, and she wasn't there. So I turned back and continued cutting. Then I heard an even louder clearer female whisper. Hey, are you going to eat a cookie? I want one. I quickly looked around and there was nobody there. I quickly hustled to the bedroom and jumped in bed. My wife was still awake and obviously had not been in the kitchen asking for cookies. I made myself go back into the kitchen after about 10 minutes to clean up my mess and I didn't hear anything. The next night I heard nothing until I got into bed. I was on my side and I felt a tug on my sleeve. I turned my head to look and I heard a voice whisper, Mom? Dad? I quickly walked across the hall and my boys were fast asleep. I also heard more words that I couldn't make out. I left a recorder running all night in the kitchen, but I haven't had the time or the nerve to analyze it yet. My husband and I live in Willow Creek, California, in Northern California. Our small town revolves around Bigfoot. Everything here is Bigfoot themed. We even have a cage in case he's ever captured. No joke. Our property is 40 acres and is surrounded by forest service land. We have no neighbors. We've always felt like we've been watched. We barely hear any wildlife and rarely see any despite living in the woods. A couple of separate nights we've had knocking on our bedroom wall and window, and it's freaked us out a bit, but we've since brushed it off. Tonight, though, my husband had to take our quad up to the generator above our house to fill our solar panels with water. It was pitch black, and as soon as he turns out the quad and it turns off, he's loudly screamed at by what he described as a large male human. He did what he had to do, and quickly left. He's convinced that whatever it was was not human, as it's extremely unlikely that we have someone else living in our woods. 
I'm trying to chalk it up as an animal, but it's getting hard to. Does this sound like Bigfoot behavior or something else? I grew up in Saugus, California on Copper Hill. I've had several paranormal experiences while living there. I've had things thrown at me. I've seen full body apparitions. I had a milk carton crushed in front of me and had an unplugged vacuum cleaner turn on. My parents, whom I live with, had their own experiences as well, such as seeing an entity or just having a general unease in the house. I guess I'm just reaching out to those who may know the area because this stupid house haunts my dreams to this day, and it's been 18 years since I lived there. I told a story before here, expressing my concerns for a house that I lived in 18 years ago. I wanted validation that maybe the area itself was haunted, and I wasn't the only one being tormented. Turns out a lot more people responded than I initially thought would. Some wanted a more detailed account of the happenings within the abode, so here we go. Let me start off by stating that there were numerous occurrences, so many that I'm only going to share the big ones. Some smaller events were hearing my mother's voice when she wasn't home, general unease throughout the entirety of the house, and my younger brother's room seeming to be in a permafrost even when it was over a hundred outside. His electronic toys would go off on their own as well. I would hear, I am the Dark Knight, in the middle of the night on some occasions, from his talking Batman toy. That part was kind of hilarious looking back on it now. Just for quick info, I was between the ages of 6 and 12 when I experienced all this madness, and I am now 30. The first occasion I want to talk about is a shadow that I encountered. It was probably around 7 in the morning. I was eating breakfast at the dining table before school. I had made myself a bowl of cereal and left the milk out on the counter of our kitchen. From the dining table, I had a clear view of our entire kitchen. As I was eating, I started to feel that nasty unease that I so often felt. I looked up from my bowl and into the kitchen, and I stared in horror as I saw a black mist enter the kitchen and move toward the counter where the milk carton was. As the mist started to dissipate, the milk carton on the counter was crushed, the cap flying off, and what remained of the milk exploding everywhere. My father, who was a very abusive and angry man, walked into the kitchen and started screaming at me for making the mess. I just stared at the table. I didn't even try to defend myself what was I supposed to say? A shadow crushed it? The second experience I'll elaborate on is being tormented in my room. There was one night in particular where I stayed up late, as I often did. I was a fearful child. I was staring at my bedroom door. I could sense that unease, and I tried my best to make myself comfortable. As I continued to stare at the door, I felt my blankets tug toward the lower corner of my bed. As I sat up in terror, the corner of my comforter lifted and started shaking violently, as if my blankets were going to be ripped off. I was so mortified that I went to scream, but nothing came out. I've never experienced that before or after. It brings even more fear because you can't call out for anyone in that state. Finally, I did manage to yell for my parents with a raspy voice. They came into my room as the shaking stopped, and searched it to make sure that there weren't any intruders or that our cat wasn't scaring me. They found nothing. On other occasions, I've had my rocks from my rock tumbler thrown at me as I ran out of my room, and I've seen small shadows darting in and out of mine and my brother's rooms. The last incident that I'll mention was probably one of the last experiences that I had before moving. I was about 12, and I had just gotten home from school. I was a latchkey kid. I went straight for my back living room. 
I had two living areas, as a lot of houses in the area had at the time. Maybe they still do. I don't know. I plopped down on the couch and turned on my television. There was a vacuum sitting next to the TV. My puppy joined me. Suddenly I got that weird feeling again. I tried my best to ignore it, but my puppy started whimpering and ran to the back door that led to the backyard. I called to her, desperately trying to deny that anything was going to happen. She progressively got louder in her cries and started scratching at the back door, something that she had never done. I stood up to go get her, and as I did, I saw a mist form next to the vacuum. I thought maybe it was just dust, puffing up from the bag, and I walked toward it to investigate. As I got closer, the vacuum suddenly turned on, startling me. It turned off within a few seconds, and I thought, maybe it was a power surge. I investigated further, only to discover that the cord wasn't even plugged in. Needless to say, I grabbed my puppy and stayed at my neighbor's house until my parents got home from work. I don't know if anybody who lives in Saugus can tell me what happened. I don't know if the land is haunted or if it was just the house. Either way, it haunts me to this very day. This happened in Costa Mesa, California. I was homeless at the time and under immense stress as a result. I've had a dozen or so very strange things happen in my life, but this one was truly upsetting. I was walking my usual route, which was around the campus of the community college that I attended, even still. I had only recently quit my job and moved out of a house I was renting a room in. Admittedly, I am something of an antisocial, misanthropic, generally depressed person that feels the weight of the world seemingly heavier than my peers. But I'm an A student, and I think a troubled life has lent a heavy hand in these detrimental character traits. I'm being verbose only because I think, or hope, there's a certain genuine nature to someone who can see potential red flags in their own recollections. But I would swear to my creator that the following testimony is 100% accurate. So I was walking and approaching a crosswalk. Down the adjacent sidewalk, I see a woman 30 yards away, walking up to a grocery bag on the sidewalk, 10 feet in front of her. She's already carrying two in her hands, one in each. I go to help her as I have nothing to do and she seemed old. As I approached her, this was confirmed. At most, she stood five feet, probably two to three inches shorter. She looked to be about 60 to 70 years old. She was generally unkempt. I asked her if she could use some help. She said with a heavy accent, sure, and indicated her destination was on the other side of the street, where I had planned on crossing anyway. I was handed one of her bags and insisted on taking the other, leaving just the one that she'd been walking up on, now at our feet. We start heading to the corner. The bags were heavy enough for me to look inside. It looked to be four mangoes in each bag, but I remember thinking it was easily ten pounds. We get to the crosswalk and she starts hitting the button super fast, like her feet were on fire. At this point, the bags felt as if they had doubled in weight. We get to the signal and I make it no more than halfway through the intersection and the bags feel every bit of 80 to 100 pounds each. I'm 6'1", and I'm in good shape. I could not believe what was happening. I sincerely didn't think I was going to make it. I looked back at her, and she has both hands supporting her bag, taking half strides. She puts on the most disturbing, full tooth smile and said, Too heavy? I remember the fear of her face made me turn around more than anything. I made it in one single step to the other side of the street, and I had to drop the bags. I remember the strangest of all was that the plastic handles hadn't been compromised whatsoever. No stretching, nothing. She was click-clacking in half steps, and at this point I was tearing up because I couldn't understand what was happening. 
She dropped her bag by my two. She looked at me, smiled wide, full teeth again, and said, Too heavy? You stop or keep going. I said, weeping, I'm so sorry. I can't go any farther. Her smile somehow got even bigger, and she said, Okay. I began to sprint back across the street to get away from her. I was ashamed and terrified. I looked back to where she was, and she was now hoisting each bag, one by one, under her chin with both hands, walking at three or four steps, putting it down and then grabbing the next, carrying it three or four steps, over and over. She was walking into a place for the developmentally disabled. It was a community for mentally disabled people in the area. I walked away, weeping as I saw her carry those three bags, now no more than four feet at a time, but I also had no desire to help her anymore. I'm still bewildered and terrified. I don't know what else to add. I know it sounds made up or phony, or like I'm making up for being a terrible person, but I'm telling you, those bags went from holding just a few mangoes each to feeling like they were holding so much more. I don't know how that happened. And it's almost like she knew somehow. I don't know what happened that day, but it did. And if anybody knows how to explain it, please let me know. I went on a little hiking trip with my dad to Shasta, California, a small town in Northern California near the Oregon border. Shasta is home to a potentially active volcano, named, of course, Mount Shasta. There are many trails on Mount Shasta, so my father and I were excited to do some hiking. We drove up the side of the mountain to the parking lot in which one of the trails begins. I believe it was called the Old Ski Bowl Trail. The landscape was a very barren incline filled with rocks, boulders, dirt, and very few trees. About an hour into the trail, we came across a very odd assembly of these large boulders. They were arranged in a circle. We thought it was strange, but we continued on. If you look up pictures of the trail, you'll see much smaller rocks arranged in patterns and circles. My father and I only encountered three people. At least, that's what they appeared to be at first. The first two were a father and son. We met them on a steep incline that went along the wall of a cliff that would then switch back as it reached the top of the cliff. We stopped and said hello, talked about the trail, and then went along our separate ways. Here's where it gets weird. Dad and I kept walking up the incline for just about two minutes. I turned around and I saw the father and son so far down the trail. It should have taken them at least 20 minutes to get down to where they were but somehow they were there in only two minutes. To this day, I have absolutely no idea how that could have happened. There was no one else on the trail at that point, and I could see the color of their clothing from that distance, so I knew it was them. I pointed it out to my dad. We thought it was weird, but we didn't dwell on it, and we kept going. Here's where it gets so much weirder. As we reached the top of the cliff, there was another strange rock arrangement that was off to the side of the trail. This time, there were far more rocks than before, and they were now arranged in rows, almost like gravestones. We continued on the trail and reached another sort of incline, with a switchback to reach the top of yet another cliff. We reached a point where we would need climbing gear to continue, so we decided to head back. When we turned around, I saw a man standing among the rocks, staring at us. He was wearing a button-up shirt, cargo shorts, and a wide-brimmed straw hat. He was at a distance where I should have been able to make out his facial features, but it was almost as if he had none, like his face was just flesh and skin. I pointed him out to my dad, and then the man quickly ducked down behind a boulder and was peering out at us over the top of it. It seemed almost playful, like a child trying to play hide-and-seek. For a few moments, I was out of it, and I have no recollection of what was going on. According to my dad, I just started walking toward this man in the hat. 
My dad was calling out to me. Joshua, Josh, what are you doing? Where are you going? And then I came to. I was standing right at the edge of a cliff. It was a huge drop, enough to kill me or seriously injure me. My dad grabbed me and pulled me back to the trail. He told me to stay put, and my dad went down to the boulders to search for the man. But he wasn't there. There was nowhere for him to go except up or down the trail. It didn't make any sense. He just disappeared. I have no idea what was going on on that trail, and I have no explanation for it. I have told this story many times to family and friends, and no one else has an explanation either. I've done research and I've found similar stories about encounters with a man with no facial features wearing a hat. I've also read that the Native American tribes from the area viewed Mount Shasta as a holy site. They believed that it could act as a portal to another dimension, and that it's guarded by spirits who would potentially harm anybody who tried to go up to the volcano. If anybody has any similar experiences or any insight at all, I would love to hear. First things first, you should know that I am a skeptic, and I don't believe in things without evidence. I prefer to think rationally, and I'll try to debunk anything before I put too much stock in it. I do, however, have a story that I can't explain. In 2010, I was in my early 20s living in Southern California and working for a computer and phone company with big fancy mall stores. Come on, you probably know the one, right? We nicknamed it the Fruit Stand. Anyway, we'd just come out with a new phone that was in high demand. Part of working in this store was giving a personalized experience to each customer who purchased a product, and helping them get it set up if they so desired. One day, I remember taking a customer for a new phone. The man was very tall and very thin. He had long blonde and gray hair, and very defined features, prominent cheekbones, and a very pronounced chin. I also remember his clothing was very formal. He wore a black suit with a white shirt, not something you would often see in sunny San Diego. The man looked to be somewhere in his late fifties to maybe mid sixties. His hair was graying and thinning, and he was quite pale. During the transaction, it was clear that money was no issue. He picked up one of every single accessory that I suggested. You always knew rich people from how they dropped cash on expensive products that they didn't need or understand. He happily agreed to the insurance program for the phone and the other membership services that we were selling as well. The normal process to sell a phone requires the customer's driver's license and credit card. To activate the phone on their phone line, we needed to put in their license information and have them give some info to access their account and check for their upgrade. Once I had his driver's license, I discovered a birthday of 1915. This man was 95 years old. At the time, I should have been really surprised, but it was like I didn't even consider it. I think I just politely told him that he looked very good for his age. We finished the transaction, I set him up with everything, and his demeanor was calm and friendly. It wasn't until looking back that I realized how strange it was that he was 95 years old but looked to be so much younger, and also how not shocked I was at the strangeness of the situation at the time. I now joke that I once met a real-life vampire, because that's honestly the closest thing I can identify him with. Pale, not aging, and somehow charming me into not being stunned by his age or the strangeness of the situation. Whatever he was, I do think I was hypnotized to some degree, and that he was not just a 95-year-old human. And just for context, this happened when I was about nine years old, and I'm 18 now. My mom recently married and moved to California, so I was dragged along with her. 
leaving everything and everybody I knew behind, except my sister. The house we moved into was decently big, having four bedrooms and two stories, and my new stepfather was actually a pretty nice guy. My sister and I got our own separate rooms, which was a plus, despite them being right next to each other. One thing that always haunted me until I was 16 years old was the dark, and I never really understood why. Just the thought that anything could come out of nowhere to jump at me always frightened me, I guess. Anyway, it was a night in April, and my sister had just recently turned 12 years old. We were having a great time on the trampoline that my sister had gotten for her birthday, but since it was getting late, my mom came out and told me it was time for bed. I didn't argue with her, and I went straight to bed. The next thing I remember is waking up with a numb arm in the middle of the night. This was extremely strange for me. I always remember sleeping through the night as a kid, but this one night I woke up for no explained reason. I didn't have the urge to go to the bathroom, I didn't need food or water, nothing that I can think of. But when I woke up, the first thing that I realized was that it was very cold in my room. Like, really cold for spring in California, and certainly nothing that an air conditioner could produce. I then picked my head up, looked around the room, and I saw this large black figure standing by my door. Being nine years old, I didn't know what to do, so I just pulled the blankets over my head and prayed for whatever this thing was to go away. About five minutes had passed, and I peeked out from under the covers to see the black figure staring at me. I froze, thinking that if I didn't move, then it wouldn't come to hurt me. But after a couple of minutes passed, I finally got the courage to jump out of bed and run across my room into this black figure. When I got to it, it suddenly disappeared, and when I turned the lights on, I couldn't find any traces of something having been there. Obviously still being frightened, I thought that being with my sister would help me calm down. So I rushed out of my room and burst through my sister's door to see the same black figure. I grew wide-eyed again and swiftly climbed into my sister's bed to find her gone. My sister wasn't in her room, and I was stuck alone on the bottom floor of my house, not knowing where my sister was, with this black thing stalking me. I started to cry, thinking that this black thing had killed my sister and was now going to kill me but I somehow fell asleep. I was up the next morning to my sister shaking me, wondering what I was doing in her bed instead of my own. I told her that there was this black figure in my room, and I figured that going to her would make it go away. What she then told me shakes me up to this very day. She told me that she also saw a black figure in the middle of the night, and had gotten so scared that she ran all the way up to my parents' bedroom to sleep with them. I've lived in California my whole life. As soon as I had my driver's license, I would save as much as I could so that I could go down to Disneyland at least once a year. It was a lot cheaper to do that back then, and I'm a Disney freak. When this happened, I was almost 22, and I was still living in my first apartment. It was in the South Bay area of the Silicon Valley. Earlier in the day, I had driven into the North Central Valley to pick up my best friend at the time. We were going to Disneyland, and this was her first time. She was so ridiculously excited, I didn't even mind the fact that I had to drive three hours north just to go back down south again once I had her in tow. We were finally officially on our way at about 9 p.m. so that we could avoid any traffic. We were going to make a quick stop by Isla Vista, where my partner was staying for school, to catch a nap and pack him up so we could all go together. I always took Highway 101 when I was driving down to Santa Barbara. It took longer than taking the I-5, but honestly, I just preferred it. This trip was no exception. A few hours into the trip, as my friend and I were blasting Disney music to get us in the mood and singing along, we had passed through King City. 
and that's when I began to see the strange shapes along the side of the road. I didn't think much of it at the time, attributing it to the Tully fog beginning to settle in onto the highway. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, there was a deer carcass right in front of us on the highway. Without enough time to avoid it, and going probably a little bit too fast, we ran right over the thing. Instantly, my car began to reek of decay. Honestly, it was horrific. We pulled over under the nearest street lamp to make sure that there was no damage to my car. We called animal control to report the corpse and pull the putrid deer meat out of my front bumper and grill. Soon enough, and only a little nauseous, we were back on our way. I remember that I had started to feel off right about then, but I thought it was just me being sick from the deer smell. At the time, I didn't even entertain how strange it was that there was a rotten deer carcass in the middle of a busy highway. They're usually prompt about at least moving those things to the side of the road where nobody will hit it. About 20 minutes later, the strange white shapes moving, almost rolling, along the side of the road became much more prevalent. There were zero traces of any fog, and with the smell almost completely gone, the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach was only getting worse. I knew something was off, but I didn't want to say anything about it because my friend was a little bit of a scaredy cat. Then I saw what looked like a body, wrapped in gauze, roll onto the shoulder from an embankment. But when I looked for it again in the rearview mirror, there was nothing there. I had slowed down considerably at this point, which tipped my friend off that something was wrong. I could feel her nerves rising almost instantly. When I finally pulled my eyes back to the road in front of me, that's when I saw it. And my friend saw it too. On the side of the road, a man was standing beneath one of the sparsely placed street lamps. He was no ordinary man either. He was half as tall as a lamp, making him at least three meters tall. The not-actually-a-man man was wholly unclothed, but lacked any genitalia at all. Almost like an alien. Despite this, I more or less just understood that he was male. He was emaciated to the point of almost being skeletal, but still managed to be standing perfectly straight. His hair was long, wispy, like cobwebs, and his skin looked like white, tanned leather stretched over his bones. As we passed him, the only part of him that moved was his head, to slowly turn and keep watching us. His eyes almost looked like they were made of chrome metal. I kept my eye on him through the rearview mirror, watching him get farther and farther away, until we crested over the hill and were no longer able to see him. In the passenger seat beside me, my friend was sobbing uncontrollably, which to me meant that she had seen him too. Not wanting to stop, all I could do was offer her my hand and floor it. I tried to get to my partner's house as fast as I could. We spent several minutes not saying a word. I wanted to say something, but trying to wrap my brain around what I had just seen left me speechless. At some point, the radio had been switched off, leaving the only sound in the car being my friend's sobbing. What happened next all happened more or less in the same moment. Without even a shudder, my friend abruptly stopped crying and almost threw herself at the window control on her door with one hand, frantically trying to buckle her seatbelt with the other. Her belt had been on the whole ride, and she was particular about seatbelt safety. Before she could even reach it, the window was already halfway down, and she was scrambling to keep it from lowering any further. She screamed something about not letting it take her, and eventually got the window to roll back up. At the moment I saw her begin to move, I could hear the window was already going down. My hands were nowhere near the window controls on my side of the car. They both had been white-knuckled on the steering wheel since we saw the man, except for when I held her hand. At the moment I heard the window going down, I heard a raspy, biting whisper in my ear that said, I'm gonna pull your friend out of that effing window. After hearing the voice, I slammed on my brakes and swerved onto the shoulder. By the time we stopped, the window was up and my friend was sitting back, shock white and wide-eyed in her seat. I was livid. I turned to the seemingly empty back seat, and almost in a growl, I spat out the words, Get the F out of my car. You are not welcome here. 
I never thought that anything would answer me back. But at that moment, both my friend and I heard it. The same voice that it had whispered in my ear, saying, Fine. That was all it said, before I could feel that something had changed. I floored it again, calling my partner as my friend began to sob once more. I instructed him to do some warding things in his room before hanging up, and desperately tried to build a protective bubble around the car. We still had an hour or so to go before we reached Isla Vista, and honestly, it was one of the longest hours of my life. Eventually, my friend became more lucid and we talked about what had happened to her. She told me that she didn't know why, but all of a sudden her seatbelt unbuckled and she just knew something was going to try and pull her out of the window. I told her what I had heard and confirmed that we both heard the response to my demand. We eventually made it to Isla Vista and decided to pack up with my partner and continue straight down to Orange County. Nothing else happened on the trip down, and we eventually got back to feeling the excitement for Disneyland. We all had an absolute blast, almost completely pushing what happened from our minds. Almost. We took the same route back home as well, and we didn't see a single thing out of place. I've made that drive probably a hundred times between Disney and visiting friends and partners in Southern California, and to this day, that's the one and only experience I've ever had on that drive. I was out in the garden with a friend when my partner, we'll call him Bob, called our dog. Let's call him Spot. Just his name. Spot started running toward his name, and then stopped dead in his tracks. In the same amount of time that it took Spot to hear his name and run a few steps, I thought, Bob is calling Spot. I wonder why. Wait, was that Bob? The last thought coming just as Spot stopped, with one front leg grazed mid-step. My friend and I looked at each other, eyebrows raised. Did you just hear that? I asked. Yeah, it was Bob calling Spot, my friend replied, a bit dubious. You see, Bob was about a hundred yards away, last I knew, and his voice seemed to come from closer and to the right of where I thought he was. Feeling something was off, I yelled, Bob, did you call Spot? He responded, what? From where I had thought that he was, and also because he's a bit hard of hearing. Trying to be heard, I yelled, Did you call Spot? To which he replied, Spot, thinking that I was asking him to call the dog. Instantly, though, Spot takes off running in the direction of actual Bob. My friend and I look at each other with more eyebrow raising and agree that that was really weird. Ten minutes later, when Bob joined us in the garden, I asked him if he had called Spot earlier. He said, yeah, you told me to. I said, no, before that, before I yelled to you. He said no, and he thought it was weird that I was asking him to call Spot. So I told him what happened and clarified everything, and he immediately guessed that it was a raven mimicking him calling our dog. I was a little suspicious, assuming that a raven could even sound exactly like him, or at least enough alike to fool myself, my friend, and the dog. Also, we've never heard the ravens talk before. Fast forward three weeks, when I mentioned this to my friend in a group of people, and how I have never been creeped out at our place before, but that I can't stop thinking about that. He says, me too. Then suddenly remembering, he turned to Bob and said, earlier today when you walked up the hill, did you call for Nick? Referring to his partner, who was also visiting. Bob said, no, I don't think I've ever called for Nick. My friend then relates a similar story to ours, hearing Bob call for Nick, but not from where he thought Bob should be, feeling doubtful then going to find Nick to see if he'd heard it too, and he hadn't. This happened outside, and we live in a fairly remote place in Northern California. National Forest borders three sides of our property, and we have neighbors to the north of us. None of the neighbors are close enough to hear, and they don't sound like Bob. 
I looked into corvids, as we have many, including ravens and stellar jays. The first one could be explained by this. Bob calls Spot often enough that it's not too far-fetched that a corvid could have been mimicking that, although I still doubt it would have sounded exactly like him. The second one is a bit harder for everyone involved to swallow. Bob hasn't said Nick's name very often on our property, mostly just in the last week that they've been visiting, and certainly he's never called to him. I also looked into cryptids. I was told once that the natives believed an entity lived on the mountain that I now live on. I wasn't told much, just that it was neither good nor bad, but that the natives stayed well away from there. Any thoughts on what this might be? This paranormal encounter took place at the hotel that I worked at last year. I was 20 years old, working at a small mom-and-pop hotel in Ontario, California. I had worked there for some time before I started to stay there for a few months. The owner taught me everything I needed to know so that I could run his business while he went on a business trip to Africa. Mind you, I didn't have a car so my only option was to stay there and work around the clock if need be. I didn't have to pay for the room, and I got to wash my clothes in the laundry room. There was a grocery store within walking distance and restaurants all around me where I could get food at a discounted price since I worked at the hotel. I thought this was a pretty sweet deal. One night my boyfriend came down to visit and while he was in the bathroom, I heard banging coming from the room next to ours. Then I heard scratching on my walls. I told him to stop playing around, and he didn't even know what I was talking about. The banging continued all night, so I called the front desk, and I told them that the people next to me were being loud. I had to be up at six to go down there and work. She was quiet for a while, and then she said, We didn't rent out the room next to yours. Mind you, I had an end room. I quickly ran outside to see if the curtains were open or closed, and they were open. I could see right into that room, and nobody was in there. It was an outside hotel. I've never been so creeped out in all my life. Then I decided to sage the room just to rid it of any bad spirits or energy, and that worked, for a while, until it didn't. The next time something demonic happened, I was asleep and kept hearing whispers in my sleep. I hate whispers with a passion, they creep me out to the fullest. So I sat up in bed, and I was looking around the dark room. In the corner of the room, I saw white, glowing eyes staring at me. I felt frozen by its glare. I could see its body, and saw that it was crouched down, holding its knees. Then I saw more shadows appearing closer and closer. I reached to turn on the lamp next to the bed, and it didn't turn on. My next thought was that I needed to run outside and get to safety. It took all the balls in the world for me to get up and run out there. I was so scared I couldn't even feel my legs. All I could feel was the cold wooden floor beneath me. I got to the door and flung it open only to see that the bedroom curtains were on the outside of my room's window. The sky was black and the clouds were dark, dark green with gray tints. I was mortified to realize that I was still asleep, and I hadn't actually woken up. I looked back inside the hotel room and I saw myself asleep in the bed. I screamed bloody murder, and that's when I jolted awake for real. I said a prayer and went back to sleep. The encounter that followed was much worse. I went back to sleep and yet again I could hear things. I was scared and I couldn't move any part of my body. I started to pray in my head as loud as I could, only to awake and feel my body slam onto the bed as if I had been levitating. I called my grandma the next day and she said that it was probably a demonic attack. I got my car shortly after, just a few days later and I never stayed in that hotel again. I was severely depressed at the time I was staying there, and maybe those spirits were feeding off of that, but I never stayed there again. Something 
happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away, but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have, and suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about eight to 10 feet off the ground. And the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd tearing sound for lack of a better word. And each tearing sound was loud and lasted two to three seconds. I told myself that it was a deer and that it was tearing bark off trees and that's what was making the noise, but deep down I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer still about eight to ten feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within five to ten feet. Right then I heard Sarah scream whisper my name, and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was, and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer, and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer but I insisted that it was because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent, still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent where the ground dropped off steeply. So each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the eight to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I'd heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it.
One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20-pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece-of-shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to ten days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boombox and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way, and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002, and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream, respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I want to know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around 1 to 2 in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. 
The camp was on two sides of a highway, and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp, so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox, and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel. Gray shapes. I assumed they were deer, and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling, and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white, and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running, and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol. We were both under 21 and we were working at a church camp with strict policies. So I have no idea what we saw. When I, was, when I was around five, I went camping with my parents in a place called Bear Creek Reservoir in BC. It's a very isolated place, deep in the woods. We got there by driving up an old logging road. The actual reservoir itself was very beautiful and quiet. I actually looked up the area on Google Maps and it still gives me chills, even looking at it from a satellite perspective. But anyway, the day passed by without incident, and we mostly just swam the whole day. We went to bed that night, and nothing unusual had happened. But the following morning, I woke up in my parents' tent just as the sun was making its appearance. I unzipped the tent and noticed a figure standing maybe 50 feet away. The light was still fairly dim, so it was hard to make out distinct details, but it was just standing there, staring at me, unmoving. The entity had the figure of a woman of average size, but instead of seeing a face, there was just darkness. Even so, I could tell that it was looking at me. And instead of clothes and skin, it had leaves and sticks, as if it was made from them. I remember feeling very afraid of this creature, like if I left the tent, I wouldn't be seen again kind of fear. So I tried waking up my parents, and they were both really pissed that I woke them up and they didn't believe me at all, until they finally got up later and explored the area. We ended up finding a bunch of man-made structures made of branches and other weird stuff in the area, but not one where I had seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, that's my true story. Let me know what you think. I'd like to go there again someday and see if I can find anything, but maybe it's best I don't. When I was in northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, 
I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk, and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious. It just felt bad, like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention, or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things, because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before, and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time, I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. Where do I begin? This had taken place a few years ago. I was with my best friend, and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Lockett Meadow. We had taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, 
burying itself into our tent. It had this weird way of hovering back and forth over my body and my dog, who was curled up, awake, and not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I look over and I see my best friend passed out and his dog. I'm unsure whether or not his dog was awake, but I was clearly the only one between my friend and I that was, and I'm experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what happened, and he replied no and thought that I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear or something, so we looked around our campsite but couldn't find any trace. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch, so even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it wouldn't have gotten into any of our food. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. I don't know if it was the wind or a deer or a bear, who knows, but this is just one encounter out of the whole camping trip. The next night, we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we were in Arizona. Before we settled in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eyes a big rock being thrown near us, making this huge splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything above us, so we run over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top, and we see nobody. We yell out a bunch of foul stuff and heard nobody running off or anything like that. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up there, my friend told me that throughout the trip, since we started in Flagstaff, he's had rocks being thrown at him, even before that big ass rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said that was impossible and that we were just trying to connect dots and have it be a cool adventure. Nothing happened that night and going into the next day, where we packed up and headed home with nothing of a memory to be justified by. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure what we encountered. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends who was a year older told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five-day camp, but I remember exactly what happened and I always will. We were sitting with the other students and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind, the tents were way away from the rest of camp and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked at the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere and I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? And we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers where the teacher had just talked to the class 
we had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way, and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had sort of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually, at the top, we found this secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our site was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking one in front of the other dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead and they didn't acknowledge my mom or I whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and then right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Neither of them had lights. They were totally barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on edge the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I said I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought they were paranormal, he said, pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. 
they looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird, but again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car, and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console, and get into the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to ten miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then, after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights, and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out, and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato, so there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories, too, that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. 
We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around. It was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no stakes and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the stakes allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights, and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground, like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Sometime later, we went into the tent for shut-eye, and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite, was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. 
I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take and packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and I jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and I hike for about 15 to 20 miles until I find the right spot and I head off the trail to find a place to put up my tent. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and I go back to eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep yet, so I pull out a book I brought with me and I start to read by the light of the lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down, and I listen to this animal walk-drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing, and stops, and I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. There's nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip up the tent and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter, and then sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm really hearing is what I'm really hearing, or if it's just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different. Old men, old women, younger people, even children, and I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a little bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and I listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the whole way, 
I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way out. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, just like I left all my gear in the woods that night. I managed a resort in the Adirondack for several years. The place is old and rustic. It's miles from civilization and very peaceful. It was built in the 20s and had somewhat of a sordid past. It was built for a Canadian senator who would run rum down from Canada during the prohibition. We still had the underground locked safe room where he would store the booze as well as hidden booze hiding areas underneath some of the cabins. Calvin Coolidge stayed at a camp across the pond during his presidency and would visit my camp, for the spirits, I'm sure. Anyway, I met a girl and decided to sleep out under the stars on the camp's peninsula. It started to rain, so I suggested we sleep on the screened in porch of the boathouse, which I thought was a pretty good compromise. So, after we were all set up, it was getting pretty late, about 1.30 in the morning or so. We were laying there, and I was all tossing and turning because I'd been asleep and woken up. So I have a hard time falling asleep after stuff like that. We'd been laying there for about a half an hour or so, when I hear the bathroom door open in the boathouse. It couldn't have been anything else but that door. I did all the maintenance on those old buildings, and oiling that particular door was on my work list for the next day. I knew exactly what it sounded like. My first thought was that it was my boss, the owner of the camp. She is notoriously nosy and has been known to spy on the staff in their staff quarters. So she was my first logical thought as to who had made the noise. Why she would have been hiding out in the men's bathroom in the boathouse for over an hour is beyond my comprehension. I proceed to hear footsteps walking across the boathouse, down the three steps onto the dance floor and stopping right in front of the door to the screened in porch. I lay there just waiting for the door to open and for my boss to call my name. As the minutes stretched out, I started praying that she would open the door walk away, sneeze, dance the funky chicken, anything. But there was nothing. The rest of the night I stayed up, stiff straight in my sleeping bag. No receding footsteps, no door noises, no nothing. Just my girlfriend, myself, the night, and an empty boathouse. The next morning, my girlfriend, she wasn't at the time, but she was the four years that followed, rolled over to me and immediately asked me about the footsteps the night before. She had also stayed up all night, waiting for some other sound to explain those footsteps in the night, and heard nothing. She was terrified. We never went into that boathouse again. I unfortunately had to go to the boathouse myself on a daily basis. Everything was cool during the day. At night, I had to turn all the lights in the camp off. This is something I've done every night for the past three years. However, ever since that, there was always a sense of dread going in there, being alone in the dark in the boathouse. The worst part is that there's this enormous hanging bed in there in front of the fireplace. It was for the former camp owners to take naps on during the day, hung on chains, so that the bed could be lifted out of the way for entertaining guests in the evening. Every single night, that bed was swinging. A 175 pound bed swinging on its chains in the darkness of the boathouse. Until my last day at that camp, if I went in at night, that bed was swinging.
A couple of years ago, my brother bought a large piece of land out in the middle of nowhere, about 30 miles or so from cell phone reception. It's quiet. There's no light pollution, no paved roads, and not a lot of people around. Shortly after he bought the place, two of my brothers, the landowner and another, myself and our families, spent a weekend camping on the land and doing our best to clean it up. People had used it as a dump. There were many downed trees and stuff like that. On the second night that we camped there, I woke up in the middle of the night to relieve myself. As I was walking to the bushes in the dark, I realized that I could faintly hear music. This didn't really strike me as odd because I knew my brother had a radio in his camper. I finished up and went back to sleep with no further thought on the matter. The next morning at breakfast, I mentioned the radio and the music. Several other people recalled waking in the night and hearing music. But here's the kicker. No two people heard the same music. Finally, the brother who had brought the radio woke up. I asked him about the music and he seemed a bit freaked out. He said that he woke up sometime during the night and went outside to smoke. He had heard music as well and had assumed that it was someone else. I should mention though, that he was the only one with a generator and a radio. If it wasn't his radio we heard, it wasn't anyone else's either. I've been back several times, but I'm a bit freaked out by that place at night. I have fun while I'm there, but I'm almost always armed and I don't sleep in a tent anymore. I sleep in my SUV with the doors locked. It might seem kind of dumb, but realizing that everybody heard different music when there were no people, no functional radios that were on, and no electricity is quite creepy. This happened maybe 20 years ago, when three friends and I went camping at Kentucky Lake. Well, technically it was Lake Barkley. So we had just settled on a campsite after hiking maybe an hour from where we had parked. It was on a small inlet, maybe 300 yards long and 150 yards to the opposite shore. We had it all to ourselves and we camped near the U bend of the inlet so we had a limited view of the lake proper. We could see it to the left, but it was mostly blocked by trees on the opposite side of the little bay. It being relatively hot and humid, we were all standing in the water after having set up our tents and things like that. The sun had gone down maybe an hour earlier, so there was still a little bit of light left. I think it was early summer or late spring. So we're standing there shooting the breeze, you know, up to our shoulders in the water. It felt great. Suddenly above us, there was a meteor-like fireball that lasted maybe two seconds at most. It appeared to be very close, but there's no way to be certain. We saw it fall behind the opposite spit of land and presumably land in the lake. Immediately afterwards, the entire lake lit up seemingly from the bottom. Seriously, all the water visible from where we were standing, including our little inlet and the portion of the lake proper, lit up like the entire floor of the lake was made of spotlights. It flashed two or three times and went out. There was no accompanying sound whatsoever. A few seconds went by when one of the guys asks, okay, did anyone else see that? which was followed by an evening of us all theorizing what it could have been because yes, we had all seen it. To this day, none of us have any idea what it was, but we all saw it. It may not be as weird or terrifying as some stories, but it's easily the strangest thing I've ever encountered.
When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to my housing estate so we could drink beer and listen to music as loudly as we wanted. This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill where all the surrounding houses were far away enough so that we wouldn't disturb the neighbors. And we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around this time, so I lay awake for hours, just thinking. Around 3 a.m., I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation as someone walked on it outside of our tent. I was stunned with terror. For one, because this was a private field owned by a farmer who would probably be angry to find us there. But more so because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent where there wasn't before. No approaching steps, nothing. I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to a dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly, listening to this person and his dog walking back and forth outside the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us every time he passed our tent, and I couldn't see the dog's shadow even though I heard it making increasingly erratic circulations of the tent. This carried on for around five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything, it was more like they were still walking just outside the tent, but with perpetually lighter footing. When I was sure that the sounds had ceased and that there was no threat waiting for me outside, I freaked out at my friends, still as quietly as possible, and said that we had to go because someone knew we were here and we could get in trouble with the owner. I told them everything that had happened, but they didn't believe me thinking that I had been asleep as well and had dropped the whole thing. I assured them that I hadn't and that we had to go right away. They tried to get back to sleep, ignoring me because they're lazy as hell and didn't want to pack everything up and go. I gave up too, even though I knew that now I'd never get to sleep. 10 minutes later, the sounds returned in the same way they had gone the volume gradually increased just outside the tent. It wasn't like anybody approached. It was just louder and louder, and then it was there. I felt the same dread that I had felt before and whispered one of my friend's names so they could wake up and hear. One person said, shh. They had already heard it, and they told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand out of the sleeping bag and up to the zipper. It felt like it took five minutes for me just to reach it, so I was sure not to make a single sound, and I pulled it down so violently I nearly ripped the whole thing in half. There was nobody there. We got out within the space of about five seconds, and there was nobody anywhere. As I said, we were atop a hill in the middle of a field so we could see if anyone had decided to run, but there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anybody to escape our seeing them, I am absolutely positive that there were footsteps outside our tent that night. This is just added to by the fact that my other friends heard it the second time. To this day, we have no idea what it was. One summer, I helped the Boy Scout troop that I was a part of, and we took the troop down to Antietam National Battlefield. 
I received my Eagle Award two years before, but wasn't particularly active afterwards. I liked camping and they needed a few leaders, so I decided to go. A number of other troops had also come down for the weekend, and we had a weekend full of Civil War education, reenactments, and troops pranking other troops. All of the troops were camped along Antietam Creek, on the other side of the Burnsides Bridge Road. That side isn't part of the park. It was pretty easy for anyone to cross the road and walk onto the battlefield to go up to Burnsides Bridge, along the creek, and see the field where the Union soldiers massed and tried to cross the bridge. I grew up outside of Gettysburg, so ghost stories about Antietam didn't bother me at all. There's enough weird tales in Gettysburg that other battlefields really didn't faze me. The second night that we were there, the troops all hit the hay early due to the fact that they were made to march all day by an overzealous reenactor. I took a walk over to the bridge right after dinner and the sun was slowly sinking towards night. It was actually quite beautiful seeing the field and the creek. I walked up to the bridge and started to cross it when I felt an excruciating sharp pain in my chest. I almost doubled over in pain and clenched my chest. I thought maybe I was having a heart attack, but both of my arms were fine and free to move. I put both hands on the part of my chest that hurt and felt another sharp pain right below the top of my right shoulder, in the meaty part above your pecs, underneath your shoulder and just in front of your underarm. That pain came and knocked me down where I almost cracked my head open on the side of the stone bridge. I laid there, freaking out, and scrambled to my feet and booked it back to camp. I got back to camp and had the other scoutmaster take a look at my chest. I have these two raised red lumps that, under the skin, you could see were turning into blood blisters. He asked me what I was doing, and I told him that it happened when I was just walking around the battlefield. Not once had I thought about a haunting or anything like that. I called in an evening and turned in. The next morning, after breakfast, the troops were scheduled to meet with a park official at Burnside's Bridge. Our troop and about four other ones stood on the battlefield facing toward the bridge where the park official was detailing the history of the battle. When he talked about the bridge, then I paid more attention. I found out that Confederate sharpshooters took up positions on the other side of the creek and that on the side where we were all at was the Union. The Union soldiers were supposed to take the bridge and were just picked off left and right up on that bridge. Confederates lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 soldiers and the Union lost over 15,000. No Union soldier ever made it past the halfway point of the bridge. At this point, my scoutmaster just looks at me, and I'm wondering what the hell happened to me the night before. I'm pretty sure that I felt ghost bullets, and to this day, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever had happen to me. At my high school, all the seniors went on an annual camping and rafting trip up in Maine. My class only had about 90 kids in it. All the kids got assigned cabins, four to a cabin. The campground was beautiful. It was right on this huge lake at the bottom of a mountain. On the first night that we were there, some of the people who worked there sat around this huge bonfire with us and told us the story of a ghost who haunted the grounds. Apparently, the campground used to belong to a rich family back in the early 1900s, and the daughter of the owner drowned in the river, or something like that, while sneaking around after dark with her lover. They said that if you were in bed and you heard the sound of rushing water, like a river, she was outside 
waiting to guide you to the river. If you saw her light, you would be entranced and she would walk you to your watery death. The teachers told us that they only told the story to scare the kids from leaving their cabins after bedtime and that it wasn't real. I got paired up with three other girls in my cabin and we stayed up the first night giggling and talking. By the time we finally fell asleep around 3 a.m., I was jolted awake by a loud sound. It sounded like something large splashing in water. The lake was nowhere near the cabins, by the way. You had to walk like 15 minutes to get to the water, and the river was at least three or four miles away. I figured it was a dream or something, so I ignored it. But a few minutes later, it happened again. I looked over and saw that two of the other girls were wide awake, petrified. One of them looked out the small window, but nobody was there. We didn't sleep well that night. None of the other kids heard the noise, except for a group of boys whose cabin was very far from us. They said they heard it at around 1 a.m., right outside their cabin. And when they woke up, there was a bright light shining into their cabin. When they looked out, they could see a light flashing in the dark trees. We all confronted the campground people, but they all said they had nothing to do with it. The teachers did runs every now and then throughout the night to check and make sure the students weren't out of bed or doing things they shouldn't be doing. They said that they didn't see or hear anything. We didn't believe them. And one of the girls in my cabin was so scared that she wanted to go home. She called her mom and everything to come and get her. Keep in mind, this trip cost all of us a lot of money, and we had paid for three days. The teachers tried to calm her down, and the campground people insisted on staying up with us to see if it happened again. She stayed. The next night, the teachers stayed outside our cabin, while the campground people stayed outside the boys' cabin. All of the students were accounted for. One of the teachers continued to walk around and check all the cabins so nobody was out of bed. Nothing happened for a while, so eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up what seemed like minutes later to one of my cabin mates screaming and pointing at the door. I looked over and saw really long, dark, wet hair dangling in front of the window. The teachers came running in and a few minutes later, so did the campground people. The other girl was sobbing and it woke everybody up. We told them what we saw, but the campground people said that nobody else was staying in the campground and the teachers confirmed that everybody was accounted for and nobody had wet hair. Nobody slept that night. And for the last night, we all just camped out in the main hall because we were too afraid to sleep in the cabins. I had forgotten about this story until just now. I've always figured that either the teachers or workers there were playing a sick joke, but I guess I'll never know. One time, about two or three years ago, I was out in the woods camping with my brother. We had just gotten there at about 4 p.m. to set up and everything like that. Once we had everything set up, we got a fire going. I told my brother that I was going to go get some firewood because we really only had enough to start the fire. It was about seven o'clock and then I suddenly got really cold, even though the weather wasn't cold at all. When I got this sudden rush of coldness, I felt a heavy feeling of just pure evil and hatred and despair. I immediately went back to my brother. He told me that it was fine and that there was probably just a strong thing of wind that made me cold, but I knew something was wrong. We sat around the fire and I just felt like someone or something was watching me. Once again, I started to feel that same feeling of pure evil, 
It started to get worse and worse, kind of like it was growing inside me, but I tried to brush it off and I just went to bed. At around 2.20 in the morning, I heard something that sounded like a scream and it woke me up. I looked around in the tent and got a flashlight. When I turned the light on, I noticed that my arm was bleeding and had been cut open by something in multiple spots. I woke my brother up in a panic and told him what had happened. He said that he didn't know what I was talking about and that my arm wasn't even cut, even though I was looking right at it and it was obviously cut open and bleeding. I was like, are you joking? He continued to say that nothing happened to me and, kind of irritated, said that I was pranking him. At around that time, I felt a huge amount of pain in my arm and then I heard the scream again. But it didn't sound like how a human screams. It was more of a screech, as though there was some kind of animal or some creature in the distance that was in pain. I looked at my brother and asked if he had heard it. And he said, what do you mean? I didn't hear anything. Nothing happened. At that point, I was scared for my life. I mean, if it was an animal, he would have heard it too. I was just praying that nothing more would happen. After a few minutes, I heard the scream again. Every time that thing screamed, I would get that feeling again and my arm would start to burn. Eventually, all of it stopped. After that, I wasn't able to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I told my brother that I just wanted to leave right away. When we got into the truck, I could have sworn that out of the corner of my eye, I saw something run through the woods. We got to the truck and I looked to the right while packing the stuff up and four of the trees had marks like they'd been clawed by something. The thing is, the marks were at least 12 feet up in the trees, maybe higher. At that point, I was tired and scared, so I just got in the truck and we left. To this day, I still haven't gone camping again and I still wonder what that was. I've never really had any paranormal experiences before, but I cannot explain this. I'm in college and about seven other people and I from my school went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year and it was cold. Everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite. There were a couple of other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples and then two college-aged girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp farther away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places and the energy in this place wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one-person tents, and we formed a kind of cluster in this site, with my tent being in the back, so no one was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest, because this backpacking site was like a big cleared off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m., and I wake up to leaves crunching right by my tent. I hear footsteps, walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like it was bipedal. I could not make this up. This creature or thing was circling my tent for a long period of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of the tent and then just stopping for periods of time that seemed like forever. Then it would move on, walking around the rest of our tent cluster. I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth whenever it was close to my tent. 
like a sort of light heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this went on for hours, and it seemed to me like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shape from my tent, although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow, and it didn't move, kind of like a flashlight would if you were holding it still. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply couldn't believe that it was an animal. At some point, probably due to sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep, but I could hear the heavy footsteps circling right up until the point that I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it, and my leader admitted that she had heard the footsteps and the noises as well, admitting that it was bizarre and that she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said that he also noticed the light that came on, but thought that it was someone else. Not a single person in the group had gotten up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. I've heard things about the Appalachian region being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Some people on Reddit have leaned toward Bigfoot because apparently he's associated with light orbs. I've never really been a Bigfoot believer, but I'm telling you, this didn't feel like just any animal or person or anything I've ever experienced before. So maybe Bigfoot is as good an explanation as any. A few years back, I went camping with two buddies in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. We hiked about two hours with our packs to a small lake and set up camp. All was normal during the day. We made some hot dogs and beans and then stayed up until it was dark to watch the stars. Once it was dark out, we hiked up to the top of a large boulder to get a vantage point to see the stars over the trees. I recall that there was no moon out that night because we could see the stars so clearly due to the limited ambient light. We were pretty far out there, so there was no background noise or light from humans. Once our eyes adjusted after a half an hour or so, we could see all of the stars and even some satellites slowly moving in the sky. After we're done stargazing, we head down to our tents that were set up right by the lake. We have two two-person tents for the three of us. My two friends shared one tent and I was alone in the other. We set up the tents right next to each other on the same flat spot. I fall asleep pretty easily because I was tired from hiking and exploring all day and because it was so dark out and I like sleeping in the dark. However, at about three or four in the morning, I wake up to a rustling on the outside of my tent. In my half asleep days, I'm not sure if it's just wind or something else. I keep listening and I realize that it's something brushing against my tent. It sounds like an animal pushing its nose against the tent fabric and sniffing. The sound is coming from the side of the tent right next to my head so I can hear it super clearly. At this point, my heart is racing and I'm lying frozen in my sleeping bag, hoping that whatever is outside will leave my tent and it'll just be over. I think about calling out to my friends in their tent, but I don't want to startle or anger whatever is outside. So I decide to just keep lying still and hope it will leave. My mind is going through every possibility when I finally realize what it is. When we had set up our tents earlier that day, there wasn't much flat space, so we placed our tents very close to each other, like I said. Evidently, they were so close that when my friend was moving his feet in his sleeping bag, they brushed up against his tent, which was right near my head. So all along, it was my friend's feet moving around, and there was no animal or person outside. 
Phew. However, that wasn't the end of the weird stuff. And I only realized that this next part was weird once we had left the next day and I got home. As I laid in my tent and tried to slow my heart after realizing that the rustling was my friend, I was looking at the shadows of the trees on the wall of my tent. They reminded me of when I was a kid, when a car would slowly drive down your street and the headlights through the blinds would cast shadows that slowly draw across the ceiling. At the time, it made sense to me, and I thought it was just like when I was a kid. Considering that I had just thought a creature was outside my tent, this seemed like nothing. However, as I mentioned earlier, it was a moonless, pitch-dark night. So what could that light have been? It was a very slow-drawing light that had the shadows of the trees moving across my tent walls for about five minutes. We were very far from civilization, so there's no way that it was a car or a flashlight from a midnight hiker, because the light was so steady and slow moving. I don't know if it was a flare or a comet streaking across the dark sky or something else. I still don't know what it could have been, and I think maybe I'm okay with that. In the early 90s, my parents sent me to a YMCA summer camp in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It was called something like Matalonike, and it was located on the shores of a series of man-made lakes in Medford Lakes, so not exactly backwoods. We all knew the stories of the Jersey Devil, but the camp had a few of its own ghost stories. The White Lady, said to have jumped off a bridge on her wedding day, and Hatchet Harry, an axe-wielding maniac who got kids that wandered into the woods. I assumed both of these stories were developed to keep kids from wandering off. What I encountered was neither of those. I woke up in the middle of the night in my bunk, hearing some rustling in the bushes. The cabins were basically a half wall with screened windows all around, save for the back wall, with eight bunk beds, four on each side. You could lay in your bunk and look right out the windows. It really sucked, though, when it rained because there were no shutters to close. I had heard this rustling, so I grabbed my flashlight and I shined it into the bushes from across the front of the cabin, sweeping from bottom to top. There was nothing else in that direction save for woods, as our cabin group was right on the edge of the camp. I didn't see anything out there, so I put my flashlight back, but kept it next to me and got ready to settle back in. But then this light reappeared. It was this bluish white light and flickered slightly, kind of like a firefly. The light slowly followed the same path that my flashlight had traced from bottom to top. And then it disappeared. It scared the hell out of me, but I didn't bother to wake my grouchy counselor she wouldn't have believed me anyway, since she already thought that I was just a troublemaker. So I just smushed down into my sleeping bag and tried to get back to sleep. I never saw it again after that point. My best guess is some sort of firefly that thought my flashlight was a prospective mate. Although the fireflies in that area usually had a greenish hue. I've shared this story before, but I've never really gotten a satisfactory response. Maybe I'll never know what that was, and maybe it was something totally natural. But I still thought it was really freaky. I have been backpacking and camping, mostly solo as an adult, for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings, and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer and move through the land with as little impact as possible. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and the obscure. Cryptids, 
alternate realities and the unexplained fascinate me. I've read most of the missing 411 cases, and I'm a serious devotee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find, I devour. Anything strange that will fire the imagination. There have been occasions where I have felt slightly uncomfortable, or watched even, when I've been out in the woods. But mostly, I've just chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters that other people experience. I always look for logical conclusions first. I even think that David Politis is experiencing some kind of confirmation bias. I don't know that all the missing 411 cases are what he thinks they are. I've never encountered any truly off or deranged people out in the forests, but I do consider that the biggest threat is the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged, and if you get the chance to visit one, wherever you might live, I would suggest it. It's beautiful, serene, and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of hemlock and poplar, and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail, which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked out through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring. I was looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. Eventually, I made my way down to a creek and crossed over it to an old field that formed a sort of bowl in the land, with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field means that there had, I guessed at one point, been people living in that area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there, and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up my tent and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and just look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution, and I always relished the opportunity to enjoy the sky at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I'd been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together, loud enough to reverberate in the little bowl that I was in, loud enough that you could almost feel it. I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest, and anyone who's been out there knows that it is dark. I thought it had to be a person making the noise, because what else would make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud, and would have taken considerable effort to produce. I had seen no one else at all that day, and the direction from which the sound was coming was the section of old growth that I had explored earlier. And that's it. That's the story. Eventually, the sound stopped and I went to bed feeling like I had heard something that I wasn't meant to hear. Or maybe that I'd heard something specifically meant for me and me alone. Both disturbed me. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware and waiting for something else to happen. But nothing ever did. I've told friends about this, and they'll either say that it was for sure a Sasquatch, or that I was for sure close to someone's house that I didn't know about. But why would a person be out in the woods late at night, banging logs together in the dark? I'm not ready to come to a conclusion. Like I said, I'm a skeptic. But I'll admit that I have no idea how to explain what I heard that night.
I was in a mountainous recreation area, well after dark, by myself, with no flashlight or camping equipment. I had planned on meditating and fasting all night. At about 10 p.m., I decided that I was hungry, and I started walking down off the ridge that I was on. All of a sudden, there's something big in the darkness. I hear its footsteps in the grass. It sounds very heavy and very large. I got really scared and I started talking to it, pleading it to leave me alone, that I was just going down the hill and that I just wanted to pass and I didn't want any trouble. I started singing some kind of song and I found two rocks and started banging them together. I made it past the place that I last heard it moving, which was only about 14 feet from me. I heard it shift its weight. It was still there, but it didn't walk. The comforting part was that it wasn't moving toward me. The scary part was that all my forceful talking and shouting and noise making hadn't scared it at all. I had to stay close to its position because I was on a steep ridge. Something that wasn't afraid of me out there could only have been a bear or something paranormal. The last I checked, bears don't exactly understand human language and don't negotiate with you if you ask them to let you pass. I don't know. I banged the rocks together all the way down the hill so it could hear me moving away. I'm not really sure what this was. And sometimes I think that I'm just fine, never knowing. Okay, so I had this experience a long time ago, and it's been something that has driven me crazy ever since. I need to know if this has happened to anyone else, or if anybody knows what it might be. I believe in the paranormal, but I had never heard of anything like this happening to anyone else. So here goes. When I was 10, I was at a friend's house for her birthday party. It was Friday the 13th, but nobody was really that aware of it. Like nobody thought of the date or anything. Anyway, it was a camp out in her backyard which is basically in the middle of the woods. When it comes time to go into the tents and sleep, most of the other girls decide that they would rather sleep inside. Except for me and one other girl, we decided that we wanted to sleep in the tent outside. So the rest of them all slept inside while this other girl and I were outside. The birthday girl's dad slept in a separate tent right next to ours. The girl and I were talking and then, for some random reason, I asked her what the date was. She said, oh, it's Friday the 13th. We both kind of paused for a minute, thinking it over. And we both just kind of said, whatever, that's just a myth. Remember, we were still young, so while we had heard that Friday the 13th was bad luck and stuff like that, we hadn't really seen any scary movies, and we weren't informed about all the bad things that happened on that day. To us, it was a campfire story. Anyway, we don't give it another thought, and eventually, we go to sleep. This is when things took a turn. I am a very heavy sleeper, but I was woken up in the middle of the night. I have no idea what time it was. We didn't have cell phones yet, but I think it was somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. I woke up because I heard this deep, menacing laughter it honestly sounded evil. I sat up and it immediately stopped. I thought I must have just been dreaming, so I went to go lay back down. As soon as my head hits the pillow, it starts again. It's an extremely low man's voice, just going, ha ha ha. I wake up my friend from her deep sleep and ask her if she's hearing it. She sleepily says no. She said she didn't hear anything and she fell right back asleep. I brushed it off once again and once again I tried to go back to sleep. But as soon as I laid my head on the pillow, it started up. I noticed that every time I heard it, it got louder, as if it was getting closer. 
I tried one more time to go back to sleep, but this time it was so loud, it sounded like it was 10 feet away. At this point, I wake up the girl and tell her we're going inside. She's tired, so she said she's gonna stay out there. I wake up my friend's dad from his tent next to ours, and I tell him that I wanna go inside. He woke up and escorted me inside where I was finally able to fall back asleep. I tell everyone the next day what happened, and they all tell me that I'm crazy. But when I talk to the other girl who was in the tent, she tells me that after I left, she started hearing it too, and that she would swear by it. Whenever I tell people this story, the first thing they say is that it was the dad messing with us, but I'm certain that it wasn't. I knew this guy very well, and he just isn't that type of guy. He's very plain and very quiet. I had known him a long time, and I've never seen him act differently. The other reason I know that it's not him is because the entire time it was going on, I could hear him snoring from his tent. So, it definitely wasn't him. I've never been able to get that evil laughter out of my head. Ever since that day, I've been afraid of the dark, and I've always felt like something is watching me. I suffer from sleep paralysis from time to time now, and whenever I do, I hear the laugh. This was 10 years ago, and it still haunts me. Something strange happened while I was camping at Gatlin Point in Land Between the Lakes Recreation Area. This past weekend, I was camping with some family and some friends there. This was quite a beautiful spot, right on the water. I had a great day setting up, cooking, and then a good evening, sitting by the fire and relaxing. At about one in the morning, my wife and I went to bed. At four, she woke me up and said that it sounded like somebody had thrown something into the lake. I told her it was probably just a fish jumping in the water. But right about that moment, I heard the splash, and it was not the sound of a fish jumping at all. It sounded like somebody had thrown a concrete block into the water. If you've ever heard a fish jump, you know that sound versus something thrown into the water. A couple of minutes later, there was another splash, but this time it was even closer and louder. A couple of minutes later, another. This is where things get really strange. At the waterline distance away, but right even with the tent, we heard a subdued scream and then the splash again. I opened the tent and shined my flashlight toward the shore and scanned it back and forth saying nothing. Nothing was there. Then the scream and splash again, farther to the right this time, but not by much. Then again farther down, and then gone. I got up and drove around. I searched with my light, and I found nothing. I don't really believe in ghosts or anything like that, but I'm having a really hard time with this one. Does anyone know what this might have been? Years ago, my parents bought a piece of land in the southwestern Colorado prairie, near the Huerfano River, deep in the middle of nowhere. I've lost count of all the camping trips that we had in my dad's expansive canvas tent atop what we would later dub as Cyclone Hill, on account of the furious winds we've experienced camping atop the hill. Some gusts powerful enough to rock our old F-150 back and forth. Immediately upon exiting the car, you feel the land. Call them spirits or psychic remnants, or just the knowledge of so many eras past leaving an indelible mark. The feeling of being watched is instant, constant, and lasting. Below Cyclone Hill is a spiraling labyrinth of arroyos dug out from flash floods over time. What's cool 
is that the deepest arroyos connect and lead a trail down south to where the road curves around the land and heads west, if you know which arroyos to follow. Usually this road is washed out completely, and instead of hard dirt road, there's about a foot or two of quick mud. As a kid growing into a teenager and then an adult, I have learned how to track animals that use the arroyo trails at night. Most of these are just coyotes, which yip and sing throughout the night. Eerie at first, maybe, but I've always found it kind of cute, listening to them make their way throughout the arroyo labyrinth, yipping and howling and singing all the way. There are jackrabbits that are almost too fast to see, lizards that live in the woodpile, and about a billion different bugs. There are beautiful families of hawks living in selected areas. For years, a great white owl lived in an old dried off chute of the river, near cliff walls that rise on either side of the Werfano, the farther east you walked. And occasionally, you would hear this owl screech, and it was the most hauntingly beautiful thing you might ever hear. The only neighbors we had were tarantulas about the size of a frying pan that like to say hi to you in the morning by climbing up on the walls of the tent. Honestly, they're very friendly. So now that I've established this area to you and hopefully demonstrated that I know this land like the back of my hand, let me explain, or try to explain, what happened to my dad and I one random day camping at our land. We always wake early to watch the sunrise, which is always worth it. It was summer, and the temperature at midday climbed into the hundreds, so you relished the cool, sweet, dewy mornings. While drinking coffee, my dad, sitting off at our table, leashed to the tent so the wind didn't take it to Kansas, I walked around to the west side of our 12 by 12 canvas tent, to where we keep a sizable wood pile for our camping stove. As I turned the corner to walk along and inspect our wood pile, I noticed something odd, and when I looked down, I saw a footprint. The prairie dirt was displaced with a perfect shoe print. It was a simple shoe pattern, very oval, like bulky skate shoes, except with a more rounded sole. The shoe itself was maybe a size five, tiny, especially compared to my size 12 boot. I knelt down to look at it, and that's when I realized that there were more, both in front of and behind me. Behind the tent, about 35 to 40 yards, is the road you come in on, that curves westward after sloping down about a mile south. The footprints came from that direction. At this point, in sort of a half crouch, completely forgetting the coffee in my hand, I followed the tracks all the way to the road. They were almost perfect indents every time, and what made me very puzzled was how long the stride was. Imagine your normal step and how long of a stride that takes up. Now take into account height and possible leg length. Now this is possible, I guess, but isn't it odd to imagine somebody with very tiny feet goose stepping along the prairie, making strides that you would see someone making if they were over six feet tall? I certainly thought it was strange as I tried to match the stride and couldn't, even though I'm over six feet tall. Plus, with this strange stride, I could rule out my mother and sister, who A, weren't there, and B, had short legs. Nobody else came here. There are no houses or people, and our land is clearly marked and fenced, about as well as you can fence that land. At the road, the tracks stopped. And I don't mean I lost them down the road. I mean, they stopped. There was the road, and then two perfect side-by-side -side prints, as if someone had set their shoes down. Nothing before that. The idea that somebody could drive up to our camp, jump out, and walk past our tent is creepy, but I find it very hard to believe. If you've never been to the prairie, you might have gotten the idea from my mentioning of the wind and animals that nights out here are loud, as they are in the mountains or foothill campgrounds with lots of bugs and animal noises, you would be wrong. Yes, you can hear the coyotes. 
but they aren't nearly loud enough to penetrate the quiet of the night. It's so quiet that the slightest of sounds would wake up any moderate to heavy sleeper, and both my dad and I are light sleepers. The tracks I found by the tent and woodpile literally passed by my dad's head on the other side of the canvas tent. Whatever made them literally could have touched him, they were so close. With the way they were walking, too, I find it very difficult to believe we wouldn't have heard them, considering we've been woken up many times to critters coming to check out our tent. Is it possible that I misread the tracks? Sure, I guess. But bear in mind that I've been doing this my whole life, and I've tracked animals back to their dens before. It's much easier in the prairie compared to the mountains or grassland because the ground is dirt, and displaced dirt looks different than non-displaced dirt. A shoe print is a shoe print, and the distance between them was long enough to make me believe that this person was goose-stepping or just very tall with very long legs and very tiny feet. And that is just very odd. So where do the tracks go? By now I've informed my dad and showed him everything that I have found up until that point, including freaking him out some by pointing out how close the tracks were to him, separated by just a sheet of canvas. We geared up and followed the tracks out past the tent and down. The tracks descended the hill, never breaking the long stride, which is not only hard as hell to do, but dangerous, as the prairie dirt could easily slide on you and send you down the hill face first. I know this from experience. Once down the hill, the tracks descend into the arroyos and to our shock, perfectly follow the arroyo trail. We track these footprints with true trepidation, growing more and more perplexed, as the tracks crazily walked up and down the arroyo walls at such extreme angles that whatever made them had to be walking almost sideways at some points. When we reached the road and the washout, we found the tracks stopped once again, just as they had appeared at the top of the slope. Only now, we would be able to tell if a car passed through here and picked up whoever the footprints belonged to. But there were no tracks. The washout was nice and flat, free of any human-made tracks. This freaked me out. It's not possible that you could pass through this area and not leave some kind of mark. I made a search in widening loops from the center of the washed out road, covering at least a hundred feet in every direction, picking up the original tracks that led to the dead end and not finding them reappear anywhere. They were just gone. I put my hand in the last two tracks, both feet again side by side, like someone had taken their shoes off and stuck them in the perimeter of the mud to make two perfect prints. They were still soft and pliable. The mud hadn't hardened yet, still wet from the evening before. We pushed on toward the Werfano, all the while our eyes fixed on the ground, trying to find even the slightest hint of a track. There was nothing. Whatever it was, its tracks appeared on our road somewhere between 11.30 at night and 4.30 in the morning when my dad woke up, and they walked past two grown men both very light sleepers, passing mere inches from one of their faces, then proceeded to goose step down a hill, down into the arroyos and run up and down the arroyo walls as it marched on down the washed out road it had just been on, only to then stand perfectly still, feet side by side, and disappear. All in the middle of the night, all in the middle of nowhere on a random summer night. To this day, I think about those prints and really wonder what they could have been. The skeptic in me is just as puzzled as the believer in me. I really have no idea how or why this small-footed, long-legged person or thing just casually walked past our tent, down into some arroyos, which at night are dark and spooky as hell, and then disappeared back into the night it had come from. I've discussed this with my dad, and he holds the opinion that it may be a good thing we didn't wake up to see whatever the hell was out there. Because while we've never felt afraid down there, that day, we did. In all the years before and since, 
We've never had any encounters like that. And while we have had other weird things happen to us down there, involving voices on the wind and other weirdness, nothing tops that for me. And at night, when I'm all alone, lying in bed thinking about this, I can't help but wish I had seen it, whatever it was, because the mystery of it will confound and thrill me until my dying day. This happened in 2018, in December, just before Christmas. Two of my friends and I, we were 17 at the time, and a cousin of mine who was 15, were camping in the woods. It was on the property of one of the friends that had come along. We were there for five days, and pretty much did it all by ourselves, except for water. That we would hike back to the house to grab for the day since it was pretty impractical to get water ourselves for five days. This region was relatively dry, with no water filters or anything like that. We'd lie down pretty early, which felt rather primitive, literally when the sun set. Every night we would hear boar around our tent and steps. Paranoia fueled it a lot, but we had a bow, two axes, and some big knives. One day though, and I think this was either the last night or the second to last, we were just having a chat after dinner, like we would often do, and we hear a scream. It was pretty odd. It didn't sound human, but I have no clue what animal would be doing it either. I know a fair amount of our country's fauna. I've heard a lot of their screams, but this one was just different. The scream sounded like it had a buildup, not like a scream where you immediately hear the loudest part and then it dies off, but like it started low, got really intense, and then stopped. It sounded far enough, say 50 to 70 meters or so, but then it happens again, and again, and again. Now, suddenly, it's coming from almost all sides, and it was getting pretty close. It didn't sound super menacing, even though we were really scared, shooting my air gun with no rounds just to make a sound. It got to the point where the sound seemed like it was coming right to where the campfire couldn't shed light, just outside of what we could see. I remember that we had set up some traps for rabbits down the trail that day. So we gathered all the strength and courage that we could and we went there. The bait was gone, but the traps were unarmed. And that was a stupid idea anyway. Rabbits don't scream like that. We had some pretty strong flashlights, but we couldn't see a thing. All of a sudden, the sounds just stopped with no clear reason. It was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. And anytime somebody asks me for a scary story, I share this one. Also, where I live in Portugal, we don't have any cougars or anything like that that typically screams. Maybe there's no explanation, I don't know. But all I know is that it terrified me and I still think about it to this day. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip we were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had kind of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason, we ended up going up this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go on forever. Eventually, at the top, we found a secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anybody around, but the sun was about to set. So we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now it was dark and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our site was right at the edge of the trees. 
I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking, one in front of the other, dressed completely in white, in perfectly clean clothing. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, never acknowledged my mom or I whatsoever, and then walked out of the woods, past us, and right back into the trees. What's weird is that neither of them had lights. They were barefoot. They had no belongings with them, and they weren't even dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark, and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as I was. She could never see them. I was on edge the rest of the night, and I had a lot of trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I had seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought this was paranormal, he just looked at her and said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance. It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god-awful, low guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story, but even now when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore. A few months ago, three other friends and I went out to camp near a lake. We went camping on the shore of the lake, right next to a forest that went up a hill. It was nighttime, and the sky was very clear. We had a fire going, and so one friend and I decided to go a bit farther near to the lake to look at the stars. You could see the Milky Way and everything. It was really cool. While we were there, we were talking a little bit, and I noticed a light in the forest, above where the other two friends were, and above where we were camping. It was really bright in the middle, like a white orb, and at first I thought it was a person with a flashlight. The next thing I know, it zipped in a straight line, super fast, then went back again, with the same speed. Then, instantly, it just disappeared. My other friend who was with me saw it, 
and we both got really freaked out. He is very religious and can't explain it to me, but still doesn't want to believe that it's anything paranormal. So I'm kind of alone in this. The other friends didn't see anything because it was behind them. I have no idea what it could have been. The weird thing was that it was at the moment we noticed it that it reacted and moved around and disappeared. I wonder if it had been there the whole time while we were camping. There would have been no way to see it. Only when we moved away and then faced toward our camp could we have seen it. I told my other friends about it and they thought I was just joking. And the friend who was with me and saw it doesn't want to talk about it. So I don't really have any good answers. For the rest of the camping trip, I felt really uneasy. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer, with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. I think nothing else about it after that and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted, with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing, and stops. I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing, nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions. All different. Old men, old women, younger adults, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, so I grab my rifle preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. 
Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings. No laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off, I sat down and, in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night and I've never done it since. I recently moved from North Carolina to Vancouver Island, BC, Canada for work. It's truly beautiful here, and the lush, green, mossy forests of the Pacific Northwest are definitely something else. You have trails, woods, and parks everywhere here, so it's no surprise that there was a huge old-growth tree area two minutes away from my house. After a couple of weeks of settling in, it became a routine to walk my dog in these woods daily. I mean, at least until two days ago. I went for a walk with my dog fairly early in the morning, right after the sun rose. It was a typical walk for me, until my dog, who always loves to walk these woods, wouldn't move. It just stood still and barked toward a tree. As much as I tried to get him to move, he's a big dog and it's hard to control him when he doesn't obey. At first I thought it must have been a squirrel or a bird, but then I hear laughing coming from that direction. As far as I could see, there were no other humans nearby, but then I see it. A little human looking being quickly sprints through some ferns, no taller than 10 to 12 inches, seems pale green, a sort of moldish color. As far as I'm aware, it had some hairs, and it ran very fast. I didn't manage to get a photo of it or observe many details, as my dog's loud barking got distracting. After this, I didn't stay to investigate and quickly walked back home, and luckily, my dog followed along. I no longer feel safe in those woods, and if anybody knows what that could have been, help is very much appreciated. I know what I saw. I assume that I'm going to be called delusional, and I guess I would most likely say the same if someone told me this story. But everything that I said is exactly what I saw. I live on the west coast of British Columbia in Canada, about midway up the coast. I was driving my girlfriend back to her granddad's house, two towns over from mine. It's about a two and a half hour drive on the highways. 
I had driven her home and spent the day visiting her family. The town she is from is right on the coast. It's a port city. Not super important, but the point is that I spent the day there and was now getting ready to drive back home. About 25 to 30 minutes into the drive, I'm on the highway that runs parallel to the mouth of the river on one side and the CN tracks on the other. So it goes rail on my left, the road I'm on, and then sort of a mini channel where the river ends. I'm driving and it's getting dark, but I'm not tired or drowsy at all. There's a few rest stops along the road on my right, on the river bank. I had to pee, so I started slowing down at the first one, and that's when some thing scurries across the road. And that's almost all that happened. It was four-legged, at least from what I saw, and it was the blackest of black, like unnaturally dark. No texture or anything to it. It almost looked like a void of light or color in the shape of this thing. It ran out of the bush, over the rails, and I was going slow enough that the wind and highway noise was gone, and I heard it. It sounded like metal tapping as it ran over the ballast and the rail. And then there was the sound like if you took a rod of rebar or something and stabbed it into the ground. Then metal again, as it ran right in front of me, across the road. Its body was shaped like how some people describe a UFO. Almost flat and disc-like, like an oval stretched out with the legs protruding from the front and the back. It had no features. No eyes, no face, no mouth, nothing that I could see. It ran across the road, limbs outstretched as it ran, and then it ran into the rest area, and over the bank, and I'm guessing into the river. This thing was huge. I'm talking like the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Very big, and very fast. I've tried searching this online, but I haven't had any luck. If anyone can help me figure out what I saw, please let me know. When I was a kid, years ago, we heard stories of a little ghost boy that haunted my grandparents' place. Stories of how they would hear my cousin's toys moving around at night, or find his tricycle not where it was left. My uncle was renovating the basement one day by himself, and was going back to the house with some lumber. He looked up at the house, and the little boy was looking at him through the window. One day, when I was about 11 or 12, it would be my turn. I was in the kitchen eating a sandwich and drinking a pop and my little cousin was about six to seven. He was drawing on a piece of paper on the floor. His back was to the basement stairs and he was crouched over his drawing. I was watching him and all of a sudden, a little boy of about four years old comes tiptoeing up the stairs. He stood behind my cousin and was leaning over him, watching him draw. When he was doing this, he had his hands behind his back, leaning. Then he turned and looked at me, smiled, and ran down the hallway. When he got to the bathroom, he disappeared. I remembered that he was bow-legged and pigeon-toed by the way his feet swept back when he ran. Also, he wore tight blue jeans that went above his ankles, navy blue socks, and a striped tight t-shirt. I am a Native American from Alberta, Canada, and this little boy was Caucasian. We heard stories about an old man and a little boy that were buried in the unmarked graves nearby. The land before we lived there was used to travel to a trading post that used to be near us. I bet it was him. Poor little guy. He used to be just a baby before he passed. My grandparents were eventually tired of the stories and they prayed over the home, and we've never seen him again.
When I was 16 years old, I bought a one-way plane ticket to Edmonton, Alberta. My first real girlfriend had broken my heart and I needed to get away. School ended and I got on that plane. I ended up traveling and working all over northern Alberta, making forays into the Northwest Territory and northern British Columbia. I was living in a tent in high-level Alberta and working at Swanson's, a local lumber mill on the dry chain pole. This involved grading lumber and stacking it as it came out from the sawmill. Mostly 2x material, spruce used in framing applications and things like that. I lived pretty simply and cooked over a fire. Wood was not an issue. For a refrigerator, I just dug down in the cold earth about three feet and made a lid with plywood and kept all of my perishables in there. It worked great. I worked with a lot of indigenous people. My foreman was a native, as were most of my co-workers. I grew fond of most of them. They would stop by my camp and check in on me from time to time. Even the foreman, who took me to a real bar for the very first time. This campsite had a hand-pumped well, where I would get my daily water from. It was maybe a hundred yards away from my tent, with a clear and worn path to follow. One morning in late July, I woke up, shook myself out of my sleeping bag, opened the tent door, and grabbed my water jug. I was far enough north that the night was short. I could read a book at 11 p.m. and not need any extra light other than what the sun provided. I proceeded up the path, and about halfway to the pump, I almost tripped over a guy who was laying on the ground. He was dressed in what I assumed to be traditional native garb, and had a fire going, right up against a tree, to reflect the heat back onto him. I said, oh, I'm sorry, almost didn't see you there. He looked at me and all he said was, white man use propane? I was a bit thrown off, but I pointed to his fire and said, kind of chuckling, no, no, I use wood for fires, just like you. He didn't say anything, but gave me the biggest smile and nodded. I went on my way, got my water, and started heading back. I got to the spot where I had seen the old man, but he was gone. The fire was gone too. I thought, well that's weird, and I went back to make sure that I wasn't missing him somehow. I knew I was right though. I felt the tree, and it wasn't even warm. I kicked some needles around, but there was absolutely no sign of a fire ever being there. No sign of a body laying down. Nothing. It was like he never existed. Like the fire never existed. The funny thing was, though, I wasn't really scared or freaked out, as he had seemed so benign. Like he was on my side. It's really hard to describe. So this happened 15 years ago to my brother and I, and I still can't come up with a satisfactory logical answer to explain our experience. For detail, this happened in Ontario, Canada, and we were 8 and 5. I was 8 and he was 5. It's a suburban area built around a medium-sized forest, and our house backs into the woods. We were driving home with our mom, and we were arguing, so she told us to get out and work it out before we came home. She dropped us off in front of the woods at the playground. There's a connected public path leading back up through the woods to our street, it's about a five minute walk, and a small hill between the playground and the main road. We were not pleased that we got in trouble, so we made up quickly and started playing on the slide and the swings. My brother was up on the slide platform, and I was over on the swings when he called down to me. Who are those guys? I looked over and I saw two men dressed in black suits, white shirts, and black sunglasses coming over the top of the hill toward us. They were walking briskly and purposefully, right in our direction. They had brown hair, 
not close-cropped but short, and had fairly pale skin. It was beyond bizarre, and they scared me right away. I told my brother to come down the slide so we could go home. They had already unnerved him enough that he actually listened to me. We started down the path home, and when I looked over my shoulder, they were still coming toward us, walking quickly. That was horrifying, so I started to walk even faster too, holding my brother's hand and pulling him along. Maybe 30 seconds later, I looked behind me again, and they had started to run toward us. They weren't sprinting, more of a jog, but they were bigger, so they were gaining on us fast. That pushed us over the edge into complete terror. I screamed at my brother to run home as fast as he could. I knew that he was a faster runner than me, and I thought that he would be able to tell our parents if I ended up being kidnapped. I have honestly never run faster in my life, and we didn't look behind us again until we made it to our house. Our parents were still unloading the groceries and were surprised when we ran up out of breath and on the verge of tears. They figured that we had gotten spooked on our own. After all, some guys in suits chasing us was a pretty weird story. The men never said a word. It was like a wall of silence had accompanied them. Neither of us have ever experienced anything like that again, and it wasn't until last year, when I watched a BuzzFeed Unsolved episode about men in black encounters, that I realized that was what we'd seen. Has anyone else had an encounter? Or does anyone have any theories about who those men could have been, if you don't believe in the men in black? I'm a 28-year-old male who lives in British Columbia, Canada. This experience had happened when I was about nine years old. During the time, we used to live by a heritage site which was called the Pillith House. You can Google it if you want some more background. My family and pretty much the entire neighborhood used to refer to this house as the Creepy Doll House every time we drove by or spoke of it. This experience had happened on a windy, somewhat rainy fall day. I was sick that day, so my mom made me stay home, and I didn't have to show up to school. At the time, it was only my mom and I at home. I had two older sisters that were in high school, and my dad was at work. My mom used to sew clothes for a living and worked from home a couple of days during the week. Right outside the rear sliding door that exits to the backyard, we built a small shed, like a room area, where my mom could sew and store her sewing machine and supplies. She would be in there a couple of hours a day and would check up on me when it was time for lunch and things like that. On this particular day, it was a normal sick day for me, just like every other sick day. I woke up, had some cereal, and turned on the TV to watch some Barney while my mom was in the backyard sewing her clothes. The couch that I was on was facing the TV, so my head was turned to the left. In front of me was a black glass fireplace with a reflection where my two feet were facing. We also had a hallway that would lead up to the bedrooms where my head was pointing at. As I was watching Barney, I remember this pretty vividly, I noticed a dark figure with its knees bent, hunched over and swaying side to side with its arms bent out on the reflection of my fireplace. This figure continued its dancing for a couple of seconds until I turned around to look down the hallway and nothing was there. It was almost as if it was mimicking what Barney was doing on TV. I wasn't frightened because I thought it could have just been one of my siblings home for lunch or just screwing with me. I called out to my siblings by name, but nobody answered. I even ran down the hallway and checked out all the rooms, but again nobody was there. I ran out to get my mom and told her what happened, 
so we both came inside to look around, but the house was empty. But here's the strangest part. As we were coming out of the hallway, the front door slammed open, so I had to go downstairs and close and lock it. It was windy that day, but the door should have been locked. We didn't really think much of it, and just sort of brushed it off. Fast forward more than ten years later. By this time, we had already moved out. My sister had come to visit me and my parents, and we were talking over lunch. My sister had recently learned that her friend's dad works for the government, and was assigned to take care of and maintain the Pillith House. She only brought this up because, again, the Pillith House used to be right beside us. This would require him to stay a night, so he could wake up and do yard work. Apparently, he has had some frequent experiences in that house, such as random footsteps, knocking, but mostly someone jumping on his bed while he was trying to sleep. He was never bothered by it because it was so frequent it just seemed normal. He mentioned that there was the spirit of a little boy and a man in that house. As she was telling us this, I immediately connected the dots. I'm pretty sure I met the little boy, and I'm pretty sure he just wanted to play. I have a ghost in my life, and I have named him Toby. The name from the Paranormal Activity franchise. It's to make light of a creepy situation. Oddly enough, I would say that 98% of my encounters with my ghost, I was never alone. There was usually another person with me when he would make an appearance. This all started with a single photo that I took. I should give more context. So before I moved out for school, I lived on an acreage with my dad and brother, and this area has small abandoned buildings everywhere that can be easily explored. So between the ages of 17 and 18, I had some friends over, two guys and three girls including myself, and we would go exploring and get our spook on. We had some scary moments, but I am also chalking it up to overactive imaginations and purposefully scaring each other. This time was no different than the others, we thought. We went to this little church near my dad's house and we did some exploring. We managed our way in and looked around. The girls and I spooked ourselves and hightailed it back to the truck, and the guys were laughing at us. I decided to take a picture of them. I was periodically taking photos throughout the night. The next day we all woke up and I was looking through my photos and noticed that I had captured something else in one particular photo. It really creeped me out, but it eventually was just forgotten. Not long after I started having nightmares and these nightmares are recurring and can last anywhere between one night to a whole year. I am 24 years old now, and I still get them. Initially, I didn't put two and two together, until a friend of mine noticed my ghost and nightmares started happening at the same time. My nightmares are also important to my spooky happenings, or at least I feel like they are. Now for the meat of the story. A few months after graduating high school, I moved eight hours away from home with my best friend and then boyfriend for college. At the time, I have been getting this particular nightmare of a horse being dismembered alive, and I was stuck in place and couldn't do anything to help. It was disrupting my sleep, and I would say that I was having this nightmare anywhere between one to three times a week for a year. A year and a half later, after moving to this new city, things happened and my best friend and I were looking for somewhere else to live. We'd asked a friend that we'd become very close with to move in with us. We found a little three-bedroom townhouse on the west side of the city. We also had the best friend's brother and my cousin staying in the basement temporarily. It was a cramped house, but we made it work. 
The townhouse is when Toby made his first appearance. The layout of this place was simple. You walk in, there are stairs going up to your right, and straight ahead, you can see the kitchen and living room. They were separated by a wall. I believe this was a Friday or a Saturday night in the winter time in Canada, because I remember fondly that I was home alone and the others were out being busy. I was in the living room studying with no TV on, and I heard this very distinct man sneeze come from the kitchen. I just froze because it was so unexpected and so close. I remember going through the entire house to see if I was truly alone. Once I realized that I was indeed by myself, I called my best friend and told her to come home because I was scared. They ended up laughing at me because they just assumed that I had an active imagination, but oh boy, were they going to find out that they were wrong. Around this time, I was nightmare-free for maybe a few months, and after Toby's first appearance, they started up again, but it was a different one. I had a recurring dream of me watching this man being eaten alive by a bear, and again I was frozen in place and I couldn't help. So a month or so after the sneeze, my friend and roommate and I were watching TV. We were the only ones home at the time, and our stairway had photos and paintings and frames. Every single one of them came crashing down at the same time. The stairway has no windows in it, and it was cold outside, so no wind could have knocked them down. We went to investigate, and every single one of them was on the ground. We were pretty scared at that point, but we hung them back up. Over a period of time, we would learn that we couldn't keep anything on the walls. After some time, we had to move out due to the landlord selling the place, and we moved to this condo. It was a beautiful place. I started getting more and worse nightmares, and they were alternating between four dreams. Two events happened in this condo, and I also forgot to mention that I had two cats this entire time they began to interact with Toby in this place. For the first occurrence, all of us were sitting on the couch in the living room, and the couch is parallel with the stairs going up. It was nighttime, and both cats got fuzzy-tailed and stared intently upstairs, growling. Everyone who lived at this place was in the living room. It creeped us out, but we just made a joke out of it and tried to keep it light. For the second occurrence, I was having a brand new nightmare. In my dream, I was actively being decapitated, and in real life, my neck was getting hot. I couldn't breathe, and I felt like I was falling out of consciousness, but I woke up screaming, crying, and holding my neck. Then I thought I saw something by the door. My then-boyfriend woke up to my screaming and said he thought he saw something in the room, but that it was so dark it could have been nothing. I hadn't mentioned that I also saw something until after he said something, and this is when I started to fear Toby. We lived there for about a year and a half, roughly, before the other girls moved in with their boyfriends, and I moved into a big house that my then-boyfriend's family owned. The mother and sister said that they felt uneasy in that house when they visited, but I figured it couldn't be worse than my nightmares. So, I had two people move in with me, and they experienced things as well. The nightmares were becoming less severe, and I was down to just one nightmare, maybe one to two a week, and it was a small kitten being tortured. It made me really sad in real life, and I would wake up unhappy. This house has two sub-basements, and the first sub-basement was a second living room. The second one had a bedroom with no windows, a bathroom, and a laundry. Our stuff was going missing and then turning up in random places. The front door would just open. My brother came down to visit me, and my other two roommates were working. We were watching a spooky movie in the living room sub-basement, and my one cat was sitting on the arm of the couch that we were sitting on. She quickly turned her head toward the stairs, going down, got up all fuzzied up, and stared intently at the darkness. 
Her eyes followed something that we couldn't see to the stairs going up. She laid back down, but wouldn't look away from the stairs. My brother looked at me and said that that was damn creepy, and I agreed. A couple of months later, I was doing laundry, and my roommate's bedroom door starts to shake quite violently as he was headed to his room. We both just stood there, looking at the door, perplexed, and suddenly it just stopped. He didn't want to enter his room alone, so I went in with him for peace of mind. Everything was normal in the room, so I left to finish the laundry. It was rather creepy. I moved again. I know, I move a lot. And I lived with my best friend and her boyfriend in June 2018. This is when all Toby occurrences and nightmares completely stopped. Like, as soon as I moved in. It was wonderful. I took the silence for granted, though. A week before Christmas, I experienced my first form of sleep paralysis, and I say form because it wasn't the classic type of sleep paralysis. This scared me so badly, to the point that I could not sleep at all the rest of the night and was noticeably off for the day. My sleep paralysis, I had no idea that I was asleep. Like, honestly, I had no idea that I was asleep. I thought everything happening in my dream was real. I could move, or it felt like moving. In this dream, I was on YouTube, and randomly a deep web YouTube took over. This horribly graphic video was flooding my screen, and I felt the panic of trying to get rid of it, to force it to shut down. But the videos just wouldn't go away. I was in full panic mode, and I couldn't stop it. And then I woke up. I was really bothered because I had zero idea that I was asleep. I felt like I could feel the laptop in my hands, and I still felt the panic. After that radio silence since March of 2019, my male cat, who was six, died suddenly with no previous medical conditions. My friends believe it was Toby. I moved in with my current boyfriend, and I hadn't had any nightmares since Christmas of last year and no Toby, until last weekend. He plucked the boyfriend's acoustic guitar loudly and distinctly, and I also had a new nightmare last night. So far, these are all of my occurrences, but this is definitely an ongoing situation. I just want to live my life in peace. Update. So, this morning, my boyfriend wakes me up at 5.30 a.m. He leaves at 6 a.m., and I wake up at 7 a.m. I had a new nightmare in that hour of being alone. I woke up to this feeling of just gloom since I hate these types of nightmares. My cat sits with me as I put on my makeup on the couch and I hear stuff falling and quiet thumps downstairs. I found the blanket cupboard was open and all of the blankets were on the ground. I can only imagine what Toby will do next. I have always enjoyed the paranormal for entertainment, but kept with me a healthy dose of skepticism when it came to real life stories. Growing up, my mother was very much into the supernatural or anything paranormal. Psychics, ghosts, the afterlife, you name it. This instilled in me from a very young age a skeptical outlook on things of this nature. Instead, I would learn how psychic and paranormal experts fake evidence or cold read and things of this nature to basically debunk my mom, although I was always entertained by her stories on some level. She would always tell me stories about my supposed gift to communicate with ghosts from a very young age, and how my family members refused to babysit me because I creeped them out too much. I also have a lot of memories of being young and strange, unexplainable and downright creepy things happening to me all the time, but I would cope with it by justifying how there must be some logical explanation such as sleepwalking, or just my overactive child's mind or something. 
There is one experience, though, that always stuck with me that I witnessed as an adult. I wouldn't say it changed my mind, but there is something about this I cannot let go of or rationalize away. I even get a little bit emotional and start to tear up a little when I think about it today, which is unlike me. I am now 28 years old, but when I was 21, I worked in a four-star hotel and spa named Earth Castle in Scotland, located just outside of Stirling, where many of the bloody and violent wars Scotland is historically known for took place. This is a real place and already has a reputation for being haunted. I want to tell you my experiences of working in this hotel and the strange events I experienced while working there. To give context, the hotel is made up of two main buildings. The first is a new building, a typical hotel where the guests stay with luxury dining and spa, etc. The other building is the castle itself, which is mainly only used for weddings and one time Sean Penn stayed with us while filming a movie. That was pretty cool. I worked as a kitchen porter. My job was to wash dishes, clean up, basically all the kitchen duties which didn't involve cooking to allow the chef to focus on preparing the food. Whenever there was a wedding that needed to be catered for, some of us would be sent up to the castle to work there. Eventually, I refused to work in the castle. Of course, the staff there knew about the castle's reputation and would tell each other stories about what they had heard. In my skeptical mind, I simply rationalized it as local entertainment and just got on with my work. One of the most frequent occurrences that would be reported is that whenever guests would stay in the castle, they would phone the front desk in the main building and tell us that they could hear children playing and running around and ask if we could send somebody up to deal with the children. There never were any children in the building. The castle was always reserved for the bride and groom to have the place to themselves. I cannot stress how common this complaint was. Almost everyone who stayed in the castle reported the same story of being disturbed by the sounds of children playing in the hallways. Sometimes, late at night, I could hear the running coming from the upstairs balcony in the central room of the castle. If I was ever brave enough to go investigate, it would stop. The basement floor of the castle has been turned into a few guest rooms and a storage space for the staff to use. It looks like any other floor of a hotel, not the creepy basement of a castle that you might expect. There are reports that this floor is haunted by a groundskeeper, and I also have a few stories about people telling me about a phantom dog they could hear barking. I never encountered either of these spirits, but the reason that I'm mentioning it is that the basement floor of this castle especially terrified me. Every time I was there, I felt the most uncomfortable feeling, like when people tell you that they feel like someone's watching them. That entire floor gave me the most uneasy feeling, as if I could feel someone breathing down my neck or I was surrounded by something. I was never able to go down there without feeling stiff and having the most horrible feeling of dread come over me. It's hard to put into words. I hated going down there. If you stand outside the castle facing it, there's a dining room just to the left of the entrance on the ground floor. In this room, there's an enormous painting of a woman. I forget who she is, a wife of the commander or something who lived there. This painting was also especially creepy. She has such a stern look on her face which I guess was common for that era and style, very regal looking. There were a lot of unexplained noises that came from the area this painting is located in, like knocking, banging, things like that. One time, a group of us were standing in that room commenting on how depressing the painting looked, only to be interrupted by a slow scratching noise that went all the way from the top to the bottom of the 10 foot high wall that the painting was hanging on. Old castles like this do not have hollow walls, not like a loose piece of stone could have been falling inside, which was my first thought. We could never figure out where this noise came from. The most frightening moment inside that castle happened one night during a wedding. 
The chefs had finished with their jobs and had taken everything back down to the main building. I was left in the kitchen to finish washing up and cleaning. The guests had left and the bride and groom were, well, it's not my business what they were up to, but they were off in their suite. The only other people in the castle were a few remaining wait staff also finishing tidying up. I went out the side door to the castle to have a cigarette. The southwest corner of the kitchen was the entrance to the kitchen. The southeast corner was the washing up area where I was working. And the northeast corner was a passageway to a small room where we kept plates, cutlery, and a walk-in fridge. When I came back into the kitchen after finishing my cigarette, I could hear someone working in the back room, moving cutlery around and stacking plates. The normal sounds of someone else working, so I paid no attention to it and got back to washing dishes. After a few minutes, I heard the working sounds from the other room stop, and the room fell silent for a while. It sounded like nobody was moving, which I thought was strange. Another piece of information that you need to know is that another one of the girls I worked with and I would play this game where we would try to creep up on each other and scare the other person. When the sounds of the working stopped, there was an unusual silence. So I figured, aha, this is that girl and she's about to try to scare me. My plan was to continue working like normal. And then when she jumped out to try to scare me, I would be just as cool as a cucumber and be like, nice try. I waited for a full minute and she never jumped out. I waited for a second minute, still nothing. Thinking she was just really committed to this joke, I went to investigate. I walked into this room and nobody was there. I cannot describe how hard my heart jumped when I walked into the room to find it empty. I started questioning my own sanity and kind of freaking out. I definitely heard someone working back there for a good 30 to 60 seconds before it stopped. The workstations the chefs used formed kind of an alley you had to walk through to get out of the kitchen. Nobody could have left that kitchen without walking directly by me washing dishes. And since I was on high alert, I definitely would have noticed somebody leaving. The incident really freaked me out. I had to leave the building for a while and I really didn't want to go back in to finish my shift. Another time, I was working in the same kitchen, and the night security guy came through looking confused and told me to follow him. This security guy also had more than his fair share of creepy stories while walking around this building at night, but back to that in a minute. He took me through to a room at the back, which had a small bar and was used to entertain the wedding guests sometimes. This room was not in use that night. He asked me to tell him if I could smell anything. Upon stepping into the room, I immediately was hit with an overwhelming smell of cigar smoke. He insisted that nobody had been using this room and the guests had left a while ago. Apparently, this room was previously used as the aforementioned commander's study, where he would draw up battle plans and spend time alone. Since I was normally working quite late, I knew this night security guy pretty well. We talked about all the creepy stuff that we had both encountered in the castle, and he was insistent that it was not just stories. He began telling me of all his stories and just how commonly they occurred. After all, he was the guy who had to go check the castle out every time a guest complained about the children running around. He told me that his encounters were so frequent and impossible to ignore that he had begun to do deep research into the history of the castle and its previous inhabitants. Apparently, there were two children who had died in a fire there once, the children of the woman in the painting in the dining room. Their nanny had run back into the building to try to save them and was also killed in the fire. The night security guy told me that he had personally taken a photograph of the castle and in one of the upstairs rooms, slightly left of the entrance, you could clearly see a nanny with two children standing in front of her, looking out the window at him. Although shaken from other strange experiences, my rational, skeptical mind was still there. 
He was a tall, slim man in his 40s, spent a lot of time alone, walking around a castle, investigating disturbances constantly. I figured he might have been exaggerating or making it up just for a good ghost story. But the next day, he brought in the photo and showed me. In the upstairs window, just like he said, were two children and their nanny looking directly out the window. Clear as day. I don't know if that man still works there or not, but he owns a picture that will give you the creeps. He doesn't seem to have put it online anywhere. I looked. If anyone from Earth Castle reads this, and a man matching that description still works there as a night security guard, tell him I'm looking for that picture. Once he showed me this photo, that was the last time I was ever in that castle. Every time a wedding was happening, I would refuse to go cater for it. I'm not going, send someone else, I would say. Eventually, I was fired from that job because the manager and I would frequently fall out over this. But honestly, I don't care. I never wanted to go near that place again. Despite keeping my skepticism, I admit there was something about that place that just wasn't right. I will remember that job and that castle until the day I die. Just thinking about being back in that building gives me the creeps. In the seaside town where I went to university, there stood some awesome castle ruins parallel to the promenade. Two years ago now, and in my final year, I used to go to the ruins at night to chill with my friends. Sometimes we would play a hide-and-seek style game called Murder in the Dark, where we would try and scare each other when we found the opposing team. One night, we were there playing the game two-on-two, -two, and I was searching on my own on one side of the ruins. Bear in mind, it was the early hours and I had a phone with little battery, so I couldn't use my torchlight all the time. The crevices of the ruin and the pitch black sent my tired imagination into overdrive. I became emotional and started crying at the war memorial that was next to the ruins whilst trying to find my friends. I didn't feel upset or scared, it just overwhelmed me, so I put it down to being in the dark. Maybe it made me more vulnerable. When walking back to my flat, I could honestly feel like somebody was following me and getting closer. I kept looking over my shoulder to be sure there wasn't an actual person walking from the footsteps I could hear, only to see an empty street every time. It took a couple of days for anything terrifying to happen, and when it did, when it started, I felt a heavy sense of dread fill my bedroom and follow me around the flat. The strange thing to me was that it never followed me outside when I was out of view of the building I lived in, like whatever it was couldn't travel far from where it had decided to settle. Moving forward a couple more days, and I experienced during the day an inability to leave my bed. I wasn't being held down at this point, it was more because I could feel a heavy mass loitering in my bedroom doorway that was constantly watching me. I was too scared to go to the bathroom or kitchen when my flatmates weren't home, and I missed classes. I didn't know what was wrong with me. A week had gone by, and I had started sleeping with my lights on, not to mention the very vivid nightmares that made me too freaked out to close my eyes by choice. Even so, I fought to sleep, but the entity had drained me and started shadowing me when laying in bed. It could have been sleep paralysis for all my flatmate knew when I told her, yet it felt so real. I went so far as to make crosses by tying two paintbrushes together with an elastic band and sticking it above my bed. They didn't work. I was being pinned to the bed by unseen hands while awake and a weight was on my chest randomly during the day and night, only ever in my bedroom. I also saw a dark figure waiting for me by my bedroom window when I had mustered the strength to go out and buy food. 
It was watching me walk down the street toward the building, and I could feel its eyes on the back of me when walking into town. This happened all day, every day, until I felt too scared to go back to my flat for two consecutive nights of the second week that this was happening. I stayed on my best friend's sofa, and with her being into tarot and spiritual healing, she lent me two of her crystals to take back with me to see if they would help keep the entity at bay. I always believed in spirits, and open to my friend's interests, I gratefully took the crystals with me. She had also told me to keep hold of the crystals for as long as I needed them and to be forceful with the entity, to tell it to leave me alone, even if I had to scream at it to show my inner strength. That I was more powerful than it thought I was. The final night of my two weeks in hell, I did everything she had said, and when I got inside, I laid the crystals on the end of my bed and got into my pajamas. When I turned around, the crystals had disappeared. Worried that my friend would go mad if I told her I'd lost them, I said nothing about them for almost a month. It took around two days from when I had the crystals for the dark atmosphere to completely clear. My room felt a safe haven again, and I was able to sleep peacefully without fear. Forgetting all about the crystals, I had moved my bed to clean behind it. When I lifted the mattress, the crystals were on the floor underneath the head of my bed. I took them back to my friend, confessed what had happened, and she suggested the entity must have tried to steal the crystals so that I couldn't use them against it. If it were a true explanation as to why the crystals disappeared when they did, the entity must have been abolished or sent back to where it had come from the moment it came into contact with them. For the rest of the academic year, I kept the cross above my bed for peace of mind and thankfully, the entity never returned to darken my doorway again. I had an experience with the infamous Franklin Castle in Cleveland, Ohio, back in July of 2009. For those not already familiar with the castle, I strongly recommend looking it up. There are a ton of websites that have articles about the history of it, including the known facts, legends, and personal encounters. In July of 2009, my then boyfriend's brother got a free reservation for a guided group tour of Franklin Castle and invited my then boyfriend and myself to tag along with him and his then girlfriend. I've always been fascinated by the castle, so I was pretty excited. I'm not 100% sure that the tour was legal or that the guide even had permission to enter the castle, but regardless, we went. All of the info the guide gave me matched up with everything I had read about it, so at least he was well informed. The guide started outside at 11 p.m. We were in the yard of Franklin Castle, just staring up at it, and all I could keep thinking about was how long I'd wanted to go in there, and I was finally about to. Once everyone that had reserved a spot for the tour arrived, we started. There were about 20 to 25 of us. The guide took us around the outside of the castle, telling us about it, and then we headed in and went to the first floor, which was the basement, where the servants' area initially was. Within about 15 minutes of being in there, I started to feel kind of funny, like overloaded. I knew what was coming and tried fighting it off, but I couldn't. I started to get dizzy and things started to get dark. I went and sat on the steps, freezing, pale and sweating it out. After about five minutes, I was okay to go on. It was just so intense. Things like this have happened to me before when I'm around immense amounts of energy like that. I think the energy of the house was just too much for my sensitivity. We carried on to the second floor, then the third floor. At this point, I was standing around with a couple of other people, listening to the guide tell us about the floor and any stories surrounding it. All of a sudden, 
I hear these light footsteps coming from above. I thought it was just my imagination, or maybe somebody went up there ahead of the guide. Then the girl next to me asks the guy next to her, did you hear that? One of them asked the guide if anyone had gone upstairs yet, and the guide confirmed that nobody had ventured to the fourth floor yet. Then we went to the fourth floor and wrapped up the tour. Part of me couldn't wait to get out of there, but another part of me wanted to look around some more. So I followed my boyfriend's brother and his girlfriend down to the third floor, then the second floor, and finally the first floor. I was walking behind my boyfriend's brother's girlfriend through the kitchen area, and she stopped in the doorway in the living area. I was standing behind her, and I suddenly got this overwhelming feeling of uneasiness, to say the least. I got out of there right away. I made my way outside and waited for the others. The tour was nice, and the castle was amazing. It was all torn up, though. Between the constant attempts at remodeling, the fire, and its age in general, it was in need of a lot of work and completely unlivable at the time. The guide stated that there were all these plans for it, but most never happened. It's been sold again since then. From what I've read online, the current owners have their own plans, but do not have any interest in doing tours. Only time will tell what's in store next for the castle. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends, which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I've never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the 10 of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. 
It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost ten years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and, embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick-or-treat thing around the surrounding village. I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night up to the old bendy spooky road you take up to the house and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. The scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway, which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around but it still freaks me out to this very day. The Preston Castle, standing tall and alone in the plains of California, was originally constructed in the 1800s as a prison boarding school for troubled young boys. Now that the school has been closed, it serves as a historical and haunted location that offers walking tours of the castle. For my 16th birthday, instead of throwing some big sweet 16 party like most people would, I decided to take a friend of mine to Northern California where we would explore as many haunted locations as possible and try to find evidence of ghosts. The Preston Castle was one such place we explored. My mom, my aunt, my best friend, for who the sake of anonymity will be called T, and I packed up our things and traveled north, arriving at the Preston Castle around 10 a.m. 
We entered the castle and decided to do the self-guided tour, which permitted us access to the first floor, the second floor, and the basement. The first floor was the least interesting of the three. When we entered the second floor, things started to get interesting. We came across a room filled with several children's toys, things like dolls, coloring supplies, and teddy bears. Using the EMF detector that I bought for the trip, I walked around the room to see if there were any changes in the electromagnetic field and came up with nothing. Then, when I was not moving, the meter spiked up to 12 when there was nothing in that same spot a moment before. I called my aunt over and showed her the reading while my mom and T moved on to the next room. While we stood there looking at the EMF, we noticed one of the crayons on the table begin to move on its own, despite the two of us being the only ones in the room. We both decided we should catch up to my mom and T. In the next room, we found T recording what she saw, a simple bedroom with a closet. Upon reviewing the recording later, we found a class three apparition. In the video, you can see a pale white arm sticking out of the closet that none of us could see when we were there in person. The rest of the second floor was pretty bland, aside from a few unexplainable spikes on the EMF meter. Unfortunately, she looked on her Snapchat later to see if she still had it, but today she doesn't have it saved to her memories and can't seem to find the footage. Finally, we arrived at the basement which was by far the scariest floor we were allowed in. The third and fourth floors were off limits to the public as the flooring was unsafe to walk on. We were walking through and we reached a room referred to as the chemical pool and it is exactly what it sounds like. Back when this was a boarding school, the boys that came to the school often had head lice or scabies. The solution the workers at Preston Castle came up with was to fill a pool with chemicals that could kill the lice and throw the boys in, forcing them to swim across. Several boys drowned or received injuries from the chemicals because of this. As we were looking upon the emptied chemical pool, I walked away from my group for a moment to scan the room with EMF. I was close to the corner of the room when the EMF spiked to 15 and I suddenly felt a hand tightly grip my thigh. I whipped around, expecting to see somebody from my group standing behind me. Perhaps they were trying to prank me, and we would laugh about it afterwards. But when I turned, there was no one there. My aunt called across the room, asking me what was wrong. I glanced down at my leg and saw a small white handprint on my thigh where I was grabbed. I explained to my group what had happened, but no one seemed to believe me until we were walking to the next room, where my aunt suddenly jumped and spun around to look at us. She asked which of us had touched her neck, but none of us had. The final room we explored in the Preston Castle was the entrance room. It was here the boys would have to sign in, back when the castle was still in use. Stepping into this room, it was easy to feel the immense temperature drop. The castle had no power, Therefore, there was no reason that room should have been colder than any of the others. This put us on edge immediately. So, naturally, I turned on the EMF. It was going crazy in there, giving us the highest reading that we'd gotten so far, which was 25. Obviously, we were freaking out about this, but we still wanted to explore more. Eventually, we decided that we weren't going to stay in there any longer. I was walking behind the rest of my group when an unexplainable strong force pushed me into T. That weekend was by far the scariest and most amazing birthday I have ever had. I have plenty of tales from that weekend as well as other ghostly experiences that were not from that birthday, but those stories are for another time.
Bruce's castle and cave on Ratlin Island is full of countless ghost stories and legends from local fishermen, hikers, and tourists. The island was a known sanctuary and hiding place for centuries until Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norrie overtook the island and castle. Those living on the island quickly surrendered, but Norrie's forces slaughtered the helpless 400 civilians and 200 castle defenders, including the sick, old, and young. Today, the castle is in ruins. People have reported hearing screams and cries coming from the old site. A ghostly figure of a man in old leather armor is often seen guarding the castle perimeter before he vanishes. One spirit attempts to interact with people. She is the brown lady and walks the castle grounds and approaches visitors as if she is trying to speak, but she never says anything before fading away. The cave on Ratlin Island is believed to be the most haunted place in Northern Ireland. It is thought to have been bewitched long ago by the pagans who first inhabited the island. People report hearing moans and whispers coming from deep within the cave. Legend says that the Scottish King Robert the Bruce and his men hid in the cave from the English after a brutal defeat, waiting for their forces to regroup during the First War of Scottish Independence. Robert the Bruce eventually defeated the English and was recognized as the true King of Scotland. According to local folklore, the King never died, but he and his men returned to the old cave and entered into an enchanted sleep, waiting until the day they will awake and unite the people of Scotland to defend against those who attack it. Recently, a group of fishermen settled into the cave to take a break and make tea. As they gathered and poured their cups, a hand appeared out of the darkness and placed an extra cup out to be filled. The fishermen quickly poured their mysterious guest a cup, but were too afraid to look up and see what was lurking in the darkness. The hand disappeared back into the depths of the cave with its cup. Fairies regularly travel from Ratland Island to Ballycastle, where you will find another old haunted castle overlooking the sea which has been turned into a hotel. Ballygally Castle is over 400 years old and is haunted by three very active spirits. The most well-known is Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of Lord James Shaw, that only wanted a son so that he would have a proper heir. When Lady Shaw finally gave birth to a son, Lord Shaw took the baby from her and locked his wife in a tiny room at the top of the castle. One report says Isabella grew restless and possibly went insane in the room. She finally tried to escape, only to fall to her death. Others said that Lord Shaw, or someone he hired, threw Isabella out of the window at the top of the castle. Now, Isabella roams the castle in search of her baby. Guests hear strange noises, witness a mysterious green mist, and sometimes smell the old vanilla scent the lady was known to wear. She is most often seen in the tiny old room she was imprisoned in. Today, it has been fittingly named the Ghost Room, which guests can stay in if they so choose. Madame Nixon lived in the hotel during the 19th century and is thought to be the second ghost that roams the castle at night. Guests often report mysterious footsteps and glimpses of a phantom woman wearing a silk dress roaming the halls. The sound of a child running around, playing and laughing is often heard around the castle grounds, even when no guests have children with them. The restless child is known to play pranks on guests and staff. He loves to knock things over, unfold sheets and towels, so that unsuspecting staff will open locked rooms only to mysteriously find them in disarray. Apparently, a medium stayed at Ballygally Castle, and one night she detected, quote, more spirits than there were guests staying in the hotel. In the summer of 2019, 
I became fixated on this ruined castle hidden deep within the woodlands, a day's cycle from where I lived. It is by no means easy to access. We often rode our bikes there, and there was a lot of lugging them through the mud, up hills, and down hills that were too narrow for a bike. Every week in June, my buddy and I would ride out to this castle, pack lunch, and make a day out of it. I still have fond memories of those cycles. The castle itself harbored an underground chamber that could be accessed by a small tunnel, leading you into this subterranean room that was strewn with rock and plastered with graffiti. I haven't been to the castle in a while now, but if I remember correctly, some of the graffiti read things like, no one leaves and Satan is good. Now is probably a good time to mention that the castle has a long past with rituals and so-called devil worshipping. I've had three peculiar happenings at the castle, and I suppose I'll tell them from least likely to be paranormal to most likely. It was by no means a summer day. The sun made the occasional appearance, but mostly remained hidden by clouds. To me, it seems like the way to get to the castle is always guarded by an unholy amount of mud, even if it hadn't rained for days. So our bikes would always be splattered by the time we got home. Once under the shaded canopy of the trees and with the mud far behind us, we approached the ruins with the same amount of giddiness we always did. Our giddiness was shattered though, when we heard the sounds of children floating down from the ruins. We liked having the castle to ourselves, which in hindsight is pretty selfish. But upon arrival, we found that no children, no families, nobody at all was present. This struck us as odd, seeing as the castle sits on a hill. We ruled out that any family would dare venture down the steep slopes, especially if they had children, and we never heard any children's voices again. The second incident was when I was waiting outside the entrance of the tunnel, about to duck down and head inside, when I heard a sharp whistle right beside my ear. It was as if somebody had placed their mouth mere centimeters from my ear and whistled. The third and final incident was when we brought candles to the castle to take some nice photos of the illuminated chamber. The chamber itself is littered with dried leaves and being paranoid that a rogue spark from the match could potentially cause a fire, we lit them outside and carried them in. On the fourth or fifth candle, while I was lighting a match, there was a thunderous hiss from inside, so loud that I often tell people it was as if a giant snake was in there. Fearing that something had caught fire, I rushed in to find everything the way it was. No fire, with the candles flickering silently. Those are the three occurrences that I've had a hard time explaining. I've been to the castle since, but nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm sure I'll be returning to the castle soon now that summer has once again rolled around. So, who knows? Maybe I'll have more stories then. I was a guest at Abbey Glen Castle in Ireland on October 28th through 30th of 2019. It was a stay for my birthday. We arrived and were overwhelmed with the kindness and hospitality we experienced. We arrived late, so we dropped our bags in our room and headed for dinner in the restaurant with the piano. Our table was adorned with the Ireland and American flags a special touch for us as your international guest, I suppose. We enjoyed our dinner, and just after dessert, we were treated to a piano serenade. As we prepared to leave, if memory serves me correctly, the piano player, dressed in a nice suit, offered to take our picture. As we left the restaurant, we were handed a great picture documenting our trip. We retired to our room, ready to sleep after a long day of travel from Derry up north. That night, we struggled to be made comfortable. Both my partner and I felt a strange presence in the room. Neither of us mentioned it to the other upon awakening. 
but shortly after breakfast, while shopping, we compared our strange feelings. We were both shocked that the other had felt this presence. Though we had booked the stay for two nights, we politely returned our keys to the front desk and decided to forego our second night and leave to Limerick. Fast forward three years since returning. My partner has displayed the picture in our room. We have looked, passed, and gazed at the picture no less than a hundred times, always with fond memories of Ireland. But a few weeks ago, with a normal glance, she saw an image in the picture that clearly looks like a ghost or apparition as the third party to our dinner picture. We were both kind of freaked out by this sighting. Maybe it was there all along. Maybe it's our imagination. Maybe it's real. Who knows? We have shown the picture to numerous confidants and simply asked, what do you see? Without fail, they all see the third party in our couple picture. I visited Dudley Castle in England today with a friend, a very historically significant place, and apparently very haunted. The main attraction is the zoo, Dudley's zoological gardens and castle, but one of the enclosures, the castle creatures part, is within a section of the castle itself. There's a room that displays the history of the castle, and as we were reading the information, we both felt sort of uneasy as if somebody was behind us. Note that the zoo was very empty today. My friend jumped away, saying that somebody had touched her arm. We stood for a second and moved on through the exhibition, feeling a little shaken, but in a sort of way excited too. As we nearly approached the bat enclosure, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye and a third shadow appeared behind us as if somebody was striding toward us. We had seen absolutely nobody inside the enclosures, and the layout of the building means that the noises often echo throughout the tight halls, but there was nobody there. We quickly ran out of the enclosure, terrified but still kind of excited. Something else to note is that my mother has experienced some potentially paranormal activity in this building, specifically inside of the bat enclosure. As she went to leave, she backed away and said sorry to someone who was behind her previously, who apparently had disappeared. Both of my parents were adamant that there was somebody there that she nearly ran into and then disappeared the second she turned to apologize. Apparently, these are common experiences. As I said, Dudley Castle is apparently very haunted. So I'm just curious if anybody else has ever had an experience there or if there are any potential explanations, paranormal or otherwise. If you're from Northeast Ohio, you've definitely heard about Squire's Castle in Willoughby. And like many other places in Willoughby, Squires is said to be haunted. My whole life, I have said this is bogus. In fact, the ghost stories that I heard of it felt practically impossible. It's said that at night, through the windows, you can see the lantern light of the owner's wife who died there. This can't be true, because she didn't die there. But I don't know, whatever, I guess. Still, everything I believed about this place changed when some friends and I went ghost hunting the other night. We went in so excited. We had planned to walk up to the castle, look through, and maybe even explore the hiking trails afterwards, all late at night. It was drizzling, not very much, no big storms or anything at the time that we were out there. At right about midnight, driving towards Squires, maybe about a mile away, the three of us in the car saw a bright light in the sky, somewhat above where the castle was. One of us initially thought it was lightning, but it definitely wasn't. It was bright, produced no sound, and lasted just a couple of seconds. It happened twice, 
lighting up a circle of clouds in a white, bluish-purple light. We didn't think too much of it at the time, but now it feels like it should be included in the story. Then at about 12.05, we pulled up to Squire's Castle. From the road, before even pulling into a parking spot, we could see it. The lantern. There was an orange glow coming from inside the castle, and it was moving. Initially, I thought it was a house behind the castle. Then I remembered nothing was behind the castle except dense trees. It couldn't have been my headlights because they weren't even pointing that way, and we weren't moving. One of my friends thought it was just some teens exploring the castle like we had planned to do. But as we pulled into the parking spaces, we saw that there were no other cars and that the light had disappeared. After gathering enough courage, we left the car and started toward the castle. I was recording on a handheld camera. One friend was recording video on his phone and my other friend was recording audio on her phone. We walked all the way up until we could see the castle. I personally didn't see much, but my friends saw quite a bit. Watching his phone, my friend said things like, I saw something flash by on my camera, or there's something moving around inside. My other friend felt a little gross. If you've had the same kind of encounter, I'm sure you'll know what she means. She also said that she saw things moving inside that she was looking with just her eyes and no camera. My friend said she really wanted to go into the building, but my other friend and I wanted to get out of there, me especially. So we turned back toward the car and walked back. On the way back, we were still kind of exploring, thinking that maybe we could see things on the side of the path, but we weren't sure. Then my friend half jokingly said, I low-key want to go back up and into the castle. Shortly after she said this, boom, a heavy stomp could be heard right next to my friend. Nope, she said and ran. The two of us ran after her. My friend said that they heard the stomp and could feel the presence of something right next to them. We got in the car and drove off so fast. All of us were in shock. I was holding back tears. I didn't know what to feel. I had never experienced anything like that before. On our 20 minute drive home, we decided to examine our evidence. First up was the audio recording. We listened back to it and my friend stopped it shortly after it started. She was like, what? Why is it like that? That's so weird. The audio recording started as normal. We leave the car and then we're heading back to the car. The part of the recording where we walked up to the castle and all that was completely missing. We've never had any issues with her phone before. In fact, we've used that exact phone to catch the voices of multiple entities in the past. Then we moved on to the phone video. You can see lots of misty drizzle moving past the camera, and sometimes you can see my friend's breath. It was surprisingly cold for being 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit the whole day. But when we're up at the castle, the video gets a little spooky. We paused the video on the flashes that he saw earlier and saw single frames of shapes running past. These things were differently shaped and colored than the misty water droplets. These were the most terrifying things that we got from the trip, in my opinion. We also got one picture that was kind of clear and whatever it was, wasn't really too human shaped. Also, we could very faintly see shapes of people or reflections of eyes inside the windows. Then, on the way back from the castle, we didn't see anything in the video. Recently, I examined my video on a computer. Now, typically, people save the best for last, but my video was not the best. I saw very little within it, as it was very dark. But on our way up, we could see a couple of orbs, and on the way back, we could see small points that kind of looked like sets of eyes peering and blinking. Looking back on the experience, we are kind of filled with dread. My friend is very spiritually active and knowledgeable and feels that we could have been in some serious danger. 
She says she's definitely adding this to her list when she's felt unsafe from the presence of some kind of entity. I guess we might never know what exactly we experienced that night, but we'll never forget it. This happened a few years ago, but now it came back to my memory because of something I read recently. At the time of this, I was working for a private security company, and we were working at an event at Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. There were probably 10 to 15 of us scattered across the darkened castle in winter. It was really early in the morning, probably about 1 to 2 a.m., and a colleague and I picked the short straw of doing perimeter walk, where there is no light, not even from street lights nearby. So we have to do laps of the entire castle, along the wall with the moat on our right-hand side, in near darkness, bar the torches that we were allowed to carry. As we approached our second lap, near the longest stretch of the wall, I noticed footsteps in the darkness that weren't ours. We stopped a few times to check out this noise, but we could never pin it down to anything. It could have been an animal moving in the darkness, I suppose, but it just sounded strange. The next thing happened all within a few seconds, not really fast enough for us to respond. In the darkness, I noticed a figure of a man walking toward me. He was walking up from the moat to the right of us. As he approached, he said something along the lines of, Right Greeley, then walked straight past us into the solid 12-foot rock wall. In a complete state of shock, my colleague and I just confirmed with each other what we'd seen, that somebody had walked into a solid wall and vanished. Not gone over, not walked past, but walked directly into. We raised the alarm for an intruder just in case, but after a site-wide search, we never found anything of this guy who had walked up the slope. I am of Japanese descent, and each year, I go visit my family in the north of Japan. I also do the Obon, which is basically like the Japanese version of Dia de los Muertes, when all of the spirits of the dead come visit the land of the living. During this period, I decided to go visit Kyoto. After walking for a while out of the city, I began climbing a nearby mountain to discover a substantially sized cemetery. Being a young lad of 16 at the time, I decided that I would go exploring and see which families are interred here. It was about 3 p.m. and it was scorching. The trees here and there in the cemetery bore a welcome shade for me to cool down a little. After about 10 minutes or so of looking around the very old stone slabs, I realized a few odd details. First. It seems I somehow got lost in the cemetery. Mind you, I have an excellent sense of geolocation, and I've found my way out of many a forest, mountains, crowded airports, and such. The cemetery itself was lower in its middle part, and surrounded by woods, so I think it was in the lower part because the horizon was only tombstones. Second, it was getting dark. As I said before, it was around 3 p.m., so that was very odd, and the surroundings had that yellowish tinge you get at dusk. To make a small cultural parenthetical remark here, dusk in Old Japanese is called Tasogare Doki, and it's supposed to be the in-between moment when strange things occur. Not a good time to be surrounded by tombs. Third, I was getting a little cold. Not like I was plunged in an icy pool, but more like when you're in the middle of the mountains and you can feel some coldness through the gaps of your coat. After that, 
I began to see some weird shadows, or something, out of the corner of my eye. Very weird, because I wasn't feeling panicked or anything yet. I could calmly observe them. It was moving like these old lava lamps, very deliberately, and sometimes looked a bit human-shaped, or like huge faces. I was walking toward it, because I thought that if it could harm me physically, I could certainly punch it, right? But it was like a mirage, like it was fluttering. After a while, I started to feel like I was in real danger. I was getting colder and colder, and at this moment I saw a monk, who was very surprised to see me there, because the cemetery was supposed to be closed at this hour. He brought me back to the entrance, and I told him that it was open when I got there. He informed me that he was next to it all day, and he never saw me pass by. I assumed that he thought I went in by a fraction, so I told him everything that I saw and felt. He seemed very surprised at first, and then he told me to look at the hour. It was 6.10 p.m. That means I was in there for over three hours. He then told me that I shouldn't come here while the sun is setting, because I could have been taken away by the Kamikakoushi. Anyway, that was my very weird experience there. The cemetery was east of Kyoto, near the Shogunzuka mountain. I'd be interested to know if anybody else has had strange experiences there. When I was 17, I'm 24 now, I visited a cemetery at night with a small group of friends. We were just going to look at the graves, give a little love to the graves that looked like maybe nobody visited them anymore because they were from so long ago, and things like that. We were not going there to hurt anything, or mess around, or be disrespectful, because we were, and most of us still are, very spiritual. I had always liked cemeteries, and I feel a kind of peace when I'm in one, so I was very comfortable and relaxed there. I think that may be why what happened happened at all. I was following near the back of the group, lingering on some graves to read what was written, when everything just goes blank for me. The rest of what happens is what my friends told me about hours later. Hey, 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 this one's mine. I called to the next nearest people in the group. He turned around to laugh and tell me to quit playing around when he stopped. I shouldn't have died. Really, it wasn't my fault. Wh what do you mean? He asked, getting my other friends to stop and walk back to me. Well, you see, I was playing in the barn with the kittens and the man came in with a gun and bang. I don't think they would have believed that I wasn't the one speaking if the voice coming out of me hadn't been so much higher pitched and had a very, very country accent. I don't know why he did it, he was my daddy's best friend. For the next two hours, I led them around the cemetery, pointing out graves and telling them about the people buried there like I knew them. One of my friends had her phone out to use as a flashlight. She recorded everything I was saying so that they could fact check when we went back to the house that we were staying at. Eventually, I stopped again, frowning at a headstone. This one's my brother. He got to live a long, long time. It's not fair. I wanted to live too, I said, stomping my foot just before collapsing on the ground. I didn't wake up until we got home that night, and I remember that I had the worst headache of my entire life. My friends showed me the video, and then we all looked up as much as we could on the internet to see if I had been right. The grave that I had collapsed on top of had not been the brother of the girl who had supposedly possessed me. He had been the son of her father's best friend. The same best friend, who she said shot her. I've never been back to that cemetery since. I'm afraid that the little girl won't be the one to possess me next time. 
Unfortunately, my friend's phone is the one that had the video, and she doesn't have that phone anymore. We didn't really think to save it after we did our fact check. You can believe whatever you want, but everything that I told you is the truth. I have never been back to that cemetery since. I'm afraid that the next time, the little girl won't be the one to possess me. A few years ago, this girl that I liked and I went out one night. We were having a really fun time just goofing around. We bought some snacks and drinks and just wanted to find a spot to sit. It was kind of romantic because it was quiet and it was quite chilly out. We didn't pay much attention to that, as though each other's company was helping us keep warm enough, you know? Anyway. We see a cemetery, and although it's already past closing time, the front gate is open. We decided to go inside, as it was a place that we could have some privacy. We walk through the cemetery for a minute or so, and we see a bench to sit at. It's right by another gate, but that one was locked. We sit and talk and laugh, and then something pretty off-putting happens. On the other side of the cemetery, I see a white, almost transparent something rush by, disappearing behind a mausoleum. I told her about it, and she looked back as she had her back turned to that direction. We waited, and the cold began to kick in a little. She told me that she didn't doubt it. We were probably disturbing the dead, and there was probably a reason for the closing time other than routine maintenance. After that, we tried to exit the cemetery through the way that we had gotten in, but it was already locked. We were a little bit worried, but we were also kind of enjoying ourselves, as the situation was harmless. We didn't see anything after that, and just climbed over the gate next to the bench. This experience, not being the most clear one, only added to my already existing belief of the world that we choose to look away from every day. When this happened to me, I was so young that I actually don't remember all of it but I have heard all of it secondhand so many times that I know the story. The last time it happened with this particular ghost is actually my earliest memory. So when I was little, the very first house I lived in as a baby was this old 18th century townhouse that my parents rented from the local doctor. Suffice it to say, that place was super haunted. It's a story for another day, but three years ago, they finally sealed the upper floors off entirely, and the doctor told my mom that nobody will ever set foot up there again. The bottom floor is now the GP office and waiting room. All of this aside, growing up in that environment left me with a major sensitivity to spirits that is kind of still active sometimes, even though I'm 25 now. But when I was a kid, I terrified my entire extended family with the things that I would come out and say at random. Anyway, one of the more popular stories that my parents like to tell at barbecues and parties and really to anybody who will listen, happened when I was two and my mom wanted to pop in to visit her grandfather's grave. Her family is from a village about a 20 minutes drive away and there are two graveyards the new one, and the old one. My grandfather is buried in the old one in the old family plot. This graveyard has since been locked, and you have to get a key from the priest to get in. So, being two, I wasn't overly interested in sitting down by a graveside to pray with my parents, and they were happy enough to let me wander so long as I stayed in their sight. And luckily for them, I didn't go far. I bolted down the path and stopped 
about halfway back among the tombstones, where I started to sort of sway on the spot and dance as much as a two-year-old is capable of. My parents watched me for a few minutes, but didn't think much of it, and then told me that we were leaving. My dad picked me up, and we headed for the gate. But just before we left, I turned over his shoulder, looked around, and smiled and waved at something. They obviously didn't really think it was anything to be concerned about, because a week later they went back. My grandfather had died the day before their wedding four years earlier, and Mom had been very close to him, so they visited verily often. This time, when we went in, I didn't even wait for permission, and ran back down to the same graveside where I began swaying on the spot again, looking up over the grave in the air, as if something was suspended there. It's probably worth describing the grave, but there really isn't much to describe. It was a very small patch of earth that didn't even have a border, fairly overgrown, and with a totally rusted small iron cross at the head of it. There was no nameplate, no indication of who was buried there, and it clearly wasn't a recent grave. Keep in mind, literally nobody is buried in this cemetery anymore, except a couple more of my family members who went into the family plot. At this point, my parents are creeped out. My dad, who swears blind that he doesn't believe in ghosts and never will, came down to ask me what I was doing. I explained that I was dancing. He asked me why, and I pointed above the iron cross and, in the jumbled English of a toddler, said, The boy is singing and he wants me to dance. My dad picked me up, ran past my mother, and got into the car to wait for mom. They went to my great-grandmother's house across the street and told her the whole story, but they all agreed it sounded a bit more ridiculous the more they thought about it, and since I was only two, it was probably just me playing a game with myself to keep myself entertained. So they went back. They entered through different gates. They went over the wall. No matter what they did to try to confuse two-year-old me, I always went back to the same grave. And once again, there was nothing special about it. It wasn't beautiful or impressive. There was no reason for a two-year-old to be so drawn to this little patch of earth. But I always went straight there. I always danced while he sang to me, and I always waved to him before I left regardless of which side we left from or which winding pathway they took out of there. They brought other family members with them as witnesses. They had family friends question me about it, and I always told the same story. My earliest memory is of my grandmother sitting me down on the cemetery wall while I was trying to dance as instructed, while my parents looked at me, totally scared, and asked me to describe him or tell her what his name was. I don't think I answered her, but I remember finding the looks on their faces just so unbelievably funny because they were so afraid of my friend, who only wanted to sing to me. What I didn't know was that my great-grandmother had told the priest, brought him in there to show him the grave, and asked if there was any way to know who was buried in the little unmarked plot. He went off and checked the burial records, and, sure enough, Five-year-old Robert, the blacksmith's son, had died of tuberculosis nearly a century earlier and lay there, marked only by the little iron cross that his father had made for him. Funny enough, my great-grandmother knew the blacksmith. He was their next-door neighbor, but he was an old man when she was a little girl, so she never knew the boy. My parents stopped bringing me to see my friend after that, we only went into the cemetery for funerals. We also moved out of the doctor's house, but it was a few years before I stopped being a creepy little kid that terrified anybody that spoke to me. I actually did go back a couple of years ago, and I brought a friend of mine visiting Europe from Boston. She told me when we met that she could speak to ghosts, and after a couple of weeks, I started divulging the hundreds of stories I have from childhood. She asked if she could come to the cemetery with me. 
Since the gate was locked, we had to hop the wall, but once we were inside, she pointed clean across the top of the headstones and said, Hey, is it that one over there? Pointing at its location. I nodded and she started walking toward it and stopped right at the iron cross. It's this one, right? I nodded. I swear this is totally real. She stood there for a second, and then she started backing away. I didn't have to ask her why. It was in the middle of December, and yet the air seemed to fizzle and get really hot. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and the pressure that built up in my head made it feel like my scalp would split open. She told me she wanted to leave, but I was already running out of there at that point, and we vaulted the wall like Olympians. I don't know what happened that day, since I'm not a child anymore and didn't really see anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling afterward that my little friend there felt like I had brought her with me so that I could impress her, and that he didn't like that. Not at all. I live near Mount Hope Cemetery. It's the very same one that Stephen King mentions in his books, and the one that he cameos in in Pet Cemetery. Day and night, Mount Hope Cemetery is always unsettling. Every time I pass by it, I always feel like I'm being watched. Most of the time, it's an easy feeling to brush off, but there are three instances where I've been shook to the core. First, I was in the fourth grade. My whole class went on a field trip to the cemetery. From the very beginning when it was brought up, I expressed my lack of interest in going, but I was the only one not showing enthusiasm, so I knew then it was going to happen. I dreaded it, hoping that my teacher would decide to cancel the trip. I wasn't allowed to skip school as a kid, so I never even asked. I went to the cemetery with my class, and they were all having a wonderful time. I was immersed in vibes that were making me sick to my stomach. We were told to make rubbings on paper with crayon of at least three gravestones that caught our eye. I didn't want to, but I did anyway. While I'm rubbing these gravestones, I felt like I was stepping on the toes of someone and that I was bothering someone. I managed to rub two, the third I picked. My crayon was still in my left hand. I grabbed a piece of paper from the pile near me, but when I knelt down to begin rubbing it, I had an overwhelming feeling of anger wash over me. I stopped dead. For a second, I couldn't move. That gravestone didn't want to be rubbed. I tried to talk myself into reason. It's a 117-year-old rotted corpse. It can't possibly do anything. But to no avail, I could have forced myself to rub this one, but I thought that that wasn't best. I didn't rub a third one. I just couldn't get myself to do it. It freaked me out. I said it out loud to nobody in particular. There's something wrong with this grave. It doesn't... I stopped talking. I wasn't really comfortable talking about the experience to anyone around me. I knew that they wouldn't have believed me anyway. I know what I felt, and it wasn't peaceful. If I had rubbed that grave, someone, or something, would have attached itself to me, and it would have been nearly impossible to shake off. It was in the summer of 2012. I biked home from work. I worked at Wendy's. The cemetery was on my right. I looked because I saw somebody. I thought it was just a dumb teenager doing something stupid, but it wasn't. I saw two shadows watching me, one looming over a grave. It had long, creepy fingers and a thick, dark, malevolent energy that seemed so bent on anger and misery that it must have been an entity of pure evil. The other was a man, a shadow, standing right next to it. It was standing next to a thick tree. His top hat brim remained straight, 
even though as close as he was to that tree, the tree would have bent the brim. He must have been seven feet tall. The looming one lunged toward me. I yelled an expletive, completely sure that I was about to get possessed. The akimbo one flinched, and then they were both gone. I was still myself and relieved, heart pounding, but I was okay. The third. I was biking home again through Mount Hope Avenue. I almost got through the cemetery without seeing anything. Then, suddenly, two lights caught my attention. They were moving crazy fast. One was chasing the other. They crossed the road in front of me. The one lagging behind suddenly pounced. They let go. They both darted past the road and onto the other side. The moment they began getting smaller, they were gone. Of course, there are times when I can't avoid going past Mount Hope Cemetery. I have sensed other spirits and the like. I just completely downright refuse to acknowledge them. There's definitely something sinister about the cemetery, and part of me feels like there might be something that wants to latch on to me there. This is an experience that I've wondered about for a long time. When I was a kid, about five or six years old, I was really afraid of what might be under the bed. My parents knew this and rationally told me to look under the bed so that I could see there was nothing there. Anyway, one day I decided to try this out and to look under the bed. And sure enough, nothing was there. But then I looked into the air vent under my bed. Inside it, I saw a terrible pale white face, with bright red hair, staring back at me, with its eyes wide open. I ran away as fast as I could. It took me years to not feel uncomfortable whenever I was getting onto my bed. I would always run and jump onto it, in case it was there, watching. To this day, I still believe that I saw something, as it was incredibly vivid. I just don't know what it was. My husband's family inherited a lake home from his grandparents when they passed. His grandparents, he called them Mama and Papa, built the home but neither died there. In an effort to keep the house, my in-laws began flipping it so that they could rent it out via Verbo. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law both claimed that they started to have weird things happen, but nobody really believed them. I always felt uncomfortable late at night walking around to go to the bathroom, but I chalked it up to it just being dark and there's this wall of windows overlooking the lake at night, the lake is usually covered with mist, so it's beautiful and spooky. My mother-in-law claims that she's felt an impression on the bed. A renter has said that he saw the shadow of a man outside the sliding glass doors to the bedroom. It's on a peninsula and it's gated, so the only way in would be to drive blind to the end of the road and jump the gate or to swim up. My sister-in-law swears somebody ran their fingers through her hair in the bedroom. So basically, weird shit has happened, but not to us. The first time we took our daughter there, she was about 10 months old and really babbling at people. My husband called me in from the kitchen to show me what she was doing. She was following something with her eyes and talking to it. About a year later, we're sleeping in the guest bedroom. She's in a pack and play, which is like a portable crib. When I hear her saying, no, 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 Papa, no, no, Papa, in a scared little voice. My husband's dad also goes by Papa and looks a lot like his dad. So the whole thing was creepy. I shook my husband to go and get her, but by the time he got up, she was already laying back down. 
My husband is 100% a skeptic, and he laughed at me for thinking that she may have seen his grandpa. But two months ago, we went back to visit. This time, my daughter slept in one bed with me, and he slept in the other. His mom and sister had mentioned hearing things rattling and knocking around the house. We all kind of laughed at them. The last day we were there, we were drinking coffee, and he goes, I have to ask you something. Did you hear somebody knocking on our door last night? I didn't, but he was clearly shaken up by it. He said that he opened the door, thinking that it was his dad or sister, but there was nobody there. That pretty much solidified to me that my daughter had definitely been seeing things. This happened a few weeks ago. My wife was working late and I had just put our two-year-old down for bed. I left the hallway light on, told him that I loved him and left his door open just slightly. I headed into my office to finish up some work and occasionally I would glance at the baby monitor. I could tell he was just about to doze off, so I paid slightly less attention. Five minutes later, I look over and he's just staring at his door on his side and I can hear him talking. I'm hoping that he'll eventually go down, but he doesn't. So eventually I head to his room. I said, hey buddy, you okay? He says, daddy at door. I said, nope, daddy was in his office. He says, someone at door. I understand toddlers have immaculate imaginations, but crap, that is not what I wanted to hear. My daughter goes through bouts where she's scared of certain rooms in the house. She always has, even though we moved over a year ago. In our old house, when she was about two, we were going through our first experience with these monster fears. Nothing was working, so I decided to just start asking her about them. She would say, monster in room. I would say, oh, okay, well, what does it look like? dead. I would say, dead? Oh my, what is it doing? She replies, it say, help me. I said, well, what does it want help with? And she says, to go to the big light way in the sky. I finally told her to go help it, but that one freaked me out. She also used to tell us in great detail about what I think was a past life how she was getting married to a man named Jasper Cohen, and how she was in her, quote, marriage dress when a bunch of men came and stabbed her soon-to-be husband in the stomach. These things have kind of kept happening, and needless to say, they're pretty creepy. I was stationed on Okinawa, the most haunted World War II island, for four years. I had a friend who was a single parent. I offered to babysit her son, who was three at the time. We all lived on base, old Camp Foster, which the government has since torn down. A little bit about the base. A lot of Japanese people had family members buried on the base and would build small shrines to commemorate them. Every year, they were allowed on base to visit their family members. So basically, you have a bunch of military housing with random grave sites peppered throughout the base. I was watching her little boy when he came running out to me in the living room to tell me that there was a man in the corner of his bedroom. Obviously, at three years old and with a wild imagination, it was a little hard to grasp, but I followed him into the room anyway. 
He pointed directly into the corner and described this man in so much detail it gave me chills. He wasn't frightened at all, but it scared the hell out of me. He did this a few more times. He's now 15 years old and of course has no recollection, but I will never forget it. When I still lived at my mom's place, I used to share the same bedroom with my younger sister. As a child, she used to sleepwalk almost every night. Nothing creepy, just usually walking to my mom's bedroom or looking for the bathroom and then coming back to bed with the help of my mom. This stopped when she was around 10 years old and for around the next five years, nothing happened. I've always been super sensitive for sensing energies around me. For a long time, I'd felt a deeply bad energy at my mom's home and felt like someone was with me, looking at me all the time. I just felt purely unsafe. One night, I woke up to my sister sitting on her bed across the room, staring at nothing and talking quietly with her eyes fully open. I remember low-key laughing at first, before asking what on earth she was talking about. She didn't say anything to me, but stopped mumbling, while sitting up and staring at that same spot of nothing. I remember frowning and asking who she was talking to, and she turns to me and goes, to that man standing right there. The second she said that, I turned to face the space that she'd been staring at, and I didn't see anything, but I felt an overwhelming dark presence of something in the room. I started crying and literally ran into my mom's bedroom to tell her what had happened. Almost the scariest part about this was that my mom has never believed in anything supernatural or evil. She's Christian, but she only believes in God, angels, and the devil himself, and therefore she never believed our stories. But the second I told her this one, I could see the deep worry and fear in her face. It almost seemed like she had seen or experienced something too. My sister didn't remember any of this in the morning. For around a year, nothing happened, but then it all started again. Although that time, it was even scarier. But that's a story for another day. My son used to tell me about he and his sister and how they died in a basement when they had a different mommy and daddy. He has two sisters, so I would ask him which one, and he would always say that it was a different sister named Claire or Clara. It was hard to tell which one he was saying. He would go into detail about their dad locking them in the basement, how they heard gunshots, and how the fire would come and they couldn't get out. He would talk about it being so hot he couldn't breathe and really smoky, and then he would fall asleep. He was only three or four at the time, and every time he would talk about it, he was so consistent and very matter of fact. He hasn't talked about it in a few years though, and he doesn't remember anything about it when I ask him. My three-year-old, who is normally very happy-go-lucky, was extremely concerned the other day. He kept looking around the room, talking about the rhino. Who knows what a three-year-old might translate as a rhino. This went on for about 20 minutes, and he was very concerned and looking around the entire time. So we get to a point where he says, the rhino is moving. My wife asks where the rhino is, and he just says, he's coming to daddy. He, yeah, 
Um, I'm daddy and my ass puckered just a wee bit after that comment. Fast forward about four days and he starts talking about the ghost. My daughter asks my son, where's the ghost? And my son says, he's biting daddy. What the actual hell is happening? My nephew, who was two and a half at the time, sister and her husband used to live in my house. One day, my nephew was looking out the window and sharing his juice with the window. His mom asked him what he was doing, and he said something about sharing his juice with the man. My sister assumed he was sharing with his reflection and didn't know the word for boy, so she brushed it off. He then began to show off his dino slippers. No big deal. Next day, he's back at it, except this time he says the man had his horses and was scary. She looked out the window, nothing, and no horse-related items in the room at the time. As she's looking, my nephew runs over and begins to cry, saying the man was scary. His dad came home later and shot the bad guy away with a Nerf gun, and he never appeared again. This is really weird because both my sister and I, the only two of us who have ever slept in the front end of the house where this happened, used to see this scary looking man out of the other window wearing a cowboy hat. My sister even found a dog tag with info on it about a man. We looked up the information though and found nothing of use. I don't remember anything written on the tag. We live in a fairly big new neighborhood and there were no local deaths. It was really, really odd. A few years back, I was babysitting a little girl who was around four. I'll call her Emma. So Emma was a bubbly child, very energetic and always laughing. She also happened to have an imaginary friend named George with whom she played constantly, but she never really mentioned him other than to tell me and her parents who she was playing with. One day, as she was playing with this George, she suddenly turned to me and said, George doesn't like you. I was startled and asked her why he didn't like me, but Emma only repeated what she'd said before. I asked what George looked like, and she said that he was very tall with a red face and an eye patch. I, of course, got creeped out. Fortunately, she never said anything like that again, but I would sometimes catch her whispering to herself as she stared at me, only to resume playing when she saw that I caught her. Every once in a while, I'm asked, what's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to you? And this is always my response. My son used to say things like, in former times when I was older, usually followed by something older people would say. He would say things like, in former times when I was older, we would have to wait for the milkman to bring the milk. When he started school, we had to tell him that maybe this wasn't the best thing to say to the other kids. He said it so regularly and casually that we were a little bit worried about how the other kids would react. He stopped saying it altogether when he turned 10. I have no idea if he has any memories of these events. I babysit two kids frequently. 
I had them in the kitchen eating their dinner and I needed to use the restroom. So I went across a small hall to get to the stairs. The girl, who was seven at the time, thought I was out of earshot. And she says to her brother, wouldn't it be funny if Emmy fell backwards and cracked her skull open at the bottom of the stairs? There would be blood everywhere. It creeped me out more because she thought I couldn't hear her. The boy told me he heard scratches and growling inside of his closet one night, which is why he refuses to sleep alone to this day, and that he had also seen shadow figures, quote, the size of his dad, who's about 6'2". Their home is creepy. I've been with these people for six years, and I also dog sit for them when they go out of town, which is frequent. And take it from me, their home is definitely haunted. When my daughter was three or four, she was downstairs at my in-laws while we were visiting. There was a playroom down there with dolls and things like that. We were upstairs in the kitchen when she came up and asked, is it okay to play with great grandpa? She said it like she was asking if she could play with her dolls. At the time, she never had a great grandparent and had never even heard the term before. The thing is, her great-grandfather died in that house about 30 years prior. My kid is six years old and literally says weird things all the time. He has a sleepwalking and sleep talking thing going on. The pediatrician says he'll grow out of it. Anywho, he likes to sit up in the dark and say things like, tell those people to get out of here, I'm trying to sleep. Or my personal favorite, mom, who is she? Why is she looking at us? While pointing to the empty wall next to the side of the bed. He also likes to get up and sprint into the dark house in the middle of the night. So that's fun. At the age of 18 months, my son would point to things. I totally believe in the paranormal, so I brought out pictures. I pointed to Papa Spiller, my husband's grandpa. I have video of him giving Papa his pacifier and waving by. He also started talking about his other parents, Papa Fisher and Mama Joe. They were murdered, Papa then Mama and then him. After he was shot, he was in my tummy and here we are. He's now seven and doesn't speak much of it anymore, but he would randomly say things like, Papa liked those, or in his sleep, he would casually mention needing help on the farm. Let me start by saying that growing up, my little sister never slept in our room as a child, like ever. Normally she would sleep with my mom due to her freaking out about one thing or another. To be honest, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable about sleeping in there by myself, which I did every night. Her constant freakouts about it, coupled with the feeling of being watched while I was in there alone, even in the middle of the day, made me feel super uneasy. That being said, there was one night that I came home from hanging out with my boyfriend at the time, and I walked into my room. And who do I see? My little sister. At the time, she was five and I was 15, and she was totally fine and in the top bunk. I was incredibly surprised that my mom got her to sleep in her own bed. She looks down from her bunk 
and points to my great-grandmother's rocking chair. It was then that I noticed that it was slightly rocking back and forth. She laughed as she pointed and said, look, it's grandma. I immediately yelled for my mom to take her and the rocking chair out of my room. My great grandma had died a few months before and my sister barely knew her. Without pictures, she wouldn't even know what she looked like. It was so creepy. I have always hated my best friend's grandma's house. My friend has lived there off and on since we were probably five. At one point, she was staying there with her oldest daughter, who would have been about three or four at the time. Her daughter would draw pictures of the man and talk about seeing him in the hallway. The creepiest, though, was one night when a few of us were sitting on the porch, one summer night. One of the girls was getting ready to leave and my friend's daughter said, Laura, you don't have to be scared. The man is in your car right now, but he's not going to hurt you. We couldn't see anything in the car. Instead of leaving, literally all of us went inside to give the man some time to vacate the vehicle. have a five-year-old boy. My son once asked me if I knew the man that died here. We were at home. I said, uh, no. He said, I do, and went on playing. A few weeks to a month later, he came up and hugged me and said, I waited a long time for you to be my mom. One time he told me that he couldn't sleep because of all the people calling his name. I don't remember the exact conversation, but it was in a questioning context, like he thought that maybe that happened to me too. I asked him if it was scary, and he said no. Scared me though. I called my sister and asked her to sage my house. This is a really short story, but it's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to me. My boss's kid came into my office and saw an old picture of my son. She said, oh, you have a little boy? I told her, yes, I do, but he isn't that little anymore. Before I could even finish my sentence, she said, because he's dead. I said, no, he's alive and well. He's just older now. She then looked me dead in my eyes and said, when are you gonna die? Creepiest thing I've ever encountered. When I was younger, my brother and I were babysitting my goddaughter. We were all downstairs watching movies while lazing around on the couches when she starts to laugh hysterically and starts talking to what seemed like the stairs, repeating stuff like, that's funny. When I asked her what she was laughing at, she replied with, over there, can't you see him? The man with the green teeth sitting on the stairs. My brother and I grabbed her and got right out of there. I still don't like that basement. My mom said that when I was about nine or 10 at night while I was sleeping, 
She would come into my room to turn my Christmas lights off. This was about late November or early December. And I apparently woke up immediately after she turned off the first set of lights and started screaming at her, what are you doing? Stop, really loudly. She turned the lights back on and I apparently went back to sleep. She asked me in the morning while I was getting ready for school if I remembered it happening and I didn't. I'm 14 now and still to this day, I don't remember that event happening. I'm sure that this startled the hell out of my mom, but it probably wasn't paranormal. Either way, she got a good scare. My cousin, who is 14 years younger than me, was playing in his bedroom at about age two, maybe three. Suddenly, he starts screaming and bolts out of the room into my arms. I asked him what had happened, expecting him to say that he got hurt or something. He's sobbing, saying, scary guy, scary guy. It was the middle of the day, bright and sunny, and his room was on the second floor. So I just thought something startled him and I was going to go show him that everything was okay. I tried coaxing him back to the bedroom, but he wasn't having it. I went and checked the room for myself and there was nothing spooky, no one there. I finally convinced him to come back into the room, but he insisted on being in my arms when he did. When we got to the room, I said, see, nothing to worry about. But he pointed to his closet and said, scary guy over there. So I walked over to the closet and looked, nothing. So I told him there's nothing here. He turns around and looks at the ceiling of the closet. And that's when he starts shrieking and climbing up my body, trying to get out of my arms and away from the closet. I bolted out of that room with him and he calmed down. I never did figure out what he saw, but that room always freaked me out from then on until the day that they finally moved. One night, I was laying in bed watching TV and I saw a ghost in my bedroom door against the blackness of the hallway. He was obviously a ghost because of how his face looked. It was really messed up. He was wearing a cowboy hat. I stared at him for a good few minutes without moving, but not really feeling scared either. Then he sort of just melted into the darkness behind him. I convinced myself I was dreaming. In the morning, my then three-year-old daughter came up to me and totally unprompted said, Mummy, did you see that man last night? The one and only time I've ever truly seen a ghost and my kid creeps me out because I couldn't convince myself it was just a dream anymore. She saw him too. A couple of months ago, my two-year-old son woke up crying around 3 a.m., so I brought him into bed with my wife and I. After laying there for a few minutes, he sat straight up, pointed to the corner of the room, and said, Dada, guy, guy die. My wife and I looked at each other, freaked out, and decided we would just pretend that it never happened. We bought this house from an elderly woman who lived here with her husband, and I do know that he passed away in the house some time ago. A few other strange things have happened, but I'm honestly not sure it's anything to be too worried about. Either way, that was pretty freaky.
This one time, I was babysitting my cousin. She drew this really creepy picture of her friend Ellie. In this picture, Ellie had a braid wrapped around her neck and into her eyes, and she was pulling me into a closet. I asked her why she drew this, and she said, Ellie thinks you're mean. She told me she wants to hurt you, and she started crying. I mean, heck, I almost cried myself. Not much happened after that, but it was pretty terrifying. When my little niece was like four, we were in the car and randomly she goes, mommy, are we puppets? My sister was like, no, no, baby, we're not puppets. My niece thought about it for a moment and then said, I think we are, we just don't know it yet. Incredibly ominous, little child, thanks. When my nephew was a toddler, about two years old, he would cry at night and say that there was a man in a hat in the closet who would talk to him. He was petrified and he wouldn't even sleep in his bedroom anymore. He would only sleep in his sister's room every night. My brother lives in a home that was built by our grandfather. Our grandfather had cancer when we were teens. By the time it was found, it was really too late. Near the end of his life, we brought him back home and we turned the office room into a hospital room. That same room, many years later, had become my nephew's bedroom. My brother, sister-in-law, and I were all living at the house at the time and we were all a bit startled. We didn't think it could actually be our grandfather though. I mean, he wasn't the type of man to pop out of a closet in the dark and scare the shit out of a toddler. Whatever it was that my nephew saw, or thought he saw, has left him afraid of the dark and still prefers to sleep in the same room as his sister to this day. After my brother died, we didn't tell my children because I wasn't ready. One of my sons, three years old, pointed at his picture and said, Oh, Uncle Matt, he's my ghost friend that goes to the woods. A few weeks before this, he made me shut his door every single night because he didn't want his ghost friends to go to the woods to sleep. Super creepy but also creepily comforting. When my daughter was three or four, she came upstairs from playing in the basement when we were visiting family. She asked if it was okay to play with great grandpa who was asking if he could play dolls with her. She had never heard the term great-grandpa before, mainly because her great-grandparents were long dead. Turns out my wife's grandpa died in that house. I was hanging family photos on our wall. I picked up a black and white framed photo of my father-in-law who had passed away over 20 years prior. My husband never speaks of him and I had never met him. My son had never seen a photo of him. As I was placing it on the wall, my three-year-old son says, that's the angel man who lives in our house. 
I asked him to tell me more, but he looked embarrassed and wouldn't explain further. I've never told my husband or any of his family members. I don't think they would be open to it and would probably think I was a nut. Not really creepy, but years ago, I was told I probably wouldn't be able to have kids. About four years ago, my three-year-old nephew came up to me and poked my belly a couple of times. Then he said, there's someone in there, before running away. He was right, and also correctly guessed the genders of both of my kids before I ever knew I was pregnant. Like I said, not really creepy, but still kind of weird. I keep a photo of my grandma and I on my nightstand. She was the most influential person in my life, and she died when I was 12. Once, when my daughter was four, she said, that's your granny, Barbara Jo. I'm named after her. I responded that she was right, and I asked her who told her that. She says, she told me when I was in your tummy. I moved to the United States from London with my two boys, three and four years old at the time. Their dad stayed behind. Trying to explain the new situation to my youngest, I said, we don't live in London anymore. This is our new house. We live here now, you, me, and your brother. Yes, he said, and Yazin. Who's Yazin? I asked. The dead girl. He kept referring to Yazin for two to three weeks until I finally said, please tell Yazin she cannot stay with us and needs to go to the light. He just says, okay. And we never heard about her again. One day, I was walking by my nephew's bedroom. I thought I heard a noise, so I got a little bit closer, just to listen in and make sure everything was okay. I heard him whispering, so I stopped and opened the door a bit. I said, who are you whispering to? He said, no one. Just as I started to walk away, I heard him whisper again, but this time, I heard what he was saying loud and clear. He said, Shh, she's gonna hear you. Totally creeped me out. I was around eight or nine years old and I was staying with my grandparents. I had this dream one night that my granny had given birth to me, but before my mom was born, a middle child. I told my granny about this dream and she said, huh, tell me more. In the dream, I was a little man child. I was born to give them wisdom and to guide them through their lives. I was born to help them, to be their peer, I remember being really confused about this, about being their equals. I found out years later that my grandma had taken a child to term, and the child died in childbirth. About two years later, my mom was born. I guess in hindsight, that was a really creepy thing I said to my granny, and I'm sure it's the story she tells when people ask her about creepy things a kid in her life has said. Sorry, granny.
My nephew didn't say this to me personally, but he did to my sister, repeatedly, for about a month. At the time, he was about five years old. Every single morning, he would ask my sister why the lady with blood on her tries to make him take her hand at night and come with her. He would tell her to leave him alone and cry. And she would say, shh, 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 like a mother comforting her child, all whilst holding her hand out and asking him to come with her. Freaked the hell out of all of us. So I work with kids, and one of them comes up to me, and he asks me if I have ears. I'm thinking, that's kind of an odd question, but I say, yes, I do have ears. He goes, if you have ears, then why can't you hear the people asking me to play with them? I stare at this kid in shock as he walks away. I was like, what do you mean? But he never answered me. That really freaked me out because all the other teachers that I worked with there were convinced that the building was haunted. Up until that point, I didn't believe them. But after that, I don't know. At a house that I used to live in, my room was upstairs, and creepy stuff was always happening. One night, my little cousin spent the night with us and wanted to sleep in bed with me. There were knocks and noises, and the next thing I know, she's laughing. I asked her why she was laughing, and she told me, stop tickling my feet. I never touched her feet. I took her downstairs and we camped out on the floor that night. I never told her what was really going on. I told her it would just be fun, but there was no way we were staying up there after that. I was babysitting my brother's girlfriend's kid, who is three, almost four. We were eating in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, he started to have a full-on conversation with no one. I jokingly said, wow, you have a lot to say. Who are you talking to? He then just stared into the living room, which happened to be completely dark at the time. He stared for a few minutes, which made me feel pretty uneasy. It was probably a kid's active imagination, but my brother works at an old cemetery, and we always joke about what would happen if a ghost ever followed him home. Maybe that wasn't such a joke after all. When my daughter was about four, we had just finished her bath. I had her on her bed, drying her off. All of a sudden, she said, Daddy just said, hey. I was taken off guard because my husband worked second shift and was not home at the time. I said, no, baby, Daddy isn't here. She said, no, Daddy just said, hey. Then she looked all weird and got scared. She didn't want to be in her room anymore. I don't know if it was my reaction or response that made her that way or not, but it sure gives me chills and creeps me out. I called my husband just to calm my nerves and make sure he was okay. Either way, that was still one of the creepiest things a kid has ever said to me.
Years ago, we used to babysit my baby cousins. One day, we were trying to get Vivian ready to go home, and we couldn't get her to focus on getting her coat on. She kept turning to look at the front door. Exasperated, my mom asked her why she was staring at the door. Vivian answers, I want to wave by at the man's. Why they dress like Halloween? I wave at them. And then she waved at our front door before saying, they gone now. Still creeps me out thinking about it. I'm first off, I'm currently 51 years old, and this still bothers me to this day. I have quite a few stories throughout my life to share, but this is the first. I was living in a new state, which I had never been to before. This was in the era where our parents told us to go out and play and be back at dinner time. I was nine years old in 1979, and we had just moved to Dallas, Texas. I was playing outside by myself and I was approached by another young girl. She seemed normal and asked to play with me. I was okay with it. She asked if I wanted to see her playroom. I didn't see any reason not to, and I followed her. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse that looked like row houses, so we went into her townhouse, and I never saw anyone in the house, just the two of us. The townhouse looked normal enough, we went upstairs and into a bedroom that looked like a little girl's room. She walked up to the wall and pushed a panel, which opened. She crawled in and, stupid me, I followed. Inside was this amazing room full of toys and a little black kitten she was holding. I was so taken by all that was in front of me and I was just excited to play. We played for a bit. However, in the secret room, there were no windows or natural lighting. I couldn't tell what time it was. Eventually, I felt uncomfortable, like I needed to get home. So I told her I had to go. Mind you, never once asking for her name or telling her mine. But she turned to me with dark eyes and asked me by name if I really wanted to go because it was fun here in the room. I was creeped out because I know I didn't tell her my name. I crawled out and she followed me. I just kept moving down the stairs to the door, trying to avoid looking back. But once I opened the door, I did look back, and to me she looked like part girl and part skeleton. So I ran home, as it was dusk and I knew I was going to get in trouble. I didn't say anything about it to my mom. I went about my evening and slept like normal. But the next day, I was disturbed by it, and I decided to go back and see if she was still there. When I walked down to the townhome, it was boarded up like there'd been a fire there. I stood back and looked at it for a while, knowing that I had been in there yesterday, and it looked normal. I never saw or heard anything about that little girl again. I wish I had told someone who could have found out if she ever lived there. To this day, I can see that hidden playroom like it was yesterday, and I have no explanation. My sister and I slept in the same bedroom. She's two years younger than me. Our beds were pretty much next to each other. Next to my sister's bed was a tall wardrobe. Not a spooky one, just a white box from Ikea. It was attached to the wall and filled with our old toys. One night, I woke up to my sister sitting on her bed, mumbling quietly. She's done this before. But this time she was facing the wardrobe, so I only saw her back. I sat up quickly, remembering the previous time this had happened. I felt super uneasy. I didn't feel like somebody was in the room. I couldn't sense anything around us. I just felt scared. What I hadn't realized immediately was that my sister wasn't just facing the wardrobe, but the door was actually open. 
not just a little bit, like I took something during the day and didn't notice that I left it open a crack, but it had been clearly opened during the night. We never go to that wardrobe since there's just a ton of old toys in there, nothing that we actually need. Instead of asking who she was talking to or what she was talking about, I decided to just listen, or maybe I was too afraid to ask. I honestly can't remember. At first I only heard mumbling and I couldn't make out anything, but then I heard her clearly ask, what did you want to tell me, while looking into the wardrobe? And when I shifted a little bit in my bed to look, that's when I got this overwhelming feeling of someone being in the room with us. I called my sister's name and I noticed her stiffening from hearing my voice, but she didn't turn around to face me before quietly mumbling, I have to go, and closing the door of the closet. After that, she seemed way sleepier, way less aware of her surroundings, like she was still asleep. But the way that she just spoke a little bit earlier and closed the door was like a completely coherent person. She seemed to be fully awake, not like she was still asleep. She fell asleep right after I told her to lay her head on the pillow and get some sleep. And once again, like the last time, she couldn't remember any of this the next morning. After the previous time, the feeling of the unsafe and dark presence disappeared. But after this time, it stayed. Every day, in every room, it felt like someone was looking at you or sitting in the shadows. It sounds spooky, but it felt even spookier. I feel like usually home is your safe place, but during that time, it felt like everything but safe and cozy. My mom experienced super vivid bad dreams. Never before had she believed us, or in any sort of presences or ghosts, or had she ever been spooked out by those things. I struggled with severe insomnia, but my little sister? She slept like a baby. Around a month after the wardrobe incident, I woke up again to the same setting. And this time I just started crying immediately from how freaked out I was. My sister was once again sitting on her bed, facing the wardrobe with her back turned towards me. This time the door was closed, but she was tapping the same door with her fingernail. Not once or twice, but continuously, while mumbling quietly. This time I immediately told her to stop and get back to bed. She put her hand down and kept mumbling, but kept facing the wardrobe. I called her name calmly again for a couple of times before she finally turned to me with her eyes closed and said, I can't do it. I asked what she couldn't do, but then she just laid down and fell asleep. After this night, the bad energy or presence I had felt disappeared, and slowly my mom's nightmares and my insomnia left too. I still don't know what the heck was going on, but honestly, I'm just glad it stopped. I moved out about a year after that, and now my sister has her own room, so there's no telling if stuff like this keeps happening or not. But there are still times when I visit my mom's place and feel the same feeling of unsafe, especially during the nights. My little sister was around, I want to say like six, maybe seven, when she started talking about her imaginary friend, the Red Man. She explained to me that he was a magician with a magic finger. I didn't think too much into it. We were homeschooled, and she was incredibly bored before her friends got home. So I assumed that's all it was. One day she comes running into my room, very upset and frantic. She told me, I took his finger and now he's really angry. I tried to calm her down, again assuming that this was just a six-year-old's imagination. But she was convinced that he was coming after her, and for a few nights I let her sleep in my bed. She stopped talking about it for a few days and acted fine. And then I was doing dishes with our brother, who's about two years older, 
He was never the type to have imaginary friends. He didn't pretend like that at all. Very analytical. So when he asked my sister if she'd seen the red man lately, I was a little shocked. Apparently he knew all about it too, and was just as convinced as our sister that it was real. So I asked him, and he said that they'd been playing with the red man and she accidentally took his finger. I was starting to get very unsettled by all of this. My sister drew pictures of him all the time. Sometimes he would look like a person. Other times he looked more like a mist. The last straw was the evening that she and I were outside late. My parents had brought a big load of groceries in. Suddenly she stiffens up and points. He's right there, she said. I turned around to where she was pointing. Across the street, under a large tree, was an unsettling sight. A tall man thing. He was very red, and I felt total dread looking at it. My parents were very religious at the time, and they had heard all about the situation, and had my sister see the priest at our church, and it all seemed to stop. I didn't think about it for a long time, until a few months ago, when my sister came to visit me at my house. She's 13 now. We were sitting outside and talking, when, very casually, she said, Do you think the red man still wants his finger back? I'll never know if she said that to mess with me, or if something very strange is haunting my baby sister. But it spooks me, nonetheless. This was a couple of months ago. I was staying the night at my significant other's house. We were laying in bed, watching TV. Her two daughters, ages five and eight, came into the room. The five-year-old was leaning against my side of the bed and looking over my chest toward her mother, whose side of the bed is near the wall. Who's that lady? The five-year-old says. Me, thinking she was being silly and talking about her mom, said, that's your mommy. The five-year-old says, no, not her, the lady behind her. She was staring at the wall, looking at eye level, about where a person's eyes would be if they were standing there. Gave me the chills. My significant other who was chatting with her other daughter didn't hear this exchange. Later, when I told her, she got freaked out and told me that she was pretty certain her house was haunted. Apparently, she's had all kinds of things happen. Now when I go over there, I get a little paranoid, and I get an eerie feeling. I'm not sure if it's because of anything actually supernatural, or if I just expect it to be haunted because she's told me those things, regardless of whether it's true or not, you know? The only other things I've experienced have been lights randomly turning on, and my glasses disappearing from where I definitely left them. Haven't seen them since, actually. I had to get new ones. The whole deal with the five-year-old really freaked me out, though. I still have no idea what she was looking at. I was 14, and I was having a sleepover at my friend Jake's house. His parents weren't going to be home until about 1.30 or 2, so it was nice for them to let me hang out with him. Jake's little brother Aiden was probably six years old, maybe five. I don't remember the exact details, but I do remember what happened. Jake put his brother to bed early in the evening, and he slept pretty well until about 11. We both hear Aiden calling to Jake from his own room down the hall so Jake handed me the controller to continue playing. A couple of minutes later, Jake comes back and says, that was freaking weird. I asked him what was up, and he told me that Aiden apparently woke up and saw a man in his closet with his back facing to him. Jake checked the closet, found nobody, closed the door and brushed it off as Aiden having a nightmare. He plugged in the nightlight for him and then came back. It was definitely eerie, but it got worse. At about 12.30, 
we both heard Aiden screaming for Jake. I knew it was probably a nightmare, but because of what he said previously, I decided to go with Jake to check on him. Jake ended up taking a few minutes to calm him down, and when he finally did, Aiden said, the man in the closet came out. He had no eyes, and then he tried to get in the bed with me. That was freaky enough, but to make everything even scarier, I noticed something. Aiden's closet door was ajar a couple of inches, and I remember that it was completely shut, because not long after the first encounter, I had passed by his bedroom to use the bathroom and peered in just out of curiosity. I remember that the closet was completely closed, because I actually looked for it, because of what he had told Jake. I don't think any of us got a wink of sleep that night. Maybe Aiden opened the closet door or sleepwalked or something, but he's never done that before or since. It really spooked us all. Aiden ended up sleeping in his parents' room that night, and I remember not coming over too much after that. About a month after my grandfather died from cancer, I had started a new job and had to go away for training. As my grandmother was retired, she cared for my children, aged seven and nine at the time, during the week while I was away. This was during the summer. She told me that one afternoon, my seven-year-old came stomping into the house and said something like, Pop is mad I went into the shed. My grandfather, who we called Pop, had a shed that he never wanted the kids in because he had his tools, gas for mowers, and paint in there. Nothing that kids need to be into. And when he was alive, he wouldn't let them go in there. I asked my son about it when I came home that weekend. He told me he went into the shed and Pop threw a hammer at him. I think a tool fell off a shelf, not that one was actually thrown at him, because if it was my Pop, he would never do that. He also said that Pop would play with them in the yard during the day. Having seen a ghost as a child and not being believed, I believed him. I was also comforted by the story, as his death was still recent and I really missed him. So I was glad that he was still around to play with the kids and watch over them. My sister and nephew used to live in a small house in the old, original area of town when he was very young. She had this touch lamp that would be off when she walked by, but on when she came by his room later. She would hear my nephew babble in his baby speak and would ask him who he was talking to. One time, he answered that he was talking to the man. In the next week or so, I went over to hang out, and he started talking at nothing when he woke up from his nap. She had told me about what had happened, so we decided to see if we could get more out of him. He was able to tell us that it was a sad grandpa, which we think just meant that he was older, wearing a hat, oh, and that he was up in the air. We couldn't tell if he meant floating, and he said, no, he was swinging. He pointed up toward the light fixture. We went back out to the living room as a group, and the lamp was on again. Never happened again after she moved out of that house. I've always been sensitive, and I've had some paranormal experiences. My son has said some creepy things to me that hint that he might also be sensitive. The other night, he told me that he saw somebody standing by our hall closet door, right outside of the big bedroom door. He's six, but he sleeps with us. He said, there was somebody standing by the closet, 
looking into the room last night. I said, what? Are, are you sure it wasn't just the door? Yes, he said. I asked if it was a piece of clothing or a towel or something on the banister. He said, no, it was somebody looking in. I asked if it was a kid or an adult, and he said it was an in-between size. I asked him if he was sure that it wasn't our tuxedo cat. He said, well, I don't think our cat can stand up on his legs like that. That's when I stopped asking questions. My niece used to sleepwalk, which is kind of creepy in and of itself. One night at like 3 a.m., she went to my brother and sister-in-law's bedroom, stood in the doorway, and just said, she's here. Another thing that happened, my stepdaughter, about the age of eight, was in her room sleeping, and I was in our bedroom scrolling Reddit. My husband is in the living room, watching TV. Sometimes you would hear her mumble in her sleep. No big deal. This night, though, I hear what sounds like a full conversation. She's talking normally, like she would to a friend. I turned my fan off, and I heard her say, Do what? Then a pause. And then, No, I can't do that. Seconds later, I see my husband walk into her room and ask, Hey, what are you doing? You okay? lay down and go to sleep. He laid with her for a little bit and then came back out to the living room. I went out there and was like, were you guys talking? He said, no. When I went in there, she was sitting straight up in her bed with her eyes open and I told her to lay back down. I told him what I heard her say and he decided that he'd better sleep in her room tonight because that's really creepy. I asked her the next morning if she had had any bad dreams, if she remembered talking to anybody, and told her what she said. She had no idea what I was talking about, and didn't remember a thing. I had just found out that I was pregnant and twins run in my family, so I was excited for my first ultrasound that was a couple of weeks away. My neighbor's five-year-old grandson was visiting her and we all took a walk together around the neighborhood. She told him that I was going to have a baby, and he replied, no she's not. She told him again that there was a baby in my tummy and that we were going to check soon whether there were one or two. He stopped walking, looked at my belly, and said, No, there's zero. Then he continued on walking with us, chatting about bugs and kid stuff. I miscarried about a week later. Somehow, that kid knew. From 1993 to 1998, every summer I attended a Christian youth camp for girls. Camp lasted four days and three nights. There were about 200 girls at the camp and it was about a one and a half to two hour drive away from our homes. Some of the camping areas were tent only. Others had A-frames and at least one of the camping areas had longhouses. The campground is called Ensign Ranch in Kittitas County, Washington. You can look online to see pictures of what these different camping areas look like. It's a really safe campground, and we had a lot of fun every year. In the evenings, we would tell spooky stories, pretty typical stuff for youth camps. On the last night of camp in 1996, I was 15 at the time, there were several of us girls on the top level of our longhouse. It was past bedtime, so we were quietly telling scary stories. I had told a couple, one with the help of a friend I'll call Lily. I don't remember the specific stories from that night, 
Just typical, and the hook was hanging from the car door kind of stuff. After a couple of hours of spooky stories, someone else was talking and I was getting really tired and could hardly keep my eyes open. Then some of the girls asked me to tell one more story. So, I start telling a story, making it up as I go. Just typical, on a dark night, in the woods not far from here, type of beginning. Next thing I know, I wake up, lying flat on my back. As I'm waking, I realize that I'm still talking. But once I became aware of my own talking, I couldn't remember what I was saying, or trying to say. I was fully awake then. I finished by lamely saying something like, they all died, the end. I looked around me at the girls who were all staring wide-eyed at me. A couple of the girls were quietly crying, mouths open in horror with tears streaming down their faces. My friend Lily whispered, that was the creepiest thing I've ever heard. The girls that weren't crying nodded in agreement. I said I was tired and that we should all go to bed. As all of the other girls moved away to their sleeping bags, I asked Lily and another girl, who I'll call Sarah, what I had said. I admitted to them that I had fallen asleep and I couldn't remember anything. Lily and Sarah exchanged glances, and Lily paused before saying, that just makes it worse. Sarah nodded in agreement and said that she didn't want to retell it because it was that creepy. Now, at this point, if it had just been Lily and one or two of the other girls that were in that group, I would have thought that they realized I was asleep and were just messing with me. But Sarah was, and still is, a very serious person who doesn't have much of a sense of humor, doesn't like pranks, even innocent ones, and is honest almost to a fault. So, I went to sleep feeling unnerved but exhausted. A few hours later, I was being shaken awake by one of the adult camp leaders. She told me to gather my things and follow her. I sleepily and awkwardly carried my stuff down the ladder, then followed her outside. Two other camp leaders were standing next to a tent. They told me to put my items inside and then to come talk to them. Inside the tent were two of the younger girls, 12 or 13, that had been listening to the scary stories and who had been crying when I woke up. They wouldn't even look at me. They just laid there, sobbing. When I went back outside to talk to the leaders, they said that Lily had shown up at their tent with two of the sobbing girls. The girls were crying and kept saying they wanted their parents to come get them. Lily explained about the scary stories and about mine being the one that made them cry. The leaders asked me what I had said. I admitted that I had fallen asleep and honestly didn't know. The leader said that Lily refused to tell them what I said, and the two girls sobbed harder the more they tried to talk to them. They explained to the girls that they weren't going to call and wake their parents up at 3 a.m. and have them drive over an hour just because of spooky stories. Plus, we were all going home the next day. As punishment for scaring the girls, the leaders made me sleep in the tent with them while the leaders went to sleep in the longhouse. The girls cried for a bit and then we fell asleep. They were both gone from the tent when I awoke in the morning. To this day, I have no idea what story I told. Nobody that was there has ever been willing to tell me any of the details. Several years afterward, Lily told me that she would randomly still have nightmares because of it. The only details I ever had answered were that my voice sounded the same as usual, my eyes remained closed for the majority of the story, which creeped them out even more, and that the story was coherent and made sense up until the end when I lamely finished it off. Again, if it had only been Lily and a few other, less serious girls, I would know that they were just screwing with me. But for Sarah and most of the other girls that were there, including the one that cried most of the night, being part of a prank on me just doesn't seem probable. I will likely never know the story that I told, and maybe it's for the best. So last weekend, I went camping at Brownwood State Park in Texas. 
I had to shower that night, so I made my way to the camp showers. They were incredibly loud, but it wasn't a big deal. I showered like normal and had the shower off to dry off and leave. I heard a loud knocking on the door suddenly. It was perfectly rhythmic. One knock, two second pause. One knock, two second pause. For about ten knocks. I finally shouted, Occupied. It stopped for a beat, and then continued. I shouted, I'll be out soon. Assuming it was my boyfriend, I just let it go. A few knocks later, it finally stopped. Then I heard my boyfriend come to the door, knock softly, and ask, Sweetie, you almost done? I had immediately assumed that it was my boyfriend messing with me, but I noticed later, I never heard whatever was knocking come or go, and I could hear my boyfriend walk up to the door from a distance. I had been accusing him of messing with me, but he's very no-nonsense and seemed as scared as I was. He had a flashlight and said that he didn't see anybody leaving. At the time the knocking stopped, there was about a 45 second gap from the knocking stopping and him walking up. It was really weird. I didn't shower at night after that, but I'm really glad I didn't open the door to whatever was knocking. Anyone had something weird happen like this while camping? So when I was about 13 or 14, I went camping with my father, my uncle, and my cousin. It was in a faraway place from home and it was near a small fall that turned into a little river. Note that this was in Brazil, so we were camping in the deep depths of the rainforest. Very dark. After we had dinner, we put down the fire and went to sleep. It was my first time camping, so I was uncomfortable with all the forest noises and everything. After a good 30 or 40 minutes of trying to get to sleep, I realized that I wasn't hearing any noises anymore. It was completely silent, and my dad and relatives were sleeping. I was frightened because of the silence, so I stepped outside the tent to take a look outside with my flashlight, and then something kind of reflected the light. I was so scared that I went inside the tent again to find my dad and my relatives all wake up and ask if I saw something. I said that something reflected the light, and everyone stepped outside to see. When everybody was outside, we saw three gigantic figures, about seven feet high, fully covered in white clothes, gloves, and boots, and their faces were covered with something that looked like black nets. They had very long arms to the point of almost reaching the ground, and had a strange blue aura all over them that looked like fog. They made weird sounds as they were speaking with each other, at least I assume that's what they were doing, and then proceeded to just walk into the woods again. Everybody was so afraid that we just packed up and left that same night. I remember this like it was yesterday, and even now I am afraid to go camping again. I never want to have the possibility of encountering those things again. Also, I'm 25 years old now, so no, it wasn't drones. My wife and I were camping last night in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon. We camp here often and decided to explore up FSR 520. FSR means Forest Service Road for those who don't know. We found a cool abandoned bridge far back in the woods over Cook Creek. The spot was beautiful and we were set up over the river on this long abandoned bridge over the creek. If you've ever been into the Oregon woods, you know that they can give off a creepy vibe, and this was no exception, but it really was a dream campsite. Being 40 feet directly over a river while on a bridge with limbs growing everywhere all over it isn't your everyday spot. I'll throw in for background that there was nobody within at least three miles of us. We had to hike in a little from our car, approximately a tenth of a mile. 
We explored around the area for quite a while and didn't come across anything out of the ordinary besides a pair of shoes and a name, Mona, written in ash on a rock of the fire ring. While we were sitting by the fire, I noticed a very bright flash of light over the river, and I snapped my head up, but didn't see anything. A few moments later, I was paying closer attention, and I watched a ball of light float, even with the bridge 40 feet in the air, from one side to the other in the woods, over 50 feet. The light was very blue. My thought the first time had been that somehow headlights had come through, but I would have heard a car, and no man-made light could get to us in this isolated area. This blue light was unlike anything I've ever seen. I mentioned it to my wife, but I didn't want to freak her out, so I dropped the subject soon after. Later that night, in the tent, we had the mesh lining up where we could see outside. My wife gasped and watched as the same blue light floated at the end of the bridge 30 feet away and hovered in the air. After a good bit of time, it shot into the woods. It being late at night, we were obviously scared of somebody's headlamp, but it shot away 40 times as fast as any human could go, and there was nothing attached to it. Our dog left the tent and stared at the spot for the next 10 minutes while peeking down the side of the bridge very seriously. Has anybody else had a similar experience on Forest Service Road 520 in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon? Or maybe in the Pacific Northwest at all? I'd be very curious to know. My parents forced me into a church camping trip. I wasn't from any church, and I didn't really want to be friends with the people there. My female cousin went too, so we had nice conversations. The place was okay, but around it was a lake, and a bridge to the forest on the other side of the lake. There was this weird air in the areas around the camping place that we were. I remember exploring it, and there was a very bad energy there. Ripped clothes, campfires that looked old, black trash bags hanged into trees. All that in the forest around the camping area as well. I suppose it was kind of normal, but it just gave off a bad vibe. On one of the last nights there, they finally lighted a campfire for people to come around. My cousin and I were talking for a moment, and then we remained quiet for five minutes or so. I looked far away into the forest to that little lake that was splitting off from there. I suddenly saw a man running around the lake in the forest area. He was wearing big, white, Jesus kind of clothes and no shoes. He ran fast, and while I watched him, I felt this really bad energy. I looked at my cousin, and then she looked at me. We were both pretty spooked. I asked her if she saw something there, and she described exactly what I saw. We got this really creepy feeling from it, but nobody from the church would believe us. Even today, I remember clearly that the man, if that's what he was, looked tall, white robes, very pale, running on completely bare feet, giving off this really bad vibe. He looked human, but it was almost like he wasn't. I know it's not as much of an impressive story as others, but it was one of the realest things I've ever experienced, and I really don't think that guy was a human. The man disappeared within seconds after me spotting him and looking away, and we never saw him again after that. There was nowhere for him to go. I still can't explain it. This story happened in my childhood, when I was about 12 years old. I thought about it ever since, and I still don't know what it actually was, or what I should think of it. It's not the most spectacular story, but it was creepy to me. I grew up in an apartment that was pretty much outside the city and close to a forest, so we had a lot of green around where we were, 
always playing in it and sometimes going camping outside with friends in the summer. So one night a couple of friends and I decided to build up my tent and sleep outside. We were always staying up for a really long time and telling each other ghost stories. While we did this, we suddenly heard noises from outside the tent. We all held our breath. Then we could hear steps. They came closer and closer. And then the steps even went around our tent and then they stopped. We got really scared and we started saying things like, whoever you are, go away or we'll call the police. It seemed to work because the steps continued and headed away from our tent. After a minute or so, we then tried to be brave and went outside the tent to see who had come. But the only thing we could see was a woman in a really long dress walking away in the dark. I still don't know who or what that was, but she had no business being out there. It still gives me chills to this day. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot, and I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice-sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and I start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg, as it sounded like the animal was making a walking and dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. Thinking nothing of it, I go to bed after eating my food, douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decided that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I couldn't quite go to sleep. So I pulled out a book that I brought with me and started to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and I listened to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after. It's almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I try not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, and then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is real or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughter from a couple other different directions. All different kinds of people, old men, old women, even children. And I confirm that yes, this is real. The noises are closing in and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot in the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. 
Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing. The forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down in my exhausted state and I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety. It was still dark out. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I got up and sprinted out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the whole way. I never heard anybody follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way. But I still couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, like I left all my gear in the woods that night. So my mom and I were camping in our sort of local national park in the Alps. I had a headache and had had a rough night, but nothing special. My mom, who thought that I had slept really well, really did not. The next morning she told me about the dreams she had had, and that they were really realistic and they kind of scared her. She thought she heard men talking outside of our tent in a foreign language, and thought that we were going to be in trouble, being that we were two women alone in the middle of nowhere. Then she saw a woman walk slowly, just next to our tent while looking in at us, kind of wearing a farm outfit. The next thing she saw was a whole lot of people dressed in white in the trenches, just standing there. Back in the day, this national park was the site of a world war event. There are still remnants standing around. That particular night, I didn't see anything particular, and I had no idea my mom was having such bad dreams. We thought it was maybe sleep paralysis, but the more we talk about it, it feels more like an encounter than a simple episode of sleep paralysis. Maybe they were just dreams, but she said it was nothing like any dream she'd ever had, that it was so vivid that she was sure it was real. We're okay, we're just wondering about the weirdness of it all, and we're curious if anything similar has happened to you. So about three years ago, I went camping with my now ex-girlfriend, as she had always expressed an interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest, and it's my go-to trail and camp spot. It's hidden deep in the forest, and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs, etc. My family has been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends that introduced me to it have been going for about ten years or so. We went for a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to the campsite, but they were just stargazing and they ended up leaving. Around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like somebody was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended. It got very high-pitched and sounded as it kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. And that's when the laugh noise moved up higher and started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped. Then it started up again at about 3am. 
When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in my hand, and I turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see coyotes or something like that around the campsite. I didn't see anything or hear any movements. This went on until about 6 a.m., and then it stopped. That's when we were finally able to get some rest. After we woke up, we checked around the campsite, but we didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I went to start my vehicle, and it was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I am always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure that everything was closed properly and unplugged the night before. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I was able to get a jump from AAA somehow. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but at the end we both laughed. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite and also had a cabin in the same forest about 25 miles away. When I told him what happened, he got freaked out. He told me about two incidents, which he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While he was hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and saw a pair of eyes up in the tree looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight up at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, there they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went right to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that leads into the woods. They stated that the height of the eyes that were looking at them meant that whatever it was had to be at least seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles and the eyes had disappeared, but once they were done shooting, the eyes reappeared, this time closer. At that point, they were both freaked out and went back to the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all feel very scared. We especially felt fear at the time that the events were happening. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thinks it might have been a Wendigo. I don't really know what it could have been but I have never felt that scared before or since. I was nine years old and camping out with three families other than my own. I was sleeping in a small tent with one of my close friends when something woke me up. I listened and heard nothing from outside at first, so I opened the tent zipper enough to see the fire was out, so I knew the adults must be asleep. I closed the zipper and I laid back down. Shortly after I laid down, I heard a high-pitched voice from outside the tent. It kept saying, come out, come out and play with me. I would have thought that it was a person but it was repeating itself over and over again and moving closer to the tent and then farther away, all the time circling. I opened the tent and looked out, but it was pitch black. At this point, I tried to wake the friend I was in the tent with, but he pushed me off. I tried again more violently this time and he woke up. I told him that I heard something outside, but he must not have been fully awake because he just mumbled something and laid back down. After I talked to my friend, I tried to go to sleep, but the voice kept me up, always beckoning me to come out and play, always circling the tent. I don't know when exactly, or how, but somehow, I drifted off to sleep. The next morning I told my friend who had been in the tent about it, and he said that he remembered being annoyed that I woke him up. So to me, that means that I wasn't dreaming. I'm certain that I was fully awake, so I doubt that I just hallucinated it. I know this didn't lead anywhere satisfactory, and I don't have any answers, but this is my true story about something that I can only assume is paranormal. Paranormal. 